Moby Dick, chapters 55 to 58. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 55 to 58. Chapter 55 of the monstrous pictures of whales. I shall ere long paint to you, as well as one can without canvas, something like the true form of the whale as he actually appears to the eye of the whaleman when in his own absolute body the whale is moored alongside the whale-ship, so that he can be fairly stepped upon there. It may be worth while, therefore, previously to advert to those curious imaginary portraits of him which, even down to the present day, confidently challenge the faith of the landsman. It is time to set the world right in this matter by proving such pictures of the whale all wrong. It may be that the primal source of all those pictorial delusions will be found among the oldest Hindu, Egyptian, and Grecian sculptures, for ever since those inventive but unscrupulous times when, on the marble panellings of temples, the pedestals of statues, and on shields, medallions, cups, and coins, the dolphin was drawn in scales of chain armor like Saladin's, and a helmeted head like St. George's, ever since then has something of the same sort of license prevailed, not only in most popular pictures of the whale, but in many scientific presentations of him. Now, by all odds, the most ancient extant portrait, anyways purporting to be the whale's, is to be found in the famous cavern pagoda of Elephanta in India. The Brahmins maintain that in the almost endless sculptures of that immemorial pagoda, all the trades and pursuits, every conceivable avocation of man, were prefigured ages before any of them actually came into being. No wonder, then, that in some sort our noble profession of whaling should have been there shadowed forth. The Hindu whale referred to occurs in a separate department of the wall, depicting the incarnation of Vishnu in the form of Leviathan, learnedly known as the Matse Avatar. But, though this sculpture is half man and half whale, so as only to give the tale of the latter, yet that small section of him is all wrong. It looks more like the tapering tail of an anaconda than the broad palms of the true whale's majestic flukes. But go to the old galleries, and look now at a great Christian painter's portrait of this fish, for he succeeds no better than the antediluvian Hindu. It is Guido's picture of Persis rescuing Andromeda from the sea monster or whale. Where did Guido get the model of such a strange creature as that? Nor does Hogarth, in painting the same scene in his own Persis Descending, make out one whit better. The huge corpulence of that Hogarthian monster undulates on the surface, scarcely drawing one inch of water. It has a sort of howdah on its back, and its distended, tusked mouth into which the billows are rolling might be taken for the traitor's gate leading from the Thames by water into the tower. Then there are the Prodromus whales of old Scotch Sibald, and Jonah's whale as depicted in the prints of old Bibles and the cuts of old primers. What shall be said of these? As for the bookbinder's whale, winding like a vine stalk round the stock of a descending anchor, as stamped and gilded on the backs and title pages of many books, both old and new, that is a very picturesque but purely fabulous creature imitated, I take it, from like figures on antique vases. Though universally denominated a dolphin, I nevertheless call this bookbinder's fish an attempt at a whale, because it was so intended when the device was first introduced. It was introduced by an old Italian publisher somewhere about the fifteenth century, during the revival of learning, and in those days, and even down to a comparatively late period, Dolphins were popularly supposed to be a species of the Leviathan. 
In the vignettes and other embellishments of some ancient books, you will at times meet with very curious touches at the whale, where all manner of spouts, jets de eau, hot springs and cold, Saratoga and Baden-Baden, come bubbling up from his unexhausted brain. In the title page of the original edition of the Advancement of Learning, you will find some curious whales. But quitting all these unprofessional attempts, let us glance at those pictures of Leviathan purporting to be sober, scientific delineations by those who know. In old Harris's collection of voyages, there are some plates of whales extracted from a Dutch book of voyages, A.D. 1671, entitled, A Whaling Voyage to Spitsbergen in the Ship Jonas and the Whale, Peter Peterson of Friesland, Master. In one of those plates, the whales, like great rafts of logs, are represented lying among ice isles, with white bears running over their living backs. In another plate, the prodigious blunder is made of representing the whale with perpendicular flukes. Then again, there is an imposing quarto, written by one Captain Colnett, a post-captain in the English Navy, entitled, A Voyage Round Cape Horn into the South Seas for the Purpose of Extending the Spermaceti Whale Fisheries. In this book is an outline purporting to be a, quote, picture of a visitor or spermaceti whale drawn by scale from one killed on the coast of Mexico, August 1793, and hoisted on deck. I doubt not the captain had this veracious picture taken for the benefit of his marines. To mention but one thing about it, let me say that it has an eye which, applied according to the accompanying scale to a full-grown sperm whale, would make the eye of that whale a bow window some five feet long. Ah, my gallant captain, why did you not give us Jonah looking out of that eye? Nor are the most conscientious compilations of natural history for the benefit of the young and tender, free from the same heinousness of mistake. Look at that popular work, Goldsmith's Animated Nature. In the abridged London edition of 1807, there are plates of an alleged whale and a narwhale. I do not wish to seem inelegant, but this unsightly whale looks much like an amputated sow, and as for the narwhale, one glimpse at it is enough to amaze one, that in this nineteenth century such a hippogriff could be palmed for genuine upon any intelligent public of schoolboys. Then again, in 1825, Bernard Germain, Count de la Cepede, a great naturalist, published a scientific, systematized whale book, wherein are several pictures of the different species of the Leviathan. All these are not only incorrect, but the picture of the Mysticetus, or Greenland whale, that is to say the right whale, even Scoresby, a long-experienced man as touching that species, declares not to have its counterpart in nature. But placing of the cap sheaf to all this blundering business was reserved for the scientific Frederick Cuvier, brother to the famous Baron. In 1836, he published a natural history of whales, in which he gives what he calls a picture of the sperm whale. Before showing that picture to any Nantucketer, you had best provide for your summary retreat from Nantucket. In a word, Frederick Cuvier's sperm whale is not a sperm whale, but a squash. Of course, he never had the benefit of a whaling voyage, such men seldom have, but whence he derived that picture, who can tell? Perhaps he got it, as his scientific predecessor in the same field, Desmarais, got one of his authentic abortions, that is, from a Chinese drawing. And what sort of lively lads with the pencil those Chinese are, many queer cups and saucers inform us. As for the sign-painter's whales seen in the streets hanging over the shops of oil-dealers, what shall be said of them? They are generally Richard the Third whales with dromedary humps, and very savage, breakfasting on three or four sailor tarts, that is, whale-boats full of mariners, their deformities floundering in seas of blood and blue paint. 
But these manifold mistakes in depicting the whale are not so very surprising after all. Consider, most of these scientific drawings have been taken from the stranded fish, and these are about as correct as a drawing of a wrecked ship with broken back would correctly represent the noble animal itself in all its undashed pride of hull and spars. Though elephants have stood for their full lengths, the living leviathan has never yet fairly floated himself for his portrait. The living whale, in all his full majesty and significance, is only to be seen at sea in unfathomable waters, and afloat the vast bulk of him is out of sight, like a launched line of battleship, and out of that element it is a thing eternally impossible for mortal man to hoist him bodily into the air, so as to preserve all his mighty swells and undulations. And, not to speak of the highly presumable difference of contour between a young sucking whale and a full-grown Platonian leviathan, yet even in the case of one of those young sucking whales hoisted to a ship's deck, such is then the outlandish, eel-like, limbered, varying shape of him, that his precise expression the devil himself could not catch. But it may be fancied that from the naked skeleton of the stranded whale, accurate hints may be derived touching his true form. Not at all. For it is one of the more curious things about this leviathan, that his skeleton gives very little idea of his general shape, though Jeremy Bentham's skeleton, which hangs for candelabra in the library of one of his executors, correctly conveys the idea of a burly-browed utilitarian old gentleman, with all Jeremy's other leading personal characteristics, yet nothing of this kind could be inferred from any leviathan's articulated bones. In fact, as the great hunter says, the mere skeleton of the whale bears the same relation to the fully invested and padded animal as the insect does to the chrysalis that so roundingly envelops it. This peculiarity is strikingly evinced in the head, as in some parts of this book will incidentally be shown. It is also very curiously displayed in the side fin, the bones of which almost exactly answer to the bones of the human hand, minus only the thumb. This fin has four regular bone fingers, the index, middle, ring, and little finger, but all these are permanently lodged in their fleshy covering, as the human fingers in an artificial covering. However recklessly the whale may sometimes serve us, said humorous Stubb one day, he can never be truly said to handle us without mittens. For all these reasons, then, any way you may look at it, you must needs conclude that the great leviathan is that one creature in the world which must remain unpainted to the last. True, one portrait may hit the mark much nearer than another, but none can hit it with any very considerable degree of exactness. So there is no earthly way of finding out precisely what the whale really looks like, and the only mode in which you can derive even a tolerable idea of his living contour is by going a-whaling yourself. But by so doing you run no small risk of being eternally stove and sunk by him. Wherefore it seems to me you had best not be too fastidious in your curiosity touching this leviathan. Chapter 56 of the less erroneous pictures of whales, and the true pictures of whaling scenes. In connection with the monstrous pictures of whales, I am strongly tempted here to enter upon those still more monstrous stories of them, which are to be found in certain books, both ancient and modern, especially in Pliny, Purchas, Hakluyt, Harris, Cuvier, etc. But I pass that matter by. I know of only four published outlines of the great sperm whale, Colnett's, Huggins's, Frederick Cuvier's, and Beale's. In the previous chapter, Colnett and Cuvier have been referred to. Huggins's is far better than theirs, but by great odds, Beale's is the best. All Beale's drawings of this whale are good, excepting the middle figure in the picture of three whales in various attitudes, capping his second chapter. 
His frontispiece, Boats Attacking Sperm Whales, though no doubt calculated to excite the civil skepticism of some parlor men, is admirably correct and lifelike in its general effect. Some of the sperm whale drawings in J. Ross Brown are pretty correct in contour, but they are wretchedly engraved. This is not his fault, though. Of the right whale, the best outline pictures are in Scoresby, but they are drawn on too small a scale to convey a desirable impression. He has but one picture of whaling scenes, and this is a sad deficiency, because it is by such pictures only, when at all well done, that you can derive anything like a truthful idea of the living whale as seen by his living hunters. But, taken for all in all, by far the finest, though in some details not the most correct, presentations of whales and whaling scenes to be anywhere found, are two large French engravings well executed, and taken from paintings by one garnery. Respectively, they represent attacks on the sperm and right whale. In the first engraving, a noble sperm whale is depicted in full majesty of might, just risen beneath the boat from the profundities of the ocean, and bearing high in the air upon his back the terrific wreck of the stoven planks. The prow of the boat is partially unbroken, and is drawn just balancing upon the monster's spine, and standing in that prow, for that one single incomputable flash of time, you behold an oarsman, half shrouded by the incensed boiling spout of the whale, and in the act of leaping as if from a precipice. The action of the whole thing is wonderfully good and true. The half-emptied line-tub floats on the whitened sea, the wooden poles of the spilled harpoons obliquely bob in it, the heads of the swimming crew are scattered about the whale in contrasting expressions of affright, while in the black stormy distance the ship is bearing down upon the scene. Serious fault might be found with the anatomical details of this whale, but let that pass, since for the life of me I could not draw so good a one. In the second engraving, the boat is in the act of drawing alongside the barnacled flank of a large running right whale that rolls his black weedy bulk in the sea like some mossy rock slide from the Patagonian cliffs. His jets are erect, full, and black like soot, so that from so abounding a smoke in the chimney you would think that there must be a brave supper cooking in the great bowels below. Sea fowls are pecking at the small crabs, shellfish, and other sea candies and macaroni which the right whale sometimes carries on his pestilent back. And all the while, the thick lipped leviathan is rushing through the deep, leaving tons of tumultuous white curds in his wake, and causing the slight boat to rock in the swells like a skiff caught nigh the paddle wheels of an ocean steamer. Thus the foreground is all raging commotion, but behind, in admirable artistic contrast, is the glassy level of a sea becalmed, the drooping unstarched sails of the powerless ship, and the inert mass of a dead whale, a conquered fortress with the flag of capture lazily hanging from the whale pole inserted into his spout hole. Who Garnery, the painter, is or was, I know not but my life for it, he was either practically conversant with his subject, or else marvelously tutored by some experienced whaleman. The French are the lads for painting action. Go and gaze upon all the paintings of Europe, and where will you find such a gallery of living and breathing commotion on canvas, as in that triumphal hall at Versailles, where the beholder fights his way pell-mell through the consecutive great battles of France, where every sword seems a flash of the northern lights, and the successive armed kings and emperors dash by, like a charge of crowned centaurs. Not wholly unworthy of a place in that gallery are these sea-battle pieces of garnery. The natural aptitude of the French for seizing the picturesqueness of things seems to be peculiarly evinced in what paintings and engravings they have of their whaling scenes, with not one-tenth of England's experience in the fishery, and not the thousandth part of that of the Americans, 
they have nevertheless furnished both nations with the only finished sketches at all capable of conveying the real spirit of the whale hunt. For the most part, the English and American whale draftsmen seem entirely content with presenting the mechanical outline of things, such as the vacant profile of the whale, which, so far as picturesqueness of effect is concerned, is about tantamount to sketching the profile of a pyramid. Even Scoresby, the justly renowned right whaleman, after giving us a stiff, full length of the Greenland whale, and three or four delicate miniatures of narwhales and porpoises, treats us to a series of classical engravings of boat-hooks, chopping-knives, and grapnels, and, with the microscopic diligence of a Lewenhock, submits to the inspection of a shivering world ninety-six facsimiles of magnified arctic snow-crystals, I mean no disparagement to the excellent voyager, I honor him for a veteran, but in so important a matter it was certainly an oversight not to have procured for every crystal a sworn affidavit taken before a Greenland justice of the peace. In addition to those fine engravings from Garnery, there are two other French engravings worthy of note by someone who subscribes himself H. Duran. One of them, though not precisely adapted to our present purpose, nevertheless deserves mention on other accounts. It is a quiet noon scene among the isles of the Pacific. A French whaler anchored inshore in a calm, and lazily taking water on board, the loosened sails of the ship, and the long leaves of the palms in the background, both drooping together in the breezeless air. The effect is very fine, when considered with reference to its presenting the hardy fishermen under one of their few aspects of oriental repose. The other engraving is quite a different affair. The ship hove to on the open seas, and in the very heart of the leviathanic life, with a right whale alongside, the vessel in the act of cutting in hove over to the monster as if to a quay, and a boat, hurriedly pushing off from this scene of activity, is about giving chase to whales in the distance. The harpoons and lances lie leveled for use. Three oarsmen are just setting the mast in its hole, while from a sudden roll of the sea the little craft stands half erect out of the water, like a rearing horse. From the ship the smoke of the torments of the boiling whale is going up like the smoke over a village of smithies, and to windward a black cloud, rising up with earnest of squalls and rains, seems to quicken the activity of the excited seamen. Chapter 57 Of whales in paint, in teeth, in wood, in sheet iron, in stone, in mountains, in stars. On Tower Hill, as you go down to the London docks, you may have seen a crippled beggar, or kedger, as the sailors say, holding a painted board before him, representing the tragic scene in which he lost his leg. There are three whales and three boats, and one of the boats, presumed to contain the missing leg in all its original integrity, is being crunched by the jaws of the foremost whale. Any time these ten years, they tell me, has that man held up that picture, and exhibited that stump to an incredulous world. But the time of his justification has now come. His three whales are as good whales as were ever published in Wapping, at any rate, and his stump as unquestionable a stump as any you will find in the western clearings. But, though forever mounted on that stump, never a stump speech does the poor whaleman make but with downcast eyes, stands ruefully contemplating his own amputation. Throughout the Pacific, and also in Nantucket and New Bedford and Sag Harbor, you will come across lively sketches of whales and whaling scenes, graven by the fishermen themselves on sperm whale teeth, or ladies' busks wrought out of the right whale bone, or other like scrimshander articles, as the whalemen call the numerous little ingenious contrivances they elaborately carve out of the rough material in their hours of ocean leisure. Some of them have little boxes of dentistical-looking implements, specially intended for the scrimshandering business. 
but in general they toil with their jackknives alone, and with that almost omnipotent tool of the sailor, they will turn you out anything you please, in the way of a mariner's fancy. Long exile from Christendom and civilization inevitably restores a man to that condition in which God placed him, i.e. what is called savagery. Your true whale-hunter is as much a savage as an Iroquois. I myself am a savage, owing no allegiance but to the king of the cannibals, and ready at any moment to rebel against him. Now one of the peculiar characteristics of the savage, in his domestic hours, is his wonderful patience of industry. An ancient Hawaiian war-club or spear-paddle, in its full multiplicity and elaboration of carving, is as great a trophy of human perseverance as a Latin lexicon. For with but a bit of broken sea-shell or a shark's tooth, that miraculous intricacy of wooden network has been achieved, and it has cost steady years of steady application. As with the Hawaiian savage, so with the whale-sailor savage. With the same marvelous patience, and with the same single shark's tooth of his one poor jackknife, he will carve you a bit of bone sculpture, not quite as workmanlike, but as close-packed in its maziness of design as the Greek savage Achilles' shield, and full of barbaric spirit and suggestiveness as the prince of that fine old Dutch savage, Albrecht Dürer. Wooden whales, or whales cut in profile out of the small dark slabs of the noble South Sea warwood, are frequently met with in the forecastles of American whalers. Some of them are done with much accuracy. At some old gable-roofed country houses you will see brass whales, hung by the tail for knockers to the roadside door. When the porter is sleepy, the anvil-headed whale would be best. But these knocking whales are seldom remarkable as faithful essays. On the spires of some old-fashioned churches you will see sheet-iron whales, placed there for weathercocks, but they are so elevated, and besides that are to all intents and purposes so labelled with hands off, you cannot examine them closely enough to decide upon their merit. In bony, ribby regions of the earth, where at the base of high broken cliffs masses of rock lie strewn in fantastic groupings upon the plain, you will often discover images as of the petrified forms of the leviathan partly merged in grass, which of a windy day breaks against them in a surf of green surges. Then again, in mountainous countries, where the traveller is continually girdled by amphitheatrical heights, here and there, from some lucky point of view, you will catch passing glimpses of the profiles of whales defined along the undulating ridges, but you must be a thorough whaleman to see these sights, and not only that, but if you wish to return to such a sight again, you must be sure and take the exact intersecting latitude and longitude of your first standpoint, else so chance-like are such observations of the hills, that your precise previous standpoint would require a laborious rediscovery, like the Saloma Islands, which still remain incognita, though once high-ruffed Medana trod them, and old Figuera chronicled them. Nor, when expandingly lifted by your subject, can you fail to trace out great whales in the starry heavens, and boats in pursuit of them, as when, long filled with thoughts of war, the eastern nations saw armies locked in battle among the clouds. Thus at the north have I chased Leviathan round and round the pole, with the revolutions of the bright points that first defined him to me. And, beneath the effulgent Antarctic skies, I have boarded the Argo Navis, and joined the chase against the starry Cetus, far beyond the utmost stretch of Hydrus and the flying fish. With a frigate's anchors for my bridle bits, and fasces of harpoons for spurs, would I could mount that whale, and leap the topmost skies, to see whether the fabled heavens, with all their countless tents, really lie encamped beyond my mortal sight. Chapter 58 Brit 
Steering north-eastward from the Crozettes, we fell in with vast meadows of Brit, the minute yellow substance upon which the right whale largely feeds. For leagues and leagues it undulated round us, so that we seemed to be sailing through boundless fields of ripe and golden wheat. On the second day, numbers of right whales were seen, who, secure from the attack of a sperm whaler like the Pequod, with open jaws sluggishly swam through the Brit, which, adhering to the fringing fibres of that wondrous Venetian blind in their mouths, was in that manner separated from the water that escaped at the lip. As morning mowers, who side by side slowly and seethingly advance their scythes through the long wet grass of marshy meads, even so these monsters swam, making a strange grassy cutting sound, and leaving behind them endless swaths of blue upon the yellow sea. Footnote. That part of the sea known among whalemen as the Brazil Banks does not bear that name as the banks of Newfoundland do, because of their being shallows and soundings there, but because of this remarkable meadow-like appearance, caused by the vast drifts of Brit continually floating in those latitudes, where the right whale is often chased. End of footnote. But it was only the sound they made as they parted the Brit, which at all reminded one of mowers, seen from the mastheads, especially when they paused and were stationary for a while, their vast black forms looked more like lifeless masses of rock than anything else, and, as in the great hunting countries of India, the stranger at a distance will sometimes pass on the plains recumbent elephants without knowing them to be such, taking them for bare, blackened elevations of the soil, even so, often, for him who, for the first time, beholds this species of leviathans on the sea. And even when recognized at last, their immense magnitude renders it very hard really to believe that such bulky masses of overgrowth can possibly be instinct in all parts with the same sort of life that lives in a dog or a horse. Indeed, in other respects, you can hardly regard any creatures of the deep with the same feelings that you do of those of the shore. For though some old naturalists have maintained that all creatures of the land are of their kind in the sea, and though taking a broad general view of the thing this may very well be, yet coming to specialties, where, for example, does the ocean furnish any fish that in disposition answers to the sagacious kindness of the dog, the accursed shark alone can in any generic respect be said to bear comparative analogy to him. But though to landsmen in general the native inhabitants of the seas have ever been regarded with emotions unspeakably unsocial and repelling, though we know the sea to be an everlasting terra incognita, so that Columbus sailed over numberless unknown worlds to discover his one superficial western one, though by vast odds the most terrific of all mortal disasters have immemorially and indiscriminately befallen tens and hundreds of thousands of those who have gone upon the waters, though but a moment's consideration will teach that, however baby man may brag of his science and skill, and however much, in a flattering future, that science and skill may augment, yet forever and forever, to the crack of doom, the sea will insult and murder him, and pulverize the stateliest, stiffest frigate he can make, nevertheless, by the continual repetition of these very impressions, man has lost that sense of the full awfulness of the sea which aboriginally belongs to it. The first boat we read of floated on an ocean that, with Portuguese vengeance, had whelmed a whole world without leaving so much as a widow, that same ocean rolls now, that same ocean destroyed the wrecked ships of last year. Yea, foolish mortals, Noah's flood is not yet subsided, two-thirds of the fair world it yet covers. Wherein differ the sea and the land, that a miracle upon one is not a miracle upon the other? 
preternatural terrors rested upon the Hebrews, when under the feet of Korah and his company the live ground opened and swallowed them up forever. Yet not a modern sun ever sets, but in precisely the same manner the live sea swallows up ships and crews. But not only is the sea such a foe to man who is an alien to it, but it is also a fiend to its own offspring, worse than the Persian host who murdered his own guests, sparing not the creatures which itself hath spawned, like a savage tigress that tossing in the jungle overlays her own cubs, so the sea dashes even the mightiest whales against the rocks, and leaves them there side by side with the split wrecks of ships. No mercy, no power, but its own controls it. Panting and snorting like a mad battle steed that has lost its rider, the masterless ocean overruns the globe. Consider the subtleness of the sea, how its most dreaded creatures glide under water, unapparent for the most part, and treacherously hidden beneath the loveliest tints of azure. Consider also the devilish brilliance and beauty of many of its most remorseless tribes, as the dainty embellished shape of many species of sharks. Consider once more the universal cannibalism of the sea, all whose creatures prey upon each other, carrying on eternal war since the world began. Consider all this, and then turn to this green, gentle, and most docile earth. Consider them both, the sea and the land. And do you not find a strange analogy to something in yourself? For as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man there lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all the horrors of the half-known life. God keep thee. Push not off from that isle. Thou canst never return. End of chapters 55 to 58 Moby Dick, chapters 59 to 63 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 59 to 63. Chapter 59. Squid. Slowly wading through the meadows of Brit, the Pequod still held on her way northeastward towards the island of Java, a gentle air impelling her keel, so that in the surrounding serenity, her three tall, tapering masts mildly waved to that languid breeze, as three mild palms on a plain. And still, at wide intervals in the silvery night, the lonely, alluring jet would be seen. But one transparent blue morning, when a stillness almost preternatural spread over the sea, however unattended with any stagnant calm, when the long burnished sun-glade on the waters seemed a golden finger laid across them, enjoining some secrecy, when the slippered waves whispered together as they softly ran on, in this profound hush of the visible sphere, a strange spectre was seen by Dagoo from the main masthead. In the distance a great white mass lazily rose, and, rising higher and higher, and disentangling itself from the azure, at last gleamed before our prow like a snow-slide, new slid from the hills. Thus glistening for a moment, as slowly it subsided and sank, then once more arose, and silently gleamed. It seemed not a whale, and yet is this Moby Dick, thought Dagoo? Again the phantom went down, but on reappearing once more, with a stiletto-like cry that startled every man from his nod, the negro yelled out, There! There again! There she breaches! Right ahead! The white whale! The white whale! 
Upon this the seamen rushed to the yard-arms, as in swarming times the bees rushed to the boughs. Bareheaded in the sultry sun, Ahab stood on the bowsprit, and with one hand pushed far behind in readiness to wave his orders to the helmsman, cast his eager glance in the direction indicated aloft by the outstretched motionless arm of Dagoo. Whether the flitting attendance of one still and solitary jet had gradually worked upon Ahab, so that he was now prepared to connect the ideas of mildness and repose with the first sight of the particular whale he pursued, however this was, or whether his eagerness betrayed him, whichever way it might have been, no sooner did he distinctly perceive the white mass than with a quick intensity he instantly gave orders for lowering. The four boats were soon on the water, Ahab's in advance, and all swiftly pulling towards their prey. Soon it went down, and while, with oars suspended, we were awaiting its reappearance, lo, in the same spot where it sank, once more it slowly rose. Almost forgetting for a moment all thoughts of Moby Dick, we gazed at the most wondrous phenomenon which the secret seas have hitherto revealed to mankind— a vast pulpy mass, furlongs in length and breadth, of a glancing cream color, lay floating on the water, innumerable long arms radiating from its center, and curling and twisting like a nest of anacondas, as if blindly to clutch at any hapless object within reach. No perceptible face or front did it have, no conceivable token of either sensation or instinct but undulated there on the billows, an unearthly, formless, chance-like apparition of life. As, with a low sucking sound, it slowly disappeared again, Starbuck, still gazing at the agitated waters where it had sunk, with a wild voice exclaimed, Almost rather had I seen Moby Dick and fought him, than to have seen thee, thou white ghost. "'What was it, sir?' said Flask. "'The great live squid, which, they say, few whale-ships ever beheld, and returned to their ports to tell of it.' But Ahab said nothing. Turning his boat, he sailed back to the vessel, the rest as silently following. Whatever superstitions the sperm-whalemen in general have connected with the sight of this object— Certain it is, that a glimpse of it being so very unusual, that circumstance has gone far to invest it with portentousness. So rarely is it beheld, that though one and all of them declare it to be the largest animated thing in the ocean, yet very few of them have any but the most vague ideas concerning its true nature and form. Notwithstanding, they believe it to furnish the sperm whale his only food, for though other species of whales find their food above water, and may be seen by man in the act of feeding, the spermaceti whale obtains his whole food in unknown zones below the surface, and only by inference is it that any one can tell of what precisely that food consists. At times, when closely pursued, he will disgorge what are supposed to be the detached arms of the squid, some of them, thus exhibited, exceeding twenty and thirty feet in length. They fancy that the monster to which these arms belonged ordinarily clings by them to the bed of the oceans, and that the sperm whale, unlike other species, is supplied with teeth in order to attack and tear it. There seems some ground to imagine that the great kraken of Bishop Pontopidan may ultimately resolve itself into squid. The manner in which the bishop describes it, as alternately rising and sinking, with some other particulars he narrates, in all this the two correspond. But much abatement is necessary with respect to the incredible bulk he assigns it. By some naturalists who have vaguely heard rumors of the mysterious creature here spoken of, it is included among the class of cuttlefish, to which, indeed, in certain external respects it would seem to belong, but only as the Anak of the tribe. CHAPTER 60. THE LINE 
With reference to the whaling scene shortly to be described, as well as for the better understanding of all similar scenes elsewhere presented, I have here to speak of the magical, sometimes horrible, whale line. The line originally used in the fishery was of the best hemp, slightly vapored with tar, not impregnated with it, as in the case of ordinary ropes. For while tar, as ordinarily used, makes the hemp more pliable to the rope-maker, and also renders the rope itself more convenient to the sailor for common ship-use, yet not only would the ordinary quantity too much stiffen the whale-line for the close coiling to which it must be subjected, but, as most seamen are beginning to learn, tar, in general, by no means adds to the rope's durability or strength, however much it may give it compactness and gloss. Of late years the manila rope has, in the American fishery, almost entirely superseded hemp as a material for whale lines, for though not so durable as hemp, it is stronger and far more soft and elastic, and, I will add, since there is an aesthetics in all things, is much more handsome and becoming to the boat than hemp. Hemp is a dusky, dark fellow, a sort of Indian, but Manila is as a golden-haired Circassian to behold. The whale line is only two-thirds of an inch in thickness. At first sight you would not think it so strong as it really is. By experiment its one and fifty yarns will each suspend a weight of one hundred and twenty pounds, so that the whole rope will bear a strain nearly equal to three tons. In length, the common sperm whale line measures something over two hundred fathoms. Towards the stern of the boat it is spirally coiled away in the tub, not like the worm pipe of a still, though, but so as to form one round, cheese-shaped mass of densely bedded sheaves or layers of concentric spiralizations, without any hollow but the heart, or minute vertical tube formed at the axis of the cheese. As the least tangle or kink in the coiling would, in running out, infallibly take somebody's arm, leg, or entire body off, the utmost precaution is used in stowing the line in its tub. Some harpooners will consume almost an entire morning in this business, carrying the line high aloft and then reeving it downward through a block towards the tub, so as, in the act of coiling, to free it from all possible wrinkles and twists. In the English boats, two tubs are used instead of one, the same line being continuously coiled in both tubs. There is some advantage in this, because these twin tubs, being so small, they fit more readily into the boat and do not strain it so much, whereas the American tub, nearly three feet in diameter and of proportionate depth, makes a rather bulky freight for a craft whose planks are but one half inch in thickness, for the bottom of the whaleboat is like critical ice, which will bear up under a considerable distributed weight, but not very much of a concentrated one. When the painted canvas cover is clapped on the American line tub, the boat looks as if it were pulling off with a prodigious great wedding cake to present to the whales. Both ends of the line are exposed, the lower end terminating in an eye splice or loop coming up from the bottom against the side of the tub, and hanging over its edge completely disengaged from everything. This arrangement of the lower end is necessary on two accounts. First, in order to facilitate the fastening to it of an additional line from a neighboring boat, in case the stricken whale should sound so deep as to threaten to carry off the entire line originally attached to the harpoon. In these instances, the whale, of course, is shifted like a mug of ale, as it were, from one boat to the other, though the first boat always hovers at hand to assist its consort. Second, this arrangement is indispensable for common safety's sake, for were the lower end of the line in any way attached to the boat, and were the whale then to run the line out to the end, almost in a single smoking minute, as he sometimes does, he would not stop there, for the doomed boat would infallibly be dragged down after him into the profundity of the sea, 
and in that case no town crier would ever find her again. Before lowering the boat for the chase, the upper end of the line is taken aft from the tub, and, passing round the loggerhead there, is again carried forward the entire length of the boat, resting crosswise upon the loom or handle of every man's oar, so that it jogs against his wrist in rowing, and also passing between the men, as they alternately sit at the opposite gunwales, to the leaded chocks or grooves in the extreme pointed prow of the boat, where a wooden pin or skewer the size of a common quill prevents it from slipping out. From the chocks it hangs in a slight festoon over the bows, and is then passed inside the boat again, and some ten or twenty fathoms, called box line, being coiled upon the box in the bows, it continues its way to the gunwale still a little further aft, and is then attached to the short warp, the rope which is immediately connected with the harpoon. But previous to that connection, the short warp goes through sundry mystifications too tedious to detail. Thus the whale line folds the whole boat in its complicated coils, twisting and writhing around it in almost every direction. All the oarsmen are involved in its perilous contortions, so that to the timid eye of the landsmen they seem as Indian jugglers, with the deadliest snakes sportively festooning their limbs. Nor can any son of mortal woman for the first time seat himself amid those hempen intricacies, and while straining his utmost at the oar, bethink him that at any unknown instant the harpoon may be darted, and all these horrible contortions be put into play like ringed lightnings. He cannot be thus circumstanced without a shudder that makes the very marrow in his bones to quiver in him like a shaken jelly. Yet habit, strange thing, what cannot habit accomplish? Gayer sallies, more merry mirth, better jokes, and brighter repartees you never heard over your mahogany than you will hear over the half-inch white cedar of the whale-boat, when thus hung in hangman's nooses, and, like the six burghers of Calais before King Edward, the six men composing the crew pull into the jaws of death with a halter around every neck, as you may say. Perhaps a very little thought will now enable you to account for those repeated wailing disasters, some few of which are casually chronicled, of this man or that man being taken out of the boat by the line and lost. For when the line is darting out, to be seated then in the boat is like being seated in the midst of the manifold whizzings of a steam engine in full play, when every flying beam and shaft and wheel is grazing you. It is worse, for you cannot sit motionless in the heart of these perils, because the boat is rocking like a cradle, and you are pitched one way and the other, without the slightest warning, and only by a certain self-adjusting buoyancy and simultaneousness of volition and action can you escape being made a mazeppa of, and run away with where the all-seeing sun himself could never pierce you out. Again, as the profound calm, which only apparently precedes and prophesies of the storm, is perhaps more awful than the storm itself, for indeed the calm is but the wrapper and envelope of the storm, and contains it in itself, as the seemingly harmless rifle holds the fatal powder and the ball and the explosion, so the graceful repose of the line, as it silently serpentines about the oarsman before being brought into actual play, this is a thing which carries more of true terror than any other aspect of this dangerous affair. But why say more? All men live enveloped in whale lines. All are born with halters round their necks. But it is only when caught in the swift, sudden turn of death that mortals realize the silent, subtle, ever-present perils of life. And if you be a philosopher, though seated in a whale-boat, you would not at heart feel one whit more of terror than though seated before your evening fire with a poker and not a harpoon by your side. Chapter 61 
Stubb Kills a Whale If, to Starbuck, the apparition of the squid was a thing of portents, to Queequeg it was quite a different object. When you see him quid, said the savage, honing his harpoon in the bow of his hoisted boat, then you quick see him parm whale. The next day was exceedingly still and sultry, and with nothing special to engage them, the Pequod's crew could hardly resist the spell of sleep induced by such a vacant sea. For this part of the Indian Ocean through which we were voyaging is not what whalemen call a lively ground, that is, it affords fewer glimpses of porpoises, dolphins, flying fish, and other vivacious denizens of more stirring waters than those off the Rio de la Plata or the inshore ground off Peru. It was my turn to stand at the foremast head, and, with my shoulders leaning against the slackened royal shrouds, to and fro I idly swayed in what seemed an enchanted air. No resolution could withstand it. In that dreamy mood, losing all consciousness, at last my soul went out of my body, though my body still continued to sway as a pendulum will, long after the power which first moved it is withdrawn. Ere forgetfulness altogether came over me, I had noticed that the seamen at the main and mizzen mastheads were already drowsy so that at last all three of us lifelessly swung from the spars, and for every swing that we made there was a nod from below from the slumbering helmsman. The waves, too, nodded their indolent crests, and across the wide trance of the sea, east nodded to west, and the sun over all. Suddenly bubbles seemed bursting beneath my closed eyes. Like vices my hands grasped the shrouds, some invisible, gracious agency preserved me. With a shock I came back to life. And lo, close under our lee, not forty fathoms off, a gigantic sperm whale lay rolling in the water like the capsized hull of a frigate, his broad, glossy back of an Ethiopian hue, glistening in the sun's rays like a mirror. But lazily undulating in the trough of the sea, and ever and anon tranquilly spouting his vapory jet, the whale looked like a portly burgher smoking his pipe of a warm afternoon. But that pipe, poor whale, was thy last. As if struck by some enchanter's wand, the sleepy ship and every sleeper in it all at once started into wakefulness, and more than a score of voices from all parts of the vessel, simultaneously with the three notes from aloft, shouted forth the accustomed cry, as the great fish slowly and regularly spouted the sparkling brine into the air. "'Clear away the boats! Luff!' cried Ahab, and, obeying his own order, he dashed the helm down before the helmsman could handle the spokes. The sudden exclamations of the crew must have alarmed the whale, and ere the boats were down, majestically turning, he swam away to the leeward, but with such a steady tranquillity, and making so few ripples as he swam, that, thinking after all he might not as yet be alarmed, Ahab gave orders that not an oar should be used, and no man must speak but in whispers. So, seated like Ontario Indians on the gunwales of the boats, we swiftly but silently paddled along, the calm not admitting of the noiseless sails being set. Presently, as we thus glided in chase, the monster perpendicularly flitted his tail forty feet into the air, and then sank out of sight like a tower swallowed up. "'There go flukes!' was the cry, an announcement immediately followed by Stubbs producing his match and igniting his pipe, for now a respite was granted. After the full interval of his sounding had elapsed, the whale rose again and, being now in advance of the smoker's boat, and much nearer to it than any of the others, Stubb counted upon the honor of the capture. It was obvious now that the whale had at length become aware of his pursuers. All silence of cautiousness was therefore no longer of use. Paddles were dropped, and oars came loudly into play. And still puffing at his pipe, Stubb cheered on his crew to the assault. Yes, a mighty change had come over the fish. 
all alive to his jeopardy, he was going head out, that part obliquely projecting from the mad yeast which he brewed. Footnote. It will be seen in some other place of what a very light substance the entire interior of the sperm whale's enormous head consists. Though apparently the most massive, it is by far the most buoyant part about him, so that with ease he elevates it in the air, and invariably does so when going at his utmost speed. Besides, such is the breadth of the upper part of the front of his head, and such the tapering cut-water formation of the lower part, that by obliquely elevating his head, he thereby may be said to transform himself from a bluff-bowed sluggish galliot into a sharp-pointed New York pilot boat. End of footnote. Starter! Starter, my men! Don't hurry yourselves. Take plenty of time. But starter! Starter like thunderclaps, that's all! cried Stubb, spluttering out the smoke as he spoke. Starter now! Give him the long and strong stroke, Tashtego. Starter, Tash, my boy. Starter all. But keep cool, keep cool. Cucumbers is the word. Easy, easy. Only starter like grim death and grinning devils. And raise the buried dead perpendicular out of their graves, boys. That's all. Starter. Woohoo! Why he! screamed the gay header in reply raising some old war-whoop to the skies, as every oarsman in the strained boat involuntarily bounced forward with the one tremendous leading stroke which the eager Indian gave. But his wild screams were answered by others quite as wild. Ki-hi! Ki-hi! yelled Dagoo, straining forwards and backwards on his seat like a pacing tiger in his cage. Kala! Kulu! howled Queequeg as if smacking his lips over a mouthful of grenadier's steak. And thus, with oars and yells, the keels cut the sea. Meanwhile, Stubb, retaining his place in the van, still encouraged his men to the onset, all the while puffing the smoke from his mouth. Like desperados, they tugged and they strained, till the welcome cry was heard. Stand up, Tashtego! Give it to him! The harpoon was hurled. Stern all! The oarsmen backed water. The same moment something went hot and hissing along every one of their wrists. It was the magical line. An instant before, Stubb had swiftly caught two additional turns with it round the loggerhead, whence, by reason of its increased rapid circlings, a hempen blue smoke now jetted up and mingled with the steady fumes from his pipe. As the line passed round and round the loggerhead, so also, just before reaching that point, it blisteringly passed through and through both of Stubb's hands, from which the hand-cloths or squares of quilted canvas sometimes worn at these times had accidentally dropped. It was like holding an enemy's sharp, two-edged sword by the blade, and that enemy all the time striving to wrest it out of your clutch." "'Wet the line! Wet the line!' cried Stubb to the tub oarsman, him seated by the tub, who, snatching off his hat, dashed seawater into it. Footnote. Partly to show the indispensableness of this act, it may here be stated that in the old Dutch fishery a mop was used to dash the running line with water. In many other ships a wooden piggin or baler is set apart for that purpose— your hat, however, is the most convenient. End of footnote. More turns were taken, so that the line began holding its place. The boat now flew through the boiling water, like a shark all fins. Stubb and Tashtego here changed places, stem for stern, a staggering business truly in that rocking commotion. From the vibrating line extending the entire length of the upper part of the boat, and from its now being more tight than a harp-string, you would have thought the craft had two keels, one cleaving the water, the other the air, as the boat churned on through both opposing elements at once. A continual cascade played at the bows, a ceaseless whirling eddy in her wake, and at the slightest motion from within, but even of a little finger, the vibrating, cracking craft 
canted over her spasmodic gunwale into the sea. Thus they rushed, each man with might and main clinging to his seat, to prevent being tossed to the foam, and the tall form of Tashtego at the steering oar crouching almost double in order to bring down his centre of gravity. Whole Atlantics and Pacifics seemed passed as they shot on their way, till at length the whale somewhat slackened his flight. "'Haul in! Haul in!' cried Stubb to the bowsman, and facing round towards the whale all hands began pulling the boat up to him, while yet the boat was being towed on. Soon ranging up by his flank, Stubb, firmly planting his knee in the clumsy cleat, darted dart after dart into the flying fish. At the word of command, the boat alternately sterning out of the way of the whale's horrible wallow, and then ranging up for another fling. The red tide now poured from all sides of the monster, like brooks down a hill. His tormented body rolled not in brine but in blood, which bubbled and seethed for furlongs behind in their wake. The slanting sun playing upon this crimson pond in the sea sent back its reflection into every face, so that they all glowed to each other like red men. And all the while jet after jet of white smoke was agonizingly shot from the spiracle of the whale, and vehement puff after puff from the mouth of the excited headsman, as at every dart hauling in upon his crooked lance by the line attached to it, Stubb straightened it again and again, by a few rapid blows against the gunwale, and then again and again sent it into the whale. "'Pull up! Pull up!' he now cried to the bowsman, as the waning whale relaxed in his wrath. "'Pull up! Close to!' and the boat ranged along the fish's flank. When reaching far over the bow, Stubb slowly churned his long, sharp lance into the fish, and kept it there, carefully churning and churning, as if cautiously seeking to feel after some gold watch that the whale might have swallowed, and which he was fearful of breaking, ere he could hook it out. But that gold watch he sought was the innermost life of the fish. And now it is struck, for, starting from his trance into that unspeakable thing called his flurry, the monster horribly wallowed in his blood, overwrapped himself in impenetrable, mad, boiling spray, so that the imperiled craft, instantly dropping astern, had much ado blindly to struggle out from that frenzied twilight into the clear air of day. And now, abating in his flurry, the whale once more rolled out into view, surging from side to side, spasmodically dilating and contracting his spout-hole, with sharp, cracking, agonized respirations. At last, gush after gush of clotted red gore, as if it had been the purple lees of red wine, shot into the frighted air, and, falling back again, ran dripping down his motionless flanks into the sea. His heart had burst. "'He is dead, Mr. Stubb,' said Tashtego. "'Yes, both pipes smoked out.' and withdrawing his own from his mouth, Stubb scattered the dead ashes over the water, and, for a moment, stood thoughtfully eyeing the vast corpse he had made. CHAPTER 62 THE DART A word concerning an incident in the last chapter. According to the invariable usage of the fishery, the whaleboat pushes off from the ship, with the headsman or whale-killer as temporary steersman, and the harpooner or whale-fastener pulling the foremost oar, the one known as the harpooner oar. Now, it needs a strong, nervous arm to strike the first iron into the fish, for often, in what is called a long dart, the heavy implement has to be flung to the distance of twenty or thirty feet, but however prolonged and exhausting the chase, the harpooner is expected to pull his oar meanwhile to the uttermost. Indeed, he is expected to set an example of superhuman activity to the rest, not only by incredible rowing, but by repeated loud and intrepid exclamations. 
and what it is to keep shouting at the top of one's compass, while all the other muscles are strained and half-started, what that is none know but those who have tried it. For one, I cannot bawl very heartily and work very recklessly at one at the same time. In this straining, bawling state, then, with his back to the fish, all at once the exhausted harpooner hears the exciting cry, Stand up and give it to him. He now has to drop and secure his oar, turn round on his centre halfway, seize his harpoon from the crotch, and, with what little strength may remain, he essays to pitch it somehow into the whale. No wonder, taking the whole fleet of whalemen in a body, that out of fifty fair chances for a dart, not five are successful. No wonder that so many hapless harpooners are madly cursed and disrated. No wonder that some of them actually burst their blood vessels in the boat. No wonder that some sperm whalemen are absent four years with four barrels. No wonder that to many ship owners whaling is but a losing concern, for it is the harpooner that makes the voyage, and if you take the breath out of his body, how can you expect to find it there when most wanted? Again, if the dart be successful, then at the second critical instant, that is, when the whale starts to run, the boat-header and harpooner likewise start to running fore and aft, to the imminent jeopardy of themselves and every one else. It is then they change places, and the headsman, the chief officer of the little craft, takes his proper station in the bows of the boat. Now, I care not who maintains the contrary, but all this is both foolish and unnecessary. The headsman should stay in the bows from first to last. He should both dart the harpoon and the lance, and no rowing whatever should be expected of him, except under circumstances obvious to any fisherman. I know that this would sometimes involve a slight loss of speed in the chase, but long experience in various whalemen of more than one nation has convinced me that in the vast majority of failures in the fishery, it has not by any means been so much the speed of the whale as the before-described exhaustion of the harpooner that has caused them. To ensure the greatest efficiency in the dart, the harpooners of this world must start to their feet from out of idleness, and not from out of toil. Chapter 63 The Crotch out of the trunk the branches grow, out of them the twigs. So, in productive subjects, grow the chapters. The crotch alluded to on a previous page deserves independent mention. It is a notched stick of a peculiar form, some two feet in length, which is perpendicularly inserted into the starboard gunnel near the bow, for the purpose of furnishing a rest for the wooden extremity of the harpoon, whose other naked, barbed end slopingly projects from the prow. Thereby the weapon is instantly at hand to its hurler, who snatches it up as readily from its rest as a backwoodsman swings his rifle from the wall. It is customary to have two harpoons reposing in the crotch, respectively called the first and second irons. But these two harpoons, each by its own cord, are both connected with the line, the object being this, to dart them both if possible, one instantly after the other, into the same whale, so that if, in the coming drag, one should draw out, the other may still retain a hold. It is a doubling of the chances. But it very often happens that, owing to the instantaneous, violent, convulsive running of the whale upon receiving the first iron, it becomes impossible for the harpooner, however lightning-like in his movements, to pitch the second iron into him. Nevertheless, as the second iron is already connected with the line, and the line is running, hence that weapon must at all events be anticipatingly tossed out of the boat, somehow and somewhere, else the most terrible jeopardy would involve all hands. Tumbled into the water it accordingly is in such cases the spare coils of box-line, mentioned in a preceding chapter, making this feat, in most instances, prudently practicable. 
But this critical act is not always unattended with the saddest and most fatal casualties. Furthermore, you must know that when the second iron is thrown overboard, it thenceforth becomes a dangling, sharp-edged terror, skittishly curvetting about both boat and whale, entangling the lines or cutting them, and making a prodigious sensation in all directions. Nor, in general, is it possible to secure it again until the whale is fairly captured and a corpse. Consider, now, how it must be, in the case of four boats, all engaging one unusually strong, active, and knowing whale, when, owing to these qualities in him, as well as to the thousand concurring accidents of such an audacious enterprise, eight or ten loose second irons may be simultaneously dangling about him, for, of course, each boat is supplied with several harpoons to bend on to the line, should the first one be ineffectually darted without recovery. All these particulars are faithfully narrated here, as they will not fail to elucidate several most important, however intricate, passages in scenes hereafter to be painted. End of chapters 59 to 63 Moby Dick, chapters 64 to 67. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 64 to 67. Chapter 64. Stubbs' Supper. Stubb's whale had been killed some distance from the ship. It was a calm, so, forming a tandem of three boats, we commenced the slow business of towing the trophy to the Pequod. And now, as we eighteen men, with our thirty-six arms and one hundred and eighty thumbs and fingers, slowly toiled hour after hour upon that inert sluggish corpse in the sea, and it seemed hardly to budge at all except at long intervals, good evidence was hereby furnished of the enormousness of the mass we moved. For upon the great canal of Hang Ho, or whatever they call it, in China, four or five laborers on the footpath will draw a bulky freighted junk at the rate of a mile an hour. But this grand argosy we towed heavily forged along, as if laden with pig lead in bulk." Darkness came on, but three lights up and down in the Pequod's main rigging dimly guided our way, till drawing nearer we saw Ahab dropping one of several more lanterns over the bulwarks. Vacantly eyeing the heaving whale for a moment, he issued the usual orders for securing it for the night, and then, handing his lantern to a seaman, went his way into the cabin, and did not come forward again until morning. Though in overseeing the pursuit of this whale, Captain Ahab had evinced his customary activity, to call it so, yet now that the creature was dead, some vague dissatisfaction or impatience or despair seemed working in him, as if the sight of that dead body reminded him that Moby Dick was yet to be slain. And, though a thousand other whales were brought to his ship, all that would not one jot advance his grand, monomaniac object. Very soon you would have thought, from the sound of the Pequod's decks, that all hands were preparing to cast anchor in the deep, for heavy chains are being dragged along the deck, and thrust rattling out of the portholes. But by those clanking links the vast corpse itself, not the ship, is to be moored, tied by the head to the stern, and by the tail to the bows, the whale now lies with its black hull close to the vessels, and seen through the darkness of the night, which obscured the spars and rigging aloft, the two, ship and whale, seemed yoked together like colossal bullocks, whereof one reclines while the other remains standing. Footnote. A little item may as well be related here. The strongest and most reliable hold which the ship has upon the whale, when moored alongside, is by the flukes or tail, 
and as from its greater density that part is relatively heavier than any other, excepting the side fins, its flexibility, even in death, causes it to sink low beneath the surface, so that with the hand you cannot get at it from the boat in order to put the chain around it. But this difficulty is ingeniously overcome. A small, strong line is prepared, with a wooden float at its outer end, and a weight in its middle, while the other end is secured to the ship. By adroit management the wooden float is made to rise on the other side of the mass, so that now, having girdled the whale, the chain is readily made to follow suit, and, being slipped along the body, is at last locked fast round the smallest part of the tail at the point of junction with its broad flukes or lobes. End of footnote. If Moody Ahab was now all quiescence, at least so far as could be known on deck, Stubb, his second mate, flushed with conquest, betrayed an unusual but still good-natured excitement. Such an unwanted bustle was he in, that the stead Starbuck, his official superior, quietly resigned to him for the time the sole management of affairs. One small helping cause of all this liveliness in Stubb was soon made strangely manifest. Stubb was a high liver. He was somewhat intemperately fond of the whale, as a flavorish thing to his palate. A steak! A steak! Ere I sleep! You, Dagoo, overboard you go, and cut me one from his small. Here be it known that though these wild fishermen do not as a general thing, according to the great military maxim, make the enemy defray the current expenses of the war, at least before receiving the proceeds of the voyage, yet now and then you find some of these Nantucketers who have a genuine relish for that particular part of the sperm whale designated by Stubb, comprising the tapering extremity of the body. About midnight that steak was cut and cooked, and lighted by two lanterns of sperm oil, Stubb stoutly stood up to his spermaceti supper at the capstan head, as if that capstan were a sideboard. Nor was Stubb the only banqueter on whale's flesh that night. Mingling their mumblings with his own mastications, thousands on thousands of sharks, swarming round the dead leviathan, smackingly feasted on its fatness. The few sleepers below in their bunks were often startled by the sharp slapping of their tails against the hull, within a few inches of the sleepers' hearts. Peering over the side you could just see them, as before you heard them, wallowing in the sullen, black waters, and turning over on their backs as they scooped out huge, globular pieces of the whale of the bigness of a human head. This particular feat of the shark seems all but miraculous. How, at such an apparently unassailable surface, they contrive to gouge out such symmetrical mouthfuls, remains a part of the universal problem of all things. The mark that they thus leave in the whale may best be likened to a hollow made by a carpenter in countersinking for a screw. Though, amid all the smoking horror and diabolism of a sea-fight, sharks will be seen longingly gazing up to the ship's decks, like hungry dogs round a table where red meat is being carved, ready to bolt down every killed man that is tossed to them, and though, while the valiant butchers over the deck-table are thus cannibally carving each other's live meat with carving knives all gilded and tasseled, the sharks, also, with their jewel-hilted mouths, are quarrelsomely carving away under the table at the dead meat, and though, were you to turn the whole affair upside down, it would still be pretty much the same thing, that is to say, a shocking, sharkish business enough for all parties, and though sharks also are the invariable outriders of all slave ships crossing the Atlantic, symmetrically trotting alongside to be handy in case a parcel is to be carried anywhere, or a dead slave to be decently buried, and though one or two other like instances might be set down, touching the set terms, places, and occasions when sharks do most socially congregate and most hilariously feast, yet there is no conceivable time or occasion when you will find them in such countless numbers, 
and in gayer or more jovial spirits, than around a dead sperm whale, moored by night to a whale-ship at sea. If you have never seen that sight, then suspend your decision about the propriety of devil-worship, and the expediency of conciliating the devil. But as yet Stubb heeded not the mumblings of the banquet that was going on so nigh him, no more than the sharks heeded the smacking of his own epicurean lips. "'Cook! Cook! Where's that old fleece?' he cried at length, widening his legs still further, as if to form a more secure base for his supper, and at the same time darting his fork into the dish, as if stabbing with his lance. "'Cook! You, cook! Sail this way, cook!' The old black, not in any very high glee at having been previously roused from his warm hammock at a most unseasonable hour, came shambling along from his galley, for like many old blacks there was something the matter with his knee-pans, which he did not keep well scoured like his other pans. This old fleece, as they called him, came shuffling and limping along, assisting his step with his tongs, which, after a clumsy fashion, were made of straightened iron hoops. This old ebony floundered along, and in obedience to the word of command, came to a dead stop on the opposite side of Stubb's sideboard, when, with both hands folded before him, and resting on his two-legged cane, he bowed his arched back still further over, at the same time sideways inclining his head, so as to bring his best ear into play. "'Cook,' said Stubb, rapidly lifting a rather reddish morsel to his mouth, "'don't you think this steak is rather overdone? You've been beating this steak too much, Cook, it's too tender. Don't I always say that to be good a whale steak must be tough? There are those sharks now over the side. Don't you see they prefer it tough and rare? What a shindy they are kicking up. Cook, go and talk to them. Tell them they are welcome to help themselves civilly, and in moderation, but they must keep quiet. Blast me, if I can hear my own voice. Away, Cook, and deliver my message. Here, take this lantern. Snatching one from his sideboard. Now then, go and preach to them. Sullenly taking the offered lantern, old Fleece limped across the deck to the bulwarks, and then, with one hand dropping his light low over the sea, so as to get a good view of his congregation, with the other hand he solemnly flourished his tongs, and leaning far over the side in a mumbling voice, began addressing the sharks, while Stubb, softly crawling behind, overheard all that was said. Fellow critters. I's ordered here to say that you must stop dat damn noise there. You hear? Stop dat damn smackin' of de lips. Massa Stubb say that you can fill your damn bellies up to the hatchings, but by gore you must stop dat damn racket. Cook, here interposed Stubb, accompanying the word with a sudden slap on the shoulder. Cook! Why, damn your eyes! You mustn't swear that way when you're preaching. That's no way to convert sinners, Cook. Who dat? Then preach to him yourself, sullenly turning to go. No, Cook, go on, go on. Well, then, beloved fellow critters. Right, exclaimed Stubb approvingly. Coax em to it. Try that. And Fleece continued. Though you is all sharks, and by nature very voracious, Yet I say to you, fellow critters, dat dat voraciousness, top dat damn slappin' of de tail. How you tink to hear, s'pose you keep up such de damn slappin' and bitin' dare? Cook, cried Stubb, collaring him, I won't have that swearing. Talk to em gentlemanly. Once more the sermon proceeded. Your voraciousness, fellow critters, I don't blame you so much for. That is nature, and can't be helped. But to govern that wicked nature, that is the pint. You is sharks, sartin. But if you govern the shark in you, why then you be angel. For all angel is nothing more than the shark well governed. Now look here, brethren. Just try once to be civil, a helping yourselves from dat whale. 
Don't be tearing to blubber out of your neighbor's mouth, I say. Is not one shark dood right as tudder to dat whale? And by gore, none of you has the right to dat whale. Dat whale belong to someone else. I know some of you has berry brig mouth, brigger than others. But den de big mouth sometimes had the small bellies, so that the brigness of de mouth is not to swallow with, but to bit off de blubber for de small fry of sharks that can't get into de scrounge to help themselves. Well done, old fleece, cried Stubb. That's Christianity. Go on. No use going on. De damn willins will keep a scourgin and a slappin each other, Massa Stubb. They don't hear one word. No use of preaching to such damn gluttons as you call em, till their bellies is full, and their bellies is bottomless. And when they do get em full, they won't hear you then, for then they sink in the sea, go fast asleep on de coral, and can't hear nothing at all, no more, forever and ever. Upon my soul I am about of the same opinion. So give the benediction, Fleece, and I'll away to my supper." Upon this, Fleece, holding both hands over the fishy mob, raised his shrill voice and cried, "'Cursed fellow critters! Kick up the damnedest row as ever you can! Fill your damn bellies till they burst, and then die!' "'Now cook!' said Stubb, resuming his supper at the capstan. "'Stand just where you stood before there, over against me, and pay particular attention!' "'All tension,' said Fleece, again stooping over his tongs in the desired position. "'Well,' said Stubb, helping himself freely meanwhile, "'I shall now go back to the subject of this steak. "'In the first place, how old are you, Cook?' "'What dat to do with the take?' said the old black testily. "'Silence! How old are you, Cook?' "'About ninety, they say,' he gloomily muttered. And you have lived in this world hard upon one hundred years, cook, and don't know yet how to cook a whale steak, rapidly bolting another mouthful at the last word, so that morsel seemed a continuation of the question. Where were you born, cook? Hind a hatchway, in ferry boat, going over to Roanoke. Born in a ferry boat? That's queer, too. But I want to know what country you were born in, cook. "'Didn't I say to Roanoke country?' he cried sharply. "'No, you didn't, Cook. "'But I'll tell you what I'm coming to, Cook. "'You must go home and be born over again. "'You don't know how to cook a whale steak yet.' "'Bress my soul if I cook another one,' he growled, "'angrily turning round to depart. "'Come back here, Cook. "'Here, hand me those tongs. Now take that bit of steak there, and tell me if you think that steak cooked as it should be. Take it, I say, holding the tongs toward him. Take it, and taste it. Faintly smacking his withered lips over it for a moment, the old negro muttered, Best cooked take I ever taste. Juicy, very juicy. Cook, said Stubb, squaring himself once more, do you belong to the church? "'Passed one once in Cape Town,' said the old man sullenly. "'And you have once in your life passed a holy church in Cape Town, "'where you doubtless overheard a holy parson "'addressing his hearers as his beloved fellow creatures, have you, Cook? "'And yet you come here and tell me such a dreadful lie "'as you did just now, eh?' said Stubb. "'Where do you expect to go to, Cook?' "'Go to bed very soon.' he mumbled, half turning as he spoke. Avast! Heave to! I mean, when you die, Cook. It's an awful question. Now what's your answer? When this old brack man dies, said the negro slowly, changing his whole air and demeanor, he hisself won't go nowhere, but some bressed angel will come and fetch him. Fetch him? How? In a coach and four, as they fetched Elijah? "'And fetch him where?' "'Up there,' said Fleece, holding his tong straight over his head, and keeping it there very solemnly. "'So then, you expect to go up into our main top, do you, Cook, when you are dead? 
but don't you know the higher you climb, the colder it gets? Main top, eh? Didn't say that at all, said Fleece, again in the sulks. You said up there, didn't you? And now look yourself and see where your tongs are pointing. But perhaps you expect to get into heaven by crawling through the lubber's hole, Cook. But no, no, Cook, you don't get there except you go the regular way, round by the rigging. It's a ticklish business, but it must be done, or else it's no go. But none of us are in heaven yet. Drop your tongs, Cook, and hear my orders, do you hear? Hold your hat in one hand, and clap the other atop your heart, when I'm giving my orders, Cook. What? That your heart, there? That's your gizzard! Aloft, aloft! That's it, now you have it. Hold it there now, and pay attention. All attention, said the old black, with both hands placed as desired, vainly wriggling his grizzled head as if to get both ears in front at one and the same time. Well then, cook, you see this whale steak of yours was so very bad that I have put it out of sight as soon as possible. You see that, don't you? Well, for the future, when you cook another whale steak for my private table here, the capstan, I'll tell you what to do, so as not to spoil it by overdoing. Hold the steak in one hand, and show a live coal to it with the other. That done, dish it, do you hear? And now tomorrow, cook, when we are cutting in the fish, be sure you stand by to get the tips of his fins, have them put in pickle. As for the ends of the flukes, have them soused, Cook. There, now you may go. But Fleece had hardly got three paces off when he was recalled. Cook, give me cutlets for supper tomorrow night in the mid-watch. Do you hear? Away you sail, then. Hello! Stop! Make a bow before you go. Avast! Heaving again! Whale balls for breakfast, don't forget! Wish, by gore, whale eat him, stead of him eat whale. I'm breast if he ain't more of shark than massa shark hisself, muttered the old man, limping away, with which sage ejaculation he went to his hammock. Chapter 65 The Whale as a Dish That mortal man should feed upon the creature that feeds his lamp, and, like Stubb, eat him by his own light, as you may say, this seems so outlandish a thing that one must needs go a little into the history and philosophy of it. It is upon record that three centuries ago the tongue of the right whale was esteemed a great delicacy in France, and commanded large prices there. Also, that in Henry the Eighth's time, a certain cook of the court obtained a handsome reward for inventing an admirable sauce to be eaten with barbecued porpoises, which, you remember, are a species of whale. Porpoises, indeed, are to this day considered fine eating. The meat is made into balls about the size of billiard balls, and being well seasoned and spiced, might be taken for turtle balls or veal balls. The old monks of Dunfermline were very fond of them. They had a great porpoise grant from the crown. The fact is that, among his hunters at least, the whale would by all hands be considered a noble dish, were there not so much of him. But when you come to sit down before a meat pie nearly one hundred feet long, it takes away your appetite. Only the most unprejudiced of men, like Stubb, nowadays partake of cooked whales. But the Eskimos are not so fastidious. We all know how they live upon whales, and have rare old vintages of prime old train oil. Zogranda, one of their most famous doctors, recommends strips of blubber for infants as being exceedingly juicy and nourishing. And this reminds me that certain Englishmen, who long ago were accidentally left in Greenland by a whaling vessel, that these men actually lived for several months on the moldy scraps of whales, which had been left ashore after trying out the blubber. Among the Dutch whalemen these scraps are called fritters, which indeed they greatly resemble, being brown and crisp, and smelling something like old Amsterdam housewives' doughnuts or oily cooks when fresh. 
they have such an edible look that the most self-denying stranger can hardly keep his hands off. But what further depreciates the whale as a civilized dish is his exceeding richness. He is the great prize ox of the sea, too fat to be delicately good. Look at his hump, which would be as fine eating as the buffalo's, which is esteemed a rare dish, were it not such a solid pyramid of fat. But the spermaceti itself, how bland and creamy that is, like the transparent half-jellied white meat of a coconut in the third month of its growth, yet far too rich to supply a substitute for butter. Nevertheless, many whalemen have a method of absorbing it into some other substance and then partaking of it. In the long try-watches of the night it is a common thing for the seamen to dip their ship biscuit into the huge oil-pots and let them fry there a while. Many a good supper have I thus made. In the case of a small sperm whale, the brains are accounted a fine dish. The casket of the skull is broken into with an axe, and the two plump, whitish lobes being withdrawn, precisely resembling two large puddings, they are then mixed with flour and cooked into a most delectable mess, in flavor somewhat resembling calves' heads, which is quite a dish among some epicures. And every one knows that some young bucks among the epicures, by continually dining upon calves' brains, by and by get to have a little brains of their own, so as to be able to tell a calf's head from their own heads, which indeed requires uncommon discrimination. And that is the reason why a young buck with an intelligent-looking calf's head before him is somehow one of the saddest sights you can see. The head looks a sort of reproachfully at him, with an et tu brute expression. It is not, perhaps, entirely because the whale is so excessively unctuous that landsmen seem to regard the eating of him with abhorrence. That appears to result in some way from the consideration before mentioned, i.e., that a man should eat a newly murdered thing of the sea, and eat it, too, by its own light, but no doubt the first man that ever murdered an ox was regarded as a murderer. Perhaps he was hung, and if he had been put on his trial by oxen, he certainly would have been, and he certainly deserved it, if any murderer does. Go to the meat market of a Saturday night and see the crowds of live bipeds staring up at the long rows of dead quadrupeds. Does not that sight take a tooth out of the cannibal's jaw? Cannibals? Who is not a cannibal? I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the Fiji that salted down a lean missionary in his cellar against a coming famine, it will be more tolerable for that provident Fiji, I say, in the day of judgment, than for thee, civilized and enlightened gourmand, who nailest geese to the ground and feastest on their bloated livers in thy pâté de foie gras. But Stubb, he eats the whale by its own light, does he? And that is adding insult to injury, is it? Look at your knife-handle there, my civilized and enlightened gourmand, dining off that roast beef. What is that handle made of? What but the bones of the brother of the very ox you are eating? And what do you pick your teeth with after devouring that fat goose? With a feather of the same fowl. And with what quill did the secretary of the Society for the Suppression of Cruelty to Ganders formally indict his circulars? It is only within the last month or two that that society passed a resolution to patronize nothing but steel pens. Chapter 66 The Shark Massacre when, in the southern fishery, a captured sperm whale, after long and weary toil, is brought alongside late at night, it is not, as a general thing at least, customary to proceed at once to the business of cutting him in, for that business is an exceedingly laborious one, is not very soon completed, and requires all hands to set about it. Therefore the common usage is to take in all sail, lash the helm a lee, and then send every one below to his hammock till daylight, with the reservation that until that time anchor watches shall be kept, 
That is, two and two, for an hour each couple, the crew in rotation shall mount the deck to see that all goes well. But sometimes, especially upon the line in the Pacific, this plan will not answer at all, because such incalculable hosts of sharks gather round the moored carcass that were he left so for six hours, say, on a stretch, little more than the skeleton would be visible by morning. In most other parts of the ocean, however, where these fish do not so largely abound, their wondrous veracity can be at times considerably diminished by vigorously stirring them up with sharp whaling spades, a procedure notwithstanding which, in some instances, only seems to tickle them into still greater activity. But it was not thus in the present case with the Pequod sharks, though to be sure any man unaccustomed to such sights, to have looked over her side that night, would have almost thought the whole round sea was one huge cheese, and those sharks the maggots in it. Nevertheless, upon Stubb setting the anchor watch after his supper was concluded, and when, accordingly, Queequeg and a forecastle seaman came on deck, no small excitement was created among the sharks, for immediately suspending the cutting stages over the side, and lowering three lanterns so that they cast long gleams of light over the turbid seas, these two mariners, darting their long whaling spades, kept up an incessant murdering of the sharks, by striking the keen steel deep into their skulls, seemingly their only vital part. Footnote. The whaling spade used for cutting in is made of the very best steel, is about the bigness of a man's spread hand, and in general shape corresponds to the garden implement after which it is named, only its sides are perfectly flat, and its upper end considerably narrower than the lower. This weapon is always kept as sharp as possible, and when being used is occasionally honed, just like a razor. In its socket a stiff pole from twenty to thirty feet long is inserted for a handle. End of footnote. But in the foamy confusion of their mixed and struggling hosts, the marksmen could not always hit their mark, and this brought about new revelations of the incredible ferocity of the foe. They viciously snapped, not only at each other's disembowelments, but, like flexible bows, bent round and bit their own, till those entrails seemed swallowed over and over again by the same mouth, to be oppositely voided by the gaping wound. Nor was this all. It was unsafe to meddle with the corpses and ghosts of these creatures. A sort of generic or pantheistic vitality seemed to lurk in their very joints and bones, after what might be called the individual life had departed. Killed and hoisted on deck for the sake of his skin, one of these sharks almost took poor Queequeg's hand off when he tried to shut down the dead lid of his murderous jaw. Queequeg no care what God made him shark, said the savage, agonizingly lifting his hand up and down, whether Fiji God or Nantucket God, but to God what made shark must be one damn injun. Chapter 67 Cutting In It was a Saturday night, and such a Sabbath as followed. Ex officio professors of Sabbath breaking are all whalemen. The ivory Pequod was turned into what seemed a shamble, every sailor a butcher. You would have thought we were offering up ten thousand red oxen to the sea gods. In the first place, the enormous cutting tackles, among other ponderous things comprising a cluster of blocks generally painted green, and which no single man can possibly lift, this vast bunch of grapes was swayed up to the main top, and firmly lashed to the lower masthead, the strongest point anywhere above a ship's deck. The end of the hawser-like rope winding through these intricacies was then conducted to the windlass, and the huge lower block of the tackles was swung over the whale. To this block the great blubber-hook, weighing some one hundred pounds, was attached, and now, suspended in stages over the side, Starbuck and Stubb, the mates, armed with their long spades, began cutting a hole in the body for the insertion of the hook, just above the nearest of the two side fins. 
This done, a broad semicircular line is cut round the hole, the hook is inserted, and the main body of the crew, striking up a wild chorus, now commence heaving in one dense crowd at the windlass, when instantly the entire ship careens over on her side, every bolt in her starts like the nail-heads of an old house in frosty weather. She trembles, quivers, and nods her frighted mastheads to the sky. More and more she leans over to the whale, while every gasping heave of the windlass is answered by a helping heave from the billows, till at last a swift startling snap is heard. With a great swash the ship rolls upward and backwards from the whale, and the triumphant tackle rises into sight, dragging after it the disengaged semicircular end of the first strip of blubber. Now, as the blubber envelops the whale precisely as the rind does an orange, so it is stripped off from the body precisely as an orange is sometimes stripped by spiralizing it. For the strain constantly kept up by the windlass continually keeps the whale rolling over and over in the water, and as the blubber in one strip uniformly peels off along the line called the scarf, simultaneously cut by the spades of Starbuck and Stubb, the mates, and just as fast as it is thus peeled off, and indeed by that very act itself, it is all the time being hoisted higher and higher aloft, till its upper end grazes the main top. The men at the windlass then cease heaving, and for a moment or two the prodigious blood-dripping mass sways to and fro as if let down from the sky, and every one present must take good heed to dodge it when it swings, else it may box his ears and pitch him headlong overboard. One of the attending harpooners now advances with a long keen weapon called a boarding sword, and, watching his chance, he dexterously slices out a considerable hole in the lower part of the swaying mass. Into this hole, the end of the second alternating great tackle is then hooked, so as to retain a hold upon the blubber, in order to prepare for what follows. Whereupon, this accomplished swordsman, warning all hands to stand off, once more makes a scientific dash at the mass, and with a few sidelong, desperate, lunging slicings, severs it completely in twain, so that while the short lower part is still fast, the long upper strip, called a blanket piece, swings clear, and is all ready for lowering. The heavers forward now resume their song, and while the one tackle is peeling and hoisting a second strip from the whale, the other is slowly slackened away, and down goes the first strip through the main hatchway right beneath into an unfurnished parlor called the blubber room. Into this twilight apartment, sundry nimble hands keep coiling away the long blanket piece as if it were a great live mass of pleated serpents. And thus the work proceeds, the two tackles hoisting and lowering simultaneously, both whale and windlass heaving, the heavers singing, the blubber room gentlemen coiling, the mates scarfing, the ships straining, and all hands swearing occasionally, by way of assuaging the general friction. End of chapter 64 to 67 Moby Dick Chapters 68 to 71. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 68 to 71. Chapter 68. The Blanket. I have given no small attention to that not unvexed subject, the skin of the whale. I have had controversies about it with experienced whalemen afloat, and learned naturalists ashore. My original opinion remains unchanged, but it is only an opinion. The question is, what and where is the skin of the whale? Already you know what his blubber is. 
That blubber is something of the consistence of firm, close-grained beef, but tougher, more elastic and compact, and ranges from eight or ten to twelve and fifteen inches in thickness. Now, however preposterous it may at first seem to talk of any creature's skin as being of that sort of consistence and thickness, yet in point of fact these are no arguments against such a presumption, because you cannot raise any other dense enveloping layer from the whale's body but that same blubber, and the outermost enveloping layer of any animal, if reasonably dense, what can that be but the skin? True, from the unmarred dead body of the whale, you may scrape off with your hand an infinitely thin, transparent substance, somewhat resembling the thinnest shreds of isinglass, only it is almost as flexible and soft as satin, that is, previous to being dried, when it not only contracts and thickens, but becomes rather hard and brittle. I have several such dried bits, which I use for marks in my whale books. It is transparent, as I said before, and being laid upon the printed page, I have sometimes pleased myself with fancying it exerted a magnifying influence. At any rate, it is pleasant to read about whales through their own spectacles, as you may say. But what I am driving at here is this. The same infinitely thin isinglass substance, which, I admit, invests the entire body of the whale, is not so much to be regarded as the skin of the creature, as the skin of the skin, so to speak. For it were simply ridiculous to say that the proper skin of the tremendous whale is thinner and more tender than the skin of a newborn child. But no more of this. Assuming the blubber to be the skin of the whale... Then, when this skin, as in the case of a very large sperm whale, will yield the bulk of one hundred barrels of oil, and when it is considered that, in quantity, or rather weight, that oil, in its express state, is only three-fourths, and not the entire substance of the coat, some idea may hence be had of the enormousness of that animated mass, a mere part of whose mere integument yields such a lake of liquid as that. Reckoning ten barrels to the ton, you have ten tons for the net weight of only three-quarters of the stuff of the whale's skin. In life, the visible surface of the sperm whale is not the least among the many marvels he presents. Almost invariably, it is all over obliquely crossed and recrossed with numberless straight marks in thick array, something like those in the finest Italian line engravings. But these marks do not seem to be impressed upon the isinglass substance above mentioned, but seem to be seen through it, as if they were engraved upon the body itself. Nor is this all. In some instances, to the quick, observant eye, those linear marks, as in a veritable engraving, but afford the ground for far other delineations. These are hieroglyphical, that is, if you call those mysterious ciphers on the walls of the pyramids hieroglyphics, then that is the proper word to use in the present connection. By my retentive memory of the hieroglyphics upon one sperm whale in particular, I was much struck with a plate representing the old Indian characters chiseled on the famous hieroglyphic palisades on the banks of the upper Mississippi. Like those mystic rocks, too, the mystic-marked whale remains undecipherable. This allusion to the Indian rocks reminds me of another thing. Besides all the other phenomena which the exterior of the sperm whale presents, he not seldom displays the back, and more especially his flanks, effaced in great part of the regular linear appearance by reason of numerous rude scratches, altogether of an irregular, random aspect. I should say that those New England rocks on the sea coast, which Agassi imagines to bear the marks of violent scraping contact with vast floating icebergs, I should say that those rocks must not a little resemble the sperm whale in this particular. It also seems to me that such scratches in the whale are probably made by hostile contact with other whales, for I have most remarked them in the large, full-grown bulls of the species. 
A word or two more concerning this matter of the skin or blubber of the whale. It has already been said that it is stripped from him in long pieces, called blanket pieces. Like most sea terms, this one is very happy and significant, for the whale is indeed wrapped up in his blubber, as in a real blanket or counterpane, or, still better, an Indian poncho slipped over his head and skirting his extremity. It is by reason of this cosy blanketing of his body that the whale is enabled to keep himself comfortable in all weathers, in all seas, times, and tides. What would become of a Greenland whale, say, in those shuddering icy seas of the north, if unsupplied with his cosy surtout? True, other fish are found exceedingly brisk in those hyperborean waters, but these, be it observed, are your cold-blooded, lungless fish, whose very bellies are refrigerators, creatures that warm themselves under the lee of an iceberg, as a traveller in winter would bask before an inn-fire, whereas, like man, the whale has lungs and warm blood, freeze his blood, and he dies. How wonderful it is, then, except after explanation, that this great monster, to whom corporeal warmth is as indispensable as it is to man, how wonderful that he should be found at home, immersed to his lips for life in those arctic waters, where, when seamen fall overboard, they are sometimes found months afterward, perpendicularly frozen into the hearts of fields of ice, as a fly is found glued in amber. But more surprising it is to know, as has been proved by experiment, that the blood of a polar whale is warmer than that of a Borneo negro in summer. It does seem to me that herein we see the rare virtue of a strong individual vitality, and the rare virtue of thick walls, and the rare virtue of interior spaciousness. Oh, man, admire and model thyself after the whale. Do thou, too, remain warm among ice. Do thou, too, live in this world without being of it. Be cool at the equator. Keep thy blood fluid at the pole, like the great dome of St. Peter's, and like the great whale, retain, O man, in all seasons, a temperature of thine own. But how easy, and how hopeless, to teach these fine things! Of erections, how few are domed like St. Peter's! Of creatures, how few vast as the whale! Chapter 69. The Funeral. Haul in the chains, let the carcass go astern. The vast tackles have now done their duty. The peeled white body of the beheaded whale flashes like a marble sepulchre. Though changed in hue, it has not perceptibly lost anything in bulk. It is still colossal. Slowly it floats more and more away, the water round it torn and splashed by the insatiate sharks, and the air above vexed with rapacious flights of screaming fowls, whose beaks are like so many insulting poniards in the whale. The vast, white, headless phantom floats further and further from the ship, and every rod that it so floats, what seems square roods of sharks and cubic roods of fowls augment the murderous din. For hours and hours from the almost stationary ship that hideous sight is seen, beneath the unclouded and mild azure sky, upon the fair face of the pleasant sea, wafted by the joyous breezes, that great mass of death floats on and on till lost in infinite perspectives. There's a most doleful and most mocking funeral, the sea vultures all in pious mourning, the air sharks all punctiliously in black or speckled. In life but few of them would have helped the whale, I ween, if peradventure he had needed it, but upon the banquet of his funeral they most piously do pounce. O oh, horrible vulturism of earth, from which not the mightiest whale is free! Nor is this the end. Desecrated as the body is, a vengeful ghost survives and hovers over it to scare. Espied by some timid man-of-war or blundering discovery vessel from afar, when the distance obscuring the swarming fowls nevertheless still shows the white mass floating in the sun, 
and the white spray heaving high against it. Straightway the whale's unharming corpse with trembling fingers is set down in the log. Shoals, rocks, and breakers hereabouts, beware. And for years afterwards, perhaps, ships shun the place, leaping over it as silly sheep leap over a vacuum, because their leader originally leaped there when a stick was held. There's your law of precedence. There's your utility of traditions. There's the story of your obstinate survival of old beliefs, never bottomed on the earth, and not now even hovering in the air. There's orthodoxy. Thus, while in life the great whale's body may have been a real terror to his foes, in his death his ghost becomes a powerless panic to the world. Are you a believer in ghosts, my friend? There are other ghosts than the Cock Lane one, and far deeper men than Dr. Johnson, who believe in them. CHAPTER SEVENTY THE SPHINX It should not have been omitted that previous to completely stripping the body of the Leviathan, he was beheaded. Now, the beheading of the sperm whale is a scientific anatomical feat upon which experienced whale surgeons very much pride themselves, and not without reason. Consider that the whale has nothing that can properly be called a neck. On the contrary, where his head and body seem to join, there, in that very place, is the thickest part of him. Remember also that the surgeon must operate from above, some eight or ten feet intervening between him and his subject, and that subject almost hidden in a discolored, rolling, and oftentimes tumultuous and bursting sea. Bear in mind, too, that under these untoward circumstances, he has to cut many feet deep in the flesh, and in that subterraneous matter, without so much as getting one single peep into the ever-contracting gash thus made, he must skillfully steer clear of all adjacent interdicted parts, and exactly divide the spine at a critical point, hard by its insertion into the skull. Do you not marvel, then, at Stubb's boast that he demanded but ten minutes to behead a sperm whale? When first severed, the head is dropped astern, and held there by a cable till the body is stripped. That done, if it belong to a small whale, it is hoisted on deck to be deliberately disposed of. But with a full-grown leviathan this is impossible, for the sperm whale's head embraces nearly one-third of his entire bulk and completely to suspend such a burden as that, even by the immense tackles of a whaler, this were as vain a thing as to attempt weighing a Dutch barn in jeweler's scales. The Pequod's whale being decapitated and the body stripped, the head was hoisted against the ship's side, about halfway out of the sea, so that it might yet in great part be buoyed up by its native element. And there, with the strained craft steeply leaning over to it, by reason of the enormous downward drag from the lower masthead, and every yard-arm on that side projecting like a crane over the waves, there that blood-dripping head hung to the Pequod's waist, like the giant Holofernes from the girdle of Judith. When this last task was accomplished, it was noon, and the seamen went below to their dinner. Silence reigned over the before tumultuous but now deserted deck, an intense copper calm, like a universal yellow lotus, was more and more unfolding its noiseless, measureless leaves upon the sea. A short space elapsed, and up into this noiselessness came Ahab, alone from his cabin. Taking a few turns on the quarter-deck, he paused to gaze over the side. Then, slowly getting into the main chains, he took Stubb's long spade, still remaining there after the whale's decapitation, and, striking it into the lower part of the half-suspended mass, placed its other end crutch-wise under one arm, and so stood leaning over with eyes attentively fixed on this head. It was a black and hooded head, and hanging there in the midst of so intense a calm, it seemed the sphinxes in the desert. "'Speak, thou vast and venerable head!' muttered Ahab, which, though ungarnished with a beard, 
yet here and there looks hoary with mosses. Speak, mighty head, and tell us the secret thing that is in thee. Of all divers thou hast dived the deepest. That head upon which the upper sun now gleams has moved amid this world's foundations. Where unrecorded names and navies rust, and untold hopes and anchors rot, where in her murderous hold this frigate earth is ballasted with bones of millions of the drowned, there in that awful waterland, there was thy most familiar home. Thou hast been where Bell or Diver never went, hast slept by many a sailor's side where sleepless mothers would give their lives to lay them down. Thou sawest the locked lovers when leaping from their flaming ship, Heart to heart they sank beneath the exulting wave, True to each other when heaven seemed false to them. Thou sawest the murdered mate when tossed by pirates from the midnight deck, For hours he fell into the deeper midnight of the insatiate maw, And his murderers still sailed on unharmed, While swift lightnings shivered the neighboring ship That would have borne a righteous husband, to outstretched longing arms. O oh, head, thou hast seen enough to split the planets and make an infidel of Abraham, and not one syllable is thine. Sail ho! cried a triumphant voice from the main masthead. Ay, well now, that's cheering, cried Ahab, suddenly erecting himself while whole thunder-clouds swept aside from his brow. That lively cry upon this deadly calm might almost convert a better man. Where away? Three points on the starboard bow, sir, and bringing down her breeze to us. Better and better, man. Would now St. Paul would come along that way, and to my breezelessness bring his breeze. O oh, nature, and O oh, soul of man, how far beyond all utterances are your linked analogies! Not the smallest atom stirs or lives on matter, but has its cunning duplicate in mind. Chapter 71 The Jeroboam Story Hand in hand, ship and breeze blew on, but the breeze came faster than the ship, and soon the Pequod began to rock. By and by, through the glass, the stranger's boats and manned mastheads proved her a whale-ship, but as she was so far to windward and shooting by, apparently making a passage to some other ground, the Pequod could not hope to reach her, so the signal was set to see what response would be made. Here be it said that, like the vessels of military marines, the ships of the American whale fleet have each a private signal, all which signals being collected in a book with the names of the respective vessels attached, and every captain provided with it. Thereby the whale commanders are enabled to recognize each other upon the ocean, even at considerable distances and with no small facility. The Pequod signal was at last responded to by the strangers setting her own, which proved the ship to be the Jeroboam of Nantucket. Squaring her yards, she bore down, ranged a beam under the Pequod's lee, and lowered a boat. It soon drew nigh, but as the side ladder was being rigged by Starbuck's order to accommodate the visiting captain, the stranger in question waved his hand from the boat's stern, in token of that proceeding being entirely unnecessary. It turned out that the Jeroboam had a malignant epidemic on board, and that Mayhew, her captain, was fearful of infecting the Pequod's company. For though himself and boat's crew remained untainted, and though his ship was half a rifle shot off, and an incorruptible sea and air rolling and flowing between, yet conscientiously adhering to the timid quarantine of the land, he peremptorily refused to come into direct contact with the Pequod. But this did by no means prevent all communications. Preserving an interval of some few yards between itself and the ship, the Jeroboam's boat, by the occasional use of its oars, contrived to keep parallel to the Pequod, as she heavily forged through the sea, for by this time it blew very fresh, 
with her main topsail aback. Though, indeed, at times, by the sudden onset of a large rolling wave, the boat would be pushed some way ahead, but would be soon skillfully brought to her proper bearings again. Subject to this, and other the like interruptions now and then, a conversation was sustained between the two parties, but at intervals not without still another interruption of a very different sort. Pulling an oar in the Jeroboam's boat was a man of singular appearance, even in that wild whaling life where individual notabilities make up all totalities. He was a small, short, youngish man, sprinkled all over his face with freckles, and wearing redundant yellow hair. A long-skirted, cabalistically cut coat of a faded walnut tinge enveloped him, the overlapping sleeves of which were rolled up on his wrists. A deep, settled, fanatic delirium was in his eyes. So soon as this figure had been first descried, Stubb had exclaimed, "'That's he! That's he! The long-togged scaramouche the town hose company told us of!' Stubb here alluded to a strange story told of the Jeroboam, and a certain man among her crew, some time previous when the Pequod spoke the town ho. According to this account, and what was subsequently learned, it seemed that the scaramouche in question had gained a wonderful ascendancy over almost everybody in the Jeroboam. His story was this. He had originally been nurtured among the crazy society of Neskyuna Shakers, where he had been a great prophet, in their cracked secret meetings, having several times descended from heaven by way of a trap-door, announcing the speedy opening of the seventh vial, which he carried in his vest pocket, but which, instead of containing gunpowder, was supposed to be charged with laudanum. A strange apostolic whim having seized him, he had left Neskyuna for Nantucket, where, with that cunning peculiar to craziness, he assumed a steady, common-sense exterior, and offered himself as a green-hand candidate for the Jeroboam's whaling voyage. They engaged him, but straight away upon the ship's getting out of sight of land, his insanity broke out in a freshet. He announced himself as the archangel Gabriel, and commanded the captain to jump overboard. He published his manifesto, whereby he set himself forth as the deliverer of the isles of the sea, and vicar-general of all Oceanica. The unflinching earnestness with which he declared these things, the dark, daring play of his sleepless, excited imagination, and all the preternatural terrors of real delirium, united to invest this Gabriel in the minds of the majority of the ignorant crew with an atmosphere of sacredness. Moreover, they were afraid of him. As such a man, however, was not of much practical use in the ship, especially as he refused to work except when he pleased, the incredulous captain would fain have been rid of him, but apprised that that individual's intention was to land him in the first convenient port, the archangel forthwith opened all his seals and vials, devoting the ship and all hands to unconditional perdition, in case this intention was carried out. So strongly did he work upon his disciples among the crew, that at last in a body they went to the captain and told him, if Gabriel was sent from the ship, not a man of them would remain. He was therefore forced to relinquish his plan. Nor would they permit Gabriel to be any way maltreated, say or do what he would, so that it came to pass that Gabriel had the complete freedom of the ship. The consequence of all this was that the archangel cared little or nothing for the captain and mates, and since the epidemic had broken out, he carried a higher hand than ever, declaring that the plague, as he called it, was at his sole command, nor should it be stayed but according to his good pleasure. The sailors, mostly poor devils, cringed, and some of them fawned before him in obedience to his instructions, sometimes rendering him personal homage as to a god. Such things may seem incredible, but however wondrous, they are true. Nor is the history of fanatics half so striking in respect to the measureless self-deception of the fanatic himself as his measureless power of deceiving and bedeviling so many others. But it is time to return to the Pequod. 
I fear not thy epidemic, man, said Ahab from the bulwarks to Captain Mayhew, who stood in the boat's stern. Come on board. But now Gabriel started to his feet. Think, think of the fevers, yellow and bilious. Beware of the horrible plague. Gabriel, Gabriel, cried Captain Mayhew, thou must either... But that instant a headlong wave shot the boat far ahead, and its seethings drowned all speech. "'Hast thou seen the white whale?' demanded Ahab, when the boat drifted back. "'Think, think of thy whale-boat, stoven and sunk! Beware of the horrible tale!' "'I tell thee again, Gabriel, that—' But again the boat tore ahead as if dragged by fiends. Nothing was said for some moments, while a succession of riotous waves rolled by, which, by one of those occasional caprices of the seas, were tumbling, not heaving it. Meantime the hoisted sperm-whale's head jogged about very violently, and Gabriel was seen eyeing it with rather more apprehensiveness than his archangel nature seemed to warrant. When this interlude was over, Captain Mayhew began a dark story concerning Moby Dick, not, however, without frequent interruptions from Gabriel, whenever his name was mentioned, and the crazy sea that seemed leagued with him. It seemed that the Jeroboam had not long left home, when, upon speaking a whale-ship, her people were reliably apprised of the existence of Moby Dick, and the havoc he had made. Greedily sucking in this intelligence, Gabriel solemnly warned the captain against attacking the white whale, in case the monster should be seen, in his gibbering insanity, pronouncing the white whale to be no less a being than the shaker God incarnated, the shakers receiving the Bible. But when some year or two afterward Moby Dick was fairly sighted from the mastheads, Macy, the chief mate, burned with ardor to encounter him and the captain himself being not unwilling to let him have the opportunity, despite all the archangel's denunciations and forewarnings, Macy succeeded in persuading five men to man his boat. With them he pushed off, and, after much weary pulling, and many perilous, unsuccessful onsets, he at last succeeded in getting one iron fast. Meantime Gabriel, ascending to the main royal masthead, was tossing one arm in frantic gestures, and hurling forth prophecies of speedy doom to the sacrilegious assailants of his divinity. Now, while Macy, the mate, was standing up in his boat's bow, and with all the reckless energy of his tribe was venting his wild exclamations upon the whale, and essaying to get a fair chance for his poised lance— Lo, a broad white shadow rose from the sea, by its quick fanning motion, temporarily taking the breath out of the bodies of the oarsmen. Next instant the luckless mate, so full of furious life, was smitten bodily into the air, and, making a long arc in his descent, fell into the sea at a distance of about fifty yards. Not a chip of the boat was harmed, nor a hair of any oarsman's head, but the mate forever sank. It is well to parenthesize here that, of the fatal accidents in the sperm whale fishery, this kind is perhaps almost as frequent as any. Sometimes nothing is injured but the man who is thus annihilated. Oftener the boat's bow is knocked off, or the thigh-board, in which the headsman stands, is torn from its place and accompanies the body. But strangest of all is the circumstance that in more instances than one, when the body has been recovered, not a single mark of violence is discernible, the man being stark dead. The whole calamity, with the falling form of Macy, was plainly descried from the ship. Raising a piercing shriek, The vile! The vile! Gabriel called off the terror-stricken crew from the further hunting of the whale. This terrible event clothed the archangel with added influence, because his credulous disciples believed that he had specifically foreannounced it, instead of only making a general prophecy, which any one might have done, and so have chanced to hit one of many marks in the wide margin allowed. He became a nameless terror to the ship. 
Mayhew having concluded his narration, Ahab put such questions to him that the stranger captain could not forbear inquiring whether he intended to hunt the white whale if opportunity should offer. To which Ahab answered, Aye. Straightway then, Gabriel once more started to his feet, glaring upon the old man, and vehemently exclaimed with downward pointed finger, Think! Think of the blasphemer! Dead and down there! Beware of the blasphemer's end! Ahab stolidly turned aside, then said to Mayhew, Captain, I have just bethought me of my letter-bag. There is a letter for one of thy officers, if I mistake it not. Starbuck, look over the bag. Every whale-ship takes out a goodly number of letters for various ships, whose delivery to the persons to whom they may be addressed depends upon the mere chance of encountering them in the four oceans. Thus most letters never reach their mark, and many are only received after attaining an age of two or three years or more. Soon Starbuck returned with a letter in his hand. It was sorely tumbled, damp, and covered with a dull, spotted green mould, in consequence of being kept in a dark locker of the cabin. Of such a letter Death himself might well have been the postboy. "'Canst not read it?' cried Ahab. "'Give it me, man.' "'Aye, aye. It's but a dim scrawl. What's this?' As he was studying it out, Starbuck took a long cutting-spade pole, and, with his knife, slightly split the end to insert the letter there, and in that way hand it to the boat, without its coming any closer to the ship. Meantime, Ahab, holding the letter, muttered, Mr. Harry, Harry is, yes, Mr. Harry, a woman's penny hand, the man's wife, I'll wager. Aye, Mr. Harry Macy, ship Jeroboam. Why, it's Macy, and he's dead. Poor fellow, poor fellow, and from his wife, sighed Mayhew, but let me have it. Nay, keep it thyself cried Gabriel to Ahab. Thou art soon going that way. Curses throttle thee, yelled Ahab. Captain Mayhew, stand by now to receive it. And, taking the fatal missive from Starbuck's hands, he caught it in the slit of the pole, and reached it over towards the boat. But as he did so, the oarsman expectantly desisted from rowing. The boat drifted a little towards the ship's stern, so that, as if by magic, the letter suddenly ranged along with Gabriel's eager hand. He clutched it in an instant, seized the boat knife, and, impaling the letter on it, sent it thus loaded back into the ship. It fell at Ahab's feet. Then Gabriel shrieked out to his comrades to give way with their oars, and in that manner the mutinous boat rapidly shot away from the Pequod. As, after this interlude, the seamen resumed their work upon the jacket of the whale, many strange things were hinted in reference to this wild affair. End of chapter 68 to 71《Moby Dick, chapters 72 and 73 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 72 and 73. Chapter 72. The Monkey Rope. In the tumultuous business of cutting in and attending to a whale, there is much running backwards and forwards among the crew. Now hands are wanted here, and then again hands are wanted there. There is no staying in any one place, for at one and the same time everything has to be done everywhere. It is much the same with him who endeavors the description of the scene. We must now retrace our way a little. It was mentioned that upon first breaking ground in the whale's back, the blubber hook was inserted into the original hole there cut by the spades of the mates. But how did so clumsy and weighty a mass as that same hook get fixed in that hole? 
It was inserted there by my particular friend Queequeg, whose duty it was, as harpooner, to descend upon the monster's back for the special purpose referred to. But in very many cases, circumstances require that the harpooner shall remain on the whale till the whole tensing or stripping operation is concluded. The whale, be it observed, lies almost entirely submerged, excepting the immediate parts operated upon. So, down there, some ten feet below the level of the deck, the poor harpooner flounders about, half on the whale and half in the water, as the vast mass revolves like a treadmill beneath him. On the occasion in question, Queequeg figured in the Highland costume, a shirt and socks, in which, to my eyes at least, he appeared to uncommon advantage, and no one had a better chance to observe him, as will presently be seen. Being the savage's bowsman, that is, the person who pulled the bow oar in his boat, the second one from forward, it was my cheerful duty to attend upon him while taking that hard scrabble scramble upon the dead whale's back. You have seen Italian organ boys holding a dancing ape by a long cord. Just so, from the ship's steep side, did I hold Queequeg down there in the sea, by what is technically called in the fishery a monkey rope attached to a strong strip of canvas belted round his waist. It was a humorously perilous business for both of us, for before we proceed further, it must be said that the monkey rope was fast at both ends, fast to Queequeg's broad canvas belt, and fast to my narrow leather one, so that, for better or for worse, we two, for the time, were wedded, and should poor Queequeg sink to rise no more, then both usage and honor demanded that instead of cutting the cord, it should drag me down in his wake. So then, an elongated Siamese ligature united us. Queequeg was my own inseparable twin brother, nor could I any way get rid of the dangerous liabilities which the hempen bond entailed. So strongly and metaphysically did I conceive of my situation then, that while earnestly watching his motions, I seemed distinctly to perceive that my own individuality was now merged in a joint-stock company of two, that my free will had received a mortal wound, and that another's mistake or misfortune might plunge innocent me into unmerited disaster and death. Therefore, I saw that here was a sort of interregnum in providence, for its even-handed equity never could have so gross an injustice. And yet, still further pondering, while I jerked him now and then from between the whale and the ship, which would threaten to jam him, still further pondering, I say, I saw that this situation of mind was the precise situation of every mortal that breathes, only, in most cases, he, one way or other, has this Siamese connection with a plurality of other mortals. If your banker breaks, you snap. If your apothecary, by mistake, sends you poison in your pills, you die. True, you may say that, by exceeding caution, you may possibly escape these and multitudinous other evil chances of life but handle Queequeg's monkey rope heedfully as I would, sometimes he jerked it so, that I came very near sliding overboard. Nor could I possibly forget that, do what I would, I had only the management of one end of it. Footnote. The monkey rope is found in all whalers, but it was only in the Pequod that the monkey and his holder were ever tied together, this improvement upon the original usage was introduced by no less a man than Stubb, in order to afford the imperiled harpooner the strongest possible guarantee for the faithfulness and vigilance of his monkey rope holder. End of footnote. I have hinted that I would often jerk poor Queequeg from between the whale and the ship, where he would occasionally fall from the incessant rolling and swaying of both. But this was not the only jamming jeopardy he was exposed to. Unappalled by the massacre made upon them during the night, the sharks, now freshly and more keenly allured by the before-pent blood which began to flow from the carcass, the rabid creatures swarmed round it like bees in a beehive. And right in among those sharks was Queequeg, who often pushed them aside with his floundering feet, 
a thing altogether incredible, were it not that, attracted by such prey as a dead whale, the otherwise miscellaneous carnivorous sharks will seldom touch a man. Nevertheless, it may well be believed that, since they have such a ravenous finger in the pie, it is deemed but wise to look sharp to them. Accordingly, besides the monkey rope with which I now and then jerked the poor fellow from too close a vicinity to the maw of what seemed a peculiarly ferocious shark, he was provided with still another protection. Suspended over the side in one of the stages, Tashtego and Dagu continually flourished over his head a couple of keen whale spades, wherewith they slaughtered as many sharks as they could reach. This procedure of theirs, to be sure, was very disinterested and benevolent of them. They meant Queequeg's best happiness, I admit, but in their hasty zeal to befriend him, and from the circumstance that both he and the sharks were at times half hidden by the blood-muddled water, those indiscreet spades of theirs would come nearer amputating a leg than a tail. But poor Queequeg, I suppose, straining and gasping there with that great iron hook, Poor Queequeg, I suppose, only prayed to his yojo, and gave up his life into the hands of his gods. Well, well, my dear comrade and twin brother, thought I, as I drew in and then slacked off the rope to every swell of the sea, what matters it, after all? Are you not the precious image of each and all of us men in this wailing world? That unsounded ocean you gasp in is life, those sharks your foes, those spades your friends, and what between sharks and spades, you are in a sad pickle and peril, poor lad. But courage, there is good cheer in store for you, Queequeg. For now, as with blue lips and bloodshot eyes, the exhausted savage at last climbs up the chains, and stands all dripping and involuntarily trembling over the side, the steward advances, and with a benevolent, consolatory glance, hands him, what, some hot cognac? No. Hands him, ye God, hands him a cup of tepid ginger and water. Ginger? Do I smell ginger? Suspiciously asked Stubb, coming near. Yes, this must be ginger, peering into the as yet untasted cup. Then, standing as if incredulous for a while, he calmly walked toward the astonished steward, slowly saying, Ginger! Ginger! And will you have the goodness to tell me, Mr. Doughboy, where lies the virtue of ginger? Ginger! Is ginger the sort of fuel you use, Doughboy, to kindle a fire in this shivering cannibal? Ginger! What the devil is ginger? Sea coal? Firewood? Lucifer matches? Tinder? Gunpowder? What the devil is ginger, I say, that you offer this cup to our poor Queequeg here? There is some sneaking temperance society movement about this business, he suddenly added, now approaching Starbuck, who had just come from forward. Will you look at that canakin, sir? Smell of it, if you please. Then, watching the mate's countenance, he added, The steward, Mr. Starbuck, had the face to offer that calamal and jollop to Queequeg there, this instant off the whale. Is the steward an apothecary, sir? And may I ask whether this is the sort of bitters by which he blows back the life into a half-drowned man? I trust not, said Starbuck. It is poor stuff enough. Aye, aye, steward, cried Stubb. We'll teach you to drug it, Harpooner. None of your apothecary's medicine here. You want to poison us, do you? You have got out insurance on our lives, and want to murder us all and pocket the proceeds, do you? "'It was not me,' cried Doughboy. "'It was Aunt Charity that brought the ginger on board, "'and bade me never give the harpooners any spirits, "'but only this ginger-jub, so she called it. "'Ginger-jub! You gingery rascal! "'Take that, and run along with you to the lockers, "'and get something better. "'I hope I do no wrong, Mr. Starbuck. "'It is the captain's orders. "'Grog for the harpooner on a whale.' "'Enough,' replied Starbuck. Only don't hit him again, but, oh, I never hurt when I hit, except when I hit a whale or something of that sort. And this fellow's a weasel. Uh, what were you about saying, sir? Only this. Go down with him and get what thou wantest thyself. 
When Stubb reappeared, he came with a dark flask in one hand, and a sort of tea caddy in the other. The first contained strong spirits and was handed to Queequeg, the second was Aunt Charity's gift, and that was freely given to the waves. Chapter 73 Stubb and Flask Kill a Right Whale, and then have a talk over him. It must be borne in mind that all this time we have a sperm whale's prodigious head hanging to the Pequod's side, but we must let it continue hanging there for a while, till we can get a chance to attend to it. For the present other matters press, and the best we can do now for the head is to pray heaven the tackles may hold. Now, during the past night and forenoon, the Pequod had gradually drifted into a sea which, by its occasional patches of yellow brit, gave unusual tokens of the vicinity of right whales, a species of the leviathan that but few supposed to be at this particular time lurking anywhere near. And though all hands commonly disdained the capture of those inferior creatures, and though the Pequod was not commissioned to cruise for them at all, and though she had passed numbers of them near the Crozettes without lowering a boat, yet now that a sperm whale had been brought alongside and beheaded, to the surprise of all, the announcement was made that a right whale should be captured that day if opportunity offered. Nor was this long wanting. Tall spouts were seen to leeward, and two boats, stubs and flasks, were detached in pursuit. Pulling further and further away, they at last became almost invisible to the men at the masthead. But suddenly in the distance they saw a great heap of tumultuous white water, and soon after news came from aloft that one or both the boats must be fast. An interval passed, and the boats were in plain sight, in the act of being dragged right towards the ship by the towing whale. So close did the monster come to the hull, that at first it seemed as if he meant it malice, but suddenly going down in a maelstrom, within three rods of the planks, he wholly disappeared from view, as if diving under the keel. Cut! Cut! was the cry from the ship to the boats, which for one instant seemed on the point of being brought with a deadly dash against the vessel's side. But having plenty of line yet in the tubs, and the whale not sounding very rapidly, they paid out abundance of rope, and at the same time pulled with all their might so as to get ahead of the ship. For a few minutes the struggle was intensely critical, for while they still slacked out the tightened line in one direction, and still plied their oars in another, the contending strain threatened to take them under. But it was only a few feet advance they sought to gain, and they stuck to it till they did gain it, when instantly a swift tremor was felt running like lightning along the keel, as the strained line scraping beneath the ship suddenly rose to view under her bows, snapping and quivering, and so flinging off its drippings that the drops fell like bits of broken glass on the water, while the whale beyond also rose to sight, and once more the boats were free to fly. But the fagged whale abated his speed, and blindly altering his course, went round the stern of the ship, towing the two boats after him, so that they performed a complete circuit. Meanwhile, they hauled more and more upon their lines, till, close flanking him on both sides, Stubb answered Flask with lance for lance, and thus round and round the Pequod the battle went, while the multitudes of sharks that had before swum round the sperm whale's body rushed to the fresh blood that was spilled, thirstily drinking at every new gash, as the eager Israelites did, at the new bursting fountains that poured from the smitten rock. At last his spout grew thick, and with a frightful roll and vomit, he turned upon his back a corpse. While the two headsmen were engaged in making fast cords to his flukes, and in other ways getting the mass in readiness for towing, some conversation ensued between them. "'I wonder what the old man wants with this lump of foul lard,' said Stubb, not without some disgust, at the thought of having to do with so ignoble a leviathan. "'Wants with it,' said Flask, coiling some spare line in the boat's bow. "'Did you never hear that the ship, which but once has a sperm whale's head hoisted on her starboard side, and at the same time a right whale's head on the larboard, 
Did you never hear, Stubb, that that ship can never afterwards capsize? Why not? I don't know, but I heard that gamboge ghost of a Fadala saying so, and he seems to know all about ship's charms, but I sometimes think he'll charm the ship to no good at last. I don't half like that chap, Stubb. Did you ever notice how that tusk of his is a sort of carved into a snake's head, Stubb? Sink him. I never look at him at all. But if ever I get a chance of a dark night, and he's standing hard by the bulwarks, and no one by, look down there, Flask, pointing into the sea with a peculiar motion of both hands. Aye, will I? Flask, I take that Fadala to be the devil in disguise. Do you believe that cock-and-bull story about his having been stowed away on board ship? He's the devil, I say. The reason why you don't see his tail is because he tucks it up out of sight. He carries it coiled away in his pocket, I guess. Blast him! Now that I think of it, he's always wanting oakum to stuff into the toes of his boots. He sleeps in his boots, don't he? He hasn't got any hammock, but I've seen him lay of nights in a coil of rigging. No doubt. And it's because of his cursed tail. He coils it down, do you see, in the eye of the rigging. What's the old man have so much to do with him for? Striking up a swap or a bargain, I suppose. Bargain? About what? Why, do you see, the old man is hard bent after that white whale, and the devil there is trying to come round him and get him to swap away his silver watch, or his soul, or something of that sort, and then he'll surrender Moby Dick. Pooh, <laughs> Stubb, you are skylarking. How can Fadala do that? I don't know, Flask. But the devil is a curious chap, and a wicked one, I tell you. Why, they say is how he went a sauntering into the old flagship once, switching his tail about devilish easy and gentlemanlike, and inquiring if the old governor was at home. Well, he was at home, and asked the devil what he wanted. The devil, switching his hoofs, up and says, I want John. What for, says the old governor. What business is that of yours, says the devil, getting mad. I want to use him. Take him, says the governor. And by the Lord, Flask, if the devil didn't give John the Asiatic cholera before he got through with him, I'll eat this whale in one mouthful. But look sharp. Ain't you already there? Well, then pull ahead, and let's get the whale alongside. I think I remember some such story as you were telling, said Flask, when at last the two boats were slowly advancing with their burden towards the ship. But I can't remember where. Three Spaniards? Adventures of those three bloody-minded solados? Did you read it there, Flask? I guess you did. No, never saw such a book. Heard of it, though. But now tell me, Stubb, do you suppose that that devil you were speaking of just now was the same you say is now on board the Pequod? Am I the same man that helped kill this whale? Doesn't the devil live forever? Who ever heard that the devil was dead? Did you ever see any parson wearing a mourning for the devil? And if the devil has a latch-key to get into the admiral's cabin, don't you suppose he can crawl into a porthole? Tell me that, Mr. Flask. How old do you suppose Fadala is, Stubb? Do you see that mainmast there? Pointing to the ship. Well, that's the figure one. Now take all the hoops in the Pequod's hold, and string along in a row with that mast for aughts. Do you see... Well, that wouldn't begin to be Fadala's age. Nor all the coopers in creation couldn't show hoops enough to make aughts enough. But see here, Stubb, I thought you a little boasted just now that you meant to give Fadala a sea toss if you got a good chance. Now, if he's so old as all those hoops of yours come to, and if he is going to live forever, what good will it do to pitch him overboard? Tell me that. Give him a good ducking, anyhow. But he'd crawl back. Duck him again, and keep ducking him. Suppose he should take it into his head to duck you, though. Yes, and drown you. What then? I should like to see him try it. I'd give him such a pair of black eyes that he wouldn't dare show his face in the admiral's cabin again for a long while, let alone down in the orlop there where he lives, and hereabouts on the upper decks where he sneaks so much. Damn the devil, Flask. So you suppose I'm afraid of the devil? Who's afraid of him? except the old governor who dares and catch him and put him in double darbies as he deserves, but lets him go about kidnapping people. Aye, 
and signed a bond with him, that all the people the devil kidnapped he'd roast for him. There's a governor. Do you suppose Fadala wants to kidnap Captain Ahab? Do I suppose it? You'll know it before long, Flask. But I am going now to keep a sharp lookout on him. And if I see anything very suspicious going on, I'll just take him by the nape of the neck and say, Look here, Beelzebub, you don't do it. And if he makes any fuss, by the Lord, I'll make a grab into his pocket for his tail, take it to the capstan, and give him such a wrenching and heaving that his tail will come short off at the stump, you see? And then, I rather guess, when he finds himself docked in that queer fashion, he'll sneak off without the poor satisfaction of feeling his tail between his legs. And what will you do with the tail, Stubb? Do with it. Sell it for an ox-whip when we get home. What else? Now, do you mean what you say, and have been saying all along, Stubb? Mean or not mean, here we are at the ship. The boats were here hailed, to tow the whale on the larboard side, where fluke-chains and other necessaries were already prepared for securing him. Didn't I tell you so? said Flask. Yes, you'll soon see this right whale's head hoisted up opposite that parmacetes. In good time, Flask's saying proved true. As before, the Pequod steeply leaned over towards the sperm whale's head. Now, by the counterpoise of both heads, she regained her even keel. Though sorely strained, you may well believe. So, when on one side you hoist in Locke's head, you go over that way, but now on the other side hoist in Kant's, and you come back again, but in very poor plight. Thus some minds forever keep trimming boat. Oh, you foolish! Throw all these thunderheads overboard, and then you will float light and right. In disposing of the body of a right whale, when brought alongside the ship, the same preliminary proceedings commonly take place as in the case of a sperm whale. Only in the latter instance the head is cut off whole but in the former the lips and tongue are separately removed and hoisted on deck, with all the well-known black bone attached to what is called the crown piece. But nothing like this in the present case had been done. The carcasses of both whales had dropped astern, and the head-laden ship not a little resembled a mule carrying a pair of overburdening panniers. Meantime, Fadala was calmly eyeing the right whale's head, and ever and anon glancing from the deep wrinkles there to the lines in his own hand. And Ahab chanced so to stand that the Parsee occupied his shadow, while if the Parsee's shadow was there at all, it seemed only to blend with and lengthen Ahab's. As the crew toiled on, Laplandish speculations were bandied among them concerning all these passing things. End of chapters 72 and 73. Moby Dick, chapters 74 to 77. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wells. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 74 to 77. Chapter 74 The Sperm Whale's Head, Contrasted View Here now are two great whales laying their heads together. Let us join them, and lay together our own. Of the grand order of folio leviathans, the sperm whale and the right whale are by far the most noteworthy. They are the only whales regularly hunted by man. To the Nantucketer they present the two extremes of all the known varieties of the whale. As the external difference between them is mainly observable in their heads, and as a head of each is this moment hanging from the Pequod's side, and as we may freely go from one to the other by merely stepping across the deck, where, I should like to know, will you obtain a better chance to study practical cetology than here? In the first place, you are struck by the general contrast between these heads. Both are massive enough, in all conscience, 
but there is a certain mathematical symmetry in the sperm whales which the right whales sadly lacks there is more character in the sperm whale's head as you behold it you involuntarily yield the immense superiority to him in point of pervading dignity in the present instance too this dignity is heightened by the pepper and salt colour of his head at the summit giving token of advanced age and large experience in short he is what the fishermen technically call a grey-headed whale let us now note what is least dissimilar in these heads namely the two most important organs the eye and the ear far back on the side of the head and low down near the angle of either whale's jaw if you narrowly search you will at last see a lashless eye which you would fancy to be a young colt's eye so out of all proportion is it to the magnitude of the head now from this peculiar sideway position of the whale's eyes it is plain that he can never see an object which is exactly ahead no more than he can one exactly astern in a word the position of the whale's eyes corresponds to that of a man's ears and you may fancy for yourself how it would fare with you did you sideways survey objects through your ears you would find that you could only command some thirty degrees of vision in advance of the straight side-line of sight, and about thirty more behind it. If your bitterest foe were walking straight towards you, with dagger uplifted in broad day, you would not be able to see him, any more than if he were stealing upon you from behind. In a word, you would have two backs, so to speak, but at the same time also two fronts, side fronts, for what is it that makes the front of a man, what, indeed, but his eyes? Moreover, while in most other animals that I can now think of, the eyes are so planted as imperceptibly to blend their visual power, so as to produce one picture and not two to the brain, the peculiar position of the whale's eyes, effectually divided as they are by many cubic feet of solid head, which towers between them like a great mountain separating two lakes and valleys, this, of course, must wholly separate the impressions which each independent organ imparts. The whale, therefore, must see one distinct picture on this side and another distinct picture on that side, while all between must be profound darkness and nothingness to him. Man may, in effect, be said to look out on the world from a sentry-box with two joined sashes for his window, but for the whale, these two sashes are separately inserted, making two distinct windows, but sadly impairing the view. This peculiarity of the whale's eyes is a thing always to be borne in mind in the fishery, and to be remembered by the reader in some subsequent scenes. A curious and most puzzling question might be started concerning this visual matter as touching the Leviathan. But I must be content with a hint. So long as a man's eyes are open in the light, the act of seeing is involuntary, that is, he cannot help mechanically seeing whatever objects are before him. Nevertheless, anyone's experience will teach him that though he can take in an undiscriminating sweep of things at one glance, it is quite impossible for him, attentively and completely, to examine any two things, however large or however small, at one and the same instant of time, never mind if they lie side by side and touch each other. But if you now come to separate these two objects, and surround each by a circle of profound darkness, then in order to see one of them, in such a manner as to bring your mind to bear on it, the other will be utterly excluded from your contemporary consciousness. How is it then with the whale? True, both his eyes in themselves must simultaneously act, but is his brain so much more comprehensive, combining, and subtle than man's, that he can, at the same moment of time, attentively examine two distinct prospects, one on one side of him, and the other in an exactly opposite direction? If he can, then is it a marvelous thing in him, as if a man were able to simultaneously go through the demonstrations of two distinct problems in Euclid, nor, strictly investigated, is there any incongruity in this comparison. It may be but an idle whim, but it has always seemed to me 
that the extraordinary vacillations of movement displayed by some whales when beset by three or four boats, the timidity and liability to queer frights so common to such whales, I think that all this indirectly proceeds from the helpless perplexity of volition in which their divided and diametrically opposite powers of vision must involve them. But the ear of the whale is full as curious as the eye. If you are an entire stranger to their race, you might hunt over these two heads for hours and never discover that organ. The ear has no external leaf whatever, and into the hole itself you can hardly insert a quill, so wondrously minute is it. It is lodged a little behind the eye. With respect to their ears, this important difference is to be observed between the sperm whale and the right, while the ear of the former has an external opening, that of the latter is entirely and evenly covered over with a membrane, so as to be quite imperceptible from without. Is it not curious that so vast a being as the whale should see the world through so small an eye, and hear the thunder through an ear which is smaller than a hare's? But if the eye were broad as the lens of Herschel's great telescope, and his ears capacious as the porches of cathedrals, would that make him any longer of sight or sharper of hearing? Not at all. Why, then, do you try to enlarge your mind? Subtilize it. Let us now, with whatever levers and steam engines we have at hand, cant over the sperm whale's head, that it may lie bottom up, then, ascending by a ladder to the summit, have a peep down the mouth. And were it not that the body is now completely separated from it, with a lantern we might descend into the great Kentucky mammoth cave of the stomach. But let us hold on here by this tooth and look about us where we are. What a really beautiful and chaste-looking mouth, from floor to ceiling, lined, or rather papered, with a glistening white membrane, glossy as bridal satins. But come out now and look at this portentous lower jaw, which seems like the long narrow lid of an immense snuff-box, with the hinge at one end instead of one side. If you pry it up so as to get it overhead, and expose its rows of teeth, it seems a terrific portcullis, and such, alas, it proves to many a poor wight in the fishery, upon whom these spikes fall with impaling force. But far more terrible is it to behold, when fathoms down in the sea, you see some sulky whale floating there suspended with his prodigious jaw some fifteen feet long, hanging straight down at right angles with his body, for all the world like a ship's jib-boom. This whale is not dead, he is only dispirited, out of sorts perhaps, hypochondriac, and so supine that the hinges of his jaw have relaxed, leaving him there in that ungainly sort of plight, a reproach to all his tribe, who must, no doubt, imprecate lock-jaws upon him. In most cases this lower jaw, being easily unhinged by a practised artist, is disengaged and hoisted on deck for the purpose of extracting the ivory teeth, and furnishing a supply of that hard white whalebone with which the fishermen fashion all sorts of curious articles, including canes, umbrella stocks, and handles to riding whips. With a long, weary hoist the jaw is dragged on board, as if it were an anchor, and when the proper time comes, some few days after the other work, Queequeg, Dagu, and Tashtego, all being accomplished dentists, are set to drawing teeth. With a keen cutting spade, Queequeg lances the gums, then the jaw is lashed down to ring bolts, and a tackle being rigged from aloft, they drag out these teeth, as Michigan oxen drag stumps of old oaks out of wild woodlands. There are generally forty-two teeth in all, in old whales much worn down, but undecayed, nor filled after our artificial fashion. The jaw is afterwards sawn into slabs, and piled away like joists for building houses. Chapter 75 The Right Whale's Head Contrasted View Crossing the deck, let us now have a good long look at the right whale's head. 
As in general shape the noble sperm whale's head may be compared to a Roman war chariot, especially in front where it is so broadly rounded, so at a broad view the right whale's head bears a rather inelegant resemblance to a gigantic galliot-toed shoe. Two hundred years ago an old Dutch voyager likened its shape to that of a shoemaker's last, and in this same last or shoe that old woman of the nursery tale with her swarming brood might very comfortably be lodged, she and all her progeny. But as you come nearer to this great head, it begins to assume different aspects, according to your point of view. If you stand on its summit and look at these two F-shaped spout holes, you would take the whole head for an enormous base vial, and these spiracles the apertures in its sounding board. Then again, if you fix your eyes upon this strange, crested, comb-like incrustation on the top of the mass, this green barnacled thing, which the Greenlanders call the crown, and the southern fishers the bonnet of the right whale, fixing your eyes solely on this, you would take the head for a trunk of some huge oak, with a bird's nest in its crotch. At any rate, when you watch those live crabs that nestle here on this bonnet, such an idea will be almost sure to occur to you, unless indeed your fancy has been fixed by the technical term crown also bestowed upon it, in which case you will take great interest in thinking how this mighty monster is actually a diademed king of the sea, whose green crown has been put together for him in this marvellous manner. But if this whale be a king, he is a very sulky-looking fellow to grace a diadem. Look at that hanging lower lip. What a huge sulk and pout is there! A sulk and pout by carpenter's measurement, about twenty feet long and five feet deep. A sulk and pout that will yield you some five hundred gallons of oil and more. A great pity now that this unfortunate whale should be hair-lipped. The fissure is about a foot across. Probably the mother, during an important interval, was sailing down the Peruvian coast when earthquakes caused the beach to gape. Over this lip, as over a slippery threshold, we now slide into the mouth. Upon my word, were I at Mackinaw, I should take this to be the inside of an Indian wigwam. Good Lord! Is this the road that Jonah went? The roof is about twelve feet high, and runs to a pretty sharp angle, as if there were a regular ridge-pole there, while these ribbed, arched, hairy sides present us with those wondrous, half-vertical, scimitar-shaped slats of whalebone, say three hundred on a side, which, depending from the upper part of the head or crown bone, form those Venetian blinds which have elsewhere been cursorily mentioned. The edges of these bones are fringed with hairy fibres, through which the right whale strains the water, and in whose intricacies he retains the small fish when open-mouthed he goes through the seas of Brit in feeding time. In the central blinds of bone, as they stand in their natural order, there are certain curious marks, curves, hollows, and ridges, whereby some whalemen calculate the creature's age, as the age of an oak by its circular rings. Though the certainty of this criterion is far from demonstrable, yet it has the savour of analogical probability. At any rate, if we yield to it, we must grant a far greater age to the right whale than at first glance will seem reasonable. In old times there seem to have prevailed the most curious fancies concerning these blinds. One voyager in purchase calls them the wondrous whiskers inside of the whale's mouth, another hog's bristles, a third old gentleman in Hakluyt uses the following elegant language, quote, There are about two hundred and fifty fins growing on each side of his upper chop, which arch over his tongue on each side of his mouth. End quote. Footnote. This reminds us that the right whale really has a sort of whisker, or rather a mustache, consisting of a few scattered white hairs on the upper part of the outer end of the lower jaw. Sometimes these tufts impart a rather brigandish expression to his otherwise solemn countenance. End of footnote. As everyone knows, these same hog's bristles, fins, 
whiskers, blinds, or whatever you please, furnish to the ladies their busks and other stiffening contrivances. But in this particular the demand has long been on the decline. It was in Queen Anne's time that the bone was in its glory, the farthingale being then all the fashion. And as those ancient dams moved about gaily, though in the jaws of the whale, as you may say, even so in a shower, with like thoughtlessness, do we nowadays fly under the same jaws for protection, the umbrella being a tent spread over the same bone. But now forget all about blinds and whiskers for a moment, and standing in the right whale's mouth, look around you afresh. Seeing all these colonnades of bone so methodically ranged about, would you not think you were inside of the great Harlem organ, and gazing upon its thousand pipes? For a carpet to the organ we have a rug of the softest turkey, the tongue, which is glued, as it were, to the floor of the mouth. It is very fat and tender, and apt to tear in pieces in hoisting it on deck. This particular tongue now before us, at a passing glance I should say it was a six-barreler, that is, it will yield you about that amount of oil. Ere this, you must have plainly seen the truth of what I started with, that the sperm whale and the right whale have almost entirely different heads. To sum up, then, in the right whales there is no great well of sperm, no ivory teeth at all, no long, slender mandible of a lower jaw like the sperm whales. Nor in the sperm whale are there any of those blinds of bone, no huge lower lip, and scarcely anything of a tongue. Again, the right whale has two external spout holes, the sperm whale only one. Look your last now on these venerable hooded heads, while they yet lie together, for one will soon sink unrecorded in the sea, and the other will not be very long in following. Can you catch the expression of the sperm whales there? It is the same he died with, only some of the longer wrinkles in the forehead now seem faded away. I think his broad brow to be full of a prairie-like placidity, born of a speculative indifference as to death. But mark the other head's expression. See that amazing lower lip pressed by accident against the vessel's side, so as firmly to embrace the jaw. Does not this whole head seem to speak of an enormous practical resolution in facing death? This right whale I take to have been a stoic. The sperm whale, a Platonian, who might have taken up Spinoza in his latter years. Chapter 76 The Battering Ram Ere quitting for the nonce the sperm whale's head, I would have you, as a sensible physiologist simply, particularly remark its front aspect, in all its compacted collectedness. I would have you investigate it now, with the sole view of forming to yourself some unexaggerated, intelligent estimate of whatever battering ram power may be lodged there. Here is a vital point, for you must either satisfactorily settle this matter with yourself, or forever remain an infidel as to one of the most appalling, but not the less true events, perhaps anywhere to be found in all recorded history. You observe that in the ordinary swimming position of the sperm whale, the front of his head presents an almost wholly vertical plane to the water. You observe that the lower part of that front slopes considerably backwards, so as to furnish more of a retreat for the long socket which receives the boom-like lower jaw. You observe that the mouth is entirely under the head, much in the same way indeed as though your own mouth were entirely under your chin. Moreover, you observe that the whale has no external nose, and that what nose he has, his spout hole, is on the top of his head. You observe that his eyes and ears are at the sides of his head, nearly one-third of his entire length from the front. Wherefore, you must now have perceived that the front of the sperm whale's head is a dead blind wall, without a single organ or tender prominence of any sort whatsoever. Furthermore, you are now to consider that only in the extreme lower backward-sloping part of the front of the head is there the slightest vestige of bone. 
and not till you get near twenty feet from the forehead do you come to the full cranial development. So that this whole enormous boneless mass is as one wad. Finally, though, as will soon be revealed, its contents partly comprise the most delicate oil, yet you are now to be apprised of the nature of the substance which so impregnably invests all that apparent effeminacy. In some previous place I have described to you how the blubber wraps the body of the whale, as the rind wraps an orange, just so with the head, but with this difference, about the head this envelope, though not so thick, is of a boneless toughness, inestimable by any man who has not handled it. The severest pointed harpoon, the sharpest lance darted by the strongest human arm, impotently rebounds from it. It is as though the forehead of the sperm whale were paved with horses' hoofs. I do not think that any sensation lurks in it. Bethink yourself also of another thing. When two large, loaded Indiamen chance to crowd and crush towards each other in the docks, what do the sailors do? They do not suspend between them, at the point of coming contact, any merely hard substance like iron or wood. No, they hold there a large round wad of tow and cork, enveloped in the thickest and toughest of ox-hide. That, bravely and uninjured, takes the jam which would have snapped all their oaken handspikes and iron crowbars. By itself this sufficiently illustrates the obvious fact I drive at. But supplementary to this, it has hypothetically occurred to me that as ordinary fish possess what is called a swimming bladder in them, capable at will of distension or contraction, and as the sperm whale, as far as I know, has no such provision in him, Considering, too, the otherwise inexplicable manner in which he now depresses his head altogether beneath the surface, and anon swims with it high elevated out of the water, considering the unobstructed elasticity of its envelope, considering the unique interior of his head, it has hypothetically occurred to me, I say, that those mystical lung-celled honeycombs there may possibly have some hitherto unknown and unsuspected connection with the outer air, so as to be susceptible to atmospheric distension and contraction. If this be so, fancy the irresistibleness of that might to which the most impalpable and destructive of all elements contributes. Now, Mark, unerringly impelling this dead, impregnable, uninjurable wall, and this most buoyant thing within, there swims behind it all a mass of tremendous life, only to be adequately estimated as piled wood is, by the cord, and all obedient to one volition as the smallest insect. So that when I shall hereafter detail to you all the specialties and concentrations of potency everywhere lurking in this expansive monster, when I shall show you some of his more inconsiderable braining feats, I trust you will have renounced all ignorant incredulity, and be ready to abide by this, that though the sperm whale stove a passage through the isthmus of Darien, and mixed the Atlantic with the Pacific, you would not elevate one hair of your eyebrow. For unless you own the whale, you are but a provincial and sentimentalist in truth." But clear truth is a thing for salamander giants only to encounter. How small the chances for the provincials, then! What befell the weakling youth lifting the dread goddess's veil at Lais? Chapter 77 The Great Heidelberg Tun Now comes the bailing of the case. But to comprehend it aright, you must know something of the curious internal structure of the thing operated upon. Regarding the sperm whale's head as a solid oblong, you may, on an inclined plane, sideways divide it into two coins, whereof the lower is the bony structure, forming the cranium and jaws, and the upper an unctuous mass wholly free from bones, its broad forward end forming the expanded vertical apparent forehead of the whale, at the middle of the forehead, horizontally subdivide this upper coin, and then you have two almost equal parts, which before were naturally divided by an internal wall of a thick tendinous substance. 
Footnote. Quoin is not a Euclidean term. It belongs to the pure nautical mathematics. I know not that it has been defined before. A coin is a solid which differs from a wedge in having its sharp end formed by the steep inclination of one side instead of the mutual tapering of both sides. End of footnote. The lower subdivided part, called the junk, is one immense honeycomb of oil, formed by the crossing and recrossing into ten thousand infiltrated cells of tough elastic white fibers throughout its whole extent. The upper part, known as the case, may be regarded as the great Heidelberg ton of the sperm whale. And as that famous great tierce is mystically carved in front, so the whale's vast, pleated forehead forms innumerable strange devices for the emblematical adornment of his wondrous ton. Moreover, as that of Heidelberg was always replenished with the most excellent of wines from the Rhenish valleys, so the ton of the whale contains by far the most precious of all his oily vintages, namely the highly prized spermaceti, in its absolutely pure, limpid, and odoriferous state. Nor is this precious substance found unalloyed in any other part of the creature. Though in life it remains perfectly fluid, yet upon exposure to the air after death, it soon begins to concrete, sending forth beautiful crystalline shoots, as when the first thin, delicate ice is just forming in water. A large whale's case generally yields about five hundred gallons of sperm, though, from unavoidable circumstances, considerable of it is spilled, leaks and dribbles away, or is otherwise irrevocably lost in the ticklish business of securing what you can. I know not with what fine and costly material the Heidelberg ton was coated within, but in superlative richness that coating could not possibly have compared with the silken pearl-colored membrane, like the lining of a fine pelisse, forming the inner surface of the sperm whale's case. It will have been seen that the Heidelberg ton of the sperm whale embraces the entire length of the entire top of the head, and since, as has been elsewhere set forth, the head embraces one-third of the whole length of the creature, then setting that length down at eighty feet for a good-sized whale, you have more than twenty-six feet for the depth of the ton, when it is lengthwise hoisted up and down against the ship's side. As in decapitating the whale, the operator's instrument is brought close to the spot where an entrance is subsequently forced into the spermaceti magazine. He has, therefore, to be uncommonly heedful, lest a careless, untimely stroke should invade the sanctuary and wastingly let out its invaluable contents. It is this decapitated end of the head, also, which is at last elevated out of the water, and retained in that position by the enormous cutting tackles, whose hempen combinations on one side make quite a wilderness of ropes in that quarter. Thus much being said, attend now, I pray you, to that marvelous and, in this particular instance, almost fatal operation, whereby the sperm whale's great Heidelberg ton is tapped. End of chapters 74 to 77 Moby Dick, chapter 78 to 80 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 78 to 80. Chapter 78. Cistern and Buckets. Nimble as a cat, Tashtego mounts aloft, and without altering his erect posture, runs straight out upon the overhanging mainyard arm, to the part where it exactly projects over the hoisted ton. He has carried with him a light tackle called a whip, consisting of only two parts, traveling through a single sheaved block. Securing this block so that it hangs down from the yard arm, he swings one end of the rope, till it is caught and firmly held by a hand on deck. 
Then, hand over hand, down the other part, the Indian drops through the air, till, dexterously, he lands on the summit of the head. There, still high elevated above the rest of the company, to whom he vivaciously cries, he seems some Turkish muezzin calling the good people to prayers from the top of a tower. A short-handled sharp spade being sent up to him, he diligently searches for the proper place to begin breaking into the tun. In this business he proceeds very heedfully, like a treasure hunter in some old house, sounding the walls to find where the gold is masoned in. By the time this cautious search is over, a stout iron-bound bucket, precisely like a well-bucket, has been attached to one end of the whip, while the other end, being stretched across the deck, is there held by two or three alert hands. These last now hoist the bucket within grasp of the Indian, to whom another person has reached up a very long pole. Inserting this pole into the bucket, Tashtego downward guides the bucket into the tun, till it entirely disappears. Then, giving the word to the seamen at the whip, up comes the bucket again, all bubbling like a dairymaid's pail of new milk. Carefully lowered from its height, the full freighted vessel is caught by an appointed hand, and quickly emptied into a large tub. Then, remounting aloft, it again goes through the same round, until the deep cistern will yield no more. Towards the end, Tashtego has to ram his long pole harder and harder, and deeper and deeper into the tun, until some twenty feet of the pole have gone down. Now, the people of the Pequod had been bailing some time in this way. Several tubs had been filled with the fragrant sperm, when all at once a queer accident happened. Whether it was that Tashtego, that wild Indian, was so heedless and reckless as to let go for a moment his one-handed hold on the great cabled tackles suspending the head, or whether the place where he stood was so treacherous and oozy, or whether the evil one himself would have it fall out so, without stating his particular reasons, how it was exactly there is no telling now, but on a sudden, as the eightieth or ninetieth bucket came suckingly up, my God, poor Tashtego, like the twin reciprocating bucket in a veritable well, dropped head foremost down into this great tun of Heidelberg, and with a horrible oily gurgling went clean out of sight. Man overboard, cried Dagu, who, amid the general consternation, first came to his senses. Swing the bucket this way! and, putting one foot into it, so as the better to secure his slippery handhold on the whip itself, the hoisters ran him high to the top of the head, almost before Tashtego could have reached its interior bottom. Meantime there was a terrible tumult. Looking over the side, they saw the before lifeless head throbbing and heaving just below the surface of the sea, as if that moment seized with some momentous idea— whereas it was only the poor Indian unconsciously revealing by those struggles the perilous depth to which he had sunk. At this instant, while Dagu on the summit of the head was clearing the whip, which had somehow got foul of the great cutting tackles, a sharp cracking noise was heard, and to the unspeakable horror of all, one of the two enormous hooks suspending the head tore out, and with a vast vibration the enormous mass sideways swung, till the drunk ship reeled and shook as if smitten by an iceberg. The one remaining hook, upon which the entire strain now depended, seemed every instant to be on the point of giving way, an event still more likely from the violent motions of the head. "'Come down! Come down!' yelled the seamen to Dagu but with one hand holding on to the heavy tackles, so that if the head should drop he would still remain suspended, the negro, having cleared the foul line, rammed down the bucket into the now collapsed well, meaning that the buried harpooner should grasp it, and so be hoisted out. "'In heaven's name, man!' cried Stubb. "'Are you ramming home a cartridge there? Avast! How will that help him? Jamming that iron-bound bucket on top of his head!' "'Avast, will ye? "'Stand clear of the tackle!' cried a voice like the bursting of a rocket. Almost in the same instant, with a thunder-boom, the enormous mass dropped into the sea, like Niagara's table-rock into the whirlpool. The suddenly relieved hull rolled away from it, 
to far down her glittering copper, and all caught their breath as half swinging, now over the sailors' heads, and now over the water, Dagoo, through a thick mist of spray, was dimly beheld clinging to the pendulous tackles, while poor buried alive Tashtego was sinking utterly down to the bottom of the sea. But hardly had the blinding vapor cleared away, when a naked figure with a boarding sword in his hand was for one swift moment seen hovering over the bulwarks. The next, a loud splash announced that my brave Queequeg had dived to the rescue. One packed rush was made to the side, and every eye counted every ripple, as moment followed moment, and no sign of either the sinker or the diver could be seen. Some hands now jumped into a boat alongside, and pushed a little off from the ship. "'Ha, ha!' cried Dagoo all at once, from his now quiet swinging perch overhead, and, looking further off from the side, we saw an arm thrust upright from the blue waves." a strange sight to see, as an arm thrust forth from the grass over a grave. "'Both! Both! It is both!' cried Dagoo again with a joyful shout. And soon after, Queequeg was seen boldly striking out with one hand, and with the other clutching the long hair of the Indian. Drawn into the waiting boat, they were quickly brought to the deck, but Tashtego was long in coming too, and Queequeg did not look very brisk. Now how had this noble rescue been accomplished? Why, diving after the slowly descending head, Queequeg, with his keen sword, had made side lunges near its bottom, so as to scuttle a large hole there, then, dropping his sword, had thrust his long arm far inwards and upwards, and so hauled out poor Tash by the head. He averred that upon first thrusting in for him a leg was presented, but well knowing that that was not as it ought to be, and might occasion great trouble, he had thrust back the leg, and by a dexterous heave and toss, had wrought a somerset upon the Indian, so that with the next trial he came forth in the good old way, head foremost. As for the great head itself, that was doing as well as could be expected. And thus, through the courage and great skill in obstetrics of Queequeg, the deliverance, or rather delivery, of Tashtego, was successfully accomplished, in the teeth, too, of the most untoward and apparently hopeless impediments, which is a lesson by no means to be forgotten. Midwifery should be taught in the same course with fencing and boxing, riding and rowing. I know that this queer adventure of the gay headers will be sure to seem incredible to some landsmen, though they themselves have either seen or heard of someone's falling into a cistern ashore, an accident which not seldom happens, and with much less reason, too, than the Indians, considering the exceeding slipperiness of the curb of the sperm whale's well. But, peradventure, it may be sagaciously urged, how is this? We thought the tissued infiltrated head of the sperm whale was the lightest and most corky part about him, and yet thou makest it sink in an element of far greater specific gravity than itself. We have thee there. Not at all, but I have ye. For at the time poor Tash fell in, the case had been nearly emptied of its lighter contents, leaving little but the dense tendinous wall of the well, a double-welded hammered substance, as I have before said, much heavier than the sea-water, and a lump of which sinks in it like lead almost. But the tendency to rapid sinking in this substance was in the present instance materially counteracted by the other parts of the head remaining undetached from it, so that it sank very slowly and deliberately indeed, affording Queequeg a fair chance for performing his agile obstetrics on the run, as you may say. Yes, it was a running delivery, so it was. Now, had Tashtego perished in that head, it had been a very precious perishing. Smothered in the very whitest and daintiest of fragrant spermaceti, coffined, hearsed, and tombed in the secret inner chamber and sanctum sanctorum of the whale, only one sweeter end can readily be recalled, the delicious death of an Ohio honey-hunter, who, seeking honey in the crotch of a hollow tree, found such an exceeding store of it that, leaning too far over, it sucked him in, so that he died embalmed. 
How many, think ye, have likewise fallen into Plato's honey head, and sweetly perished there? Chapter 79 The Prairie To scan the lines of his face, or feel the bumps on the head of this leviathan, this is a thing which no physiognomist or phrenologist has as yet undertaken. Such an enterprise would seem almost as hopeful as for Lavater to have scrutinized the wrinkles on the rock of Gibraltar, or for Gaul to have mounted a ladder and manipulated the dome of the Pantheon. Still, in that famous work of his, Lavater not only treats of the various faces of men, but also attentively studies the faces of horses, birds, serpents, and fish, and dwells in detail upon the modifications of expression discernible therein. Nor have Gall and his disciple Spurzheim failed to throw out some hints touching the phrenological characteristics of other beings than man. Therefore, though I am but ill-qualified for a pioneer in the application of these two semi-sciences to the whale, I will do my endeavor. I try all things. I achieve what I can. Physiognomically regarded, the sperm whale is an anomalous creature. He has no proper nose, and since the nose is the central and most conspicuous of the features, and since it perhaps most modifies and finally controls their combined expression, hence it would seem that its entire absence, as an external appendage, must very largely affect the countenance of the whale. For, as in landscape gardening, a spire, cupola, monument, or tower of some sort is deemed almost indispensable to the completion of the scene, so no face can be physiognomically in keeping without the elevated open-work belfry of the nose. Dash the nose from Phidias's marble jove, and what a sorry remainder! Nevertheless, Leviathan is of so mighty a magnitude, all his proportions are so stately, that the same deficiency which in the sculptured Jove were hideous, in him is no blemish at all, nay, it is an added grandeur. A nose to the whale would have been impertinent. As on your physiognomical voyage you sail round his vast head in your jolly boat, your noble conceptions of him are never insulted by the reflection that he has a nose to be pulled. A pestilent conceit which so often will insist upon obtruding even when beholding the mightiest royal beetle on his throne. In some particulars, perhaps the most imposing physiognomical view to be had of the sperm whale is that of the full front of his head. This aspect is sublime. In thought, a fine human brow is like the east when troubled with the morning. In the repose of the pasture, the curled brow of the bull has a touch of the grand in it. Pushing heavy cannon up mountain defiles, the elephant's brow is majestic. Human or animal, the mystical brow is as that great golden seal affixed by the German emperors to their decrees. It signifies, God, done this day by my hand. But in most creatures, nay, in man himself, very often the brow is but a mere strip of alpine land lying along the snow line. Few are the foreheads which, like Shakespeare's or Melanchthon's, rise so high and descend so low that the eyes themselves seem clear, eternal, tideless mountain lakes, and all above them in the forehead's wrinkles you seem to track the antlered thoughts descending there to drink, as the highland hunters track the snow prints of the deer. But in the great sperm whale, this high and mighty, godlike dignity inherent in the brow is so immensely amplified that gazing on it, in that full front view, you feel the deity and the dread powers more forcibly than in beholding any other object of living nature. For you see no one point precisely, not one distinct feature is revealed, no nose, eyes, ears, or mouth, no face, he has none proper, nothing but that one broad firmament of a forehead, pleated with riddles, dumbly lowering with the doom of boats and ships and men. Nor, in profile, does this wondrous brow diminish, though that way viewed its grandeur does not domineer upon you so. 
In profile, you plainly perceive that horizontal, semi-crescentic depression in the forehead's middle, which in man is Lavater's mark of genius. But how? Genius in the sperm whale? Has the sperm whale ever written a book, spoken a speech? No, his great genius is declared in his doing nothing particular to prove it. It is, moreover, declared in his pyramidical silence. And this reminds me that had the great sperm whale been known to the young Orient world, he would have been deified by their child Magian thoughts. They deified the crocodile of the Nile because the crocodile is tongueless, and the sperm whale has no tongue, or at least it is so exceedingly small as to be incapable of protrusion. If hereafter any highly cultured, poetical nation shall lure back to their birthright the merry May-day gods of old, and livingly enthrone them again in the now egotistical sky, in the now unhaunted hill, then be sure, exalted to Jove's high seat, the great sperm whale shall lord it. Champollion deciphered the wrinkled granite hieroglyphics. But there is no Champollion to decipher the Egypt of every man's and every being's face. Physiognomy, like every other human science, is but a passing fable. If, then, Sir William Jones, who read in thirty languages, could not read the simplest peasant's face in its profounder and more subtle meanings, how may unlettered Ishmael hope to read the awful caldi of the sperm whale's brow? I but put that brow before you. Read it, if you can. Chapter 80 The Nut If the sperm whale be physiognomically a sphinx, to the phrenologist his brain seems that geometrical circle which it is impossible to square. In the full-grown creature the skull will measure at least twenty feet in length, Unhinge the lower jaw, and the side view of this skull is as the side of a moderately inclined plane resting throughout on a level base. But in life, as we have elsewhere seen, this inclined plane is angularly filled up, and almost squared by the enormous superincumbent mass of the junk and sperm. At the high end of the skull forms a crater to bed that part of the mass, while under the long floor of this crater, in another cavity seldom exceeding ten inches in length, and as many in depth, reposes the mere handful of this monster's brain. The brain is at least twenty feet from his apparent forehead in life. It is hidden away behind its vast outworks, like the innermost citadel within the amplified fortifications of Quebec. So like a choice casket is it secreted in him, that I have known some whalemen who peremptorily deny that the sperm whale has any other brain than that palpable semblance of one formed by the cubic yards of his sperm magazine. Lying in strange folds, courses, and convolutions, to their apprehensions, it seems more in keeping with the idea of his general might to regard that mystic part of him as the seat of his intelligence. It is plain, then, that, phrenologically, the head of this leviathan, in the creature's living, intact state, is an entire delusion. As for his true brain, you can see no indications of it, nor feel any. The whale, like all things that are mighty, wears a false brow to the common world. If you unload his skull of its spermy heaps, and then take a rear view of its rear end, which is the high end, you will be struck by its resemblance to the human skull, beheld in the same situation and from the same point of view. Indeed, place this reversed skull, scaled down to the human magnitude, among a plate of men's skulls, and you would involuntarily confound it with them, and remarking the depressions on one part of its summit, in phrenological phrase you would say, this man had no self-esteem and no veneration and by those negations, considered along with the affirmative fact of his prodigious bulk and power, you can best form to yourself the truest, though not the most exhilarating conception, of what the most exalted potency is. But if, from the comparative dimensions of the whale's proper brain, you deem it incapable of being adequately charted, then I have another idea for you. 
If you attentively regard almost any quadruped spine, you will be struck by the resemblance of its vertebrae to a strung necklace of dwarfed skulls, all bearing rudimental resemblance to the skull proper. It is a German conceit that the vertebrae are absolutely undeveloped skulls. But the curious external resemblance, I take it the Germans were not the first men to perceive. A foreign friend once pointed it out to me, in the skeleton of a foe he had slain, and with the vertebrae of which he was inlaying, in a sort of basso relievo, the beaked prow of his canoe. Now, I consider that the phrenologists have omitted an important thing in not pushing their investigations from the cerebellum through the spinal canal, for I believe that much of a man's character will be found betokened in his backbone. I would rather feel your spine than your skull, whoever you are. A thin joist of a spine never yet upheld a full and noble soul. I rejoice in my spine, as in the firm, audacious staff of that flag which I fling half out to the world. Apply this spinal branch of phrenology to the sperm whale. His cranial cavity is continuous with the first neck vertebra, and in that vertebra the bottom of the spinal canal will measure ten inches across, being eight in height, and of a triangular figure with the base downwards. As it passes through the remaining vertebrae, the canal tapers in size, but for a considerable distance remains of large capacity. Now, of course, this canal is filled with much the same strangely fibrous substance, the spinal cord, as the brain, and directly communicates with the brain. And what is still more, for many feet after emerging from the brain's cavity, the spinal cord remains of an undecreasing girth, almost equal to that of the brain. Under all these circumstances, would it be unreasonable to survey and map out the whale's spine phrenologically? For viewed in this light, the wonderful comparative smallness of his brain proper is more than compensated by the wonderful comparative magnitude of his spinal cord. But leaving this hint to operate as it may with the phrenologist, I would merely assume the spinal theory for a moment, in reference to the sperm whale's hump. This august hump, if I mistake not, rises over one of the larger vertebrae, and is therefore in some sort the outer convex mold of it. From its relative situation, then, I should call this high hump the organ of firmness or indomitableness in the sperm whale, and that the great monster is indomitable, you will yet have reason to know. End of chapter 78 to 80《Moby Dick》Chapters 81 to 82 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills.《Moby Dick》by Herman Melville Chapters 81 and 82 Chapter 81 the Pequod Meets the Virgin The predestinated day arrived, and we duly met the ship Jungfrau, Derek Dider, master of Bremen. At one time the greatest whaling people in the world, the Dutch and Germans are now among the least, but here and there at very wide intervals of latitude and longitude you still occasionally meet with their flag in the Pacific. For some reason, the Jungfrau seemed quite eager to pay her respects, while yet some distance from the Pequod she rounded to, and dropping a boat, her captain was impelled toward us, impatiently standing in the bows instead of the stern. "'What has he in his hand there?' cried Starbuck, pointing to something wavingly held by the German. "'Impossible! A lamp-feeder!' "'Not that,' said Stubb. "'No, no!' "'It's a coffee-pot, Mr. Starbuck. "'He's coming off to make us our coffee, is the Yarman. "'Don't you see that big tin can of there alongside of him? "'That's his boiling water. "'Oh, he's all right, is the Yarman. "'Get along with you,' cried Flask. "'It's a lamp-feeder and an oil-can. "'He's out of oil and has come a-begging.' 
However curious it may seem for an oil ship to be borrowing oil on the whale ground, and however much it may inadvertently contradict the old proverb about carrying coals to Newcastle, yet sometimes such a thing really happens, and in the present case Captain Derek de Dare did indubitably conduct a lamp-feeder, as Flask did declare. As he mounted the deck, Ahab abruptly accosted him, without at all heeding what he had in his hand, but in his broken lingo the German soon evinced his complete ignorance of the white whale, immediately turning the conversation to his lamp-feeder and oil-can, with some remarks touching his having to turn into his hammock at night in profound darkness, his last drop of Bremen oil being gone, and not a single flying fish yet captured to supply the deficiency, concluding by hinting that his ship was indeed what in the fishery is technically called a clean one, that is, an empty one, well deserving the name of Jungfrau, or the Virgin. His necessities supplied, Derek departed, but he had not gained his ship's side when whales were almost simultaneously raised from the mastheads of both vessels, and so eager for the chase was Derek, that without pausing to put his oil-can and lamp-feeder aboard, he slewed round his boat, and made after the leviathan lamp-feeders. Now, the game having risen to the leeward, he and the other three German boats that soon followed him, had considerably the start of the Pequod's keels. There were eight whales, an average pod, Aware of their danger, they were going all abreast with great speed straight before the wind, rubbing their flanks as closely as so many spans of horses in harness. They left a great wide wake, as though continually unrolling a great wide parchment upon the sea. Full in this rapid wake, and many fathoms in the rear, swam a huge humped old bull, which, by his comparatively slow progress, as well as by the unusual yellowish incrustations overgrowing him, seemed afflicted with the jaundice, or some other infirmity. Whether this whale belonged to the pod in advance seemed questionable, for it is not customary for such venerable leviathans to be at all social. Nevertheless, he stuck to their wake, though indeed their backwater must have retarded him, because the white bone or swell at his broad muzzle was a dashed one, like the swell formed when two hostile currents meet. His spout was short, slow, and laborious, coming forth with a choking sort of gush, and spending itself in torn shreds, followed by strange subterranean commotions in him, which seemed to have egress at his other buried extremity, causing the waters behind him to up-bubble. "'Who's got some paragoric?' said Stubb. "'He has the stomach-ache, I'm afraid. Lord, think of having half an acre of stomach-ache. Adverse winds are holding mad Christmas in him, boys. It's the first foul wind I ever knew to blow from astern. But look, did ever whale yaw so before?' It must be he's lost his tiller. As an overladen Indiaman, bearing down the Hindustan coast with a deck-load of frightened horses, careens, berries, rolls, and wallows on her way, so did this old whale heave his aged bulk, and now and then, partly turning over on his cumbrous rib-ends, expose the cause of his devious wake in the unnatural stump of his starboard fin. Whether he had lost that fin in battle, or had been born without it, it were hard to say. "'Only wait a bit, old chap, and I'll give you a sling for that wounded arm,' cried Cruel Flask, pointing to the whale-line near him. "'Mind he don't sling thee with it,' cried Starbuck. "'Give way, or the German will have him.' With one intent, all the combined rival boats were pointed for this one fish— because not only was he the largest and therefore the most valuable whale, but he was nearest to them, and the other whales were going with such great velocity, moreover, as almost to defy pursuit for the time. At this juncture the Pequod's keels had shot by the three German boats last lowered, but from the great start he had had, Derrick's boat still led the chase, though every moment neared by his foreign rivals. The only thing they feared was that, from being already so nigh to his mark, he would be enabled to dart his iron before they could completely overtake and pass him, 
As for Derek, he seemed quite confident that this would be the case, and occasionally, with a deriding gesture, shook his lamp-feeder at the other boats. "'The ungracious and ungrateful dog!' cried Starbuck. "'He mocks and dares me with the very poor box I filled for him not five minutes ago!' Then, in his old intense whisper, "'Give way, greyhounds! Dog to it!' "'I tell you what it is, men,' cried Stubb to his crew. "'It's against my religion to get mad, but I'd like to eat that villainous yarman. Pull, won't you? Are you going to let that rascal beat you? Do you love brandy? A hogshead of brandy, then, to the best man. Come, why don't some of you burst a blood vessel? Who's that been dropping an anchor overboard? We don't budge an inch. We're becalmed. Halloo, here's grass growing in the boat's bottom.' "'And by the Lord, the mast there, budding. "'This won't do, boys. "'Look at that yarman. "'The short and long of it is, men. "'Will you spit fire or not?' "'Oh, see the suds he makes!' cried Flask, dancing up and down. "'What a hump! "'Oh, do pile on the beef! "'Lays like a log! "'Oh, my lads, do spring! "'Slapjacks and quahogs for supper, you know, my lads. "'Baked clams and muffins. "'Oh, do, do spring!' He's a hundred-barreler. Don't lose him now. Oh, don't, don't. See that yarman. Oh, won't you pull for your duff, my lads. Such a sog, such a sogger. Don't you love sperm? There goes three thousand dollars, men. A bank, a whole bank, the Bank of England. Oh, do, do, do. What's that yarman about now? At this moment Derrick was in the act of pitching his lamp-feeder at the advancing boats, and also his oil-can, perhaps with the double view of retarding his rival's way, and at the same time economically accelerating his own by the momentary impetus of the backward toss. "'The unmannerly Dutch dogger!' cried Stubb. "'Pull now, men! Like fifty thousand line of battleship loads of red-haired devils! What do you say, Tashtego?' Are you the man to snap your spine in two and twenty pieces for the honor of old Gayhead? What do you say? I say, pull like goddamn, cried the Indian. Fiercely, but evenly incited by the taunts of the German, the Pequod's three boats now began ranging almost abreast, and so disposed, momentarily neared him. In that fine, loose, chivalrous attitude of the headsman, when drawing near to his prey, the three mates stood up proudly, occasionally backing the after oarsman with an exhilarating cry of, "'There she slides now! Hurrah for the white ash breeze! Down with the yarman! Sail over him!' But so decided an original start had Derrick had, that spite of all their gallantry he would have proved the victor in this race, had not a righteous judgment descended upon him in a crab which caught the blade of his midship oarsman. While this clumsy lubber was striving to free his white ash, and while, in consequence, Derrick's boat was nigh to capsizing, and he thundering away at his men in a mighty rage, that was a good time for Starbuck, Stubb, and Flask. With a shout, they took a mortal start forward, and slantingly ranged up on the German's quarter. An instant more, and all four boats were diagonally in the whale's immediate wake, while stretching from them on both sides was the foaming swell that he made. It was a terrific, most pitiable, and maddening sight. The whale was now going head out, and sending his spout before him in a continual tormented jet, while his one poor fin beat his side in an agony of fright. Now to this hand, now to that, he yawed in his faltering flight, and still at every billow that he broke he spasmodically sank in the sea, or sideways rolled towards the sky his one beating fin. So have I seen a bird with clipped wing making affrighted broken circles in the air, vainly striving to escape the piratical hawks. But the bird has a voice, and with plaintive cries will make known her fear. But the fear of this vast dumb brood of the sea was chained up and enchanted in him. He had no voice, save that choking respiration through his spiracle, and this made the sight of him unspeakably pitiable, while still, in his amazing bulk, portcullis jaw, and omnipotent tail, there was enough to appall the stoutest man who so pitied. 
seeing now that but a very few moments more would give the Pequod's boats the advantage, and rather than be thus foiled of his game, Derrick chose to hazard what to him must have seemed a most unusually long dart, ere the last chance would forever escape. But no sooner did his harpooner stand up for the stroke than all three tigers, Queequeg, Tashtego, and Dagoo, instinctively sprang to their feet, and standing in a diagonal row, simultaneously pointed their barbs, and darted over the head of the German harpooner their three Nantucket irons entered the whale. Blinding vapors of foam and white fire, the three boats, in the first fury of the whale's headlong rush, bumped the Germans aside with such force that both Derrick and his baffled harpooner were spilled out and sailed over by the three flying keels. "'Don't be afraid, my butter-boxes!' cried Stubb, casting a passing glance upon them as he shot by. "'You'll be picked up presently. All right. I saw some sharks astern, St. Bernard's dogs, you know, relieve distressed travellers.' Hurrah! This is the way to sail now, every keel a sunbeam. Hurrah! Here we go like three tin kettles at the tail of a mad cougar. This puts me in mind of fastening to an elephant in a tilbury on a plain. Makes the wheel spokes fly, boys, when you fasten to him that way. And there's danger of being pitched out, too, when you strike a hill. Hurrah! This is the way a fellow feels when he's going to Davy Jones. All a rush down an endless inclined plain. Hurrah! This whale carries the everlasting mail. But the monster's run was a brief one. Giving a sudden gasp, he tumultuously sounded. With a grating rush, the three lines flew round the loggerheads with such force as to gouge deep grooves in them, while so fearful were the harpooners that this rapid sounding would soon exhaust the lines that, using all their dexterous might, they caught repeated smoking turns with the rope to hold on, till at last, owing to the perpendicular strain from the lead-lined chocks of the boats, whence the three ropes went straight down into the blue, the gunwales of the bows were almost even with the water, while the three sterns were tilted high in the air. And the whale soon ceasing to sound, for some time they remained in that attitude, fearful of expending more line, though the position was a little ticklish, but though boats have been taken down and lost in this way, yet it is this holding on, as it is called, this hooking up by the sharp barbs of his live flesh from the back, this it is that often torments the leviathan into soon rising again to meet the sharp lance of his foes. Yet not to speak of the peril of the thing, it is to be doubted whether this course is always the best, for it is but reasonable to presume that the longer the stricken whale stays under water, the more he is exhausted, because, owing to the enormous surface of him, in a full-grown sperm whale something less than two thousand square feet, the pressure of the water is immense. We all know what an astonishing atmospheric weight we ourselves stand up under, even here above ground in the air. How vast, then, the burden of a whale, bearing on his back a column of two hundred fathoms of ocean! it must at least equal the weight of fifty atmospheres. One whaleman has estimated it at the weight of twenty line of battleships, with all their guns and stores and men on board. As the three boats lay there on that gently rolling sea, gazing down into its eternal blue noon, and as not a single groan or cry of any sort, nay, not so much as a ripple or a bubble, came up from its depths, what landsman would have thought that beneath all that silence and placidity the utmost monster of the seas was writhing and wrenching in agony? Not eight inches of perpendicular rope were visible at the bows. Seems it credible that by three such thin threads the great leviathan was suspended like the big weight to an eight-day clock? Suspended? And to what? To three bits of board! Is this the creature of whom it was once so triumphantly said, Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons, or his head with fish-spears? The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold, the spear, the dart, nor the habergeon, he esteemeth iron as straw, the arrow cannot make him flee, darts are counted as stubble, he laugheth at the shaking of a spear. This the creature, this he? Oh, that unfulfillment should follow the prophets! 
for with the strength of a thousand thighs in his tail, Leviathan had run his head under the mountains of the sea to hide him from the Pequod's fish spears. In that sloping afternoon sunlight, the shadows that the three boats sent down beneath the surface must have been long enough and broad enough to shade half Xerxes' army. Who can tell how appalling to the wounded whale must have been such huge phantoms flitting over his head? "'Stand by, men! He stirs!' cried Starbuck, as the three lines suddenly vibrated in the water, distinctly conducting upwards to them, as by magnetic wires, the life and death throbs of the whale, so that every oarsman felt them in his seat. The next moment, relieved in great part from the downward strain at the bows, the boats gave a sudden bounce upward, as a small ice-field will, when a dense herd of white bears are scared from it into the sea. "'Haul in! Haul in!' cried Starbuck again. "'He's rising!' The lines, of which hardly an instant before not one hand's breadth could have been gained, were now in long, quick coils flung back, all dripping into the boats, and soon the whale broke water within two ships' lengths of the hunters. His motions plainly denoted his extreme exhaustion. In most land animals there are certain valves or floodgates in many of their veins, whereby, when wounded, the blood is, in some degree at least, instantly shut off in certain directions. Not so with the whale, one of whose peculiarities it is to have an entire non-valvular structure of the blood vessels, so that when pierced even by so small a point as a harpoon, a deadly drain is at once begun upon his whole arterial system, and when this is heightened by the extraordinary pressure of water at a great distance below the surface, his life may be said to pour from him in incessant streams. Yet so vast is the quantity of blood in him, and so distant and numerous its interior fountains, that he will keep thus bleeding and bleeding for a considerable period, even as in a drought a river will flow, whose source is in the wellsprings of far-off and undiscernible hills, even now, when the boats pulled upon the whale, and perilously drew over his swaying flukes, and the lances were darted into him, they were followed by steady jets from the new-made wound, which kept continually playing, while the natural spout-hole in his head was only at intervals, however rapid, sending its affrighted moisture into the air. From this last vent no blood yet came, because no vital part of him had thus far been struck. His life, as they significantly call it, was untouched. As the boats now more closely surrounded him, the whole upper part of his form, with much of it that is ordinarily submerged, was plainly revealed. His eyes, or rather the places where his eyes had been, were beheld. As strange, misgrown masses gather in the knot-holes of the noblest oaks when prostrate, so from the points which the whale's eyes had once occupied now protruded blind bulbs, horribly pitiable to see. But pity there was none, for all his old age, and his one arm, and his blind eyes, he must die the death and be murdered in order to light the gay bridles and other merry-makings of men, and also to illuminate the solemn churches that preach unconditional inoffensiveness by all to all. Still rolling in his blood, at last he partially disclosed a strangely discolored bunch or protuberance the size of a bushel, low down on the flank. "'A nice spot!' cried Flask. "'Just let me prick him there once!' "'Avast!' cried Starbuck. "'There's no need of that!' But humane Starbuck was too late. At the instant of the dart, an ulcerous jet shot from this cruel wound, and goaded by it into more than sufferable anguish, the whale, now spouting thick blood with swift fury, blindly darted at the craft, bespattering them and their glorying crews all over with showers of gore, capsizing Flask's boat, and marring the bows. It was his death-stroke. For by this time, so spent was he by loss of blood, that he helplessly rolled away from the wreck he had made, lay panting on his side, impotently flapped with his stumped fin, then over and over slowly revolved like a waning world, turned up the white secrets of his belly, lay like a log, and died. 
it was most piteous that last expiring spout as when by unseen hands the water is gradually drawn off from some mighty fountain and with half-stifled melancholy gurglings the spray column lowers and lowers to the ground so the last long dying spout of the whale soon while the crews were awaiting the arrival of the ship the body showed symptoms of sinking with all its treasures unrifled immediately by starbuck's orders lines were secured to it at different points so that ere long every boat was a boy the sunken whale being suspended a few inches beneath them by the cords by very heedful management when the ship drew nigh the whale was transferred to her side and was strongly secured there by the stiffest fluke chains for it was plain that unless artificially upheld the body would at once sink to the bottom it so chanced that almost upon first cutting into him with the spade the entire length of a corroded harpoon was found embedded in his flesh on the lower part of the bunch before described but as the stumps of harpoons are frequently found in the dead bodies of captured whales with the flesh perfectly healed around them and no prominence of any kind to denote their place therefore there must needs have been some other unknown reason in the present case fully to account for the ulceration alluded to but still more curious was the fact of a lance head of stone being found in him not far from the buried iron the flesh perfectly firm about it who had darted that stone lance and when it might have been darted by some norwest indian long before america was discovered what other marvels might have been rummaged out of this monstrous cabinet there is no telling but a sudden stop was put to further discoveries by the ships being unprecedentedly dragged over sideways to the sea owing to the body's immensely increasing tendency to sink however starbuck who had the ordering of affairs hung on to it to the last hung on to it so resolutely indeed that when at length the ship would have been capsized if still persisting in locking arms with the body then when the command was given to break clear from it such was the immovable strain upon the timber heads to which the fluke chains and cables were fastened that it was impossible to cast them off meantime everything in the pequod was a slant to cross to the other side of the deck was like walking up the steep gabled roof of a house the ship groaned and gasped many of the ivory inlayings of her bulwarks and cabins were started from their places by the unnatural dislocation in vain handspikes and crows were brought to bear upon the immovable fluke chains to pry them adrift from the timber heads and so low had the whale now settled that the submerged ends could not be at all approached while every moment whole tons of ponderosity seemed added to the sinking bulk and the ship seemed on the point of going over hold on hold on won't ye cried stubb to the body don't be in such a devil of a hurry to sink by thunder men we must do something or go for it no use prying there avast i say with your handspikes and run one of ye for a prayer book and a penknife and cut the big chains knife ay ay cried queequeg and seizing the carpenter's heavy hatchet he leaned out of a porthole and steel to iron began slashing at the largest fluke chains but a few strokes full of sparks were given when the exceeding strain effected the rest with a terrific snap every fastening went adrift the ship righted the carcass sank now this occasional inevitable sinking of the recently killed sperm whale is a very curious thing nor has any fisherman yet adequately accounted for it usually the dead sperm whale floats with great buoyancy with its side or belly considerably elevated above the surface if the only whales that thus sank were old meager and broken-hearted creatures their pads of lard diminished and all their bones heavy and rheumatic then you might with some reason assert that this sinking is caused by an uncommon specific gravity in the fish so sinking consequent upon this absence of buoyant matter in him but it is not so for young whales in the highest health and swelling with noble aspirations prematurely cut off in the warm flush and may of life with all their panting lard about them even these brawny buoyant heroes do sometimes sink 
Be it said, however, that the sperm whale is far less liable to this accident than any other species. Where one of that sort go down, twenty right whales do. This difference in the species is no doubt imputable in no small degree to the greater quantity of bone in the right whale, his Venetian blinds alone sometimes weighing more than a ton. From this encumbrance the sperm whale is wholly free. But there are instances where, after the lapse of many hours or several days, the sunken whale again rises, more buoyant than in life. But the reasons of this are obvious. Gases are generated in him. He swells to a prodigious magnitude, becomes a sort of animal balloon. A line of battleship could hardly keep him under then. In the shore whaling, on soundings among the bays of New Zealand, when a right whale gives token of sinking, they fasten buoys to him, with plenty of rope, so that, when the body has gone down, they know where to look for it when it shall have ascended again. It was not long after the sinking of the body that a cry was heard from the Pequod's mastheads, announcing that the Jungfrau was again lowering her boats, though the only spout in sight was that of a finback, belonging to the species of uncapturable whales, because of its incredible power of swimming. Nevertheless, the finback spout is so similar to the sperm whales that by unskillful fishermen it is often mistaken for it. And consequently Derek and all his host were now in valiant chase of this unnearable brute. The virgin crowding all sail made after her four young keels, and thus they all disappeared far to leeward, still in bold, hopeful chase. Oh, many are the Finbacks, and many are the Derricks, my friend. Chapter 82 The Honor and Glory of Whaling There are some enterprises in which a careful disorderliness is the true method. The more I dive into this matter of whaling, and push my researches up to the very springhead of it, so much the more am I impressed with its great honorableness and antiquity, and especially when I find so many great demigods and heroes, prophets of all sort, who one way or other have shed distinction upon it, I am transported with the reflection that I myself belong, though but subordinately, to so emblazoned a fraternity." The gallant Persis, son of Jupiter, was the first whaleman, and to the eternal honor of our calling be it said that the first whale attacked by our brotherhood was not killed with any sordid intent. Those were the nightly days of our profession, when we only bore arms to succor the distressed, not to fill men's lamp-feeders. Everyone knows the fine story of Persis and Andromeda how the lovely Andromeda, the daughter of a king, was tied to a rock on the sea-coast, and as Leviathan was in the very act of carrying her off, Persis, the prince of whalemen, intrepidly advancing, harpooned the monster, and delivered and married the maid. It was an admirable artistic exploit, rarely achieved by the best harpooners of the present day, inasmuch as this Leviathan was slain at the very first dart, and let no man doubt this archite story, for in the ancient Joppa, now Jaffa, on the Syrian coast, in one of the pagan temples there stood for many ages the vast skeleton of a whale, which the city's legends and all the inhabitants asserted to be the identical bones of the monster that Persis slew. When the Romans took Joppa, the same skeleton was carried to Italy in triumph. What seems most singular and suggestively important in this story is this. It was from Joppa that Jonah set sail. Akin to the adventure of Persis and Andromeda, indeed by some supposed to be indirectly derived from it, is that famous story of St. George and the dragon, which dragon I maintain to have been a whale, for in many old chronicles whales and dragons are strangely jumbled together, and often stand for each other. Thou art as a lion of the waters, and as a dragon of the sea, saith Ezekiel, hereby plainly meaning a whale. In truth, some versions of the Bible use that word itself. Besides, it would much subtract from the glory of the exploit had St. George but encountered a crawling reptile of the land, instead of doing battle with the great monster of the deep. 
any man may kill a snake, but only a Persis, a St. George, a coffin, have the heart in them to march boldly up to a whale. Let not the modern paintings of this scene mislead us, for though the creature encountered by that valiant whaleman of old is vaguely represented of a griffin-like shape, and though the battle is depicted on land and the saint on horseback, yet, considering the great ignorance of those times, when the true form of the whale was unknown to artists, and considering that, as in Persis's case, St. George's whale might have crawled up out of the sea on the beach, and considering that the animal ridden by St. George might have been only a large seal or seahorse, bearing all this in mind, it will not appear altogether incompatible with the sacred legend and the ancientest drafts of the scene to hold this so-called dragon no other than the great Leviathan himself. In fact, placed before the strict and piercing truth, this whole story will fare like that fish, flesh, and foul idol of the Philistines, Dagon by name, who being planted before the Ark of Israel, his horse's head and both the palms of his hands fell off from him, and only the stump or fishy part of him remained. Thus, then, one of our own noble stamp, even a whaleman, is the tutelary guardian of England, and by good rights we harponeers of Nantucket should be enrolled in the most noble order of St. George. And therefore let not the knights of that honorable company, none of whom, I venture to say, have ever had to do with a whale like their great patron, let them never eye a Nantucketer with disdain, since even in our woolen frocks and tarred trousers we are much better entitled to St. George's decoration than they." Whether to admit Hercules among us or not, concerning this I long remained dubious. For though, according to the Greek mythologies, that antique Crockett and Kit Carson, that brawny doer of rejoicing good deeds, was swallowed down and thrown up by a whale, still whether that strictly makes a whaleman of him, that might be mooted. It nowhere appears that he ever actually harpooned his fish, unless indeed from the inside, Nevertheless, he may be deemed a sort of involuntary whaleman. At any rate, the whale caught him if he did not the whale. I claim him for one of our clan. But by the best contradictory authorities, this Grecian story of Hercules and the whale is considered to be derived from the still more ancient Hebrew story of Jonah and the whale, and vice versa. Certainly they are very similar. If I claim the demigod, then... Why not the prophet? Nor do heroes, saints, demigods, and prophets alone comprise the whole role of our order. Our grand master is still to be named, for like royal kings of old times, we find the headwaters of our fraternity in nothing short of the great gods themselves. That wondrous oriental story is now to be rehearsed from the Shaster, which gives us the dread Vishnu, one of the three persons of the godhead of the Hindus, gives us this divine Vishnu himself for our Lord. Vishnu, who, by the first of his ten earthly incarnations, has forever set apart and sanctified the whale. When Brahma, or the god of gods, saith the Shaster, resolved to recreate the world after one of its periodical dissolutions, he gave birth to Vishnu to preside over the work. But the Vedas, or mystical books, whose perusal would seem to have been indispensable to Vishnu before beginning the creation, and which therefore must have contained something in the shape of practical hints to young architects, these Vedas were lying at the bottom of the waters. So Vishnu became incarnate as a whale, and sounding down in him to the uttermost depths, rescued the sacred volumes. Was not this Vishnu a whaleman, then? even as a man who rides a horse, is called a horseman. Persis, St. George, Hercules, Jonah, and Vishnu. There's a member roll for you. What club but the whalemans can head off like that? End of chapters 81 and 82 Moby Dick, 
Chapters 83 to 86. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 83 to 86. Chapter 83. Jonah Historically Regarded. Reference was made to the historical story of Jonah and the Whale in the preceding chapter. Now, some Nantucketers rather distrust this historical story of Jonah and the Whale, but then there were some skeptical Greeks and Romans who, standing out from the orthodox pagans of their times, equally doubted the story of Hercules and the Whale, and Arion and the Dolphin. And yet their doubting those traditions did not make those traditions one whit the less facts for all that. One old Sag Harbor whaleman's chief reason for questioning the Hebrew story was this. He had one of those quaint, old-fashioned Bibles, embellished with curious, unscientific plates, one of which represented Jonah's whale with two spouts in his head a peculiarity only true with respect to a species of the leviathan, the right whale, and varieties of that order, concerning which the fishermen have this saying, a penny roll would choke him, his swallow is so very small. But to this Bishop Jeb's anticipative answer is ready. It is not necessary, hence the bishop, that we consider Jonah as tombed in the whale's belly, but as temporarily lodged in some part of his mouth, and this seems reasonable enough in the good bishop, for truly the right whale's mouth would accommodate a couple of whist tables, and comfortably seat all the players. Possibly, too, Jonah might have ensconced himself in a hollow tooth, but on second thoughts the right whale is toothless. Another reason which Sag Harbor, he went by that name, urged for his want of faith in this matter of the prophet, was something obscurely in reference to his incarcerated body and the whale's gastric juices. But this objection likewise falls to the ground, because a German exegetist supposes that Jonah must have taken refuge in the floating body of a dead whale, even as the French soldiers in the Russian campaign turned their dead horses into tents and crawled into them. Besides, it has been divined by other continental commentators that when Jonah was thrown overboard from the Joppa ship, he straightway effected his escape to another vessel nearby, some vessel with a whale for a figurehead, and, I would add, possibly called the whale, as some craft nowadays are christened the shark, the gull, the eagle. Nor have there been wanting learned exegetists who have opined that the whale mentioned in the book of Jonah merely meant a life preserver, an inflated bag of wind which the endangered prophet swam to, and so was saved from a watery doom. Poor Sag Harbor, therefore, seems worsted all round. But he had still another reason for his want of faith. It was this, if I remember right. Jonah was swallowed by the whale in the Mediterranean Sea, and after three days he was vomited up somewhere within three days' journey of Nineveh, a city on the Tigris, very much more than three days' journey across from the nearest point of the Mediterranean coast. How is that? But was there no other way for the whale to land the prophet within that short distance of Nineveh? Yes, he might have carried him round by the way of the Cape of Good Hope but not to speak of the passage through the whole length of the Mediterranean, and another passage up the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea, such a supposition would involve the complete circumnavigation of all Africa in three days, not to speak of the Tigris waters near the site of Nineveh being too shallow for any whale to swim in. Besides, this idea of Jonah's weathering the Cape of Good Hope at so early a day would wrest the honor of the discovery of that great headland from Bartholomew Diaz, its reputed discoverer, and so make modern history a liar. But all these foolish arguments of old Sag Harbor only evinced his foolish pride of reason, a thing still more reprehensible in him, seeing that he had but little learning except what he had picked up from the sun and the sea. 
I say it only shows his foolish, impious pride, and abominable, devilish rebellion against the reverend clergy. For by a Portuguese Catholic priest, this very idea of Jonah's going to Nineveh, via the Cape of Good Hope, was advanced as a signal magnification of the general miracle. And so it was. Besides, to this day, the highly enlightened Turks devoutly believe in the historical story of Jonah. And some three centuries ago, an English traveller, in old Harris's voyages, speaks of a Turkish mosque built in honour of Jonah, in which mosque was a miraculous lamp that burnt without any oil. Chapter 84 Pitch Poling to make them run easily and swiftly, the axles of carriages are anointed, and for much the same purpose some whalers perform an analogous operation upon their boat. They grease the bottom. Nor is it to be doubted that as such a procedure can do no harm, it may possibly be of no contemptible advantage, considering that oil and water are hostile, that oil is a sliding thing, and that the object in view is to make the boat slide bravely. Queequeg believes strongly in anointing his boat, and one morning, not long after the German ship Jungfrau disappeared, took more than customary pains in that occupation, crawling under its bottom where he hung over the side, and rubbing in the unctuousness as though diligently seeking to ensure a crop of hair from the craft's bald keel. He seemed to be working in obedience to some particular presentiment, nor did it remain unwarranted by the event. Towards noon, whales were raised, but so soon as the ship sailed down to them, they turned and fled with swift precipitancy, a disordered flight as of Cleopatra's barges from Actium. Nevertheless, the boats pursued, and Stubbs was foremost. By great exertion, Tashtego at last succeeded in planting one iron, but the stricken whale, without at all sounding, still continued his horizontal flight, with added fleetness. Such unintermitted strainings upon the planted iron must sooner or later inevitably extract it. It became imperative to lance the flying whale, or be content to lose him. But to haul the boat up to his flank was impossible, he swam so fast and furious. What then remained? Of all the wondrous devices and dexterities, the sleights of hand and countless subtleties to which the veteran whaleman is so often forced, none exceed that fine maneuver with the lance called pitch-poling. Small sword or broadsword, in all its exercises, boasts nothing like it. It is only indispensable with an inveterate running whale. Its grand fact and feature is the wonderful distance to which the long lance is accurately darted from a violently rocking, jerking boat, under extreme headway. Steel and wood included, the entire spear is some ten or twelve feet in length, the staff is much slighter than that of the harpoon, and also of lighter material, pine. It is furnished with a small rope called a warp, of considerable length, by which it can be hauled back to the hand after darting. But before going further, it is important to mention here, that though the harpoon may be pitch-poled in the same way with the lance, yet it is seldom done, and when done it is still less frequently successful, on account of the greater weight and inferior length of the harpoon as compared with the lance, which, in effect, become serious drawbacks. As a general thing, therefore, you must first get fast to a whale before any pitch-poling comes into play. Look now at Stubb, a man who, from his humorous, deliberate coolness and equanimity in the direst emergencies, was specially qualified to excel in pitch-poling. Look at him. He stands upright in the tossed bow of the flying boat, wrapped in fleecy foam. The towing whale is forty feet ahead. Handling the long lance, lightly, glancing twice or thrice along its length to see if it be exactly straight, Stubb whistlingly gathers up the coil of the warp in one hand, so as to secure its free end in his grasp, leaving the rest unobstructed. 
then holding the lance full before his waistband's middle he levels it at the whale when covering him with it he steadily depresses the butt end in his hand thereby elevating the point till the weapon stands fairly balanced upon his palm fifteen feet in the air he minds you somewhat of a juggler balancing a long staff on his chin next moment with a rapid nameless impulse in a superb lofty arch the bright steel spans the foaming distance and quivers in the life spot of the whale instead of sparkling water he now spouts red blood that drove the spigot out of him cried stubb tis july's immortal fourth all fountains must run wine to-day would now it were old new orleans whiskey or old ohio or unspeakable old monongahela then tashtego lad i'd have ye hold a canakin to the jet and we'd drink round of it yea verily hearts alive we'd brew choice punch in the spread of his spout hole there from that live punch bowl quaff the living stuff again and again to such gamesome talk the dexterous dart is repeated the spear returning to its master like a greyhound held in skilful leash the agonized whale goes into his flurry the tow-line is slackened and the pitch-poler dropping astern folds his hands and mutely watches the monster die chapter eighty five the fountain that for six thousand years and no one knows how many millions of ages before the great whale should have been spouting all over the sea and sprinkling and mystifying the gardens of the deep as with so many sprinkling or mystifying pots and that for some centuries back thousands of hunters should have been close by the fountain of the whale watching these sprinklings and spoutings that all this should be and yet that down to this blessed minute fifteen and a quarter minutes past one o'clock p m of this sixteenth day of december a d eighteen fifty one it should still remain a problem whether these spoutings are after all really water or nothing but vapour this is surely a noteworthy thing let us then look at this matter along with some interesting items contingent Everyone knows that by the peculiar cunning of their gills, the finny tribes in general breathe the air which at all times is combined with the element in which they swim. Hence a herring or cod might live a century, and never once raise its head above the surface. But owing to his marked internal structure which gives him regular lungs, like a human being's, the whale can only live by inhaling the disengaged air in the open atmosphere wherefore the necessity for his periodical visits to the upper world but he cannot in any degree breathe through his mouth for in his ordinary attitude the sperm whale's mouth is buried at least eight feet beneath the surface and what is still more his windpipe has no connection with his mouth no he breathes through his spiracle alone and this is on the top of his head if i say that in any creature breathing is only a function indispensable to vitality inasmuch as it withdraws from the air a certain element which being subsequently brought into contact with the blood imparts to the blood its vivifying principle i do not think i shall err though i may possibly use some superfluous scientific words assume it and it follows that if all the blood in a man could be aerated in one breath he might then seal up his nostrils and not fetch another for a considerable time that is to say he would then live without breathing anomalous as it may seem this is precisely the case with the whale who systematically lives by intervals his full hour and more when at the bottom without drawing a single breath or so much as in any way inhaling a particle of air for remember he has no gills how is this between his ribs and on each side of his spine he is supplied with a remarkable involved cretan labyrinth of vermicelli like vessels which vessels when he quits the surface are completely distended with oxygenated blood so that for an hour or more a thousand fathoms in the sea he carries a surplus stock of vitality in him 
just as the camel crossing the waterless desert carries a surplus supply of drink for future use in its four supplementary stomachs. The anatomical fact of this labyrinth is indisputable, and that the supposition founded upon it is reasonable and true seems the more cogent to me when I consider the otherwise inexplicable obstinacy of that leviathan in having his spoutings out, as the fishermen phrase it. This is what I mean. If unmolested upon rising to the surface, the sperm whale will continue there for a period of time exactly uniform with all his other unmolested risings. Say he stays eleven minutes and jets seventy times, that is, respires seventy breaths, then whenever he rises again, he will be sure to have his seventy breaths all over again to a minute. Now if, after he fetches a few breaths, you alarm him, so that he sounds, he will be always dodging up again to make good his regular allowance of air, and not till those seventy breaths are told will he finally go down to stay out his full term below. Remark, however, that in different individuals these rates are different, but in any one they are alike. Now why should the whale thus insist upon having his spoutings out, unless it be to replenish his reservoir of air ere descending for good? How obvious is it, too, that this necessity for the whale's rising exposes him to all the fatal hazards of the chase. For not by hook or by net could this vast leviathan be caught when sailing a thousand fathoms beneath the sunlight. Not so much thy skill, then, O hunter, as the great necessities that strike the victory to thee. In man breathing is incessantly going on, one breath only serving for two or three pulsations, so that whatever other business he has to attend to, waking or sleeping, breathe he must, or die he will. But the sperm whale only breathes about one-seventh or Sunday of his time. It has been said that the whale only breathes through his spout hole. If it could truthfully be added that his spouts are mixed with water, then I opine we should be furnished with the reason why his sense of smell seems obliterated in him, for the only thing about him that at all answers to his nose is that identical spout hole, and being so clogged with two elements, it could not be expected to have the power of smelling. But owing to the mystery of the spout, whether it be water or whether it be vapor, no absolute certainty can as yet be arrived at on this head. Sure it is, nevertheless, that the sperm whale has no proper olfactories. But what does he want of them? No roses, no violets, no cologne water in the sea. Furthermore, as his windpipe solely opens into the tube of his spouting canal, and as that long canal, like the Grand Erie Canal, is furnished with a sort of locks that open and shut for the downward retention of air or the upward exclusion of water, therefore the whale has no voice, unless you insult him by saying that when he so strangely rumbles he talks through his nose. But then again, what has the whale to say? Seldom have I known any profound being that had anything to say to this world, unless forced to stammer out something by way of getting a living. Oh, happy that the world is such an excellent listener. Now the spouting canal of the sperm whale, chiefly intended as it is for the conveyance of air, and for several feet laid along horizontally just beneath the upper surface of his head, and a little to one side, this curious canal is very much like a gas pipe, laid down in a city on one side of a street. But the question returns whether this gas pipe is also a water pipe. In other words, whether the spout of the sperm whale is the mere vapor of the exhaled breath, or whether that exhaled breath is mixed with water taken in at the mouth and discharged through the spiracle. It is certain that the mouth indirectly communicates with the spouting canal, but it cannot be proved that this is for the purpose of discharging water through the spiracle, because the greatest necessity for so doing would seem to be when in feeding he accidentally takes in water. But the sperm whale's food is far beneath the surface, and there he cannot spout even if he would. Besides, if you regard him very closely, and time him with your watch, you will find that when unmolested, 
there is an undeviating rhyme between the periods of his jets and the ordinary periods of respiration. But why pester one with all this reasoning on the subject? Speak out! You have seen him spout. Then declare what the spout is. Can you not tell water from air? My dear sir, in this world it is not so easy to settle these plain things. I have ever found your plain things the naughtiest of all, and as for this whale-spout, you might almost stand in it and yet be undecided as to what it is precisely. The central body of it is hidden in the snowy, sparkling mist enveloping it, and how can you certainly tell whether any water falls from it, when always, when you are close enough to a whale to get a close view of his spout, he is in a prodigious commotion, the water cascading all around him. And if at such times you should think that you really perceive drops of moisture in the spout, how do you know that they are not merely condensed from its vapor? Or how do you know that they are not those identical drops superficially lodged in the spout-hole fissure, which is countersunk into the summit of the whale's head? For even when tranquilly swimming through the midday sea in a calm, with his elevated hump sun-dried as a dromedary's in the desert, even then the whale always carries a small basin of water on his head, as under a blazing sun you will sometimes see a cavity in a rock filled up with rain. Nor is it at all prudent for the hunter to be over-curious touching the precise nature of the whale spout. It will not do for him to be peering into it and putting his face in it, you cannot go with your pitcher to this fountain and fill it and bring it away. For even when coming into slight contact with the outer vapory shreds of the jet, which will often happen, your skin will feverishly smart from the acridness of the thing so touching it. And I know one who, coming into still closer contact with the spout, whether with some scientific object in view or otherwise, I cannot say, the skin peeled off from his cheek and arm, Wherefore, among whalemen, the spout is deemed poisonous. They try to evade it. Another thing, I have heard it said, and I do not much doubt it, that if the jet is fairly spouted into your eyes, it will blind you. The wisest thing the investigator can do, then, it seems to me, is to let this deadly spout alone. Still, we can hypothesize, even if we cannot prove and establish. My hypothesis is this that the spout is nothing but mist. And besides other reasons, to this conclusion I am impelled by considerations touching the great inherent dignity and sublimity of the sperm whale. I account him no common, shallow being, inasmuch as it is an undisputed fact that he is never found on soundings or near shores. All other whales sometimes are. He is both ponderous and profound, and I am convinced that from the heads of all ponderous, profound beings, such as Plato, Pyrrho, the Devil, Jupiter, Dante, and so on, there always goes up a certain semi-visible steam, while in the act of thinking deep thoughts. While composing a little treatise on eternity, I had the curiosity to place a mirror before me, and ere long saw reflected there a curious, involved worming and undulation in the atmosphere over my head, the invariable moisture of my hair, while plunged in deep thought, after six cups of hot tea in my thin shingled attic of an August noon, this seems an additional argument for the above supposition. And how nobly it raises our conceit of the mighty, misty monster, to behold him solemnly sailing through a calm tropical sea, his vast, mild head overhung by a canopy of vapor, engendered by his incommunicable contemplations, and that vapor, as you will sometimes see it, glorified by a rainbow, as if heaven itself had put its seal upon his thoughts. For, do you see, rainbows do not visit the clear air, they only irradiate vapor. And so, through all the thick mists of the dim doubts in my mind, divine intuitions now and then shoot, enkindling my fog with a heavenly ray. And for this I thank God, for all have doubts, many deny, but doubts or denials, few along with them have intuitions. Doubts of all things earthly, and intuitions of some things heavenly, 
This combination makes neither believer nor infidel, but makes a man who regards them both with equal eye. Chapter 86 The Tale Other poets have warbled the praises of the soft eye of the antelope, and the lovely plumage of the bird that never alights. Less celestial, I celebrate a tale. Reckoning the largest sized sperm whale's tail to begin at that point of the trunk where it tapers to about the girth of a man, it comprises, upon its upper surface alone, an area of at least fifty square feet. The compact, round body of its root expands into two broad, firm, flat palms or flukes, gradually shoaling away to less than an inch in thickness. At the crotch or junction, these flukes slightly overlap, then sideways recede from each other like wings, leaving a wide vacancy between. In no living thing are the lines of beauty more exquisitely defined than in the crescentic borders of these flukes. At its utmost expansion in the full-grown whale, the tail will considerably exceed twenty feet across. The entire member seems a dense webbed bed of welded sinews, but cut into it and you find that three distinct strata compose it, upper, middle, and lower. The fibers in the upper and lower layers are long and horizontal, those of the middle one very short and running crosswise between the outside layers. This triune structure, as much as anything else, imparts power to the tail. To the student of old Roman walls, the middle layer will furnish a curious parallel to the thin course of tiles always alternating with the stone in those wonderful relics of the antique, and which undoubtedly contribute so much to the great strength of the masonry. But as if this vast local power in the tendinous tail were not enough, the whole bulk of the leviathan is knit over with a warp and woof of muscular fibers and filaments, which, passing on either side the loins and running down into the flukes, insensibly blend with them, and largely contribute to their might, so that in the tail the confluent measureless force of the whole whale seems concentrated to a point. Could annihilation occur to matter, this were the thing to do it. Nor does this, its amazing strength, at all tend to cripple the graceful flexion of its motions, where infantileness of ease undulates through a titanism of power. On the contrary, those motions derive their most appalling beauty from it. Real strength never impairs beauty or harmony, but it often bestows it, and in everything imposingly beautiful, strength has much to do with the magic. Take away the tied tendons that all over seem bursting from the marble in carved Hercules, and its charm would be gone. As the devout Eckerman lifted the linen sheet from the naked corpse of Goethe, he was overwhelmed with the massive chest of the man that seemed as a Roman triumphal arch. When Angelo paints even God the Father in human form, mark what robustness is there. And whatever they may reveal of the divine love in the sun, the soft, curled, hermaphroditical Italian pictures in which his idea has been most successfully embodied, these pictures, so destitute as they are of all brawniness, hint nothing of any power, but the mere negative, feminine one of submission and endurance, which, on all hands, it is conceded, form the peculiar practical virtues of his teachings. Such is the subtle elasticity of the organ I treat of, that whether wielded in sport or in earnest, or in anger, whatever be the mood it be in, its flexions are invariably marked by exceeding grace. Therein no fairy's arm can transcend it. Five great motions are peculiar to it. First, when used as a fin for progression. Second, when used as a mace in battle. Third, in sweeping fourth in lobtailing, fifth in peaking flukes. First, being horizontal in its position, the leviathan's tail acts in a different manner from the tails of all other sea creatures. It never wriggles. In man or fish, wriggling is a sign of inferiority. 
To the whale, his tail is the sole means of propulsion, scroll-wise coiled forwards beneath the body, and then rapidly sprung backwards, it is this which gives that singular darting, leaping motion to the monster when furiously swimming. His side-fins only serve to steer by. Second, it is a little significant that while one sperm-whale only fights another sperm-whale with his head and jaw, nevertheless in his conflicts with man he chiefly and contemptuously uses his tail. In striking at a boat he swiftly curves away his flukes from it, and the blow is only inflicted by the recoil. If it be made in the unobstructed air, especially if it descend to its mark, the stroke is then simply irresistible. No ribs of man or boat can withstand it. Your only salvation lies in eluding it, but if it comes sideways through the opposing water, then partly owing to the light buoyancy of the whale-boat, and the elasticity of its materials, a cracked rib or a dashed plank or two, a sort of stitch in the side, is generally the most serious result. These submerged side-blows are so often received in the fishery that they are accounted mere child's play. Someone strips off a frock, and the hole is stopped. Third, I cannot demonstrate it, but it seems to me that in the whale the sense of touch is concentrated in the tail, for in this respect there is a delicacy in it only equaled by the daintiness of the elephant's trunk. This delicacy is chiefly evinced in the action of sweeping, when in maidenly gentleness the whale with a certain soft slowness moves his immense flukes from side to side upon the surface of the sea and if he feels but a sailor's whisker, woe to that sailor, whiskers and all, what tenderness there is in that preliminary touch. Had this tale any prehensile power, I should straightway bethink me of Darmonides' elephant that so frequented the flower-market, and with low salutations presented nosegays to damsels, and then caressed their zones. On more accounts than one, a pity it is that the whale does not possess this prehensile virtue in his tail. For I have heard of yet another elephant that, when wounded in the fight, curved round his trunk and extracted the dart. Fourth, stealing unawares upon the whale in the fancied security of the middle of solitary seas, you find him unbent from the vast corpulence of his dignity, and kitten-like he plays on the ocean as if it were a hearth. But still you see his power in his play. The broad palms of his tail are flirted high into the air, then smiting the surface the thunderous concussion resounds for miles. You would almost think a great gun had been discharged, and if you notice the light wreath of vapor from the spiracle at his other extremity, you would think that that was the smoke from the touch-hole. Fifth, as in the ordinary floating posture of the Leviathan, the flukes lie considerably below the level of his back, they are then completely out of sight beneath the surface, but when he is about to plunge into the deeps, his entire flukes with at least thirty feet of his body are tossed erect in the air, and so remain vibrating a moment, till they downward shoot out of view. Excepting the sublime breach, somewhere else to be described, this peaking of the whale's flukes is perhaps the grandest sight to be seen in all animated nature. Out of the bottomless profundities the gigantic tail seems spasmodically snatching at the highest heaven. So in dreams have I seen majestic Satan thrusting forth his tormented colossal claw from the flame Baltic of hell. But in gazing at such scenes, it is all in all what mood you are in. If in the Dantean, the devils will occur to you. If in that of Isaiah, the archangels. Standing at the masthead of my ship during a sunrise that crimsoned sky and sea, I once saw a large herd of whales in the east, all heading towards the sun, and for a moment vibrating in concert with peaked flukes. As it seemed to me at the time, such a grand embodiment of adoration of the gods was never beheld even in Persia, the home of the fire-worshippers. As Ptolemy Philopater testified of the African elephant, I then testified of the whale, pronouncing him the most devout of all beings. 
for according to king juba the military elephants of antiquity often hailed the morning with their trunks uplifted in the profoundest silence the chance comparison in this chapter between the whale and the elephant, so far as some aspects of the tail of the one and the trunk of the other are concerned, should not tend to place those two opposite organs on an equality, much less the creatures to which they respectively belong. For as the mightiest elephant is but a terrier to Leviathan, so, compared with Leviathan's tail, his trunk is but the stalk of a lily, the most direful blow from the elephant's trunk were as the playful tap of a fan compared with the measureless crush and crash of the sperm whale's ponderous flukes which in repeated instances have one after the other hurled entire boats with all their oars and crews into the air very much as an indian juggler tosses his balls footnote though all comparison in the way of general bulk between the whale and the elephant is preposterous, inasmuch as in that particular the elephant stands in much the same respect to the whale as a dog does to the elephant, nevertheless there are not wanting some points of curious similitude. Among these is the spout. It is well known that the elephant will often draw up water or dust in his trunk, and then, elevating it, jet it forth in a stream. End of footnote. The more I consider this mighty tale, the more do I deplore my inability to express it. At times there are gestures in it, which, though they would well grace the hand of man, remain wholly inexplicable. In an extensive herd, so remarkable occasionally are these mystic gestures, that I have heard hunters who have declared them akin to Freemason signs and symbols, that the whale indeed by these methods intelligently conversed with the world nor are there wanting other motions of the whale in his general body, full of strangeness and unaccountable to his most experienced assailant. Dissect him how I may, then, I go but skin deep. I know him not, and never will. But if I know not even the tail of this whale, how understand his head? Much more how comprehend his face, when face he has none. Thou shalt see my back parts, my tail, he seems to say, but my face shall not be seen. But I cannot completely make out his back parts, and hint what he will about his face. I say again, he has no face. End of chapters 83 to 86 Moby Dick, chapters 87 and 88. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick, by Herman Melville, chapters 87 and 88. Chapter 87. The Grand Armada. The long and narrow peninsula of Malacca, extending southeastward from the territories of Burma, forms the most southerly point of all Asia. In a continuous line from that peninsula stretch the long islands of Sumatra, Java, Bali, and Timor, which, with many others, form a vast mole or rampart lengthwise connecting Asia with Australia, and dividing the long unbroken Indian Ocean from the thickly studded Oriental archipelagos. This rampart is pierced by several sally ports for the convenience of ships and whales, conspicuous among which are the Straits of Sunda and Malacca. By the Straits of Sunda, chiefly, vessels bound to China from the west emerge into the China Seas. Those narrow Straits of Sunda divide Sumatra from Java, and standing midway in that vast rampart of islands, buttressed by that bold green promontory known to seamen as Java Head, they not a little correspond to the central gateway opening into some vast walled empire, and considering the inexhaustible wealth of spices and silks and jewels and gold and ivory 
with which the thousand islands of that oriental sea are enriched, it seems a significant provision of nature that such treasures by the very formation of the land should at least bear the appearance, however ineffectual, of being guarded from the all-grasping western world. The shores of the Straits of Sunda are unsupplied with those domineering fortresses which guard the entrances to the Mediterranean, the Baltic, and the Propontis. Unlike the Danes, these Orientals do not demand the obsequious homage of lowered topsails from the endless procession of ships before the wind, which for centuries past, by night and day, have passed between the islands of Sumatra and Java, freighted with the costliest cargoes of the east. But while they freely waive a ceremonial like this, they do by no means renounce their claim to more solid tribute. Time out of mind, the piratical proas of the Malays, lurking among the low-shaded coves and islets of Sumatra, have sallied out upon the vessels sailing through the straits, fiercely demanding tribute at the point of their spears, though by the repeated bloody chastisements they have received at the hands of European cruisers, the audacity of these corsairs has of late been somewhat repressed, yet even at the present day we occasionally hear of English and American vessels, which in those waters have been remorselessly boarded and pillaged. With a fair, fresh wind, the Pequod was now drawing nigh to these straits, Ahab purposing to pass through them into the Javan seas, and thence, cruising northward, over waters known to be frequented here and there by the sperm whale, sweep inshore by the Philippine Islands and gain the far coast of Japan, in time for the great whaling season there. By these means the circumnavigating Pequod would sweep almost all the known sperm whale cruising grounds of the world, previous to descending upon the line in the Pacific, where Ahab, though everywhere else foiled in his pursuit, firmly counted upon giving battle to Moby Dick, in the sea he was most known to frequent, and at a season when he might most reasonably be presumed to be haunting it. But how now? In this zoned quest does Ahab touch no land? Does his crew drink air? Surely he will stop for water. Nay, for a long time now the circus-running sun has raced within his fiery ring, and needs no sustenance but what's in himself. So Ahab, mark this too in the whaler, while other hulls are loaded down with alien stuff to be transferred to foreign wharves, the world-wandering whale-ship carries no cargo but herself and crew, their weapons and their wants. She has a whole lake's contents bottled in her ample hold. She is ballasted with utilities, not altogether with unusable pig-lead and kentledge. She carries years' water in her, clear old prime Nantucket water, which, when three years afloat, the Nantucketer in the Pacific prefers to drink before the brackish fluid but yesterday rafted off in casks from the Peruvian or Indian streams. Hence it is that, while other ships may have gone to China from New York and back again, touching at a score of ports, the whale-ship in all that interval may not have sighted one grain of soil, her crew having seen no man but floating seamen like themselves. So that, did you carry them the news that another flood had come, they would only answer, Well, boys, here's the ark. Now, as many sperm whales had been captured off the western coast of Java, in the near vicinity of the Straits of Sunda, indeed, as most of the ground round about was generally recognized by fishermen as an excellent spot for cruising, therefore, as the Pequod gained more and more upon Java Head, the lookouts were repeatedly hailed and admonished to keep wide awake. But though the green palmy cliffs of the land soon loomed on the starboard bow, and with delighted nostrils the fresh cinnamon was snuffed in the air, yet not a single jet was descried. Almost renouncing all thoughts of falling in with any game hereabouts, the ship had well nigh entered the straits, when the customary cheering cry was heard from aloft, and ere long a spectacle of singular magnificence saluted us. But here be it premise that, owing to the unwearied activity with which of late they have been hunted over all four oceans, the sperm whales, instead of almost invariably sailing in small, detached companies as in former times, 
are now frequently met with in extensive herds, sometimes embracing so great a multitude that it would almost seem as if numerous nations of them had sworn solemn league and covenant for mutual assistance and protection. To this aggregation of the sperm whale into such immense caravans may be imputed the circumstance that even in the best cruising grounds you may now sometimes sail for weeks and months together without being greeted by a single spout and then suddenly be saluted by what sometimes seems thousands on thousands. Broad on both bows, at a distance of some two or three miles, and forming a great semicircle, embracing one half of the level horizon, a continuous chain of whale jets were upplaying and sparkling in the noonday air. Unlike the straight, perpendicular twin jets of the right whale, which, dividing at top, fall over in two branches, like the cleft, drooping boughs of a willow, the single, forward-slanting spout of the sperm whale presents a thick, curled bush of white mist, continually rising and falling away to leeward. Seen from the Pequod's deck, then, as she would rise on a high hill of the sea, this host of vapory spouts, individually curling up into the air, and beheld through a blending atmosphere of bluish haze, showed like the thousand cheerful chimneys of some dense metropolis, descried of a balmy autumnal morning by some horseman on a height. As marching armies, approaching an unfriendly defile in the mountains, accelerate their march, all eagerness to place that perilous passage in their rear, and once more expand in comparative security upon the plain, even so did this vast fleet of whales now seem hurrying forward through the straits, gradually contracting the wings of their semicircle, and swimming on in one solid but still crescentic center. Crowding all sail, the Pequod pressed after them, the harpooners handling their weapons, and loudly cheering from the heads of their yet suspended boats. If the wind only held, little doubt had they that chased through these straits of Sunda, the vast host would only deploy into the Oriental seas to witness the capture of not a few of their number. And who could tell whether, in that congregated caravan, Moby Dick himself might not temporarily be swimming, like the worshipped white elephant in the coronation procession of the Siamese, so with stunsail piled on stunsail, we sailed along, driving these leviathans before us, when of a sudden the voice of Tashtego was heard, loudly directing attention to something in our wake. Corresponding to the crescent in our van, we beheld another in our rear. It seemed formed of detached white vapors, rising and falling something like the spouts of the whales, only they did not so completely come and go, for they constantly hovered, without finally disappearing. Leveling his glass at this sight, Ahab quickly revolved in his pivot hole, crying, Aloft there, and rig whips and buckets to wet the sails! Malays, sir, and after us! As if too long lurking behind the headlands, till the Pequod should fairly have entered the straits, these rascally Asiatics were now in hot pursuit, to make up for their overcautious delay. But when the swift Pequod, with a fresh leading wind, was herself in hot chase, how very kind of these tawny philanthropists to assist in speeding her on to her own chosen pursuit, mere riding whips and rolls to her as they were. As with glass under arm, Ahab to and fro paced on the deck, in his forward turn beholding the monsters he chased, and in the after one the bloodthirsty pirates chasing him, some such fancy as the above seemed his, and when he glanced upon the green walls of the watery defile in which the ship was then sailing, and bethought him that through that gate lay the route to his vengeance, and beheld how, through that same gate, he was now both chasing and being chased to his deadly end, and not only that, but a herd of remorseless wild pirates and inhuman atheistical devils were infernally cheering him on with their curses. When all these conceits had passed through his brain, Ahab's brow was left gaunt and ribbed, like the black sand beach after some stormy tide has been gnawing it, without being able to drag the firm thing from its place. But thoughts like these troubled very few of the reckless crew, 
and when, after steadily dropping and dropping the pirates astern, the Pequod at last shot by the vivid green cockatoo point on the Sumatra side, emerging at last upon the broad waters beyond, then the harpooners seemed more to grieve that the swift whales had been gaining upon the ship than to rejoice that the ship had so victoriously gained upon the melees. But still driving on in the wake of the whales, at length they seemed abating their speed. Gradually the ship neared them, and the wind now dying away, word was passed to spring to the boats. But no sooner did the herd, by some presumed wonderful instinct of the sperm whale, become notified of the three keels that were after them, though as yet a mile in their rear, then they rallied again, and forming in close ranks and battalions, so that their spouts all looked like flashing lines of stacked bayonets, moved on with redoubled velocity. Stripped to our shirts and drawers, we sprang to the white ash, and after several hours pulling were almost disposed to renounce the chase, when a general pausing commotion among the whales gave animating token that they were now at last under the influence of that strange perplexity of inert irresolution, which, when fishermen perceive it in the whale, they say he is gallied. The compact martial columns in which they had been hitherto rapidly and steadily swimming were now broken up in one measureless rout, and like King Porus's elephant in the Indian battle with Alexander, they seemed going mad with consternation. In all directions expanding in vast irregular circles, and aimlessly swimming hither and thither by their short thick spoutings, they plainly betrayed their distraction of panic. This was still more strangely evinced by those of their number who, completely paralyzed as it were, helplessly floated like waterlogged dismantled ships on the sea. Had these leviathans been but a flock of simple sheep, pursued over the pasture by three fierce wolves, they could not possibly have evinced such excessive dismay. But this occasional timidity is characteristic of almost all herding creatures. Though banding together in tens of thousands, the lion-maned buffaloes of the west have fled before a solitary horseman. Witness, too, all human beings, how, when herded together in the sheepfold of a theater's pit, they will, at the slightest alarm of fire, rush helter-skelter for the outlets, crowding, trampling, jamming, and remorselessly dashing each other to death. Best, therefore, withhold any amazement at the strangely gallied whales before us, for there is no folly of the beasts of the earth which is not infinitely outdone by the madness of men. Though many of the whales, as has been said, were in violent motion, yet it is to be observed that as a whole the herd neither advanced nor retreated, but collectively remained in one place. As is customary in those cases, the boats at once separated, each making for some one lone whale on the outskirts of the shoal. In about three minutes' time Queequeg's harpoon was flung. The stricken fish darted blinding spray in our faces, and then running away with us like light steered straight for the heart of the herd. Though such a movement on the part of the whale struck under such circumstances is in no wise unprecedented, and indeed is almost always more or less anticipated, yet does it present one of the more perilous vicissitudes of the fishery. For as the swift monster drags you deeper and deeper into the frantic shoal, you bid adieu to circumspect life and only exist in a delirious throb. As, blind and deaf, the whale plunged forward, as if by sheer power of speed to rid himself of the iron leech that had fastened to him, as we thus tore a white gash in the sea, on all sides menaced as we flew by the crazed creatures to and fro rushing about us, our beset boat was like a ship mobbed by ice isles in a tempest, and striving to steer through their complicated channels and straits, not knowing at what moment it may be locked in and crushed. But not a bit daunted, Queequeg steered us manfully, now shearing off from this monster directly across our route in advance, now edging away from that, whose colossal flukes were suspended overhead, while all the time Starbuck stood up in the bows, lance in hand, pricking out of our way whatever whales he could reach by short darts, for there was no time to make long ones. Nor were the oarsmen quite idle, though their wanted duty was now altogether dispensed with. 
they chiefly attended to the shouting part of the business. "'Out of the way, Commodore!' cried one, to a great dromedary that of a sudden rose bodily to the surface, and for an instant threatened to swamp us. "'Hard down with your tail there!' cried a second to another, which, close to our gunwale, seemed calmly cooling himself with his own fan-like extremity. All whale-boats carry certain curious contrivances, originally invented by the Nantucket Indians, called drugs. Two thick squares of wood, of equal size, are stoutly clenched together, so that they cross each other's grain at right angles. A line of considerable length is then attached to the middle of this block, and the other end of the line being looped, it can in a moment be fastened to a harpoon. It is chiefly among gallied whales that this drug is used, for then more whales are close round you than you can possibly chase at one time. But sperm whales are not every day encountered, while you may then, you must kill all you can. And if you cannot kill them all at once, you must wing them, so that they can be afterwards killed at your leisure. Hence it is that at times like these the drug comes into requisition. Our boat was furnished with three of them. The first and second were successfully darted, and we saw the whales staggeringly running off, fettered by the enormous sidelong resistance of the towing drug. They were cramped like malefactors with the chain and ball. But upon flinging the third, in the act of tossing overboard the clumsy wooden block, it caught under one of the seats of the boat, and in an instant tore it out and carried it away, dropping the oarsman in the boat's bottom as the seat slid from under him. On both sides the sea came in at the wounded planks, but we stuffed two or three drawers and shirts in, and so stopped the leaks for the time. It had been next to impossible to dart these drugged harpoons, were it not that as we advanced into the herd our whale's way greatly diminished, moreover that as we went still further and further from the circumference of commotion the direful disorders seemed waning so that when at last the jerking harpoon drew out and the towing whale sideways vanished, then, with the tapering force of his parting momentum, we glided between two whales into the innermost heart of the shoal, as if from some mountain torrent we had slid into a serene valley lake. Here the storms and the roaring glens between the outermost whales were heard, but not felt. In this central expanse the sea presented that smooth, satin-like surface, called a sleek, produced by the subtle moisture thrown off by the whale in his more quiet moods. Yes, we were now in that enchanted calm which they say lurks at the heart of every commotion. And still in the distracted distance we beheld the tumults of the outer concentric circles, and saw successive pods of whales, eight or ten in each, swiftly going round and round, like multiplied spans of horses in a ring, and so closely shoulder to shoulder, that a titanic circus rider might easily have overarched the middle ones, and so have gone round on their backs. Owing to the density of the crowd of reposing whales, more immediately surrounding the embayed axis of the herd, no possible chance of escape was at present afforded us. We must watch for a breach in the living wall that hemmed us in, the wall that had only admitted us in order to shut us up. Keeping at the center of the lake, we were occasionally visited by small, tame cows and calves, the women and children of this routed host. Now, inclusive of the occasional wide intervals between the revolving outer circles, and inclusive of the spaces between the various pods in any one of those circles, the entire area at this juncture, embraced by the whole multitude, must have contained at least two or three square miles. At any rate, though indeed such a test at such a time might be deceptive, spoutings might be discovered from our low boat that seemed playing up almost from the rim of the horizon. I mention this circumstance because, as if the cows and calves had been purposely locked up in this innermost fold, and as if the wide extent of the herd had hitherto prevented them from learning the precise cause of its stopping, or possibly being so young, unsophisticated, and every way innocent and inexperienced, however it may have been, these smaller whales, now and then visiting our becalmed boat from the margin of the lake, 
evinced a wondrous fearlessness and confidence, or else a still becharmed panic which it was impossible not to marvel at. Like household dogs they came snuffling round us, right up to our gunwales, and touching them, till it almost seemed that some spell had suddenly domesticated them. Queequeg patted their foreheads, Starbuck scratched their backs with his lance, but fearful of the consequences, for the time refrained from darting it. But far beneath this wondrous world upon the surface, another and still stranger world met our eye as we gazed over the side, for suspended in those watery vaults floated the forms of the nursing mothers of the whales, and those that of their enormous girth seemed shortly to become mothers. The lake, as I have hinted, was to a considerable depth exceedingly transparent, and as human infants, while suckling, will calmly and fixedly gaze away from the breast, as if leading two different lives at the time, and, while yet drawing mortal nourishment, be still spiritually feasting upon some unearthly reminiscence, even so did the young of these whales seem looking up towards us, but not at us, as if we were but a bit of gulf-weed in their newborn sight. Floating on their sides, the mothers also seemed quietly eyeing us. One of these little infants, that from certain queer tokens seemed hardly a day old, might have measured some fourteen feet in length, and some six feet in girth. He was a little frisky, though as yet his body seemed scarce yet recovered from that irksome position it had so lately occupied in the maternal reticule, where, tail to head, and all ready for the final spring, the unborn whale lies bent like a tartar's bow. The delicate side fins and the palms of his flukes still freshly retained the pleated crumbled appearance of a baby's ears, newly arrived from foreign parts. "'Line! Line!' cried Queequeg, looking over the gunwale. "'Him fast! Him fast! Who line him? Who struck?' Two whale, one big, one little. What ails you, man? cried Starbuck. Look ye here, said Queequeg, pointing down. As when the stricken whale that from the tub has reeled out hundreds of fathoms of rope, as after deep sounding he floats up again, and shows the slackened curling line buoyantly rising and spiraling towards the air, so now Starbuck saw long coils of the umbilical cord of Madame Leviathan, by which the young cub seems still tethered to its dam. Not seldom in the rapid vicissitudes of the chase, this natural line with the maternal end loose becomes entangled with the hempen one, so that the cub is thereby trapped. Some of the subtlest secrets of the sea seem divulged to us in this enchanted pond. We saw young Leviathan amours in the deep. Footnote. The sperm whale, as with all other species of the Leviathan, but unlike most other fish, breeds indifferently at all seasons, after a gestation which may probably be set down at nine months, producing but one at a time, though in some few known instances giving birth to an Esau and a Jacob, a contingency provided for in suckling by two teats, curiously situated, one on each side of the anus, but the breasts themselves extend upwards from that, when by chance these precious parts in a nursing whale are cut by the hunter's lance, the mother's pouring milk and blood rivalingly discolor the sea for rods. The milk is very sweet and rich, it has been tasted by man, it might do well with strawberries. When overflowing with mutual esteem, the whales salute more hominum. End of footnote. And thus, though surrounded by circle upon circle of consternations and affrights, did these inscrutable creatures at the centre freely and fearlessly indulge in all peaceful concernments, yea, serenely reveled in dalliance and delight. But even so, amid the tornadoed Atlantic of my being, do I myself still forever centrally disport in mute calm, and while ponderous planets of unwaning woe revolve round me, deep down and deep inland, there I still bathe me in eternal mildness of joy. Meanwhile, as we thus lay entranced, the occasional sudden frantic spectacles in the distance evince the activity of the other boats, 
still engaged in drugging the whales on the frontier of the host, or possibly carrying on the war within the first circle, where abundance of room and some convenient retreats were afforded them. But the sight of the enraged, drugged whales now and then blindly darting to and fro across the circles was nothing to what at last met our eyes. It is sometimes the custom, when fast to a whale more than commonly powerful and alert, to seek to hamstring him, as it were, by sundering or maiming his gigantic tail-tendon. It is done by darting a short-handled cutting-spade, to which is attached a rope for hauling it back again. A whale wounded, as we afterwards learned, in this part, but not effectually, as it seemed, had broken away from the boat, carrying along with him half of the harpoon line, and in the extraordinary agony of the wound he was now dashing among the revolving circles like the lone mounted desperado Arnold at the Battle of Saratoga, carrying dismay wherever he went. But agonizing as was the wound of this whale, and an appalling spectacle enough anyway, yet the peculiar horror with which he seemed to inspire the rest of the herd was owing to a cause which at first the intervening distance obscured from us. But at length we perceive that by one of the unimaginable accidents of the fishery, this whale had become entangled in the harpoon line that he towed. He had also run away with the cutting spade in him, and while the free end of the rope attached to that weapon had permanently caught in the coils of the harpoon line round his tail, the cutting spade itself had worked loose from his flesh so that, tormented to madness, he was now churning through the water, violently flaying with his flexible tail, and tossing the keen spade about him, wounding and murdering his own comrades. This terrific object seemed to recall the whole herd from their stationary fright. First the whales, forming the margin of our lake, began to crowd a little, and tumble against each other, as if lifted by half-spent billows from afar. Then the lake itself began faintly to heave and swell. The submarine bridal chambers and nurseries vanished. In more and more contracting orbits, the whales in the more central circles began to swim in thickening clusters. Yes, the long calm was departing. A low, advancing hum was soon heard. And then, like the tumultuous masses of block ice, when the great river Hudson breaks up in the spring, the entire host of whales came tumbling upon their inner centre, as if to pile themselves up in one common mountain. Instantly Starbuck and Queequeg changed places, Starbuck taking the stern. "'Oars! Oars!' he intensely whispered, seizing the helm. "'Grip your oars and clutch your souls now! My God, men, stand by! Shove him off, you, Queequeg! The whale there! Prick him! Hit him! Stand up! Stand up and stay so. Spring men, pull men, never mind their backs, scrape them, scrape away. The boat was now all but jammed between two vast black bulks, leaving a narrow dardanelles between their long lengths. But by desperate endeavor we at last shot into a temporary opening, then giving way rapidly, and at the same time earnestly watching for another outlet. After many similar hairbreadth escapes, we at last swiftly glided into what had just been one of the outer circles, but now crossed by random whales all violently making for one center. This lucky salvation was cheaply purchased by the loss of Queequeg's hat, who, while standing in the bows to prick the fugitive whales, had his hat taken clean from his head by the air eddy made by the sudden tossing of a pair of broad flukes close by. Riotous and disordered as the universal commotion now was, it soon resolved itself into what seemed a systematic movement, for having clumped together at last in one dense body, they then renewed their onward flight with augmented fleetness. Further pursuit was useless, but the boats still lingered in their wake to pick up what drugged whales might be dropped astern, and likewise to secure one which Flask had killed and wafted. The waif is a pennoned pole, two or three of which are carried by every boat, and which, when additional game is at hand, are inserted upright into the floating body of a dead whale, both to mark its place on the sea, and also as token of prior possession, should the boats of any other ship draw near. 
The result of this lowering was somewhat illustrative of that sagacious saying in the fishery, the more whales, the less fish. Of all the drugged whales only one was captured. The rest contrived to escape for the time, but only to be taken, as will hereafter be seen, by some other craft than the Pequod. CHAPTER 88 SCHOOLS AND SCHOOLMASTERS The previous chapter gave account of an immense body or herd of sperm whales, and there was also then given the probable cause inducing those vast aggregations. Now, though such great bodies are at times encountered, yet, as must have been seen, even at the present day, small detached bands are occasionally observed, embracing from twenty to fifty individuals each. Such bands are known as schools. They generally are of two sorts, those composed almost entirely of females, and those mustering none but young, vigorous males, or bulls, as they are familiarly designated. In cavalier attendance upon the school of females, you invariably see a male of full-grown magnitude, but not old, who, upon any alarm, evinces his gallantry by falling in the rear and covering the flight of his ladies. In truth, this gentleman is a luxurious ottoman, swimming about over the watery world, surroundingly accompanied by all the solaces and endearments of the harem. The contrast between this ottoman and his concubines is striking, because while he is always of the largest leviathanic proportions, the ladies, even at full growth, are not more than one-third of the bulk of an average size male. They are comparatively delicate indeed, I dare say not to exceed half a dozen yards round the waist. Nevertheless, it cannot be denied that, upon the whole, they are hereditarily entitled to en bon point. It is very curious to watch this harem and its lord in their indolent ramblings. Like fashionables, they are forever on the move in leisurely search of variety. You meet them on the line in time for the full flower of the equatorial feeding season, having just returned, perhaps, from spending the summer in the northern seas, and so cheating summer of all unpleasant weariness and warmth. By the time they have lounged up and down the promenade of the equator a while, they start for the oriental waters in anticipation of the cool season there, and so evade the other excessive temperature of the year. When serenely advancing on one of these journeys, if any strange, suspicious sights are seen, my lord Whale keeps a wary eye on his interesting family. Should any unwarrantably pert young leviathan coming that way presume to draw confidentially close to one of the ladies, with what prodigious fury the Bashaw assails him and chases him away! High times, indeed, if unprincipled young rakes like him are to be permitted to invade the sanctity of domestic bliss. Though, do what the Bashaw will, he cannot keep the most notorious Lothario out of his bed— for, alas, all fish bed in common. As ashore, the ladies often cause the most terrible duels among their rival admirers, just so with the whales, who sometimes come to deadly battle, and all for love. They fence with their long lower jaws, sometimes locking them together, and so striving for the supremacy, like elks that warringly interweave their antlers. Not a few are captured having deep scars of these encounters, furrowed heads, broken teeth, scalloped fins, and, in some instances, wrenched and dislocated mouths. But supposing the invader of domestic bliss to betake himself away at the first rush of the harem's lord, then it is very diverting to watch that lord. Gently he insinuates his vast bulk among them again, and revels there a while, still in tantalizing vicinity to young Lothario, like pious Solomon devoutly worshipping among his thousand concubines. Granting other whales to be in sight, the fishermen will seldom give chase to one of these grand Turks, for these grand Turks are too lavish of their strength, and hence their unctuousness is small. As for the sons and daughters they beget, why those sons and daughters must take care of themselves, at least with only the maternal help, for like certain other omnivorous, roving lovers that might be named, my lord Whale has no taste for the nursery, however much for the bower, 
and so being a great traveller he leaves his anonymous babies all over the world, every baby an exotic. In good time, nevertheless, as the ardour of youth declines, as years and dumps increase, as reflection lends her solemn pauses, in short, as a general lassitude overtakes the sated Turk, then a love of ease and virtue supplants the love for maidens. Our Ottoman enters upon the impotent, repentant, admonitory stage of life, forswears, disbands the harem, and, grown to an exemplary, sulky old soul, goes about all alone among the meridians and parallels, saying his prayers, and warning each young leviathan from his amorous errors. Now, as the harem of Wales is called by the fisherman a school, so is the lord and master of that school technically known as the schoolmaster. It is therefore not in strict character, however admirably satirical, that after going to school himself he should then go abroad inculcating not what he learned there, but the folly of it. His title, schoolmaster, would very naturally seem derived from the name bestowed upon the harem itself, but some have surmised that the man who first thus entitled this sort of Ottoman whale must have read the memoirs of Vidocq, and informed himself what sort of a country schoolmaster that famous Frenchman was in his younger days, and what was the nature of those occult lessons he inculcated into some of his pupils. The same secludedness and isolation to which the schoolmaster whale betakes himself in his advancing years is true of all aged sperm whales. Almost universally, a lone whale, as a solitary leviathan is called, proves an ancient one. Like venerable, moss-bearded Daniel Boone, he will have no one near him but nature herself, and her he takes to wife in the wilderness of waters, and the best of wives she is, though she keeps so many moody secrets. The schools, composing none but young and vigorous males, previously mentioned, offer a strong contrast to the harem schools. For while those female whales are characteristically timid, the young males, or forty-barrel bulls, as they call them, are by far the most pugnacious of all leviathans, and proverbially the most dangerous to encounter, excepting those wondrous grey-headed grizzled whales sometimes met, and these will fight you like grim fiends exasperated by a penal gout. The forty-barrel bull schools are larger than the harem schools. Like a mob of young collegians, they are full of fight, fun, and wickedness, tumbling round the world at such a reckless, rollicking rate that no prudent underwriter would insure them any more than he would a riotous lad at Yale or Harvard. They soon relinquish this turbulence, though, and when about three-fourths grown, break up and separately go about in quest of settlements, that is, harems. Another point of difference between the male and female schools is still more characteristic of the sexes. Say you strike a forty-barrel bull, poor devil, all his comrades quit him. But strike a member of the harem school, and her companions swim around her with every token of concern, sometimes lingering so near her, and so long, as themselves to fall a prey. End of chapters 87 and 88 Moby Dick, chapters 89 to 91 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 89 to 91. Chapter 89 Fast Fish and Loose Fish. The allusion to the waif and waif-poles in the last chapter but one necessitates some account of the laws and regulations of the whale-fishery, of which the waif may be deemed the grand symbol and badge. It frequently happens that when several ships are cruising in company, a whale may be struck by one vessel, then escape and be finally killed and captured by another vessel 
and herein are indirectly comprised many minor contingencies, all partaking of this one grand feature. For example, after a weary and perilous chase and capture of a whale, the body may get loose from the ship by reason of a violent storm, and, drifting far away to leeward, be retaken by a second whaler, who, in a calm, snugly tows it alongside, without risk of life or line. Thus the most vexatious and violent disputes would often arise between the fishermen, were there not some written or unwritten, universal, undisputed law applicable to all cases. Perhaps the only formal whaling code authorized by legislative enactment was that of Holland. It was decreed by the States General in A.D. 1695. But though no other nation has ever had any written whaling law, yet the American fishermen have been their own legislators and lawyers in this matter, they have provided a system which for terse comprehensiveness surpasses Justinian's Pandex and the bylaws of the Chinese society for the suppression of meddling with other people's business. Yes, the laws might be engraven on a Queen Anne's farthing, or the barb of a harpoon, and worn round the neck, so small are they. 1. A fast fish belongs to the party fast to it. 2. A loose fish is fair game for anybody who can soonest catch it. But what plays the mischief with this masterly code is the admirable brevity of it, which necessitates a vast volume of commentaries to expound it. First, what is a fast fish? Alive or dead, a fish is technically fast when it is connected with an occupied ship or boat, by any medium at all controllable by the occupant or occupants, a mast, an oar, a nine-inch cable, a telegraph wire, or a strand of cobweb, it is all the same. Likewise, a fish is technically fast when it bears a waif, or any other recognized symbol of possession, so long as the party waifing it plainly evince their ability at any time to take it alongside, as well as their intention to do so. These are scientific commentaries, but the commentaries of the whalemen themselves sometimes consist in hard words and harder knocks, the coke upon Littleton of the fist. True, among the more upright and honorable whalemen, allowances are always made for particular cases where it would be an outrageous moral injustice for one party to claim possession of a whale previously chased or killed by another party but others are by no means so scrupulous. Some fifty years ago there was a curious case of a whale trover litigated in England, wherein the plaintiffs set forth that after a hard chase of a whale in the northern seas, and when indeed they, the plaintiffs, had succeeded in harpooning the fish, they were at last, through peril of their lives, obliged to forsake not only their lines but their boat itself, Ultimately, the defendants, the crew of another ship, came up with the whale, struck, killed, seized, and finally appropriated it before the very eyes of the plaintiffs. And when those defendants were remonstrated with, their captain snapped his fingers in the plaintiff's teeth, and assured them that by way of doxology to the deed he had done, he would now retain their line, harpoons, and boat, which had remained attached to the whale at the time of the seizure. Wherefore the plaintiffs now sued for the recovery of the value of their whale, line, harpoons, and boat. Mr. Erskine was counsel for the defendants, Lord Ellenborough was the judge. In the course of the defense, the witty Erskine went on to illustrate his position by alluding to a recent Crim Con case, wherein a gentleman, after in vain trying to bridle his wife's viciousness, had at last abandoned her upon the seas of life, but in the course of years, repenting of that step, he instituted an action to recover possession of her. Erskine was on the other side, and he then supported it by saying that though the gentleman had originally harpooned the lady, and had once had her fast, and only by reason of the great stress of her plunging viciousness had at last abandoned her, yet abandon her he did, so that she became a loose fish, 
and therefore when a subsequent gentleman re-harpooned her, the lady then became that subsequent gentleman's property, along with whatever harpoon might have been found sticking in her. Now in the present case Erskine contended that the examples of the whale and the lady were reciprocally illustrative of each other. These pleadings and the counter-pleadings being duly heard, the very learned judge in set terms decided, to wit, that as for the boat he awarded it to the plaintiffs, because they had merely abandoned it to save their lives, but that with regard to the controverted whale, harpoons, and line, they belonged to the defendants, the whale because it was a loose fish at the time of the final capture, and the harpoons and line, because when the fish made off with them, it, the fish, acquired a property in those articles, and hence anybody who afterwards took the fish had a right to them. Now the defendants afterwards took the fish, ergo the aforesaid articles were theirs. A common man, looking at this decision of the very learned judge, might possibly object to it but ploughed up to the primary rock of the matter, the two great principles laid down in the twin whaling laws previously quoted, and applied and elucidated by Lord Ellenborough in the above-cited case, these two laws touching fast fish and loose fish, I say, will, on reflection, be found the fundamentals of all human jurisprudence, for notwithstanding its complicated tracery of sculpture, the temple of the law, like the temple of the Philistines, has but two props to stand on. Is it not a saying in everyone's mouth, possession is half of the law, that is, regardless of how the thing came into possession? But often possession is the whole of the law. What are the sinews and souls of Russian serfs and Republican slaves but fast fish, whereof possession is the whole of the law? What to the rapacious landlord is the widow's last mite but a fast fish? What is yonder undetected villain's marble mansion with a door-plate for a waif? What is that but a fast fish? What is the ruinous discount which Mordecai the broker gets from poor Wobegon the bankrupt on a loan to keep Wobegon's family from starvation? What is that ruinous discount but a fast fish? What is the Archbishop of Save Souls' income of one hundred thousand pounds, seized from the scant bread and cheese of hundreds of thousands of broken-backed laborers, all sure of heaven without any of Save Souls' help? What is that globular one hundred thousand pounds but a fast fish? What are the Duke of Dunder's hereditary towns and hamlets but fast fish? What to that redoubted harpooner John Bull is poor Ireland? but a fast fish. What to that apostolic lancer, brother Jonathan, is Texas but a fast fish? And concerning all these, is not possession the whole of the law? But if the doctrine of fast fish be pretty generally applicable, the kindred doctrine of loose fish is still more widely so. That is internationally and universally applicable. What was America in 1492 but a loose fish, in which Columbus struck the Spanish standard by way of wafing it for his royal master and mistress? What was Poland to the Tsar? What Greece to the Turk? What India to England? What at last will Mexico be to the United States? All loose fish. What are the rights of man and the liberties of the world but loose fish? What all men's minds and opinions but loose fish? What is the principle of religious belief in them but a loose fish? What to the ostentatious smuggling verbalists are the thoughts of thinkers but loose fish? What is the great globe itself but a loose fish? And what are you, reader, but a loose fish, and a fast fish, too? Chapter 90 Heads or Tails. De baleno vero sufficit si rex habiet caput et regina caudam. Bracton, L3, C3. Latin from the books of the laws of England, which, taken along with the context, means that of all whales captured by anybody on the coast of that land, the king, as honorary grand harpooner, must have the head, 
and the queen be respectfully presented with the tail. A division which in the whale is much like having an apple. There is no intermediate remainder. Now, as this law, under a modified form, is to this day in force in England, and as it offers in various respects a strange anomaly touching the general law of fast and loosed fish, it is here treated of in a separate chapter, on the same courteous principle that prompts the English railways to be at the expense of a separate car, specially reserved for the accommodation of royalty. In the first place, in curious proof of the fact that the above-mentioned law is still in force, I proceed to lay before you a circumstance that happened within the last two years. It seems that some honest mariners of Dover or Sandwich or some one of the sink ports had, after a hard chase, succeeded in killing and beaching a fine whale, which they had originally described afar off from the shore. Now the sink ports are partially or somehow under the jurisdiction of a sort of policeman or beadle called a Lord Warden. Holding the office directly from the crown, I believe, all the royal emoluments incident to the sink port territories become by assignment his. By some writers this office is called a sinecure, but not so, because the Lord Warden is busily employed at times in fobbing his perquisites, which are his chiefly by virtue of that same fobbing of them. Now, when these poor sunburnt mariners, barefooted and with their trousers rolled high up on their ely legs, had wearily hauled their fat fish high and dry, promising themselves a good one hundred fifty pounds from the precious oil and bone, and in fantasy sipping rare tea with their wives and good ale with their cronies upon the strength of their respective shares, up steps a very learned and most Christian and charitable gentleman, with a copy of Blackstone under his arm, and laying it upon the whale's head, he says, Hands off! This fish, my masters, is a fast fish. I seize it as the Lord Warden's. Upon this the poor mariners, in their respectful consternation, so truly English, not knowing what to say, fall to vigorously scratching their heads all round meanwhile ruefully glancing from the whale to the stranger. But that did no wise mend the matter, or at all soften the hard heart of the learned gentleman with the copy of Blackstone. At length one of them, after long scratching about for his ideas, made bold to speak. "'Please, sir, who is the Lord Warden?' "'The Duke.' "'But the Duke had nothing to do with taking this fish. It is his.' We have been at great trouble and peril and some expense, and is all that to go to the Duke's benefit, and we get nothing at all for our pains but our blisters? It is his. Is the Duke so very poor as to be forced to this desperate mode of getting a livelihood? It is his. I fought to relieve my old bedridden mother by part of my share of this whale. It is his. Won't the Duke be content with a quarter or a half? It is his. In a word, the whale was seized and sold, and his grace, the Duke of Wellington, received the money. Thinking that, viewed in some particular lights, this case might, by a bare possibility, in some small degree be deemed, under the circumstances, a rather hard one, an honest clergyman of the town respectfully addressed a note to his grace, begging him to take the case of those unfortunate mariners into full consideration, to which my lord duke, in substance, replied, both letters were published, that he had already done so, and received the money, and would be obliged to the reverend gentleman, if for the future he, the reverend gentleman, would decline meddling with other people's business. Is this the still militant old man, standing at the corners of the three kingdoms, on all hands coercing alms of beggars? It will readily be seen that in this case the alleged right of the duke to the whale was a delegated one from the sovereign. We must needs inquire, then, on what principle the sovereign is originally invested with that right. The law itself has already been set forth, but Plowden gives us the reason for it. Says Plowden, the whale so caught belongs to the king and queen, quote, because of its superior excellence, end quote. 
and by the soundest commentators this has ever been held a cogent argument in such matters. But why should the king have the head and the queen the tail? A reason for that, ye lawyers. In his treatise on Queen Gold, or Queen Pin Money, an old King's Bench author, one William Prynne, thus discourseth, quote, Ye tail is ye queen's, that ye queen's wardrobe may be supplied with ye whalebone. End quote. Now this was written at a time when the black limber bone of the Greenland or right whale was largely used in ladies' bodices. But this same bone is not in the tail, it is in the head, which is a sad mistake for a sagacious lawyer like Prynne. But is the queen a mermaid to be presented with a tail? An allegorical meaning may lurk here. There are two royal fish so styled by the English law writers, the whale and the sturgeon, both royal property under certain limitations, and nominally supplying the tenth branch of the crown's ordinary revenue. I know not that any other author has hinted of the matter, but by inference it seems to me that the sturgeon must be divided in the same way as the whale, the king receiving the highly dense and elastic head peculiar to that fish, which symbolically regarded may possibly be humorously grounded upon some presumed congeniality. And thus there seems a reason in all things, even in law. Chapter 91 the Pequod Meets the Rosebud. Quote, in vain it was to rake for ambergris in the paunch of this leviathan, insufferable fetter denying not inquiry. End quote. Sir T. Brown, V. E. It was a week or two after the last whaling scene recounted, and when we were slowly sailing over a sleepy, vapory, midday sea, that the many noses on the Pequod's deck proved more vigilant discoverers than the three pairs of eyes aloft, a peculiar and not very pleasant smell was smelt in the sea. "'I will bet something now,' said Stubb, "'that somewhere hereabouts are some of those drugged whales we tickled the other day. I thought they would keel up before long.' Presently the vapors in advance slid aside, and there in the distance lay a ship, whose furled sails betoken that some sort of whale must be alongside. As we glided nearer, the stranger showed French colors from his peak, and by the eddying cloud of vulture sea-fowl that circled and hovered and swooped around him, it was plain that the whale alongside must be what the fishermen call a blasted whale. That is, a whale that has died unmolested on the sea, and so floated an unappropriated corpse." It may well be conceived what an unsavory odor such a mass must exhale, worse than an Assyrian city in the plague, when the living are incompetent to bury the departed. So intolerable indeed is it regarded by some, that no cupidity could persuade them to moor alongside of it. Yet are there those who will still do it, notwithstanding the fact that the oil obtained from such subjects is of a very inferior quality, and by no means of the nature of attar of rose. Coming still nearer with the expiring breeze, we saw that the Frenchman had a second whale alongside, and this second whale seemed even more of a nosegay than the first. In truth, it turned out to be one of those problematical whales that seem to dry up and die with a sort of prodigious dyspepsia or indigestion, leaving their defunct bodies almost entirely bankrupt of anything like oil. Nevertheless, in its proper place, we shall see that no knowing fisherman will ever turn up his nose at such a whale as this, however much he may shun blasted whales in general." The Pequod had now swept so nigh to the stranger that Stubb vowed he recognized his cutting spade-pole entangled in the lines that were knotted round the tail of one of these whales. "'There's a pretty fellow now,' he banteringly laughed, standing in the ship's bows. "'There's a jackal for thee. I well know that these crappos of Frenchmen are but poor devils in the fishery, sometimes lowering their boats for breakers, mistaking them for sperm-whale spouts.' Yes, and sometimes sailing from their ports with their hold full of boxes of tallow candles, and cases of snuffers, foreseeing that all the oil they will get won't be enough to dip the captain's wick into. 
Aye, we all know these things. But look ye, here's a crapo that is content with our leavings. The drugged whale there, I mean. Aye, and is content, too, with scraping the dry bones of that other precious fish she has there. Poor devil! I say, pass round a hat, someone, and let's make him a present of a little oil for dear charity's sake. For what oil he will get from that drugged whale there wouldn't be fit to burn in a jail. No, not in a condemned cell. And as for the other whale, why, I'll agree to get more oil by chopping up and trying out these three masts of ours than he'll get from that bundle of bones. Though, now that I think of it, it may contain something worth a good deal more than oil. Yes, ambergris. I wonder now if our old man has thought of that. It's worth trying. Yes, I'm for it. And so saying, he started for the quarter-deck. By this time the faint air had become a complete calm, so that whether or no the Pequod was now fairly entrapped in the smell, with no hope of escaping except by its breezing up again. Issuing from the cabin, Stubb now called his boat's crew and pulled off for the stranger. Drawing across her bow, he perceived that, in accordance with the fanciful French taste, the upper part of her stem-piece was carved in the likeness of a huge drooping stalk, was painted green, and for thorns had copper spikes projecting from it here and there, the whole terminating in a symmetrical folded bulb of a bright red color. Upon her headboards in large gilt letters he read, Bouton de Rose, Rose Button or Rose Bud, and this was the romantic name of this aromatic ship. Though Stubb did not understand the Bouton part of the inscription, yet the word rose and the bulbous figurehead put together sufficiently explained the whole to him. A wooden rosebud, eh? he cried with his hand to his nose. That will do very well. But how like all creation it smells! Now, in order to hold direct communication with the people on deck, he had to pull round the bows to the starboard side, and thus come close to the blasted whale, and so talk over it. Arrived then at this spot, with one hand still to his nose, he bawled, uh, Bouton de Rose, ahoy! Are there any of you uh, Bouton de Roses that speak English? Yes, rejoined a Guernsey man from the bulwarks, who turned out to be the chief mate. Well then, uh, my Bouton de Rosebud, uh, have you seen the white whale? What whale? The white whale. A sperm whale, Moby Dick. Have you seen him? Never heard of such a whale. Cachelot Blanche? White whale? No. Uh, very good, then. Uh, good-bye now, and I'll call again in a minute. Then, rapidly pulling back towards the Pequod, and seeing Ahab leaning over the quarter-deck rail, awaiting his report, he moulded his two hands into a trumpet and shouted, "'No, sir, no!' upon which Ahab retired, and Stubb returned to the Frenchman. He now perceived that the Guernsey man, who had just got into the chains, and was using a cutting spade, had slung his nose in a sort of bag. "'What's the matter with your nose there?' said Stubb. "'Broke it?' "'I wish it were broken.' that I didn't have any nose at all, answered the Guernsey man, who did not seem to relish the job he was at very much. But what are you holding yours for? Oh, uh, nothing. It's a wax nose. I have to hold it on. A fine day, ain't it? Air rather gardeny, I should say. Throw us a bunch of posies, will you, uh, Bouton de Rose? "'What in the devil's name do you want here?' roared the Guernseyman, flying into a sudden passion. "'Oh, uh, keep cool. Cool. Yes, that's the word. Uh, why don't you pack those whales in ice while you're working at them? But uh, joking aside, though, do you know, uh, Rosebud, that it's all nonsense trying to get any oil out of such whales? As for that dried-up one, there, he hasn't a gill in his whole carcass.' "'I know that well enough.' But do you see, the captain here won't believe it. This is his first voyage. He was a cologne manufacturer before. But come aboard, and mayhap he'll believe you if he won't me, and so I'll get out of this dirty scrape. Anything to oblige you, my sweet and pleasant fellow, rejoined Stubb, and with that he soon mounted to the deck, 
there a queer scene presented itself. The sailors, in tasseled caps of red worsted, were getting the heavy tackles in readiness for the whales. But they worked rather slow, and talked very fast, and seemed in anything but a good humor. All their noses upwardly projected from their faces like so many jib-booms. Now and then, pairs of them would drop their work, and run up to the masthead to get some fresh air. Some, thinking they would catch the plague, dipped oakum in coal-tar, and at intervals held it to their nostrils. Others, having broken the stems of their pipes almost short off at the bowl, were vigorously puffing tobacco smoke, so that it constantly filled their olfactories. Stubb was struck by a shower of outcries and anathemas proceeding from the captain's roundhouse abaft, and looking in that direction saw a fiery face thrust from behind the door, which was held ajar from within. This was the tormented surgeon, who, after in vain remonstrating against the proceedings of the day, had betaken himself to the captain's roundhouse, cabinet, he called it, to avoid the pest, but still could not help yelling out his entreaties and indignations at times. Marking all this, Stubb argued well for his scheme, and turning to the Guernseyman had a little chat with him, during which the stranger mate expressed his detestation of his captain as a conceited ignoramus, who had brought them all into so unsavory and unprofitable a pickle. Sounding him carefully, Stubb further perceived that the Guernsey man had not the slightest suspicion concerning the ambergris. He therefore held his peace on that head, but otherwise was quite frank and confidential with him, so that the two quickly concocted a little plan for both circumventing and satirizing the captain, without his at all dreaming of distrusting their sincerity. According to this little plan of theirs, the Guernsey man, under cover of an interpreter's office, was to tell the captain what he pleased, but as coming from Stubb, and as for Stubb, he was to utter any nonsense that should come uppermost in him during the interview. By this time their destined victim appeared from his cabin. He was a small and dark but rather delicate-looking man for a sea captain, with large whiskers and moustache, however, and wore a red cotton velvet vest with watch seals at his side. To this gentleman, Stubb was now politely introduced by the Guernsey man, who at once ostentatiously put on the aspect of interpreting between them. "'What shall I say to him first? said he. Why, said Stubb, eyeing the velvet vest and watch and seals, you may as well begin by telling him that he looks a sort of babyish to me, though I don't pretend to be a judge. He says, monsieur, said the Guernseyman, in French, turning to his captain, that only yesterday his ship spoke a vessel whose captain and chief mate with six sailors had all died of a fever caught from a blasted whale they had brought alongside. Upon this the captain started, and eagerly desired to know more. "'What now?' said the Guernsey man to Stubb. "'Why, since he takes it so easy, tell him that now I have eyed him carefully, I am quite certain that he's no more fit to command a whale-ship than a St. Jago monkey. In fact, tell him from me he's a baboon.' "'He vows and declares, monsieur, that the other whale, the dried one, is far more deadly than the blasted one.' In fine, monsieur, he conjures us, as we value our lives, to cut loose from these fish. Instantly the captain ran forward, and in a loud voice commanded his crew to desist from hoisting the cutting tackles, and at once cast loose the cables and chains confining the whales to the ship. What now? said the Guernsey man, when the captain had returned to them. Oh, why, let me see. Yes! You may as well tell him, uh, now, that, uh, that, in fact, tell him I've diddled him, and, aside to himself, perhaps somebody else. He says, monsieur, that he's very happy to have been of any service to us. Hearing this, the captain vowed that they were the grateful parties, meaning himself and mate, and concluded by inviting Stubb down into his cabin to drink a bottle of Bordeaux. He wants you to take a glass of wine with him, said the interpreter. Oh, thank him heartily, but tell him it's against my principles to drink with the man I've diddled. In fact, tell him I must go. He says, monsieur, that his principles won't admit of his drinking. 
but that if monsieur wants to live another day to drink, then monsieur had best drop all four boats, and pull the ship away from these whales, for it's so calm they won't drift. By this time Stubb was over the side, and getting into his boat, hailed the Guernsey man to this effect, that having a long tow-line in his boat, he would do what he could to help them, by pulling out the lighter whale of the two from the ship's side. While the Frenchman's boats, then, were engaged in towing the ship one way, Stubb benevolently towed away at his whale the other way, ostentatiously slacking out a most unusually long tow-line. Presently a breeze sprang up, Stubb feigned to cast off from the whale, hoisting his boats, the Frenchman soon increased his distance, while the Pequod slid in between him and Stubb's whale whereupon Stubb quickly pulled to the floating body, and hailing the Pequod to give notice of his intentions, at once proceeded to reap the fruit of his unrighteous cunning. Seizing his sharp boat-spade, he commenced an excavation in the body, a little behind the side-fin. You would almost have thought he was digging a cellar there in the sea, and when at length his spade struck against the gaunt ribs, it was like turning up old Roman tiles and pottery buried in fat English loam. His boat's crew were all in high excitement, eagerly helping their chief, and looking as anxious as gold hunters. And all the time numberless fowls were diving and ducking and screaming and yelling and fighting around them, Stubb was beginning to look disappointed, especially as the horrible nosegay increased, when suddenly, from out the very heart of this plague, there stole a faint stream of perfume, which flowed through the tide of bad smells without being absorbed by it, as one river will flow into and then along with another, without at all blending with it for a time. "'I have it! I have it!' cried Stubb with delight striking something in the subterranean regions. A purse! A purse! Dropping his spade, he thrust both hands in, and drew out handfuls of something that looked like ripe Windsor soap, or rich mottled old cheese, very unctuous and savory withal. You might easily dent it with your thumb. It is of a hue between yellow and ash color. And this, good friends, is ambergris, worth a gold guinea an ounce to any druggist. Some six handfuls were obtained, but more was unavoidably lost in the sea, and still more, perhaps, might have been secured were it not for impatient Ahab's loud command to stub to desist, and come on board, else the ship would bid them good-bye. End of chapters 89 to 91 Moby Dick, chapters 92 to 96. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 92 to 96. Chapter 92. Ambergris. Now this ambergris is a very curious substance, and so important as an article of commerce, that in 1791 a certain Nantucket-born Captain Coffin was examined at the bar of the English House of Commons on the subject. For at that time, and indeed until a comparatively late day, the precise origin of ambergris remained, like amber itself, a problem to the learned. Though the word ambergris is but a French compound for grey amber, yet the two substances are quite distinct. For amber, though at times found on the sea coast, is also dug up in some far inland soils, whereas ambergris is never found except upon the sea. Besides, amber is a hard, transparent, brittle, odorless substance used for mouthpieces to pipes, for beads and ornaments. But ambergris is soft, waxy, and so highly fragrant and spicy that it is largely used in perfumery, in pastilles, precious candles, hair powders, and pomatum. 
the turks use it in cooking and also carry it to mecca for the same purpose that frankincense is carried to st peter's in rome some wine merchants drop a few grains into claret to flavor it who would think then that such fine ladies and gentlemen should regale themselves with an essence found in the inglorious bowels of a sick whale yet so it is by some ambergris is supposed to be the cause and by others the effect of the dyspepsia in the whale how to cure such a dyspepsia it were hard to say unless by administering three or four boatloads of brandreth pills and then running out of harm's way as laborers do in blasting rocks i have forgotten to say that there were found in this ambergris certain hard round bony plates which at first stubb thought might be sailors trousers buttons but afterwards it turned out that they were nothing more than pieces of small squid bones embalmed in that manner now that the incorruption of this most fragrant ambergris should be found in the heart of such decay is this nothing bethink thee of that saying of st paul in corinthians about corruption and incorruption how that we are sown in dishonor but raised in glory and likewise call to mind that saying of paracelsus about what it is that maketh the best musk also forget not the strange fact that of all things of ill savor cologne water in its rudimental manufacturing stages is the worst i should like to conclude the chapter with the above appeal but cannot owing to my anxiety to repel a charge often made against whalemen and which in the estimation of some already biased minds might be considered as indirectly substantiated by what has been said of the frenchman's two whales elsewhere in this volume the slanderous aspersion has been disproved that the vocation of whaling is throughout a slatternly untidy business but there is another thing to rebut they hint that all whales always smell bad now how did this odious stigma originate i opine that it is plainly traceable to the first arrival of the greenland whaling ships in london more than two centuries ago because those whalemen did not then and do not now try out their oil at sea as the southern ships have always done but cutting up the fresh blubber into small bits thrust it through the bungholes of large casks and carry it home in that manner the shortness of the season in those icy seas and the sudden and violent storms to which they are exposed forbidding any other course the consequence is that upon breaking into the hold and unloading one of these whale cemeteries in the greenland dock a savor is given forth somewhat similar to that arising from excavating an old city graveyard for the foundations of a lying-in hospital i partly surmise also that this wicked charge against whalers may be likewise imputed to the existence on the coast of greenland in former times of a dutch village called schmerenberg or smerenberg which latter name is the one used by the learned fogo von slack in his great work on smells a textbook on that subject as its name imports smear fat berg to put up this village was founded in order to afford a place for the blubber of the dutch whale fleet to be tried out without being taken home to holland for that purpose it was a collection of furnaces fat kettles and oil sheds and when the works were in full operation certainly gave forth no very pleasant savor but all this is quite different with a south sea sperm whaler which in a voyage of four years perhaps after completely filling her hold with oil does not perhaps consume fifty days in the business of boiling out and in the state that it is casked the oil is nearly scentless the truth is that living or dead if but decently treated whales as a species are by no means creatures of ill odor nor can whalemen be recognized as the people of the middle ages affected to detect a jew in the company by the nose nor indeed can the whale possibly be otherwise than fragrant when as a general thing he enjoys such high health taking abundance of exercise always out of doors though it is true seldom in the open air i say that the motion of a sperm whale's flukes above water 
dispenses a perfume, as when a musk-scented lady rustles her dress in a warm parlour. What then shall I liken the sperm whale to for fragrance, considering his magnitude? Must it not be to that famous elephant with jewelled tusks, and redolent with myrrh, which was led out of an Indian town to do honour to Alexander the Great? Chapter 93 The Castaway It was but some few days after encountering the Frenchman that a most significant event befell the most insignificant of the Pequod's crew, an event most lamentable, and which ended in providing the sometimes madly merry and predestinated craft with a living and ever-accompanying prophecy of whatever shattered sequel might prove her own. Now, in the whale-ship it is not every one that goes in the boats. Some few hands are reserved called ship-keepers, whose province it is to work the vessel while the boats are pursuing the whale. As a general thing, these ship-keepers are as hardy fellows as the men comprising the boat's crew. But if there happens to be an unduly slender, clumsy, or timorous white in the ship, that white is certain to be made a ship-keeper. It was so in the Pequod with the little negro Pippin, by nickname, Pip by abbreviation. Poor Pip! You have heard of him before. You must remember his tambourine on that dramatic midnight so gloomy jolly. In outer aspect, Pip and Doughboy made a match, like a black pony and a white one, of equal developments, though of dissimilar color, driven in one eccentric span. But while hapless Doughboy was by nature dull and torpid in his intellects, Pip, though over-tender-hearted, was at bottom very bright, with that pleasant, genial, jolly brightness peculiar to his tribe a tribe which ever enjoy all holidays and festivities with finer, freer relish than any other race. For blacks the year's calendar should show naught but three hundred and sixty-five Fourth of Julys and New Year's Days. Nor smile so while I write that this little black was brilliant, for even blackness has its brilliancy, behold yon lustrous ebony, panelled in king's cabinets." But Pip loved life and all life's peaceable securities, so that the panic-striking business in which he had somehow unaccountably become entrapped had most sadly blurred his brightness, though, as ere long will be seen, what was thus temporarily subdued in him in the end was destined to be luridly illuminated by strange wild fires that fictitiously showed him off to ten times the natural luster with which in his native Tallinn County in Connecticut he had once enlivened many a fiddler's frolic on the green, and at melodious eventide with his gay ha-ha had turned the round horizon into one star-belled tambourine. So, though in the clear air of day, suspended against a blue-veined neck, the pure-watered diamond drop will healthful glow, yet when the cunning jeweller would show you the diamond in its most impressive luster, he lays it against a gloomy ground, and then lights it up, not by the sun, but by some unnatural gases. Then come out those fiery effulgences, infernally superb, then the evil blazing diamond, once the divinest symbol of the crystal skies, looks like some crown jewel stolen from the king of hell. But let us to the story. It came to pass that in the Ambergris affair Stubbs after oarsman chanced so to sprain his hand as for a time to become quite maimed, and temporarily Pip was put in his place. The first time Stubb lowered with him, Pip evinced much nervousness, but happily for that time escaped close contact with the whale, and therefore came off not altogether discreditably, though Stubb, observing him, took care afterwards to exhort him to cherish his courageousness to the utmost, for he might often find it needful. Now, upon the second lowering, the boat paddled upon the whale, and as the fish received the darted iron, it gave its customary rap which happened in this instance to be right under poor Pip's seat. The involuntary consternation of the moment caused him to leap, paddle in hand, out of the boat, and in such a way that part of the slack whale line coming against his chest, he breasted it overboard with him so as to become entangled in it, when at last plumping into the water. 
That instant the stricken whale started on a fierce run, the line swiftly straightened, and presto, poor Pip came all foaming up to the chocks of the boat, remorselessly dragged there by the line which had taken several turns around his chest and neck. Tashtego stood in the bows. He was full of the fire of the hunt. He hated Pip for a poltroon. Snatching the boat-knife from its sheath, he suspended its sharp edge over the line, and, turning towards Stubb, exclaimed interrogatively, Cut! Meantime, Pip's blue, choked face plainly looked, Do, for God's sake! All passed in a flash. In less than half a minute, this entire thing happened. Damn him, cut! roared Stubb, and so the whale was lost, and Pip was saved. So soon as he recovered himself, the poor little negro was assailed by yells and execrations from the crew. Tranquilly permitting these irregular cursings to evaporate, Stubb then, in a plain, business-like, but still half-humorous manner, cursed Pip officially, and that done unofficially gave him much wholesome advice. The substance was, never jump from a boat, Pip, except— but all the rest was indefinite, as the soundest advice ever is. Now, in general, stick to the boat is your true motto in whaling. But cases will sometimes happen when leap from the boat is still better. Moreover, as if perceiving at last that if he should give undiluted conscientious advice to Pip, he would be leaving him too wide a margin to jump in for the future, Stubb suddenly dropped all advice and concluded with a peremptory command, "'Stick to the boat, Pip, or by the Lord I won't pick you up if you jump, mind that. We can't afford to lose whales by the likes of you. A whale would sell for thirty times what you would, Pip, in Alabama. Bear that in mind.' and don't jump any more. Hereby, perhaps, Stubb indirectly hinted that, though man loved his fellow, yet man is a money-making animal, which propensity too often interferes with his benevolence. But we are all in the hands of the gods, and Pip jumped again. It was under very similar circumstances to the first performance, but this time he did not breast out the line, and hence, when the whale started to run, Pip was left behind on the sea, like a hurried traveller's trunk. Alas, Stubb was but too true to his word. It was a beautiful, bounteous blue day, the spangled sea calm and cool, and flatly stretching away, all round to the horizon, like gold-beater's skin hammered out to the extremist. Bobbing up and down in that sea, Pip's ebon head showed like a head of cloves, no boat-knife was lifted when he fell so rapidly astern. Stubb's inexorable back was turned upon him, and the whale was winged. In three minutes a whole mile of shoreless ocean was between Pip and Stubb. Out of the center of the sea, poor Pip turned his crisp, curling black head to the sun, another lonely castaway, though the loftiest and the brightest. Now, in calm weather... To swim in the open ocean is as easy to the practiced swimmer as to ride in a spring carriage ashore, but the awful lonesomeness is intolerable. The intense concentration of self in the middle of such a heartless immensity, my God, who can tell it? Mark how when sailors in a dead calm bathe in the open sea, mark how closely they hug their ship, and only coast along her sides." But had Stubb really abandoned the poor little negro to his fate? No, he did not mean to, at least, because there were two boats in his wake, and he supposed, no doubt, that they would, of course, come up to Pip very quickly and pick him up, though, indeed, such considerations towards oarsmen jeopardized through their own timidity is not always manifested by the hunters in all similar instances, and such instances not unfrequently occur, Almost invariably in the fishery, a coward, so-called, is marked with the same ruthless detestation peculiar to military navies and armies. But it so happened that those boats, without seeing Pip, suddenly spying whales close to them on one side, turned and gave chase, and Stubb's boat was now so far away, and he and all his crew so intent upon the fish, that Pip's ringed horizon began to expand around him miserably. 
By the merest chance the ship itself at last rescued him, but from that hour the little negro went about the deck an idiot, such at least they said he was. The sea had jeeringly kept his finite body up, but drowned the infinite of his soul. Not drowned entirely, though, rather carried down alive to wondrous depths, where strange shapes of the unwarped primal world glided to and fro before his passive eyes, and the miser merman, wisdom, revealed his hoarded heaps, and among the joyous, heartless, ever juvenile eternities, Pip saw the multitudinous, God omnipresent, coral insects that out of the firmament of waters heaved the colossal orbs. He saw God's foot upon the treadle of the loom, and spoke it, and therefore his shipmates called him mad. So man's insanity is heaven's sense, and wandering from all mortal reason, man comes at last to that celestial thought, which to reason is absurd and frantic, and weal or woe feels then uncompromised, indifferent as his God. For the rest, blame not Stubb too hardly. The thing is common in that fishery, and in the sequel of the narrative it will then be seen what like abandonment befell myself. Chapter 94 A Squeeze of the Hand That whale of Stubbs, so dearly purchased, was duly brought to the Pequod's side, where all those cutting and hoisting operations previously detailed were regularly gone through, even to the bailing of the Heidelberg Tun, or Case. While some were occupied with this latter duty, others were employed in dragging away the larger tubs so soon as filled with the sperm, and when the proper time arrived, this same sperm was carefully manipulated ere going to the tri-works, of which anon. It had cooled and crystallized to such a degree that when, with several others, I sat down before a large Constantine's bath of it, I found it strangely concreted into lumps, here and there rolling about in the liquid part. It was our business to squeeze these lumps back into fluid. A sweet and unctuous duty. No wonder that in old times this sperm was such a favorite cosmetic. Such a clearer, such a sweetener, such a softener, such a delicious mollifier. After having my hands in it for only a few minutes, my fingers felt like eels, and began, as it were, to serpentine and spiralize. As I sat there at my ease, cross-legged on the deck, after the bitter exertion at the windlass, under a blue tranquil sky, the ship under indolent sail, and gliding so serenely along, as I bathed my hands among those soft, gentle globules of infiltrated tissues, woven almost within the hour, as they richly broke to my fingers and discharged all their opulence like fully ripe grapes their wine, as I snuffed up that uncontaminated aroma, literally and truly like the smell of spring violets, I declare to you that for the time I lived as in a musky meadow, I forgot all about our horrible oath. In that inexpressible sperm I washed my hands and my heart of it. I almost began to credit the old Paracelsian superstition that sperm is of rare virtue in allaying the heat of anger. While bathing in that bath, I felt divinely free from all ill will or petulance or malice of any sort whatsoever. Squeeze, 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 all the morning long I squeezed that sperm till I myself almost melted into it. I squeezed that sperm till a strange sort of insanity came over me, and I found myself unwittingly squeezing my co-laborers' hands in it, mistaking their hands for the gentle globules. Such an abounding, affectionate, friendly, loving feeling did this avocation beget, that at last I was continually squeezing their hands, and looking up into their eyes sentimentally, as much as to say, Oh, my dear fellow beings, why should we longer cherish any social acerbities, or know the slightest ill humor or envy? Come, let us squeeze hands all round. Nay, let us all squeeze ourselves into each other. Let us squeeze ourselves universally into the very milk and sperm of kindness. 
would that I could keep squeezing that sperm forever. For now, since by many prolonged, repeated experiences, I have perceived that in all cases man must eventually lower, or at least shift his conceit of attainable felicity, not placing it anywhere in the intellect or the fancy, but in the wife, the heart, the bed, the table, the saddle, the fireside, the country. Now that I have perceived all this, I am ready to squeeze case eternally. In thoughts of the visions of the night, I saw long rows of angels in paradise, each with his hands in a jar of spermaceti. Now, while discoursing on sperm, it behooves to speak of other things akin to it, in the business of preparing the sperm whale for the triworks. First comes white horse, so called, which is obtained from the tapering part of the fish, and also from the thicker portions of his flukes. It is tough with congealed tendons, a wad of muscle, but still contains some oil. After being severed from the whale, the white horse is first cut into portable oblongs, ere going to the mincer. They look much like blocks of Berkshire marble. Plum pudding is the term bestowed upon certain fragmentary parts of the whale's flesh, here and there adhering to the blanket of blubber, and often participating to a considerable degree in its unctuousness. It is a most refreshing, convivial, beautiful object to behold. As its name imports, it is of an exceedingly rich, mottled tint, with a bestreaked snowy and golden ground, dotted with spots of the deepest crimson and purple. It is plums of rubies in pictures of citron. Spite of reason, it is hard to keep yourself from eating it. I confess that once I stole behind the foremast to try it. It tasted something as I should conceive a royal cutlet from the thigh of Louis Le Gros might have tasted, supposing him to have been killed the first day after the venison season, and that particular venison season contemporary with an unusually fine vintage of the vineyards of Champagne. There is another substance, and a very singular one, which turns up in the course of this business, but which I feel it to be very puzzling adequately to describe, it is called slob gallion, an appellation original with the whaleman, and even so is the nature of the substance. It is an ineffably oozy, stringy affair, most frequently found in the tubs of sperm after a prolonged squeezing and subsequent decanting. I hold it to be the wondrously thin, ruptured membranes of the case, coalescing. Glurry, so called, is a term properly belonging to right whalemen, but sometimes incidentally used by the sperm fishermen. It designates the dark, glutinous substance which is scraped off the back of the Greenland or right whale, and much of which covers the decks of those inferior souls who hunt that ignoble leviathan. Nippers. Strictly this word is not indigenous to the whale's vocabulary, but as applied by whalemen it becomes so. A whaleman's nipper is the short, firm strip of tendinous stuff cut from the tapering part of the leviathan's tail. It averages an inch in thickness, and for the rest is about the size of the iron part of a hoe. Edgewise moved along the oily deck, it operates like a leathern squilgee, and by nameless blandishments, as of magic, allures along with it all impurities. But to learn all about these recondite matters, your best way is at once to descend into the blubber room, and have a long talk with its inmates. This place has previously been mentioned as the receptacle for the blanket pieces when stripped and hoisted from the whale. When the proper time arrives for cutting up its contents, this apartment is a scene of terror to all tyros, especially by night. On one side, lit by a dull lantern, a space has been left clear for the workmen. They generally go in pairs, a pike and gaffman and a spademan. The whaling pike is similar to a frigate's boarding weapon of the same name. The gaff is something like a boat hook. With his gaff, the gaffman hooks on to a sheet of blubber and strives to hold it from slipping as the ship pitches and lurches about. Meanwhile, the spademan stands on the sheet itself, perpendicularly chopping it into the portable horse pieces. 
This spade is sharp as hone can make it. The spademan's feet are shoeless. The thing he stands on will sometimes irresistibly slide away from him like a sledge. If he cuts off one of his own toes, or one of his assistants, would you be very much astonished? Toes are scarce among veteran blubber-room men. Chapter 95 The Cassock had you stepped on board the Pequod at a certain juncture of this post-mortemizing of the whale, and had you strolled forward nigh the windlass, pretty sure am I that you would have scanned with no small curiosity a very strange enigmatical object, which you would have seen there lying along lengthwise in the lee scuppers. Not the wondrous cistern in the whale's huge head, not the prodigy of his unhinged lower jaw, not the miracle of his symmetrical tail, none of these would so surprise you as half a glimpse of that unaccountable cone, longer than a Kentuckian is tall, nigh a foot in diameter at the base, and jet black as Yojo, the ebony idol of Queequeg. And an idol indeed it is, or rather in old times its likeness was, such an idol as that found in the secret groves of Queen Macha in Judea, and for worshipping which King Asa her son did depose her, and destroyed the idol, and burnt it for an abomination at the brook Kedron, as darkly set forth in the fifteenth chapter of the first book of Kings. Look at the sailor called the Mincer, who now comes along, and, assisted by two allies, heavily backs the Grandissimus, as mariners call it, and with bowed shoulders staggers off with it as if he were a grenadier carrying a dead comrade from the field. Extending it upon the forecastle deck, he now proceeds cylindrically to remove its dark pelt, as an African hunter the pelt of a boa. This done, he turns the pelt inside out, like a pantaloon leg, gives it a good stretching so as almost to double its diameter, and at last hangs it well spread to the rigging to dry. Ere long it is taken down, when removing some three feet of it towards the pointed extremity, and then cutting two slits for armholes at the other end, he lengthwise slips himself bodily into it. The mincer now stands before you invested in the full canonicals of his calling. Immemorial to all his order, this investiture alone will adequately protect him, while employed in the peculiar functions of his office." That office consists in mincing the horse pieces of blubber for the pots, an operation which is conducted at a curious wooden horse, planted endwise against the bulwarks, and with a capacious tub beneath it, into which the minced pieces drop, fast as the sheets from a rapt orator's desk. Arrayed in decent black, occupying a conspicuous pulpit, intent on Bible leaves, what a candidate for an archbishopric! What a lad for a pope were this mincer. Footnote. Bible leaves, Bible leaves. This is the invariable cry from the mates to the mincer. It enjoins him to be careful and cut his work into as thin slices as possible, inasmuch as, by so doing, the business of boiling out the oil is much accelerated, and its quantity considerably increased, besides perhaps improving it in quality. End of footnote. Chapter 96 The Triworks Besides her hoisted boats, an American whaler is outwardly distinguished by her triworks. She presents the curious anomaly of the most solid masonry joining with oak and hemp in constituting the completed ship. It is as if from the open field a brick kiln were transported to her planks. The triworks are planted between the foremast and the mainmast, the most roomy part of the deck. The timbers beneath are of a peculiar strength, fitted to sustain the weight of an almost solid mass of brick and mortar some ten feet by eight square, and five in height. The foundation does not penetrate the deck, but the masonry is firmly secured to the surface by ponderous knees of iron, bracing it on all sides, and screwing it down to the timbers. On the flanks it is cased with wood, and at top completely covered by a large, sloping, battened hatchway. 
removing this hatch we exposed the great tripods, two in number, and each of several barrels capacity. When not in use, they are kept remarkably clean. Sometimes they are polished with soapstone and sand, till they shine within like silver punch bowls. During the night watches, some cynical old sailors will crawl into them, and coil themselves away there for a nap. While employed in polishing them, one man in each pot, side by side, many confidential communications are carried on over the iron lips. It is a place also for profound mathematical meditation. It was in the left-hand tripod of the Pequod, with the soapstone diligently circling round me, that I was first indirectly struck by the remarkable fact that in geometry all bodies gliding along the cycloid, my soapstone, for example, will descend from any point in precisely the same time. Removing the fireboard from the front of the triworks, the bare masonry of that side is exposed, penetrated by the two iron mouths of the furnaces, directly underneath the pots. These mouths are fitted with heavy doors of iron. The intense heat of the fire is prevented from communicating itself to the deck by means of a shallow reservoir extending under the entire enclosed surface of the works. By a tunnel inserted at the rear, this reservoir is kept replenished with water as fast as it evaporates. There are no external chimneys, they open direct from the rear wall. And here let us go back for a moment. It was about nine o'clock at night that the Pequod's triworks were first started on this present voyage. It belonged to Stubb to oversee the business. All ready there? Off hatch then, and starter. You cook, fire the works. This was an easy thing, for the carpenter had been thrusting his shavings into the furnace throughout the passage. Here be it said that in a whaling voyage the first fire in the triworks has to be fed for a time with wood. After that no wood is used except as a means of quick ignition to the staple fuel. In a word, after being tried out, the crisp shriveled blubber, now called scraps or fritters, still contains considerable of its unctuous properties. These fritters feed the flames. Like a plethoric burning martyr or self-consuming misanthrope, once ignited, the whale supplies his own fuel and burns by his own body. Would that he consumed his own smoke, for his smoke is horrible to inhale, and inhale it you must, and not only that, but you must live in it for the time. It has an unspeakable wild Hindu odor about it, such as may lurk in the vicinity of funeral pyres. It smells like the left wing of the Day of Judgment. It is an argument for the pit. By midnight, the works were in full operation. We were clear from the carcass, sail had been made, the wind was freshening, the wild ocean darkness was intense. But that darkness was licked up by the fierce flames, which at intervals forked forth from the sooty flues and illuminated every lofty rope in the rigging, as with the famed Greek fire. The burning ship drove on as if remorselessly commissioned to some vengeful deed, so the pitch and sulphur-freighted brigs of the bold hydriote Canaris, issuing from their midnight harbors with broad sheets of flame for sails, bore down upon the Turkish frigates and folded them in conflagrations. The hatch, removed from the top of the works, now afforded a wide hearth in front of them. Standing on this were the Tartarian shapes of the pagan harpooners, always the whale-ship's stokers. With huge pronged poles they pitched hissing masses of blubber into the scalding pots, or stirred up the fires beneath, till the snaky flames darted, curling, out of the doors to catch them by the feet. The smoke rolled away in sullen heaps. To every pitch of the ship there was a pitch of the boiling oil, which seemed all eagerness to leap into their faces. Opposite the mouth of the works, on the further side of the wide wooden hearth, was the windlass. This served for a sea sofa. Here lounged the watch, when not otherwise employed, looking into the red heat of the fire till our eyes felt scorched in their heads. Their tawny features, now all begrimed with smoke and sweat, their matted beards, and the contrasting barbaric brilliancy of their teeth, 
all these were strangely revealed in the capricious emblazonings of the works. As they narrated to each other their unholy adventures, their tales of terror told in words of mirth, as their uncivilized laughter forked upwards out of them, like the flames from the furnace, as to and fro in their front the harpooners wildly gesticulated with their huge pronged forks and dippers, as the wind howled on and the sea leaped and the ship groaned and dived, and yet steadfastly shot her red hell further and further into the blackness of the sea and the night, and scornfully champed the white bone in her mouth, and viciously spat round her on all sides, then the rushing Pequod, freighted with savages, and laden with fire, and burning a corpse, and plunging into that blackness of darkness, seemed the material counterpart of her monomaniac commander's soul. So seemed it to me, as I stood at her helm, and for long hours silently guided the way of this fire-ship on the sea. Wrapped for that interval in darkness myself, I but the better saw the redness, the madness, the ghastliness of others. The continual sight of the fiend shapes before me, capering half in smoke and half in fire, these at last begat kindred visions in my soul, so soon as I began to yield to that unaccountable drowsiness which ever would come over me at a midnight helm. But that night in particular a strange and ever since inexplicable thing occurred to me. Starting from a brief standing sleep, I was horribly conscious of something fatally wrong. The jawbone tiller smote my side, which leaned against it. In my ears was the low hum of sails, just beginning to shake in the wind. I thought my eyes were open. I was half conscious of putting my fingers to the lids, and mechanically stretching them still further apart. But spite of all this, I could see no compass before me to steer by though it seemed but a minute since I had been watching the card, by the steady binnacle lamp illuminating it. Nothing seemed before me but a jet gloom, now and then made ghastly by flashes of redness. Uppermost was the impression that whatever swift rushing thing I stood on was not so much bound to any haven ahead as rushing from all havens astern. A stark, bewildered feeling as of death came over me. Convulsively my hands grasped the tiller, but with the crazy conceit that the tiller was, somehow, in some enchanted way, inverted. My God, what is the matter with me, I thought. Lo, in my brief sleep I had turned myself about, and was fronting the ship's stern, with my back to her prow and the compass. In an instant I faced back, just in time to prevent the vessel from flying up into the wind, and very probably capsizing her. How glad and how grateful the relief from this unnatural hallucination of the night, and the fatal contingency of being brought by the lee. Look not too long in the face of fire, O oh man. Never dream with thy hand on the helm. Turn not thy back to the compass. Accept the first hint of the hitching tiller. Believe not the artificial fire, when its redness makes all things look ghastly. Tomorrow, in the natural sun, the skies will be bright. Those who glared like devils in the forking flames, the morn will show in far other, at least gentler, relief. The glorious, golden, glad sun, the only true lamp, all others but liars. Nevertheless, the sun hides not Virginia's dismal swamp, nor Rome's accursed Campagna, nor wide Sahara, nor all the millions of miles of deserts and of griefs beneath the moon. The sun hides not the ocean, which is the dark side of this earth, and which is two-thirds of this earth. So, therefore, that mortal man who hath more of joy than sorrow in him, that mortal man cannot be true, not true or undeveloped. With books the same, the truest of all men was the man of sorrows, and the truest of all books is Solomon's, and Ecclesiastes is the fine-hammered steel of woe. All is vanity. All. This willful world hath not got hold of unchristian Solomon's wisdom yet, but he who dodges hospitals and jails, and walks fast crossing graveyards, and would rather talk of operas than hell, 
calls Cowper, Young, Pascal, Rousseau, poor devils all of sick men, and throughout a carefree lifetime swears by Rabelais as passing wise and therefore jolly, not that man is fitted to sit down on tombstones and break the green damp mould with unfathomably wondrous Solomon. But even Solomon, he says, the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain, i.e., even while living, in the congregation of the dead. Give not thyself up then to fire, lest it invert thee, deaden thee, as for the time it did me. There is a wisdom that is woe, but there is a woe that is madness. And there is a Catskill eagle in some souls that can alike dive down into the blackest gorges, and soar out of them again, and become invisible in the sunny spaces. And even if he forever flies within the gorge, that gorge is in the mountains, so that even in his lowest swoop the mountain eagle is still higher than other birds upon the plain, even though they soar. End of chapters 92 to 96 Moby Dick, chapters 97 to 100 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 97 to 100. Chapter 97 The Lamp had you descended from the Pequod's triworks to the Pequod's forecastle, where the off-duty watch were sleeping, for one single moment you would have almost thought you were standing in some illuminated shrine of canonized kings and counselors. There they lay in their triangular oaken vaults, each mariner a chiseled muteness, a score of lamps flashing upon his hooded eyes. In merchantmen, oil for the sailor is more scarce than the milk of queens. To dress in the dark, to eat in the dark, and stumble in darkness to his pallet, this is his usual lot. But the whaleman, as he seeks the food of light, so he lives in light. He makes his berth an Aladdin's lamp, and lays him down to it, so that in the pitchous night the ship's black hull still houses an illumination." See with what entire freedom the whaleman takes his handful of lamps, often but old bottles and vials, though, to the copper cooler at the triworks, and replenishes them there, as mugs of ale at a vat. He burns, too, the purest of oils, in its unmanufactured and therefore unvitiated state, a fluid unknown to solar, lunar, or astral contrivances ashore, it is as sweet as early grass butter in April. He goes and hunts for his oil, so as to be sure of its freshness and genuineness, even as the traveler on the prairie hunts up his own supper of game. Chapter 98 Stowing Down and Clearing Up Already it has been related how the great Leviathan is afar off descried from the masthead, how he is chased over the watery moors, and slaughtered in the valleys of the deep, how he is then towed alongside and beheaded, and how, on the principle which entitled the headsman of old to the garments in which the beheaded was killed, his great padded surtout becomes the property of his executioner, how in due time he is condemned to the pots, and like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his spermaceti, oil, and bone pass unscathed through the fire. But now it remains to conclude the last chapter of this part of the description by rehearsing, singing if I may, the romantic proceeding of decanting off his oil into the casks and striking them down into the hold, where once again Leviathan returns to his native profundities, sliding along beneath the surface as before, but, alas, never more to rise and blow. While still warm, the oil, like hot punch, is received into the six-barrel casks, 
And while, perhaps, the ship is pitching and rolling this way and that in the midnight sea, the enormous casks are slewed round and headed over, end for end, and sometimes perilously scoot across the slippery deck, like so many landslides, till at last, manhandled and stayed in their course, and all round the hoops rap-rap go as many hammers as can play upon them, for now, ex officio, every sailor is a cooper. At length, when the last pint is casked, and all is cool, then the great hatchways are unsealed, the bowels of the ship are thrown open, and down go the casks to their final rest in the sea. This done, the hatches are replaced and hermetically closed, like a closet walled up. In the sperm fishery, this is perhaps one of the most remarkable incidents in all the business of whaling. One day the planks stream with freshets of blood and oil, on the sacred quarter-deck enormous masses of the whale's head are profanely piled, great rusty casks lie about as in a brewery yard, the smoke from the triworks is besooted all the bulwarks, the mariners go about suffused with unctuousness, the entire ship seems great leviathan himself, while on all hands the din is deafening. But a day or two after, you look about you and prick your ears in this self-same ship, and were it not for the tell-tale boats and triworks, you would all but swear you trod some silent merchant vessel with a most scrupulously neat commander. The unmanufactured sperm oil possesses a singularly cleansing virtue. This is the reason why the decks never look so white as just after what they call an affair of oil. Besides, from the ashes of the burned scraps of the whale, a potent lie is readily made, and whenever any adhesiveness from the back of the whale remains clinging to the side, that lie quickly exterminates it. Hands go diligently along the bulwarks, and with buckets of water and rags to restore them to their full tidiness. The soot is brushed from the lower rigging. All the numerous implements which have been in use are likewise faithfully cleansed and put away. The great hatch is scrubbed and placed upon the triworks, completely hiding the pots. Every cask is out of sight, all tackles are coiled in unseen nooks, and when, by the combined and simultaneous industry of almost the entire ship's company, the whole of this conscientious duty is at last concluded, then the crew themselves proceed to their own ablutions, shift themselves from top to toe, and finally issue to the immaculate deck, fresh and all aglow, as bridegroom new leaped from out of the daintiest Holland. Now, with elated step, they pace the planks in twos and threes, and humorously discourse of parlors, sofas, carpets, and fine cambrics, propose to mat the deck, think of having hanging to the top, object not to taking tea by moonlight on the piazza of the forecastle. To hint to such musked mariners of oil and bone and blubber were little short of audacity. They know not the thing you distantly allude to. Away, and bring us napkins. But mark, aloft there, at the three mastheads, stand three men intent on spying out more whales, which, if caught, infallibly will again soil the old oaken furniture, and drop at least one small grease spot somewhere. Yes, and many is the time when, after the severest uninterrupted labors which know no night, continuing straight through for ninety-six hours, when from the boat, where they have swelled their wrists with all day rowing on the line, they only step to the deck to carry vast chains and heave the heavy windlass and cut and slash, yea, and in their very sweatings to be smoked and burned anew by the combined fires of the equatorial sun and the equatorial triworks. When, on the heels of all this, they have finally bestirred themselves to cleanse the ship, and make a spotless dairy room of it, many is the time the poor fellows, just buttoning the necks of their clean frocks, are startled by the cry of, There she blows! And away they fly to fight another whale, and go through the whole weary thing again. Ah, oh, my friends, but this is man-killing! Yet this is life! For hardly have we mortals, by long toilings, extracted from this world's vast bulk its small but valuable sperm, 
and then with weary patience cleansed ourselves from its defilements, and learned to live here in clean tabernacles of the soul, hardly is this done when, there she blows, the ghost is spouted up, and away we sail to fight some other world, and go through young life's old routine again. Oh, the metempsychosis! Oh, Pythagoras, that in bright Greece two thousand years ago did die, so good, so wise, so mild! I sailed with thee along the Peruvian coast last voyage, and, foolish as I am, taught thee, a green, simple boy, how to splice a rope. Chapter 99 The Doubloon Ere now it has been related how Ahab was wont to pace his quarter-deck, taking regular turns at either limit, the binnacle and mainmast, but in the multiplicity of other things requiring narration it has not been added how that sometimes in these walks, when most plunged in his mood, he was wont to pause in turn at each spot, and stand there strangely eyeing the particular object before him. When he halted before the binnacle, with his glance fastened on the pointed needle in the compass, that glance shot like a javelin with the pointed intensity of his purpose. And when resuming his walk, he again paused before the mainmast, then, as the same riveted glance fastened upon the riveted gold coin there, he still wore the same aspect of nailed firmness, only dashed with a certain wild longing, if not hopefulness. But one morning, turning to pass the doubloon, he seemed to be newly attracted by these strange figures and inscriptions stamped on it, as though now, for the first time, beginning to interpret for himself, in some monomaniac way, whatever significance might lurk in them. And some certain significance lurks in all things, else all things are little worth, and the round world itself but an empty cipher, except to sell by the cartload as they do hills about Boston, to fill up some morass in the Milky Way. Now this doubloon was of purest virgin gold, raked somewhere out of the heart of gorgeous hills, whence east and west over golden sands the headwaters of many a Pactolus flows, and though now nailed amidst all the rustiness of iron bolts and the verdigris of copper spikes, yet untouchable and immaculate to any foulness, it still preserved its Quito glow, nor though placed amongst a ruthless crew and every hour passed by ruthless hands, and through the live-long nights shrouded with thick darkness which might cover any pilfering approach, nevertheless every sunrise found the doubloon where sunset left at last, for it was set apart and sanctified to one awe-striking end, and however wanton in their sailor ways, one and all, the mariners revered it as the white whale's talisman. Sometimes they talked it over in the weary watch by night, wondering whose it was to be at last and whether he would ever live to spend it. Now those noble golden coins of South America are as medals of the sun and tropic token pieces. Here palms, alpacas, and volcanoes, sun's discs and stars, ecliptics, horns of plenty, and rich banners waving are in luxuriant profusion stamped, so that the precious gold seems almost to derive an added preciousness and enhancing glories by passing through those fancy mints, so Spanishly poetic. It so chanced that the doubloon of the Pequod was a most wealthy example of these things. On its round border it bore the letters, Republica del Ecuador, Quito. So this bright coin came from a country planted in the middle of the world, and beneath the great equator, and named after it, and it had been cast midway up the Andes, in the unwaning clime that knows no autumn. Zoned by those letters, you saw the likeness of three Andes summits, from one a flame, a tower on another, on the third a crowing cock, while arching over all was a segment of the partitioned zodiac, the signs all marked with their usual cabalistics, and the keystone sun entering the equinoctial point at Libra. Before this equatorial coin, Ahab, not unobserved by others, was now pausing. There's something ever egotistical in mountain tops and towers, 
and all other grand and lofty things. Look here, three peaks as proud as Lucifer. The firm tower, that is Ahab. The volcano, that is Ahab. The courageous, the undaunted, and victorious fowl, that too is Ahab. All are Ahab, and this round gold is but the image of the rounder globe, which, like the magician's glass, to each and every man in turn but mirrors back his own mysterious self. Great pains, small gains, for those who ask the world to solve them. It cannot solve itself. Methinks now this coined sun wears a ruddy face. But see, ay, he enters the sign of storms, the equinox. And but six months before he wheeled out of a former equinox at Ares. From storm to storm, so be it then. Born in throes, it is fit that man should live in pains and die in pangs. So be it then. Here's stout stuff for woe to work on. So be it then. No fairy fingers can have pressed the gold, but the devil's claws must have left their mouldings there since yesterday murmured Starbuck to himself, leaning against the bulwarks. The old man seems to read Belshazzar's awful writing. I have never marked the coin inspectingly. He goes below. Let me read. A dark valley between three mighty heaven-abiding peaks that almost seem the trinity in some faint earthly symbol. So in this veil of death God girds us round, and over all our gloom the sun of righteousness still shines a beacon and a hope. If we bend down our eyes, the dark veil shows her moldy soil, but if we lift them, the bright sun meets our glance halfway to cheer. Yet, oh, the great sun is no fixture. And if, at midnight, we would fain snatch some sweet solace from him, we gaze for him in vain. This coin speaks wisely, mildly, truly, but still sadly to me. I will quit it, lest truth shake me falsely. There now's the old mogul, soliloquized Stubb by the triworks. He's been twigging it, and there goes Starbuck from the same, and both with faces which I should say might be somewhere within nine fathoms long, and all from looking at a piece of gold. Which did I have it now on Negro Hill or in Corlier's Hook? I'd not look at it very long ere spending it. Humph! In my poor, insignificant opinion, I regard this as queer. I have seen doubloons before now in my voyagings. Your doubloons of old Spain, your doubloons of Peru, your doubloons of Chile, your doubloons of Bolivia, your doubloons of Papillon, with plenty of gold moiderets and pistoles, and Joes, and half Joes, and quarter Joes. What should there then be in this doubloon of the equator that is so killing wonderful? By Golconda, let me read it once. Hello! Here's signs and wonders truly. That now is what old Bowditch in his epitome calls the Zodiac, and what my almanac below calls Ditto. I'll get the almanac, and as I have heard devils can be raised with Dabol's arithmetic, I'll try my hand at raising a meaning out of these queer curvicues here with the Massachusetts calendar. Here's the book. Let's see now. Signs and wonders, and the sun. He's always among them. Hem, hem, hem. Here they are. Here they go. All alive. Aries, or the ram. Taurus, or the bull. And Jiminy. Here's Gemini himself, or the twins. Well, the sun he wheels among them. Aye, here on the coin, he's just crossing the threshold, between two of the twelve sitting-rooms all in a ring. Book, you lie there. The fact is, you books must know your places. You do to give us the bare words and facts, but we come in to supply the thoughts. That's my small experience, so far as the Massachusetts calendar and Bowditch's navigator and de Bull's arithmetic go. Signs and wonders, eh? Pity if there is nothing wonderful in signs and significant in wonders. There is a clue somewhere. Wait a bit. Hist! Hark! By Jove! I have it! Look you, doubloon! Your zodiac here is the life of man in one round chapter, 
and now I'll read it off straight out of the book. Come, Almanac. To begin, there's Ares, or the Ram. Lecherous dog, he begets us. Then Taurus, or the Bull, he bumps us the first thing. Then Gemini, or the Twins, that is, Virtue and Vice. We try to reach Virtue. When, lo, comes Cancer the Crab, and drags us back. And here, going from Virtue, Leo, a roaring lion, lies in the path. He gives a few fierce bites and surly dabs with his paw. We escape and hail Virgo, the virgin. That's our first love. We marry and think to be happy for I. When pop comes Libra, or the scales, happiness weighed and found wanting. And while we are very sad about that, Lord, how we suddenly jump, as Scorpio, or the scorpion, stings us in the rear. We are curing the wound, when wang come the arrows all around. Sagittarius, or the archer, is amusing himself. As we pluck out the shafts, stand aside. Here's the battering ram, Capricornus, or the goat. Full tilt he comes rushing, and headlong we are tossed, when Aquarius, or the water-bearer, pours out his whole deluge and drowns us. And to wind up with Pisces, or the fishes, we sleep. There's a sermon now, writ in high heaven and the sun goes through it every year, and yet comes out of it all alive and hearty. Jollily he, aloft there, wheels through toil and trouble, and so, alo, here, does jolly stub. Ah, jolly's the word for I. Adieu, doubloon. But stop. Here comes little King Post. Dodge round the triworks. Now, and let's hear what he'll have to say. There, he's before it. He'll out with something presently. So, so, he's beginning. I see nothing here but a round thing made of gold, and whoever raises a certain whale, this round thing belongs to him. So what's all this staring been about? It is worth sixteen dollars, that's true. And at two cents the cigar, that's, uh, nine hundred and sixty cigars. I won't smoke dirty pipes like Stubb, but I like cigars. And here's nine hundred and sixty of them. So here goes Flask aloft to spy him out. Shall I call that wise or foolish now? If it be really wise, it has a foolish look to it. Yet if it be really foolish, then it has a sort of wisish look to it. But if asked, here comes our old Manxman, the old hearse-driver he must have been, that is, before he took to the sea. He luffs up before the doubloon. Hello, and goes round the other side of the mast. Why, there's a horseshoe nailed on that side. And now he's back again. What does that mean? Hark! He's muttering. Voice like an old, worn-out coffee-mill. Prick ears and listen. If the white whale be raised, it must be in a month and a day when the sun stands in some one of these signs. I've studied signs, and know their marks. They were taught me two score years ago by an old witch in Copenhagen. Now, in what sign will the sun then be? the horseshoe sign, for there it is right opposite the gold. And what's the horseshoe sign? The lion is the horseshoe sign, the roaring and devouring lion. Ship, old ship, my old head shakes to think of thee. Ah, there's another rendering now, but still one text. All sorts of men in one kind of world, you see, Dodge again. Here comes Queequeg, all tattooing. Looks like the signs of the Zodiac himself. What says the cannibal? As I live, he's comparing notes. Looking at his thigh bone, thinks the sun is in the thigh, or in the calf, or in the bowels, I suppose, as the old women talk surgeon's astronomy in the back country. And by Jove, he's found something there in the vicinity of his thigh. I guess it's Sagittarius, or the archer. No, he don't know what to make of the doubloon. He takes it for an old button off some king's trousers. But aside again, here comes that ghost devil, Fadala, tail coiled out of sight as usual, oakum in the toes of his pumps as usual. What does he say with that look of his? Ah, only makes a sign to the sign, and bows himself. There is a sun on the coin. Fire worshipper, depend upon it. Ho! Oh! more and more. This way comes Pip. Poor boy. 
Would he had died, or I. He's half horrible to me. He, too, has been watching all these interpreters, myself included. And look now, he comes to read, with that unearthly idiot face. Stand away again, and hear him. Hark! I look, you look, he looks, we look, ye look, they look. Upon my soul, he's been studying Murray's grammar, improving his mind, poor fellow. But what's that he says now? Hist! I look, you look, he looks, we look, ye look, they look. Why, he's getting it by heart. Hist! Again! I look, you look, he looks, we look, ye look, they look. Well, that's funny. And I, you, and he, and we, ye, and they, are all bats, and I'm a crow, especially when I stand atop of this pine tree here. Caw, 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 ain't I a crow? And where's the scarecrow? There he stands, two bones stuck into a pair of old trousers, and two more poked into the sleeves of an old jacket. Wonder if he means me. Complimentary. Poor lad. I could go and hang myself. Anyway, for the present, I'll quit Pip's vicinity. I can stand the rest, for they have plain wits, but he's too crazy witty for my sanity. So, so, I leave him muttering. Here's the ship's navel, the doubloon here, and they are all on fire to unscrew it. But unscrew your navel, and what's the consequence? Then again, if it stays here, that is ugly, too, for when aught's nailed to the mast, it's a sign that things grow desperate. Ha! Ha! Old Ahab, the white whale, he'll nail you. This is a pine tree. My father, in old Tallinn County, cut down a pine tree once, and found a silver ring grown over in it, some old darkie's wedding ring. How did it get there? And so they'll say in the resurrection, when they come to fish up this old mast, and find a doubloon lodged in it, with bedded oysters for the shaggy bark. Ah, oh, the gold! The precious, precious gold! The green miser'll hoard you soon. Hish! Hish! God goes mong the worlds blackberrying. Cook! Ho! Cook! And cook us! Jenny! Hey! 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 Jenny! Jenny! And get your hoe-cake done! Chapter 100. Leg and Arm. The Pequod of Nantucket meets the Samuel Enderby of London. Ship ahoy! Has seen the white whale! So cried Ahab, once more hailing a ship showing English colors, bearing down under the stern. Trumpet to mouth, the old man was standing in his hoisted quarter-boat, his ivory leg plainly revealed to the stranger captain, who was carelessly reclining in his own boat's bow. He was a darkly tanned, burly, good-natured, fine-looking man of sixty or thereabouts, dressed in a spacious roundabout that hung round him in festoons of blue pilot-cloth, and one empty arm of this jacket streamed behind him like the broidered arm of a hussar's surcoat. "'Has seen the white whale!' "'See you this!' And withdrawing it from the folds that had hidden it, he held up a white arm of sperm-whale bone, terminating in a wooden head like a mallet. "'Man my boat!' cried Ahab, impetuously, and tossing about the oars near him. "'Stand by to lower!' In less than a minute, without quitting his little craft, he and his crew were dropped to the water, and were soon alongside of the stranger." But here a curious difficulty presented itself. In the excitement of the moment, Ahab had forgotten that since the loss of his leg, he had never once stepped on board of any vessel at sea but his own, and then it was always by an ingenious and very handy mechanical contrivance peculiar to the Pequod, and a thing not to be rigged and shipped in any other vessel at a moment's warning. Now it is no very easy matter for anybody, except those who are almost hourly used to it like whalemen, to clamber up a ship's side from a boat on the open sea, 
for the great swells now lift the boat high up toward the bulwarks, then instantaneously drop it halfway down to the kelson. So, deprived of one leg, and the strange ship, of course, being altogether unsupplied with the kindly invention, Ahab now found himself abjectly reduced to a clumsy landsman again, hopelessly eyeing the uncertain, changeful height he could hardly hope to attain. It has before been hinted, perhaps, that every little untoward circumstance that befell him, and which indirectly sprang from his luckless mishap, almost invariably irritated or exasperated Ahab. And in the present instance, all this was heightened by the sight of the two officers of the strange ship, leaning over the side, by the perpendicular ladder of nailed cleats there, and swinging towards him a pair of tastefully ornamented man-ropes. For at first they did not seem to bethink them that a one-legged man must be too much of a cripple to use their sea banisters. But this awkwardness only lasted a minute, because the strange captain, observing at a glance how affairs stood, cried out, I see, I see, a vast heaving there. Jump, boys, and swing over the cutting tackle. As good luck would have it, they had had a whale alongside a day or two previous, and the great tackles were still aloft, and the massive curved blubber hook, now clean and dry, was still attached to the end. This was quickly lowered to Ahab, who, at once comprehending it all, slid his solitary thigh into the curve of the hook, it was like sitting in the fluke of an anchor or the crotch of an apple tree, and then giving the word held himself fast, and at the same time also helped to hoist his own weight by pulling hand over hand upon one of the running parts of the tackle. Soon he was carefully swung inside the high bulwarks and gently landed upon the capstan head. With his ivory arm frankly thrust forth and welcome, the other captain advanced, and Ahab, putting out his ivory leg, and crossing the ivory arm like two swordfish blades, cried out in his walrus way, Aye, aye, hearty, let us shake bones together, an arm and a leg, an arm that never can shrink, do you see, and a leg that never can run. Where didst thou see the white whale? How long ago? The white whale, said the Englishman, pointing his ivory arm towards the east, and taking a rueful sight along it, as if it had been a telescope. There I saw him, on the line last season. And he took that arm off, did he? asked Ahab, now sliding down from the capstan, and resting on the Englishman's shoulder as he did so. Aye, he was the cause of it at least. And that leg, too? Spin me the yarn, said Ahab. How was it? "'It was the first time in my life that I ever cruised on the line,' began the Englishman. "'I was ignorant of the white whale at that time. "'Well, one day we lowered for a pod of four or five whales, "'and my boat fastened to one of them. "'A regular circus horse he was, too, "'that went milling and milling round so, "'that my boat's crew could only trim dish "'by setting all their sterns on the outer gunwale.' Presently up breaches from the bottom of the sea a bouncing great whale, with a milky white head and hump, all crow's feet and wrinkles. It was he! It was he! cried Ahab, suddenly letting out his suspended breath. And harpoon sticking in near his starboard fin. Aye, aye, they were mine, my irons! cried Ahab exultingly. But on! "'Give me a chance, then,' said the Englishman, good-humouredly. "'Well, this old great-grandfather, with a white head and hump, "'runs all a-foam into the pod, "'and goes to snapping furiously at my fast-line. "'Aye, I see. Wanted to part it. Free the fast fish. "'An old trick. I know him.' "'How it was, exactly,' continued the one-armed commander, "'I do not know. But in biting the line it got foul of his teeth.' "'Caught there somehow, but we didn't know it then, "'so that when we afterwards pulled on the line, "'bounce we came plump on to his hump, "'instead of the other whales that went off to windward, all fluking. "'Seeing how matters stood, and what a noble great whale it was, "'the noblest and biggest I ever saw, sir, in my life, "'I resolved to capture him, "'in spite of the boiling rage he seemed to be in, "'and thinking the haphazard line would get loose, or the tooth it was tangled to might draw, for I have a devil of a boat's crew for a pull on a whale-line. Seeing all this, I say, 
I jumped into my first mate's boat. Now, Mr. Mounttop's here. And by the way, Captain, Mounttop, Mounttop, the captain. As I was saying, I jumped into Mounttop's boat, which, do you see, was gunnel and gunnel with mine. Then, snatching the first harpoon, let this old great-grandfather have it. But, Lord, look you, sir, hearts and souls alive, man. The next instant, in a jiff, I was blind as a bat, both eyes out, all befogged and bedeadened with black foam, the whale's tail looming straight up out of it, perpendicular in the air like a marble steeple. No use sterning all then, but as I was groping at midday, with a blinding sun all crown jewels, as I was groping, I say, after the second iron to toss it overboard, down comes the tail like a lima tower, cutting my boat in two, leaving each half in splinters, and flukes first the white hump backed through the wreck, as though it was all chips. We all struck out. To escape his terrible flailings, I seized hold of my harpoon pole, sticking in him, and for a moment clung to that like a sucking fish. But the combing sea dashed me off, and at the same instant the fish, taking one good dart forward, went down in a flash, and the barb of that cursed second iron towing along near me caught me here, clapping his hand just below his shoulder. Yes, caught me just here, I say, and bore me down to hell's flames, I was thinking, when, when all of a sudden, thank the good God, the barb ripped its way along the flesh, clear along the whole length of my arm, came out nigh my wrist, and up I floated. And that gentleman there will tell you the rest. Uh, by the way, Captain, Dr. Bunger, ship surgeon. Bunger, my lad, the captain. Now, Bunger boy, spin your part of the yarn. The professional gentleman, thus familiarly pointed out, had been all the time standing near them, with nothing specific visible to denote his gentlemanly rank on board. His face was an exceedingly round but sober one. He was dressed in a faded blue woolen frock or shirt and patched trousers, and had thus far been dividing his attention between a marling spike he held in one hand and a pill-box held in the other, occasionally casting a critical glance at the ivory limbs of the two crippled captains. But at his superior's introduction of him to Ahab, he politely bowed, and straightway went on to do his captain's bidding. "'It was a shocking bad wound.' began the whale-surgeon, and, taking my advice, Captain Boomer here stood our old Sammy. "'Samuel Enderby is the name of my ship,' interrupted the one-armed captain, addressing Ahab. "'Go on, my boy.' "'Stood our old Sammy off to the northward, to get out of the blazing hot weather there on the line. But it was no use. I did all I could, sat up with him nights, was very severe with him in the matter of diet. "'Oh, very severe!' chimed in the patient himself, then suddenly altering his voice, drinking hot rum toddies with me every night till he couldn't see to put on the bandages, and sending me to bed half seas over about three o'clock in the morning. Oh, ye stars! He sat up with me, indeed, and was very severe in my diet. Oh, a great watcher, and very dietetically severe as Dr. Bunger. "'Bunger, you dog, laugh out, why don't you? "'You know you're a precious jolly rascal. "'But heave ahead, boy. "'I'd rather be killed by you than kept alive by any other man.' "'My captain, you must have ere this perceived, respected sir,' "'said the imperturbable, godly-looking Bunger, "'slightly bowing to Ahab, "'is apt to be facetious at times. "'He spins us many clever things of that sort.' But I may as well say, en passant, as the French remark, that I myself, that is to say, Jack Bunger, late of the reverend clergy, am a strict, total abstinence man. I never drink— Water! cried the captain. He never drinks it. It's a sort of fits to him. Fresh water throws him into the hydrophobia. But go on, go on with the arm story. Yes, I may as well, said the surgeon coolly. I was about observing, sir, before Captain Boomer's facetious interruption, that, spite of my best and severest endeavours, the wound kept getting worse and worse. The truth was, sir, it was as ugly, gaping a wound as surgeon ever saw, more than two feet and several inches long. I measured it with the lead line. In short, it grew black. I knew what was threatened, and off it came. 
but I had no hand in shipping that ivory arm there. That thing is against all rule, pointing at it with the marling spike. That is the captain's work, not mine. He ordered the carpenter to make it. Uh, he had that club hammer there put to the end to knock someone's brains out with, I suppose, as he tried mine once. He flies into diabolical passions sometimes. Do you see this dent, sir? Removing his hat, and brushing aside his hair, and exposing a bowl-like cavity in his skull, but which bore not the slightest scarry trace, nor any token of ever having been a wound. Well, the captain there will tell you how that came here. He knows. No, I don't, said the captain. But his mother did. He was born with it. Oh, you solemn rogue, you, you bunger. Was there ever such another bunger in the watery world? Bunger, when you die, you ought to die in pickle, you dog. You should be preserved to future ages, you rascal. What became of the white whale? now cried Ahab, who thus far had been impatiently listening to this by-play between the two Englishmen. Oh, cried the one-armed captain, oh, yes. Well, after he sounded, we didn't see him again for some time. In fact, as I before hinted, I didn't then know what whale it was that had served me such a trick, till some time afterwards, when coming back to the line, we heard about Moby Dick, as some call him, and then I knew it was he. Didst thou cross his wake again? Twice. But could not fasten? Didn't want to try to. Ain't one limb enough? What should I do without this other arm? And I'm thinking Moby Dick doesn't bite so much as he swallows. Well, then, interrupted Bunger, give him your left arm for bait to get the right. Do you know, gentlemen, very gravely and mathematically bowing to each captain in succession, do you know, gentlemen, that the digestive organs of the whale are so inscrutably constructed by divine providence that it is quite impossible for him to completely digest even a man's arm? And he knows it, too. So that what you take for the white whale's malice is only his awkwardness. For he never means to swallow a single limb. He only thinks to terrify by faints. But sometimes he is like the old juggling fellow, formerly a patient of mine in Ceylon, that making believe to swallow jackknives, once upon a time let one drop into him in good earnest, and there it stayed for a twelve-month or more. When I gave him an emetic, and he heaved it up in small tacks, do you see? No possible way for him to digest that jackknife and fully incorporate it into his general bodily system. Yes, Captain Boomer, if you are quick enough about it, and have a mind to pawn one arm for the sake of the privilege of giving a decent burial to the other, why, in that case, the arm is yours. Only let the whale have another chance at you shortly, that's all. No, thank you, Bunger said the English captain. He's welcome to the arm he has, since I can't help it, and didn't know him then, but not to the other one. No more white whales for me. I've lowered for him once, and that has satisfied me. There would be great glory in killing him, I know that, and there is a shipload of precious sperm in him. But hark ye, he's best let alone. Don't you think so, captain? Glancing at the ivory leg. He is but he will still be hunted for all that. What's best let alone, that accursed thing is not always what least allures. He's all a magnet. How long since thou saw him last? Which way heading? Bless my soul, and curse the foul fiends, cried Bunger, stoopingly walking round Ahab, and like a dog strangely snuffing. This man's blood! Bring the thermometer! It's at the boiling point! His pulse makes these planks beat. Sir, taking a lancet from his pocket and drawing near to Ahab's arm. Avast, roared Ahab, dashing him against the bulwarks. Man the boat. Which way heading? Good God, cried the English captain to whom the question was put. What's the matter? He was heading east, I think. Is your captain crazy? Whispering Fadala. But Fadala, putting a finger on his lips, slid over the bulwark to take the boat's steering oar, and Ahab, swinging the cutting tackle towards him, commanded the ship's sailors to stand by to lower. In a moment he was standing in the boat's stern, and the Manila men were springing to their oars. In vain the English captain hailed him. With back to the stranger ship, 
and face set like a flint to his own, Ahab stood upright till alongside of the Pequod. End of chapters 97 to 100《Moby Dick》Chapters 101 to 104. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills.《Moby Dick》by Herman Melville, Chapters 101 to 104. Chapter 101: The Decanter. Ere the English ship fades from sight, be it set down here that she hailed from London, and was named after the late Samuel Enderby, merchant of that city, the original of the famous whaling-house of Enderby and Sons, a house which, in my poor whaleman's opinion, comes not far behind the united royal houses of the Tudors and Bourbons in point of real historical interest. How long, prior to the year of our Lord, 1775, this great whaling-house was in existence, my numerous fish documents do not make plain. But in that year, 1775, it fitted out the first English ships that ever regularly hunted the sperm-whale, though for some score of years previous, ever since 1726, our valiant coffins and macies of Nantucket in the vineyard had in large fleets pursued that leviathan, but only in the north and south Atlantic, not elsewhere. Be it distinctly recorded here that the Nantucketers were the first among mankind to harpoon with civilized steel the great sperm whale, and that for a half century they were the only people of the whole globe who so harpooned him. In 1778 a fine ship, the Amelia, fitted out for the express purpose and at the sole charge of the vigorous Enderbys, boldly rounded Cape Horn, and was the first among the nations to lower a whaleboat of any sort in the great South Sea. The voyage was a skilful and lucky one, and returning to her berth with her hold full of the precious sperm, the Amelia's example was soon followed by other ships, English and American, and thus the vast sperm whale grounds of the Pacific were thrown open. But not content with this good deed, the indefatigable house again bestirred itself. Samuel and all his sons, how many their mother only knows, and under their immediate auspices, and partly, I think, at their expense, the British government was induced to send the sloop-of-war Rattler on a whaling voyage of discovery into the South Seas. Commanded by a naval post-captain, the Rattler made a rattling voyage of it, and did some service, how much does not appear. But this is not all. In 1819, the same house fitted out a discovery whale ship of their own, to go on a tasting cruise to the remote waters of Japan. That ship, well called the Siren, made a noble experimental cruise, and it was thus that the great Japanese whaling ground first became generally known. The Siren, in this famous voyage, was commanded by a Captain Coffin, a Nantucketer. All honor to the Enderbys, therefore, whose house, I think, exists to the present day, though doubtless the original Samuel must long ago have slipped his cable for the great South Sea of the other world. The ship named after him was worthy of the honor, being a very fast sailor and a noble craft in every way. I boarded her once at midnight somewhere off the Patagonian coast, and drank good flip down in the forecastle. It was a fine gam we had, and they were all trumps, every soul on board, a short life to them and a jolly death. And that fine gam I had, long, very long after old Ahab touched her planks with his ivory heel, it minds me of the noble, solid Saxon hospitality of that ship, and may my parson forget me and the devil remember me if ever I lose sight of it. Flip? Did I say we had flip? Yes, and we flipped it at the rate of ten gallons the hour, 
and when the squall came, for it's squally off there by Patagonia, and all hands, visitors and all, were called to reef topsails, we were so top-heavy that we had to swing each other aloft in bowlins, and we ignorantly furled the skirts of our jackets into the sails, so that we hung there, reefed fast in the howling gale, a warning example to all drunken tars. However, the mast did not go overboard, and by and by we scrambled down, so sober that we had to pass the flip again, though the savage salt spray bursting down the forecastle scuttle rather too much diluted and pickled it to my taste. The beef was fine, tough but with body in it. They said it was bull beef, others that it was dromedary beef, but I do not know for certain how that was. They had dumplings, too, small but substantial, symmetrically globular, and indestructible dumplings. I fancied you could feel them, and roll them about in you after they were swallowed. If you stooped over too far forward, you risked their pitching out of you like billiard balls. The bread, but that couldn't be helped. Besides, it was an anti-scorbutic. In short, the bread contained the only fresh fare they had— but the forecastle was not very light, and it was very easy to step over into a dark corner when you ate it. But all in all, taking her from truck to helm, considering the dimensions of the cook's boilers, including his own live parchment boilers, fore and aft, I say, the Samuel Enderby was a jolly ship, of good fare and plenty, fine flip and strong, crack fellows all, and capital from boot heels to hat band. But why was it, think you, that the Samuel Enderby, and some other English whalers I know of, not all, though, were such famous hospitable ships, that passed round the beef and the bread and the can and the joke, and were not soon weary of eating and drinking and laughing? I will tell you, the abounding good cheer of these English whalers is a matter for historical research, nor have I been at all sparing of historical whale research, when it is seemed needed. The English were preceded in the whale fishery by the Hollanders, Zealanders, and Danes, from whom they derived many terms still extant in the fishery, and what is yet more, their fat old fashions, touching plenty to eat and drink. For, as a general thing, the English merchant ship scrimps her crew, but not so the English whaler. Hence, in the English, this thing of whaling good cheer is not normal and natural, but incidental and particular, and therefore must have some special origin, which is here pointed out, and will be still further elucidated. During my researches in the Leviathanic histories, I stumbled upon an ancient Dutch volume, which, by the musty whaling smell of it, I knew must be about whalers. The title was Dan Koopman, wherefore I concluded that this must be the invaluable memoirs of some Amsterdam cooper in the fishery, as every whale ship must carry its cooper. I was reinforced in this opinion by seeing that it was the production of one Fitz Swackhammer. But my friend, Dr. Snodhead, a very learned man, professor of low Dutch and high German in the College of Santa Claus and St. Potts, to whom I handed the work for translation, giving him a box of sperm candles for his trouble, this same Dr. Snodhead, so soon as he spied the book, assured me that Dan Koopman did not mean the Cooper, but the Merchant. In short, this ancient and learned low Dutch book treated of the commerce of Holland, and, among other subjects, contained a very interesting account of its whale fishery. And in this chapter it was headed smear, or fat, that I found a long, detailed list of the outfits for the larders and cellars of 180 sail of Dutch whalemen, from which list, translated by Dr. Snodhead, I transcribe the following. 400,000 pounds of beef, 60,000 pounds Friesland pork, 150,000 pounds of stockfish, 550,000 pounds of biscuit, 72,000 pounds of soft bread, 2,800 firkins of butter, 20,000 pounds Texel and Leiden cheese, 144,000 pounds cheese, probably an inferior article, 550 anchors of Geneva, 
10,800 barrels of beer. Most statistical tables are parchingly dry in the reading. Not so in the present case, however, where the reader is flooded with whole pipes, barrels, quarts, and gills of good gin and good cheer. At the time I devoted three days to the studious digesting of all this beer, beef, and bread, during which many profound thoughts were incidentally suggested to me, capable of a transcendental and platonic application, and furthermore I compiled supplementary tables of my own, touching the probable quantity of stockfish, etc., consumed by every low Dutch harpooner in that ancient Greenland and Spitzberg and whale fishery. In the first place, the amount of butter and Texel and Leiden cheese consumed seems amazing. I impute it, though, to their naturally unctuous natures, being rendered still more unctuous by the nature of their vocation, and especially by their pursuing their game in those frigid polar seas, on the very coasts of that Eskimo country where the convivial natives pledge each other in bumpers of train oil. The quantity of beer, too, is very large, 10,800 barrels. Now, as those polar fisheries could only be prosecuted in the short summer of that climate, so that the whole crews of one of these Dutch whalemen, including the short voyage to and from the Spitsbergen Sea, did not much exceed three months, say, and reckoning thirty men to each of their fleet of 180 sail, we have 5,400 low Dutch seamen in all. Therefore, I say, we have precisely two barrels of beer per man for a twelve weeks allowance, exclusive of his fair proportion of that 550 anchors of gin. Now, whether these gin and beer harpooners, so fuddled as one might fancy them to have been, were the right sort of men to stand up in a boat's head and take good aim at flying whales, this would seem somewhat improbable. Yet they did aim at them, and hit them too. But this was very far north, be it remembered, where beer agrees well with the constitution. Upon the equator, in our southern fishery, beer would be apt to make the harpooner sleepy at the masthead and boozy in his boat, and grievous loss might ensue to Nantucket and New Bedford. But no more. Enough has been said to show that the old Dutch whalers of two or three centuries ago were high livers, and that the English whalers have not neglected so excellent an example. For, say they, when cruising in an empty ship, if you can get nothing better out of the world, get a good dinner out of it at least. And this empties the decanter. Chapter 102 a Bower in the Arsacides. Hitherto, in descriptively treating of the sperm whale, I have chiefly dwelt upon the marvels of his outer aspect, or separately and in detail upon some few interior structural features. But to a large and thorough sweeping comprehension of him, it behooves me now to unbutton him still further, and untagging the points of his hose, unbuckling his garters, and casting loose the hooks and eyes of the joints of his innermost bones, set him before you in his ultimatum, that is to say, in his unconditional skeleton. But how now, Ishmael? How is it that you, a mere oarsman in the fishery, pretend to know aught about the subterranean parts of the whale? Did erudite Stubb, mounted upon your capstan, deliver lectures on the anatomy of the cetacea, and, by help of the windlass, hold up a specimen rib for exhibition? Explain thyself, Ishmael. Can you land a full-grown whale on your deck for examination, as a cook dishes a roast pig? Surely not. A veritable witness have you hitherto been, Ishmael, but have a care how you seize the privilege of Jonah alone the privilege of discoursing upon the joists and beams, the rafters, ridgepoles, sleepers, and underpinnings, making up the framework of the Leviathan, and be like of the tallow vats, dairy rooms, butteries, and cheeseries in his bowels. I confess that since Jonah few whalemen have penetrated very far beneath the skin of the adult whale. Nevertheless, I have been blessed with an opportunity to dissect him in miniature. 
In a ship I belonged to, a small cub sperm whale was once bodily hoisted to the deck for his poke or bag to make sheaths for the barbs of the harpoons and for the heads of the lances. Think you I let that chance go without using my boat hatchet and jackknife and breaking the seal and reading all the contents of that young cub? And as for my exact knowledge of the bones of the Leviathan in their gigantic, full-grown development, for that rare knowledge I am indebted to my late royal friend Tranquo, king of Tranc, one of the Arsacides. For being at Tranc, years ago, when attached to the trading ship Day of Algiers, I was invited to spend part of the Arsacidean holidays with the lord of Tranc at his retired palm villa at Pupella, a seaside glen not very far distant from what our sailors called Bamboo Town, his capital. Among many other fine qualities, my royal friend Tranquo, being gifted with a devout love for all matters of barbaric vertu, had brought together in Pupella whatever rare things the more ingenious of his people could invent, chiefly carved woods of wonderful devices, chiseled shells, inlaid spears, costly paddles, aromatic canoes, and all these distributed among whatever natural wonders the wonder-freighted, tribute-rendering waves had cast upon his shores. Chief among the latter was a great sperm-whale, which, after an unusually long, raging gale, had been found dead and stranded, with his head against a coconut tree, whose plumage-like tufted droopings seemed his verdant jet. When the vast body had at last been stripped of its fathom-deep enfoldings, and the bones became dust-dry in the sun, then the skeleton was carefully transported up the Pupella Glen, where a grand temple of lordly palms now sheltered it. The ribs were hung with trophies, the vertebrae were carved with Arsacidean annals in strange hieroglyphics, in the skull the priests kept up an unextinguished aromatic flame, so that the mystic head again sent forth its vapory spout, while suspended from a bough, the terrific lower jaw vibrated over all the devotees, like the hair-hung sword that so affrighted Damocles. It was a wondrous sight. The wood was green as mosses of the icy glen. The trees stood high and haughty, feeling their living sap. The industrious earth beneath was as a weaver's loom, with a gorgeous carpet on it, whereof the ground-vine tendrils formed the warp and woof, and the living flowers the figures. All the trees, with all their laden branches, all the shrubs and ferns and grasses, the message-carrying air, all these unceasingly were active. Through the lacings of the leaves the great sun seemed a flying shuttle, weaving the unwearied verdure. O oh, busy weaver, unseen weaver, pause, one word, whither flows the fabric, what palace may it deck, wherefore all these ceaseless toilings, speak, weaver, stay thy hand, but one single word with thee. Nay, the shuttle flies, the figures float from forth the loom, the freshet rushing carpet forever slides away, the weaver god, he weaves, and by that weaving is he deafened, that he hears no mortal voice. And by that humming, we too who look on the loom are deafened, and only when we escape it shall we hear the thousand voices that speak through it. For even so it is in all material factories, the spoken words that are inaudible among the flying spindles, those same words are plainly heard without the walls, bursting from the opened casements. Thereby have villainies been detected. Ah, mortal, then be heedful, for so in all this din of the great world's loom thy subtlest thinkings may be overheard afar. Now amid the green, life-restless loom of that Arsacidean wood, the great, white, worshipped skeleton lay lounging, a gigantic idler, Yet, as the ever-woven, verdant warp and woof intermixed and hummed around him, the mighty idler seemed the cunning weaver, himself all woven over with the vines, every month assuming greener, fresher verdure, but himself a skeleton. Life folded death, death trellised life, the grim god wived with youthful life, 
and begat him curly-headed glories. Now when with the royal tranquo I visited this wondrous whale, and saw the skull and altar and the artificial smoke ascending from where the real jet had issued, I marvelled that the king should regard a chapel as an object of vertu. He laughed. But more I marvelled that the priest should swear that smoky jet of his was genuine. To and fro I paced before this skeleton, brushed the vines aside, broke through the ribs, and with a ball of Arsacidean twine, wandered, eddied long amid its many winding, shaded colonnades and arbors. But soon my line was out, and following it back, I emerged from the opening where I entered. I saw no living thing within. Naught was there but bones. Cutting me a green measuring rod, I once more dived within the skeleton. From their arrow slit in the skull, the priests perceived me taking the altitude of the final rib. How now, they shouted, darest thou measure this, our god? That's for us. Aye, priests, well, how long do you make him, then? But hereupon a fierce contest rose among them, concerning feet and inches. They cracked each other's sconces with their yardsticks. The great skull echoed and seizing that lucky chance, I quickly concluded my own admeasurements. These admeasurements I now propose to set before you. But first be it recorded that, in this matter, I am not free to utter any fancied measurement I please, because there are skeleton authorities you can refer to to test my accuracy. There is a Leviathanic Museum, they tell me, in Hull, England, one of the whaling ports of that country, where they have some fine specimens of finbacks and other whales. Likewise I have heard that in the Museum of Manchester in New Hampshire, they have what the proprietors call, quote, the only perfect specimen of a Greenland or river whale in the United States, end quote. Moreover, at a place in Yorkshire, England, Burton Constable by name, a certain Sir Clifford Constable has in his possession the skeleton of a sperm whale, but of moderate size, by no means of the full-grown magnitude of my friend King Tranquo's. In both cases the stranded whales to which these two skeletons belonged were originally claimed by their proprietors upon similar grounds, King Tranquo seizing his because he wanted it, and Sir Clifford because he was lord of the seigneuries in those parts. Sir Clifford's whale has been articulated throughout, so that like a great chest of drawers, you can open and shut him in all of his bony cavities, spread out his ribs like a gigantic fan, and swing all day upon his lower jaw. Locks are to be put upon some of his trap doors and shutters, and a footman will show round future visitors with a bunch of keys at his side. Sir Clifford thinks of charging tuppence for a peep at the whispering gallery in the spinal column, threepence to hear the echo of the hollow of his cerebellum, and sixpence for the unrivaled view from his forehead. The skeleton dimensions I shall now proceed to set down are copied verbatim from my right arm, where I had them tattooed, as in my wild wanderings at that period there was no other secure way of preserving such valuable statistics, but as I was crowded for space, and wished the other parts of my body to remain a blank page for a poem I was then composing, at least what untattooed parts might remain, I did not trouble myself with the odd inches, nor indeed should inches at all enter into a congenial admeasurement of the whale. Chapter 103. Measurement of the Whale's Skeleton in the first place, I wish to lay before you a particular plain statement touching the living bulk of this leviathan, whose skeleton we are briefly to exhibit. Such a statement may prove useful here. According to a careful calculation I have made, and which I partly base upon Captain Scoresby's estimate of seventy tons for the largest size Greenland whale of sixty feet in length, According to my careful calculation, I say, a sperm whale of the largest magnitude, between 85 and 90 feet in length, and something less than 40 feet in its fullest circumference, such a whale will weigh at least 90 tons, so that reckoning 13 men to a ton, 
he would considerably outweigh the combined population of a whole village of one thousand one hundred inhabitants. Think you not, then, that brains like yoked cattle should be put to this leviathan, to make him at all budge to any landsman's imagination? Having already in various ways put before you his skull, spout-hole, jaw, teeth, tail, forehead, fins, and diverse other parts, I shall now simply point out what is most interesting in the general bulk of his unobstructed bones. But as the colossal skull embraces so very large a proportion of the entire extent of the skeleton, as it is by far the most complicated part, and as nothing is to be repeated concerning it in this chapter, you must not fail to carry it in your mind, or under your arm, as we proceed, otherwise you will not gain a complete notion of the general structure we are about to view. In length, the sperm whale's skeleton at Trank measured seventy-two feet, so that when fully invested and extended in life, he must have been ninety feet long, for in the whale the skeleton loses about one-fifth in length compared with the living body. Of this seventy-two feet, his skull and jaw comprised some twenty feet, leaving some fifty feet of plain backbone. Attached to this backbone, for something less than a third of its length, was the mighty circular basket of ribs which once enclosed his vitals. To me this vast ivory-ribbed chest, with the long unrelieved spine, extending far away from it in a straight line, not a little resembled the hull of a great ship new laid upon the stocks, when only some twenty of her naked bow-ribs are inserted, and the keel is otherwise, for the time, but a long disconnected timber. The ribs were ten on a side. The first, to begin from the neck, was nearly six feet long, the second, third, and fourth were each successively longer, till you came to the climax of the fifth, or one of the middle ribs, which measured eight feet and some inches. From that part the remaining ribs diminished, till the tenth and last only spanned five feet and some inches. In general thickness they all bore a seemly correspondence to their length. The middle ribs were the most arched. In some of the Arsacides they are used for beams, whereon to lay footpath bridges over small streams. In considering these ribs I could not but be struck anew with the circumstance, so variously repeated in this book, that the skeleton of the whale is by no means the mould of his invested form. The largest of the trank ribs, one of the middle ones, occupied that part of the fish which, in life, is greatest in depth. Now the greatest depth of the invested body of this particular whale must have been at least sixteen feet, whereas the corresponding rib measured but little more than eight feet, so that this rib only conveyed half of the true notion of the living magnitude of that part. Besides, for some way, where I now saw but a naked spine, all that had been once wrapped round with tons of added bulk in flesh, muscle, blood, and bowels, Still more, for the ample fins, I here saw but a few disordered joints, and, in place of the weighty and majestic, but boneless flukes, an utter blank. How vain and foolish, then, thought I, for timid, untravelled man to try to comprehend aright this wondrous whale by merely poring over his dead, attenuated skeleton, stretched in this peaceful wood. No, no only in the heart of quickest perils, only when within the eddyings of his angry flukes, only on the profound unbounded sea can the fully invested whale be truly and livingly found out. But the spine, for that the best way we can consider it is, with a crane, to pile its bones high up on end. No speedy enterprise, but now it's done, it looks much like Pompey's pillar." There are forty and odd vertebrae in all, which in the skeleton are not locked together. They mostly lie like the great knobbed blocks on a gothic spire, forming solid courses of heavy masonry. The largest, a middle one, is in width something less than three feet, and in depth more than four. The smallest, where the spine tapers away into the tail, is only two inches in width, and looks something like a white billiard ball. 
I was told that there were still smaller ones, but that they had been lost by some little cannibal urchins, the priest's children, who had stolen them to play marbles with. Thus we see how that the spine of even the hugest of living things tapers off at last into simple child's play. Chapter 104 The Fossil Whale From his mighty bulk the whale affords a most congenial theme whereon to enlarge, amplify, and generally expatiate. Would you, you could not compress him. By good rights he should only be treated of in imperial folio. Not to tell over again his furlongs from spiracle to tail, and the yards he measures about the waist, only think of the gigantic involutions of his intestines, where they lie in him like great cables and hawsers coiled away in the subterranean orlop deck of a line of battleship. Since I have undertaken to manhandle this leviathan, it behooves me to approve myself omnisciently exhaustive in the enterprise, not overlooking the minutest seminal germs of his blood, and spinning him out to the uttermost coil of his bowels. Having already described him in most of his present habitatory and anatomical peculiarities, it now remains to magnify him in an archaeological, fossiliferous, and antediluvian point of view. Applied to any other creature than the leviathan, to an ant or a flea, such portly terms might justly be deemed unwarrantably grandiloquent. But when leviathan is the text, the case is altered. Fain am I to stagger to this emprise under the weightiest words of the dictionary. And here be it said, that whenever it has been convenient to consult one in the course of these dissertations, I have invariably used a huge quarto edition of Johnson, expressly purchased for that purpose, because that famous lexicographer's uncommon personal bulk more than fitted him to compile a lexicon to be used by a whale author like me. One often hears of writers that rise and swell with their subject, though it may seem but an ordinary one. How then with me writing of this leviathan? Unconsciously my chirography expands into placard capitals. Give me a condor's quill. Give me Vesuvius's crater for an inkstand. Friends, hold my arms. For in the mere act of penning my thoughts of this leviathan, they weary me, and make me faint with their outreaching comprehensiveness of sweep, as if to include the whole circle of the sciences, and all the generations of whales, and men, and mastodons, past, present, and to come, with all the revolving panoramas of empire on earth, and throughout the whole universe, not excluding its suburbs. Such and so magnifying is the virtue of a large and liberal theme. We expand to its bulk. To produce a mighty book, you must choose a mighty theme. No great and enduring volume can ever be written on the flea, though many there be who have tried it. Ere entering upon the subject of fossil whales, I present my credentials as a geologist, by stating that in my miscellaneous time I have been a stonemason, and also a great digger of ditches, canals, and wells, wine vaults, and cellars, and cisterns of all sorts. Likewise, by way of preliminary, I desire to remind the reader that while in the earlier geological strata there are found fossils of monsters now almost completely extinct, the subsequent relics discovered in what are called the tertiary formations seem the connecting, or at any rate intercepted, links between the anti-chronical creatures and those whose remote posterity are said to have entered the ark. All the fossil whales hitherto discovered belong to the tertiary period, which is the last preceding the superficial formations. And, though none of them precisely answer to any known species of the present time, they are yet sufficiently akin to them in general respects to justify their taking rank as cetacean fossils. Detached broken fossils of pre-Adamite whales, fragments of their bones and skeletons, have within thirty years past at various intervals been found at the base of the Alps, in Lombardy, in France, in England, in Scotland, and in the states of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. 
Among the more curious of such remains is part of a skull, which in the year 1779 was disinterred in the Rue Dauphin in Paris, a short street opening almost directly upon the palace of the Tuileries, and bones disinterred in excavating the great docks of Antwerp in Napoleon's time. Cuvier pronounced these fragments to have belonged to some utterly unknown leviathanic species. But by far the most wonderful of all cetacean relics was the almost complete vast skeleton of an extinct monster found in the year 1842 on the plantation of Judge Cree in Alabama. The awe-stricken, credulous slaves in the vicinity took it for the bones of one of the fallen angels, the Alabama doctors declared it a huge reptile, and bestowed upon it the name of Basilosaurus. But some specimen bones of it being taken across the sea to Owen, the English anatomist, it turned out that this alleged reptile was a whale, though of a departed species. A significant illustration of the fact, again and again repeated in this book, that the skeleton of the whale furnishes but little clue to the shape of his fully invested body. So Owen rechristened the monster Zuglodon, and in his paper, read before the London Geological Society, pronounced it in substance one of the most extraordinary creatures which the mutations of the globe have blotted out of existence. When I stand among these mighty leviathan skeletons, skulls, tusks, jaws, ribs, and vertebrae, all characterized by partial resemblances to the existing breeds of sea monsters, but at the same time bearing, on the other hand, similar affinities to the annihilated anti-chronicle leviathans, their incalculable seniors, I am, by a flood, borne back to that wondrous period, ere time itself can be said to have begun, for time began with man. Here Saturn's grey chaos rolls over me, and I obtain dim, shuddering glimpses into those polar eternities, when wedged bastions of ice pressed hard upon what are now the tropics, and in all the twenty-five thousand miles of this world's circumference, not an inhabitable hand's breadth of land was visible. Then the whole world was the whales, and, king of creation, he left his wake along the present lines of the Andes and the Himalayas. Who can show a pedigree like Leviathan? Ahab's harpoon had shed older blood than the pharaohs, Methuselah seems a schoolboy. I look round to shake hands with Shem. I am horror-struck at this anti-mosaic, unsourced existence of the unspeakable terrors of the whale, which, having been before all time, must needs exist after all humane ages are over. But not alone has this leviathan left his pre-Adamite traces in the stereotype plates of nature, and in limestone and marl bequeathed his ancient bust. But upon Egyptian tablets, whose antiquity seems to claim for them an almost fossiliferous character, we find the unmistakable print of his fin. In an apartment of the great temple of Dendera, some fifty years ago, there was discovered upon the granite ceiling a sculptured and painted planisphere abounding in centaurs, griffins, and dolphins, similar to the grotesque figures on the celestial globe of the moderns. Gliding among them, old leviathans swam as of yore, was there swimming in that planisphere centuries before Solomon was cradled. Nor must there be omitted another strange attestation of the antiquity of the whale, in his own osseous post-diluvian reality, as set down by the venerable John Leo, the old Barbary traveller. Not far from the seaside they have a temple, the rafters and beams of which are made of whale bones, for whales of a monstrous size are oftentimes cast up dead upon that shore. The common people imagine that by a secret power bestowed by God upon the temple, no whale can pass it without immediate death. But the truth of the matter is that on either side of the temple there are rocks that shoot two miles into the sea, and wound the whales when they light upon them. They keep a whale's rib of an incredible length for a miracle, which lying upon the ground with its convex part uppermost makes an arch, the head of which cannot be reached by a man upon a camel's back. 
This rib, says John Leo, is said to have lain there a hundred years before I saw it. Their historians affirm that a prophet who prophesied of Mahomet came from this temple, and some do not stand to assert that the prophet Jonas was cast forth by the whale at the base of the temple. End quote. In this Afric temple of the whale I leave you, reader, and if you be a Nantucketer and a whaleman, you will silently worship there. End of chapters 101 to 104 Moby Dick Chapters 105 to 108. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 105 to 108. Chapter 105. Does the whale's magnitude diminish? Will he perish? Inasmuch, then, as this leviathan comes floundering down upon us from the headwaters of the eternities, it may be fitly inquired whether, in the long course of his generations, he has not degenerated from the original bulk of his sires. But upon investigation we find that not only are the whales of the present day superior in magnitude to those whose fossil remains are found in the tertiary system, embracing a distinct geological period prior to man, but of the whales found in that tertiary system, those belonging to its latter formations exceed in size those of its earlier ones. Of all the pre-Adamite whales yet exhumed, by far the largest is the Alabama one mentioned in the last chapter, and that was less than seventy feet in length in the skeleton. Whereas, we have already seen that the tape measure gives 72 feet for the skeleton of a large-sized modern whale. And I have heard, on whalemen's authority, that sperm whales have been captured near a 100 feet long at the time of capture. But may it not be that while the whales of the present hour are an advance in magnitude upon those of all previous geological periods, May it not be that since Adam's time they have degenerated? Assuredly we must conclude so, if we are to credit the accounts of such gentlemen as Pliny and the ancient naturalists generally. For Pliny tells us of whales that embraced acres of living bulk, and Aldrovandus of others which measured 800 feet in length, rope walks and Thames tunnels of whales, and even in the days of Banks and Solander, Cook's naturalists, we find a Danish member of the Academy of Sciences setting down certain Iceland whales, Raiden Sisker or Wrinkled Bellies, at 120 yards, that is, 360 feet. And Lassipade, the French naturalist, in his elaborate history of whales, in the very beginning of his work, page 3, sets down the right whale at 100 meters, 328 feet, and this work was published so late as A.D. 1825. But will any whaleman believe these stories? No. The whale of today is as big as his ancestors in Pliny's times, and if ever I go where Pliny is, I, a whaleman, more than he was, will make bold to tell him so because I cannot understand how it is that while the Egyptian mummies that were buried thousands of years before even Pliny was born do not measure so much in their coffins as a modern Kentuckian in his socks, and while the cattle and other animals sculptured on the oldest Egyptian and Nineveh tablets by the relative proportions in which they are drawn, just as plainly prove that the high-bred, stall-fed, prize cattle of Smithfield not only equal, but far exceed in magnitude the fattest of Pharaoh's fat kine. In the face of all this, I will not admit that of all animals the whale alone should have degenerated. But still another inquiry remains, one often agitated by the more recondite Nantucketers. 
whether owing to the almost omniscient lookouts at the mastheads of the whale ships now penetrating even through bering straits and into the remotest secret drawers and lockers of the world and the thousand harpoons and lances darted along all continental coasts the moot point is whether leviathan can long endure so wide a chase and so remorseless a havoc whether he must not at last be exterminated from the waters and the last whale like the last man smoke his last pipe and then himself evaporate in the final puff comparing the humped herds of whales with the humped herds of buffalo which not forty years ago overspread by tens of thousands the prairies of illinois and missouri and shook their iron manes and scowled with their thunder-clotted brows upon the sites of populous river capitals where now the polite broker sells you land at a dollar an inch in such a comparison an irresistible argument would seem furnished to show that the hunted whale cannot now escape speedy extinction but you must look at this matter in every light though so short a period ago not a good lifetime the census of the buffalo in illinois exceeded the census of men now in london and though at the present day not one horn or hoof of them remains in all that region and though the cause of this wondrous extermination was the spear of man yet the far different nature of the whale hunt peremptorily forbids so inglorious an end to the leviathan forty men in one ship hunting the sperm whales for forty-eight months think that they have done extremely well and thank god if at last they carry home the oil of forty fish whereas in the days of the old canadian and indian hunters and trappers of the west when the far west in whose sunset suns still rise was a wilderness and a virgin the same number of moccasined men for the same number of months mounted on horse instead of sailing in ships would have slain not forty but forty thousand and more buffaloes a fact that if need were could be statistically stated nor considered aright does it seem any argument in favor of the gradual extinction of the sperm whale for example that in former years the latter part of the last century say these leviathans in small pods were encountered much oftener than at present and in consequence the voyages were not so prolonged and were also much more remunerative because as has been elsewhere noticed those whales influenced by some views to safety now swim the seas in immense caravans so that to a large degree the scattered solitaries yokes and pods and schools of other days are now aggregated into vast but widely separated unfrequent armies that is all and equally fallacious seems the conceit that because the so-called whalebone whales no longer haunt many grounds in former years abounding with them hence that species also is declining for they are only being driven from promontory to cape and if one coast is no longer enlivened with their jets then be sure some other and remoter strand has been very recently startled by the unfamiliar spectacle furthermore concerning these last mentioned leviathans they have two firm fortresses which in all human probability will forever remain impregnable and as upon the invasion of their valleys the frosty swiss have retreated to their mountains so hunted from the savannas and glades of the middle seas the whalebone whales can at last resort to their polar citadels and diving under the ultimate glassy barriers and walls there come up among icy fields and flows and in a charmed circle of everlasting december bid defiance to all pursuit from man but as perhaps fifty of these whalebone whales are harpooned for one cachalot some philosophers of the forecastle have concluded that this positive havoc has already very seriously diminished their battalions but though for some time past a number of these whales not less than thirteen thousand have been annually slain on the nor'west coast by the americans alone yet there are considerations which render even this circumstance of little or no account as an opposing argument in this matter 
Natural as it is to be somewhat incredulous concerning the populousness of the more enormous creatures of the globe, yet what shall we say to Harto, the historian of Goa, when he tells us that at one hunting the king of Siam took four thousand elephants, that in those regions elephants are as numerous as droves of cattle in the temperate climes? And there seems no reason to doubt that if these elephants, which have now been hunted for thousands of years by Semiramis, by Porus, by Hannibal, and by all the successive monarchs of the East, if they still survive there in great numbers, much more may the great whale outlast all hunting, since he has a pasture to expatiate in which is precisely twice as large as all Asia, both Americas, Europe, and Africa, New Holland, and all the isles of the sea combined. Moreover, we are to consider that from the presumed great longevity of whales, their probably attaining an age of a century or more, therefore at any one period of time several distinct adult generations must be contemporary. And what that is we may soon gain some idea of by imagining all the graveyards, cemeteries, and family vaults of creation, yielding up the live bodies of all the men, women, and children who were alive seventy-five years ago, and adding this countless host to the present human population of the globe. Wherefore, for all these things, we account the whale immortal in his species, however perishable in his individuality. He swam the seas before the continents broke water. He once swam over the site of the Tullieries and Windsor Castle and the Kremlin. In Noah's flood he despised Noah's ark, and if ever the world is to be again flooded, like the Netherlands, to kill off its rats, then the eternal whale will still survive, and rearing upon the topmost crest of the equatorial flood, spout his froth defiance to the skies. Chapter 106 Ahab's Leg The precipitating manner in which Captain Ahab had quitted the Samuel Enderby of London had not been unattended with some small violence to his own person. He had lighted with such energy upon the thwart of his boat that his ivory leg had received a half-splintering shock. And when, after gaining his own deck and his own pivot-hole there, he so vehemently wheeled round with an urgent command to the steersman, it was, as ever, something about his not steering inflexibly enough, then the already shaken ivory received such an additional twist and wrench, that though it still remained entire and to all appearances lusty, yet Ahab did not deem it entirely trustworthy. And indeed it seemed small matter for wonder, that for all his pervading mad recklessness, Ahab did at times give careful heed to the condition of that dead bone upon which he partly stood. For it had not been very long prior to the Pequod's sailing from Nantucket, that he had been found one night lying prone upon the ground and insensible, by some unknown and seemingly inexplicable, unimaginable casualty, his ivory limb having been so violently displaced that it had stakewise smitten and all but pierced his groin, nor was it without extreme difficulty that the agonizing wound was entirely cured. Nor, at the time, had it failed to enter his monomaniac mind, that all the anguish of that then-present suffering was but the direct issue of a former woe and he too plainly seemed to see that as the most poisonous reptile of the marsh perpetuates his kind as inevitably as the sweetest songster of the grove, so equally, with every felicity, all miserable events do naturally beget their like. Yea, more than equally, thought Ahab, since both the ancestry and posterity of grief go further than the ancestry and posterity of joy." For, not to hint of this, that it is an inference from certain canonic teachings, that while some natural enjoyments here shall have no children born to them for the other world, but, on the contrary, shall be followed by the joy-childlessness of all hell's despair, whereas some guilty mortal miseries shall still fertilely beget to themselves an eternally progressive progeny of griefs beyond the grave, not at all to hint of this, there still seems an inequality in the deeper analysis of the thing. 
For, thought Ahab, while even the highest earthly felicities have a certain unsignifying pettiness lurking in them, but at bottom all heart woes, a mystic significance, and in some men an archangelic grandeur, so do their diligent tracings out not belie the obvious deduction. To trail the genealogies of these high mortal miseries carries us at last among the sourceless primogenitors of the gods, so that in the face of all the glad haymaking suns and soft cymbling round harvest moons, we must needs give in to this, that the gods themselves are not forever glad. The ineffaceable sad birthmark in the brow of man is but the stamp of sorrow in the signers. Unwittingly here a secret has been divulged, which perhaps might more properly, in set way, have been disclosed before. With many other particulars concerning Ahab, always had it remained a mystery to some why it was that for a certain period, both before and after the sailing of the Pequod, he had hidden himself away with such grand llama like exclusiveness, and for that one interval sought speechless refuge, as it were, among the marble senate of the dead. Captain Peleg's brooded reason for this thing appeared by no means adequate. Though, indeed, as touching all Ahab's deeper part, every revelation partook more of significant darkness than of explanatory light. But in the end it all came out. This one matter did, at least. That direful mishap was at the bottom of his temporary recluseness. And not only this, but to that ever-contracting, dropping circle ashore, who, for any reason, possessed the privilege of a less banned approach to him, to that timid circle the above-hinted casualty, remaining as it did, moodily unaccounted for by Ahab, invested itself with terrors not entirely underived from the land of spirits and of whales, so that, through their zeal for him, they had all conspired, so far as in them lay, to muffle up the knowledge of this thing from others, and hence it was that not till a considerable interval had elapsed did it transpire upon the Pequod's decks. But, be all this as it may, let the unseen, ambiguous synod in the air, or the vindictive princes and potentates of fire, have to do or not with earthly Ahab, yet in this present matter of his leg he took plain practical procedures. He called the carpenter. And when that functionary appeared before him, he bade him without delay set about making a new leg, and directed the mates to see him supplied with all these studs and joists of jaw ivory, sperm whale, which had thus far been accumulated on the voyage, in order that a careful selection of the stoutest, clearest grain stuff might be secured. This done, the carpenter received orders to have the leg completed that night, and to provide all the fittings for it, independent of those pertaining to the distrusted one in use. Moreover, the ship's forge was ordered to be hoisted out of its temporary idleness in the hold, and to accelerate the affair, the blacksmith was commanded to proceed at once to the forging of whatever iron contrivances might be needed. Chapter 107 The Carpenter Seat thyself sultanically among the moons of Saturn, and take high abstracted man alone, and he seems a wonder, a grandeur, and a woe. But from the same point take mankind in mass, and for the most part they seem a mob of unnecessary duplicates, both contemporary and hereditary. But most humble though he was, and far from furnishing an example of the high humane abstraction, the Pequod's carpenter was no duplicate. Hence he now comes in person on this stage. Like all seagoing ship carpenters, and more especially those belonging to whaling vessels, he was, to a certain off-handed practical extent, alike experienced in numerous trades and callings collateral to his own, the carpenter's pursuit being the ancient and outbranching trunk of all those numerous handicrafts which more or less have to do with wood as an auxiliary material. But besides the application to him of the generic remark above, this carpenter of the Pequod was singularly efficient in those thousand nameless mechanical emergencies continually recurring in a large ship, 
upon a three or four years' voyage in uncivilized and far-distant seas, for not to speak of his readiness in ordinary duties, repairing stove boats, sprung spars, reforming the shape of clumsy bladed oars, inserting bull's eyes in the deck or new tree nails in the side planks, and other miscellaneous matters more directly pertaining to his special business, he was, moreover, unhesitatingly expert in all manner of conflicting aptitudes, both useful and capricious. The one grand stage where he enacted all his various parts, so manifold, was his vice-bench, a long, rude, ponderous table, furnished with several vices, of different sizes, and both of iron and of wood. At all times, except when whales were alongside, this bench was securely lashed athwartships against the rear of the triworks. A belaying pin is found too large to be easily inserted into its hole. The carpenter claps it into one of his ever-ready vices, and straightway files it smaller. A lost land bird of strange plumage strays on board and is made a captive. Out of clean-shaved rods of right whalebone and cross-beams of sperm-whale ivory, the carpenter makes a pagoda-looking cage for it. An oarsman sprains his wrist. The carpenter concocts a soothing lotion. Stubb longed for vermilion stars to be painted upon the blade of his every oar. Screwing each oar in his big vice of wood, the carpenter symmetrically supplies the constellation. A sailor takes a fancy to wear shark-bone earrings. The carpenter drills his ears. Another has a toothache. The carpenter out pincers, and clapping one hand upon his bench, bids him be seated there but the poor fellow unmanageably winces under the unconcluded operation. Whirling round the handle of his wooden vice, the carpenter signs him to clap his jaw in that, if he would have him draw the tooth. Thus this carpenter was prepared at all points, and alike indifferent and without respect in all. Teeth he accounted bits of ivory, heads he deemed but top-blocks, men themselves he lightly held for capstans, but while now upon so wide a field thus variously accomplished, and with such liveliness of expertness in him too, all this would seem to argue some uncommon vivacity of intelligence. But not precisely so. For nothing was this man more remarkable than for a certain impersonal stolidity, as it were. Impersonal, I say, for it so shaded off into the surrounding infinite of things that it seemed one with the general stolidity discernible in the whole visible world, which, while pauselessly active in uncounted modes, still eternally holds its peace, and ignores you, though you dig foundations for cathedrals. Yet was this half-horrible stolidity in him, involving, too, as it appeared, an all-ramifying heartlessness, yet was it oddly dashed at times with an old, crutch-like, antediluvian, wheezing humorousness, not unstreaked now and then with a certain grizzled wittiness, such as might have served to pass the time during the midnight watch on the bearded forecastle of Noah's Ark. Was it that this old carpenter had been a lifelong wanderer, whose much rolling to and fro not only had gathered no moss, but, what is more, had rubbed off whatever small outward clingings might have originally pertained to him? He was a stripped abstract, an unfractioned integral, uncompromised as a newborn babe, living without premeditated reference to this world or the next, you might almost say that this strange uncompromisedness in him involved a sort of unintelligence, for in his numerous trades he did not seem to work so much by reason or by instinct, or simply because he had been tutored to it, or by any intermixture of all these, even or uneven, but merely by a kind of deaf and dumb, spontaneous, literal process. He was a pure manipulator, his brain, if he had ever had one, must have early oozed along into the muscles of his fingers. He was like one of those unreasoning but still highly useful, multum in parvo, Sheffield contrivances, assuming the exterior, though a little swelled, of a common pocket-knife, 
but containing not only blades of various sizes, but also screwdrivers, corkscrews, tweezers, awls, pens, rulers, nail filers, countersinkers. So, if his superiors wanted to use the carpenter for a screwdriver, all they had to do was to open that part of him and the screw was fast, or if for tweezers, take him up by the legs, and there they were. Yet, as previously hinted, this omnitooled open-and-shut carpenter was, after all, no mere machine of an automaton. If he did not have a common soul in him, he had a subtle something that somehow anomalously did its duty. What that was, whether essence of quicksilver or a few drops of hartshorn, there was no telling. But there it was, and there it had abided for now some sixty years or more. And this it was, this same unaccountable, cunning, life principle in him, this it was that kept him a great part of the time soliloquizing, but only like an unreasoning wheel, which also hummingly soliloquizes. Or, rather, his body was a sentry-box, and this soliloquizer on guard there, and talking all the time to keep himself awake. Chapter 108 Ahab and the Carpenter The Deck First Night Watch Carpenter standing before his vice-bench, and by the light of two lanterns, busily filing the ivory joist for the leg, which joist is firmly fixed in the vice. Slabs of ivory, leather straps, pads, screws, and various tools of all sorts lying about the bench. Forward, the red flame of the forge is seen, where the blacksmith is at work. Drat the file, and drat the bone. That is hard which should be soft, and that is soft which should be hard. So we go, who file old jaws and shin-bones. Let's try another. Aye, now this works better. Sneezes. Hello, this bone dust is... Sneezes. Why, it's... Sneezes. Yes, it's... Sneezes. Bless my soul, it won't let me speak. That is what an old fellow gets now for working in dead lumber. Saw a live tree, and you don't get this dust. Amputate a live bone, and you don't get it. Sneezes. Come, come, you, old smut. There, bear a hand, and let's have that ferrule and buckle screw. I'll be ready for them presently. Lucky now, sneezes, there's no knee joint to make. That might puzzle a little. But a mere shin-bone, why, it's as easy as making hop-poles, only I should like to put a good finish on. Time, time, if I but only had the time, I could turn him out as neat a leg now as ever, sneezes, scraped to a lady in a parlor. Those buckskin legs and calves of legs I've seen in shop-windows wouldn't compare at all. They soak water, they do, and of course get rheumatic, and have to be doctored, sneezes, with washes and lotions, just like live legs. There, before I saw it off now, I must call his old mogul ship, and see whether the length will be all right. Too short, if anything, I guess. Ha! That's the heel. We are in luck. Here he comes. Or it's somebody else, that's certain. Ahab, advancing. During the ensuing scene, the carpenter continues, sneezing at times. "'Well, man-maker?' "'Just in time, sir. Uh, if the captain pleases, I will now mark the length. Let me measure, sir.' "'Measured for a leg. <laughs> Good. Well, it's not the first time. About it. There, keep thy finger on it. This is a cogent vice thou hast here, carpenter. Let me feel its grip once.' So, so, it does pinch some. Oh, sir, it will break bones. Beware, beware. No fear. I like a good grip. I like to feel something in this slippery world that can hold man. What's Prometheus about there? The blacksmith, I mean. What's he about? He must be forging the buckle screw, sir, now. Right. It's a partnership. He supplies the muscle part. He makes a fierce red flame there. Aye, sir, he must have the white heat for this kind of fine work. Mm, so he must. I do deem it now a most meaning thing, 
that this old Greek Prometheus, who made men, they say, should have been a blacksmith, and animated them with fire. For what's made in fire must properly belong to fire, and so hell's probable. How the soot flies! This must be the remainder the Greek made the Africans of. Carpenter, when he's through with that buckle, tell him to forge a pair of steel shoulder blades. There's a peddler aboard with a crushing pack. Sir? Hold. While Prometheus is about it, I'll order a complete man after a desirable pattern. Imprimus, fifty feet high in his socks. Then chest modeled after the Thames Tunnel. Then legs with roots to him to stay in one place. Then arms three feet through the wrist. No heart at all. Brass forehead and about a quarter of an acre of fine brains. And let me see. Shall I order eyes to see outwards? No, but put a skylight on top of his head to illuminate inwards. There, take the order and away. Now what's he speaking about, and who's he speaking to? I should like to know. Uh, shall I keep standing here? Aside. "'Tis but indifferent architecture to make a blind dome. Here's one. No, 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 I must have a lantern. Ho, ho, that's it, eh? Here are two, sir, uh, one will serve my turn. What art thou thrusting that thief-catcher into my face for, man? Thrusted light is worse than presented pistols. I thought, sir, that you spoke to Carpenter. Carpenter? Why, that's... But no, a very tidy and, I may say, an extremely gentlemanlike sort of business thou art in here, carpenter. Or wouldst thou rather work in clay? Sir, clay? Uh, clay, sir, that's mud. We, we leave clay to ditchers, sir. The fellow's impious. What art thou sneezing about? A bone is rather dusty, sir. Take the hint, then. And when thou art dead, never bury thyself under living people's noses. Sir? Oh, uh, uh, I guess so. Uh, yes. Dear. Look ye, carpenter. I dare say thou callest thyself a right good workmanlike workman, eh? Well, then, will it speak thoroughly well for thy work, if, when I come to mount this leg thou makest, I shall nevertheless feel another leg in the same identical place with it. That is, Carpenter, my old lost leg, the flesh and blood one, I mean. Canst thou not drive that old Adam away? Truly, sir, I begin to understand somewhat now. Yes, I have heard something curious on that score, sir, how a dismasted man never entirely loses the feeling of his old spar, but it will be still pricking him at times. May I humbly ask if it really be so, sir? It is, man. Look, put thy live leg here in the place where mine once was. So, now, here is only one distinct leg to the eye, yet two to the soul. Where thou feelest tingling life, there, exactly there, there to a hair, do I. Is it a riddle? I should humbly call it a poser, sir. Hiss, then. How dost thou know that some entire living, thinking thing may not be invisibly and uninterpenetratingly standing precisely where thou now standest, I and standing there in thy spite? In thy most solitary hours, then, dost thou not fear eavesdroppers? Hold! Don't speak! And if I still feel the smart of my crushed leg, though it be now so long dissolved, then why mayest not thou, carpenter, feel the fiery pains of hell forever, and without a body? Ha! Huh? Good Lord! Truly, sir, if it comes to that, I must calculate over again. I think I didn't carry a small figure, sir. Look ye, pudding head should never grant premises. How long before the leg is done? Perhaps an hour, sir. Bungle away at it, then, and bring it to me. Turns to go. Oh, life! 
Here I am, proud as a Greek god, and yet standing debtor to this blockhead for a bone to stand on. Cursed be that mortal inter-indebtedness, which will not do away with ledgers. I would be free as air, and I'm down in the whole world's books. I am so rich I could have given bid for bid with the wealthiest praetorians at the auction of the Roman Empire, which was the world's. And yet I owe for the flesh in the tongue I brag with. By heavens, I'll get a crucible, and into it, and dissolve myself down to one small compendious vertebra. So. Carpenter, resuming his work. Well, well, well. Stubb knows him best of all, and Stubb always says he's queer. Says nothing but that one sufficient little word. Queer. He's queer, says Stubb. He's queer. Queer. Queer and keeps dinning it into Mr. Starbuck all the time. Queer, sir, queer, queer, very queer. And here's his leg. Yes, now that I think of it, here's his bedfellow. He has a stick of whale's jawbone for a wife. And this is his leg. He'll stand on this. What was that now about one leg standing in three places, and all the three places standing in one hell? How was that? Oh, I don't wonder he looked so scornful at me. I'm a sort of strange-thoughted sometimes, they say. But that's only haphazard-like. Then a short, little old body like me should never undertake to wade out into deep waters with tall, heron-built captains. The water chucks you under the chin pretty quick, and there's a great cry for lifeboats. And here's the heron's leg. Long and slim, sure enough. Now, for most folks, one pair of legs lasts a lifetime, and that must be because they use them mercifully, as a tender-hearted old lady uses her roly-poly old coach-horses. But Ahab, oh, he's a hard driver. Look, driven one leg to death, and spavined the other for life, and now wears out bone legs by the cord. Hello there, you smut! Bear a hand there with those screws! and let's finish it before the resurrection fellow comes a-calling with his horn for all legs, true or false, as brewery men go round collecting old beer-barrels to fill em up again. What a leg this is! It looks like a real live leg, filed down to nothing but the core. He'll be standing on this to-morrow. He'll be taking altitudes on it. Ah, hello! I almost forgot the little oval slate smooth ivory where he figures up the latitude. So, so. Chisel, file, and sandpaper now. End of chapters 105 to 108「According to usage, they were pumping the ship the next morning, and lo, no inconsiderable oil came up with the water. The casks below must have sprung a bad leak. Much concern was shown, and Starbuck went down into the cabin to report this unfavorable affair. Footnote. In sperm whalemen, with any considerable quantity of oil on board, it is a regular semi-weekly duty to conduct a hose into the hold and drench the casks with seawater, which afterwards, at varying intervals, is removed by the ship's pumps. Hereby the casks are sought to be kept damply tight, while, by the changed character of the withdrawn water, the mariners readily detect any serious leakage in the precious cargo. End of footnote. 
Now, from the south and west, the Pequod was drawing nigh to Formosa and the Bashi Isles, between which lies one of the tropical outlets from the China waters into the Pacific. And so Starbuck found Ahab with a general chart of the Oriental archipelagos spread before him, and another separate one representing the long eastern coasts of the Japanese islands, Nifan, Matsmai, and Sikoke. With his snow-white new ivory leg braced against the screwed leg of his table, and with a long pruning hook of a jackknife in his hand, the wondrous old man, with his back to the gangway door, was wrinkling his brow and tracing his old courses again. "'Who's there?' hearing the footstep at the door, but not turning round to it. "'On deck! Be gone!' "'Captain Ahab mistakes. It is I. The oil in the hold is leaking, sir. We must up Burton's and break out.' "'Up Burton's and break out! Now that we are nearing Japan!' Heave to here for a week to tinker a parcel of old hoops? Either do that, sir, or waste in one day more oil than we may make good in a year. What we come twenty thousand miles to get is worth saving, sir. So it is, so it is, if we get it. I was speaking of the oil in the hold, sir. And I was not speaking or thinking of that at all. Be gone! Let it leak! I'm all a leak myself. I leaks and leaks, not only full of leaky casks, but those leaky casks are in a leaky ship, and that's a far worse plight than the Pequod's man. Yet I don't stop to plug my leak, for who can find it in the deep-loaded hull? Or how hope to plug it, even if found in this life's howling gale? Starbuck, I'll not have the Burtons hoisted. What will the owners say, sir? Let the owners stand on Nantucket Beach and out-yell the typhoons. What cares Ahab? Owners! Owners! Thou art always prating to me, Starbuck, about those miserly owners, as if the owners were my conscience. But look ye, the only real owner of anything is its commander, and hark ye, my conscience is in this ship's keel. On deck! Captain Ahab, said the reddening mate, moving further into the cabin, with a daring so strangely respectful and cautious, that it almost seemed not only every way seeking to avoid the slightest outward manifestation of itself, but within also seemed more than half distrustful of itself. A better man than I might well pass over in thee, what he would quickly enough resent in a younger man, I, and in a happier, Captain Ahab. Devils! Dost thou then so much as dare to critically think of me? On deck! Nay, sir, not yet. I do entreat. And I do dare, sir, to be forbearing. Shall we not understand each other better than hitherto, Captain Ahab? Ahab seized a loaded musket from the rack, forming part of most South Seamen's cabin furniture, and, pointing it towards Starbuck, exclaimed, There is one God that is Lord over the earth, and one Captain that is Lord over the Pequod. On deck! For an instant, in the flashing eyes of the mate, and his fiery cheeks, you would have almost thought that he had really received the blaze of the leveled tube. But, mastering his emotion, he half calmly rose, and as he quitted the cabin, paused for an instant, and said, Thou hast outraged, not insulted me, sir. But for that I ask thee not to beware of Starbuck. Thou wouldst but laugh. But let Ahab beware of Ahab. Beware of thyself, old man. He waxes brave, but nevertheless obeys. <laughs> Most careful bravery that murmured ahab as starbuck disappeared what's that he said ahab beware of ahab there's something there then unconsciously using the musket for a staff with an iron brow he paced to and fro in the little cabin but presently the thick pleats of his forehead relaxed and returning the gun to the rack he went on deck 
"'Thou art but too good a fellow, Starbuck,' he said lowly to the mate. Then raising his voice to the crew, "'Furl the t'gallant sails, and close reef the topsails, fore and aft. Back the main yard. Up Burton's, and break out in the main hold.' It were perhaps vain to surmise exactly why it was that, as respecting Starbuck, Ahab thus acted. It may have been a flash of honesty in him, or a mere prudential policy which, under the circumstance, imperiously forbade the slightest symptom of open disaffection, however transient, in the important chief officer of his ship. However it was, his orders were executed, and the Burtons were hoisted. Chapter 110. Queequeg in His Coffin Upon searching, it was found that the casks last struck into the hold were perfectly sound, and that the leak must be further off. So, it being calm weather, they broke out deeper and deeper, disturbing the slumbers of the huge ground-tier butts, and from that black midnight sending those gigantic moles into the daylight above, so deep did they go, and so ancient and corroded and weedy the aspect of the lowermost puncheons, that you almost looked next for some mouldy cornerstone cask containing coins of Captain Noah, with copies of the posted placards vainly warning the infatuated old world from the flood. Tierce after tierce, too, of water and bread and beef and shooks of staves and iron bundles of hoops were hoisted out, till at last the piled decks were hard to get about, and the hollow hull echoed underfoot as if you were treading over empty catacombs, and reeled and rolled in the sea like an air-freighted demijohn. Top-heavy was the ship as a dinnerless student with all Aristotle in his head. Well was it that the typhoons did not visit them then. Now at this time it was that my poor pagan companion— and fast bosom friend Queequeg was seized with a fever, which brought him nigh to his endless end. Be it said that in this vocation of wailing, sinecures are unknown. Dignity and danger go hand in hand. Till you get to be captain, the higher you rise, the harder you toil. So with poor Queequeg, who, as harpooner, must not only face all the rage of the living whale, but, as we have elsewhere seen, mount his dead back in a rolling sea, and finally descend into the gloom of the hold, and, bitterly sweating all day in that subterraneous confinement, resolutely manhandle the clumsiest casks and see to their stowage. To be short, among whalemen, the harpooners are the holders, so called. Poor Queequeg! When the ship was about half disemboweled, you should have stooped over the hatchway and peered down upon him there where, stripped to his woolen drawers, the tattooed savage was crawling about amid that dampness and slime, like a green-spotted lizard at the bottom of a well. And a well or an ice-house it somehow proved to him, poor pagan, where, strange to say, for all the heat of his sweatings, he caught a terrible chill which lapsed into a fever, and at last, after some days' suffering, laid him in his hammock, close to the very sill of the door of death. How he wasted and wasted away in those few long, lingering days, till there seemed but little left of him but his frame and tattooing. But as all else in him thinned and his cheekbones grew sharper, his eyes nevertheless seemed growing fuller and fuller. They became of a strange softness of luster, and mildly but deeply looked out at you there from his sickness— a wondrous testimony to that immortal health in him which could not die or be weakened. And, like circles on the water which, as they grow fainter, expand, so his eyes seemed rounding and rounding like the rings of eternity. An awe that cannot be named would steal over you, as you sat by the side of this waning savage, and saw as strange things in his face as any beheld who were bystanders when Zoroaster died. For whatever is truly wondrous and fearful in man never yet was put into words or books. And the drawing near of death, which alike levels all, alike impresses all with a last revelation, which only an author from the dead could adequately tell. So that, 
let us say it again, no dying Chaldee or Greek had higher and holier thoughts than those whose mysterious shades you saw creeping over the face of poor Queequeg, as he quietly lay in his swaying hammock, and the rolling sea seemed gently rocking him to his final rest, and the ocean's invisible flood-tide lifted him higher and higher towards his destined heaven. Not a man of the crew but gave him up, and as for Queequeg himself, what he thought of the case was forcibly shown by a curious favor he asked. He called one to him in the gray morning watch when the day was just breaking, and taking his hand said that while in Nantucket he had chanced to see certain little canoes of dark wood, like the rich war wood of his native isle, and upon inquiry he had learned that all whalemen who died in Nantucket were laid in those same dark canoes, and that the fancy of being so laid had much pleased him, for it was not unlike the custom of his own race, who, after embalming a dead warrior, stretched him out in his canoe, and so left him to be floated away to the starry archipelagos. For not only do they believe that the stars are isles, but that far beyond all visible horizons, their own mild, uncontinented seas interflow with the blue heavens, and so form the white breakers of the Milky Way. He added that he shuddered at the thought of being buried in his hammock, according to the usual sea custom, tossed like something vile to the death-devouring sharks. No, he desired a canoe, like those of Nantucket, all the more congenial to him being a whaleman, that like a whaleboat these coffin canoes were without a keel, though that involved but uncertain steering and much leeway adown the dim ages. Now when this strange circumstance was made known aft, the carpenter was at once commanded to do Queequeg's bidding, whatever it might include. There was some heathenish, coffin-colored old lumber aboard, which upon a long previous voyage had been cut from the aboriginal groves of the Lackaday Islands, and from these dark planks the coffin was recommended to be made. No sooner was the carpenter apprised of the order, than taking his rule he forthwith, with all the indifferent promptitude of his character, proceeded into the forecastle and took Queequeg's measure with great accuracy, regularly chalking Queequeg's person as he shifted the rule. "'Ah, poor fellow! He'll have to die now!' ejaculated the Long Island sailor. Going to his vice-bench, the carpenter, for convenience sake and general reference, now transferringly measured on it the exact length the coffin was to be, and then made the transfer permanent by cutting two notches at its extremities. This done, he marshaled the planks and his tools, and to work. When the last nail was driven, and the lid duly planed and fitted, he lightly shouldered the coffin and went forward with it inquiring whether they were ready for it yet in that direction. Overhearing the indignant but half-humorous cries with which the people on deck began to drive the coffin away, Queequeg, to everyone's consternation, commanded that the thing should be instantly brought to him, nor was there any denying him, seeing that of all mortals some dying men are the most tyrannical, and certainly since they will shortly trouble us so little for evermore the poor fellows ought to be indulged. Leaning over in his hammock, Queequeg long regarded the coffin with an attentive eye. He then called for his harpoon, and had the wooden stock drawn from it, and then had the iron part placed in the coffin along with one of the paddles of his boat. All by his own request, also, biscuits were then ranged round the sides within, a flask of fresh water was placed at the head, and a small bag of woody earth scraped up in the hold at the foot and a piece of sailcloth being rolled up for a pillow, Queequeg now entreated to be lifted into his final bed, that he might make trial of its comforts, if any it had. He lay without moving a few minutes, then told one to go to his bag and bring out his little god, Yojo. Then, crossing his arms on his breast with Yojo between, he called for the coffin lid, hatch, he called it, to be placed over him. The head part turned over with a leather hinge, and there lay Queequeg in his coffin, with little but his composed countenance in view. Rarmai! It will do. It is easy, he murmured at last, and signed to be replaced in his hammock. 
But ere this was done, Pip, who had been slyly hovering near by all this while, drew nigh to him where he lay, and with soft sobbings took him by the hand, in the other holding his tambourine. Poor rover, will ye never have done with all this weary roving? Where go ye now? But if the currents carry ye to those sweet Antilles, where the beaches are only beat with water lilies, will ye do one little errand for me? Seek out one Pip, who's now been missing long. I think he's in those far Antilles. If ye find him, then comfort him, for he must be very sad, for look, he's left his tambourine behind. I found it. rig a dig dig Now, Queequeg, die, and I'll beat your dying march. I have heard, murmured Starbuck, gazing down the scuttle, that in violent fevers men, all ignorance, have talked in ancient tongues, and that when the mystery is probed it turns out always that in their wholly forgotten childhood those ancient tongues had been really spoken in their hearing by some lofty scholars. So to my fond faith poor Pip, in this strange sweetness of his lunacy, brings heavenly vouchers of all our heavenly homes. Where learned he that but there? Hark, he speaks again, but more wildly now. Form two and two, let's make a general of him. Ho, oh, where's his harpoon? Lay it across here. rig a dig dig Huzzah! Oh, for a gamecock now to sit upon his head and crow. Queequeg dies game, mind ye that. Queequeg dies game. Take you good heed of that. Queequeg dies game, I say. Game, game, game. But base little Pip, he died a coward. Died all a shiver. Out upon Pip. Hark ye, if ye find Pip, tell all the Antilles he's a runaway, a coward, a coward, a coward. Tell them he jumped from a whaleboat. I'd never beat my tambourine over base Pip, and hail him general, if he were once more dying here. No, no, shame upon all cowards, shame upon them. Let him go drown like Pip that jumped from a whaleboat. Shame, shame. During all this Queequeg lay with closed eyes, as if in a dream. Pip was led away, and the sick man was replaced in his hammock. But now that he had apparently made every preparation for death, now that his coffin was proved a good fit, Queequeg suddenly rallied. Soon there seemed no need of the carpenter's box, and thereupon, when some expressed their delighted surprise, he, in substance, said that the cause of his sudden convalescence was this. At a critical moment he had just recalled a little duty ashore, which he was leaving undone, and therefore had changed his mind about dying. He could not die yet, he averred. They asked him, then, whether to live or die was a matter of his own sovereign will and pleasure. He answered, certainly. In a word, it was Queequeg's conceit that if a man made up his mind to live, mere sickness could not kill him. Nothing but a whale or a gale, or some violent, ungovernable, unintelligent destroyer of that sort. Now, there is this noteworthy difference between savage and civilized, that while a sick civilized man may be six months convalescing, generally speaking, a sick savage is almost half well again in a day. So in good time my Queequeg gains strength, and at length, after sitting on the windlass for a few indolent days, but eating with a vigorous appetite, he suddenly leaped to his feet, threw out his arms and legs, gave himself a good stretching, yawned a little bit, and then, springing into the head of his hoisted boat, and poising a harpoon, pronounced himself fit for a fight. With a wild whimsiness he now used his coffin for a sea-chest, and emptying into it his canvas bag of clothes, set them in order there. Many spare hours he spent in carving the lid with all manner of grotesque figures and drawings, and it seemed that hereby he was striving, in his rude way, to copy parts of the twisted tattooing on his body. And this tattooing had been the work of a departed prophet and seer on his island, who, by those hieroglyphic marks, had written out on his body a complete theory of the heavens and the earth, and a mystical treatise on the art of attaining truth, so that Queequeg in his own proper person was a riddle to unfold, a wondrous work in one volume, but whose mysteries not even himself could read, 
though his own live heart beat against them. And these mysteries were therefore destined, in the end, to moulder away with the living parchment whereon they were inscribed, and so be unsolved to the last. And this thought it must have been which suggested to Ahab that wild exclamation of his, when one morning turning away from surveying poor Queequeg, Oh, devilish tantalization of the gods! Chapter 111 the Pacific. When gliding by the Bashi Isles, we emerged at last upon the Great South Sea. Were it not for other things, I could have greeted my dear Pacific with uncounted thanks, for now the long supplication of my youth was answered. That serene ocean rolled eastwards from me a thousand leagues of blue. There is one knows not what sweet mystery about this sea whose gentle, awful stirring seemed to speak of some hidden soul beneath, like those fabled undulations of the Ephesian sod over the buried evangelist St. John. And meet it is that over these sea pastures, wide rolling watery prairies and potter's fields of all four continents, the waves should rise and fall, and ebb and flow unceasingly. For here millions of mixed shades and shadows, drowned dreams, somnambulisms, reveries, all that we call lives and souls, lie dreaming, dreaming still, tossing like slumberers in their beds, the ever-rolling waves but made so by their restlessness. To any meditative Magian rover, this serene Pacific, once beheld, must ever after be the sea of his adoption. It rolls the midmost waters of the world, the Indian Ocean and Atlantic being but its arms. The same waves wash the moles of the new-built Californian towns, but yesterday planted by the recentest race of men, and lave the faded but still gorgeous skirts of Asiatic lands older than Abraham, while all between float milky ways of coral isles and low-lying, endless, unknown archipelagos and impenetrable Japans. Thus this mysterious, divine Pacific zones the world's whole bulk about, makes all coasts one bay to it, seems the tide-beating heart of earth. Lifted by those eternal swells, you needs must own the seductive god, bowing your head to Pan. But few thoughts of Pan stirred Ahab's brain, as, standing like an iron statue at his accustomed place beside the mizzen-rigging, with one nostril he unthinkingly snuffed the sugary musk from the bashy isles, in whose sweet woods mild lovers must be walking, and with the other consciously inhaled the salt breath of the new-found sea, that sea in which the hated white whale must even then be swimming. Launched at length upon these almost final waters, and gliding towards the Japanese cruising ground, the old man's purpose intensified itself. His firm lips met like the lips of a vice. The delta of his forehead's veins swelled like overladen brooks. In his very sleep, his ringing cry ran through the vaulted hull. Stern all! The white whale spouts thick blood! Chapter 112 The Blacksmith Availing himself of the mild, summer-cool weather that now reigned in these latitudes, and in preparation for the peculiarly active pursuit shortly to be anticipated, Perth, the begrimed, blistered old blacksmith, had not removed his portable forge to the hold again after concluding his contributory work for Ahab's leg, but still retained it on deck, fast lashed to ring bolts by the foremast being now almost incessantly invoked by the headsmen and harpooners and bowsmen to do some little job for them, altering or repairing or new-shaping their various weapons and boat furniture. Often he would be surrounded by an eager circle, all waiting to be served, holding boat spades, pike heads, harpoons and lances, and jealously watching his every sooty movement as he toiled. Nevertheless, this old man's was a patient hammer wielded by a patient arm. No murmur, no impatience, no petulance did come from him. Silent, slow, and solemn, bowing over still further his chronically broken back, he toiled away, as if toil were life itself, 
and the heavy beating of his hammer the heavy beating of his heart. And so it was. Most miserable. A peculiar walk in this old man, a certain slight but painful appearing yawing in his gait, had at an early period of the voyage excited the curiosity of the mariners, and to the importunity of their persisted questionings he had finally given in. So it came to pass that every one now knew the shameful story of his wretched fate. Belated, and not innocently, one bitter winter's midnight, on the road running between two country towns, the blacksmith half-stupidly felt the deadly numbness stealing over him, and sought refuge in a leaning, dilapidated barn. The issue was the loss of the extremities of both feet. Out of this revelation, part by part, at last came out the four acts of the gladness, and the one long and as yet uncatastrophied fifth act of the grief of his life's drama. He was an old man who, at the age of nearly sixty, had postponedly encountered that thing in sorrow's technicals called ruin. He had been an artisan of famed excellence, and with plenty to do, owned a house and garden, embraced a youthful, daughter-like, loving wife, and three blithe, ruddy children, every Sunday went to a cheerful-looking church planted in a grove. But one night, under cover of darkness, and further concealed in a most cunning disguisement, a desperate burglar slid into his happy home, and robbed them all of everything. And darker yet to tell, the blacksmith himself did ignorantly conduct this burglar into his family's heart. It was the bottle conjurer. Upon the opening of that fatal cork, forth flew the fiend and shriveled up his home. Now, for prudent, most wise, and economic reasons, the blacksmith's shop was in the basement of his dwelling, but with a separate entrance to it, so that always had the young and loving, healthy wife listened with no unhappy nervousness, but with vigorous pleasure, to the stout ringing of her young-armed old husband's hammer, whose reverberations, muffled by passing through the floors and walls, came up to her not unsweetly in her nursery. And so to stout labor's iron lullaby the blacksmith's infants were rocked to slumber. Oh, woe on woe! O oh, death, why canst thou not sometimes be timely? Hadst thou taken this old blacksmith to thyself ere his full ruin came upon him, then had the young widow had a delicious grief, and her orphans a truly venerable, legendary sire to dream of in their after years, and all of them a care-killing competency but death plucked down some virtuous elder brother, on whose whistling daily toil solely hung the responsibilities of some other family, and left the worse than useless old man standing, till the hideous rot of life should make him easier to harvest. Why tell the whole? The blows of the basement hammer every day grew more and more between, and each blow every day grew fainter than the last. The wife sat frozen at the window, with tearless eyes, glitteringly gazing into the weeping faces of her children. The bellows fell, the forge choked up with cinders, the house was sold, the mother dived down into the long churchyard grass, her children twice followed her thither, and the houseless, familyless old man staggered off a vagabond in crape, his every woe unreverenced his gray head a scorn to flaxen curls. Death seems the only desirable sequel for a career like this, but death is only a launching into the region of the strange untried. It is but the first salutation to the possibilities of the immense remote, the wild, the watery, the unshored. Therefore, to the death-longing eyes of such men, who still have left in them some interior compunctions against suicide, does the all-contributed and all-receptive ocean alluringly spread forth his whole plain of unimaginable, taking terrors, and wonderful, new-life adventures, and from the hearts of infinite pacifics, the thousand mermaids sing to them, Come hither, broken-hearted. Here is another life without the guilt of intermediate death. Here are wonders supernatural, without dying for them. Come hither, bury thyself in a life which, to your now equally abhorred and abhorring landed world, is more oblivious than death. 
come hither, put up thy gravestone too within the churchyard, and come hither till we marry thee. Hearkening to these voices, east and west, by early sunrise, and by fall of eve, the blacksmith's soul responded, I, I come. And so Perth went a wailing. Chapter 113 The Forge With matted beard, and swathed in a bristling shark-skin apron, about midday, Perth was standing between his forge and anvil, the latter placed upon an ironwood log, with one hand holding a pike-head in the coals, and with the other at his forge's lungs, when Captain Ahab came along, carrying in his hand a small, rusty-looking leathern bag. While yet a little distance from the forge, Moody Ahab paused, till at last Perth, withdrawing his iron from the fire, began hammering it upon the anvil, the red mass sending off the sparks in thick, hovering flights, some of which flew close to Ahab. Are these thy mother Carrie's chickens, Perth? They are always flying in thy wake. Birds of good omen, too, but not to all. Look here, they burn. But thou, thou livest among them without a scorch. Because I am scorched all over, Captain Ahab, answered Perth, resting for a moment on his hammer. I am past scorching. Not easily canst thou scorch a scar. Well, well, no more. Thy shrunk voice sounds too calmly, sanely woeful to me. In no paradise myself, I am impatient of all misery in others that is not mad. Thou shouldst go mad, blacksmith. Say, why dost thou not go mad? How canst thou endure without being mad? Do the heavens yet hate thee, that thou canst not go mad? What wert thou making there? Welding an old pike-head, sir. There were seams and dents in it. And canst thou make it all smooth again, blacksmith, after such hard usage as it had? I think so, sir. And I suppose thou canst smooth almost any seams and dents, never mind how hard the metal, blacksmith? Ay, sir, I think I can. All seams and dents but one. Look ye here, then, cried Ahab, passionately advancing, and leaning with both hands on Perth's shoulders. Look ye here, here! Can you smooth out a seam like this, blacksmith? Sweeping one hand across his ribbed brow. If thou couldst, blacksmith, glad enough would I lay my head upon thy anvil, and feel thy heaviest hammer between my eyes. Answer! Canst thou smooth this seam? Oh, that is the one, sir. Said I not all seams and dents but one? Ay, blacksmith, it is the one. Ay, man, it is unsmoothable. For though thou only seest it here in my flesh, it is worked down into the bone of my skull. That is all wrinkles. But away with child's play. No more gaffs and pikes to-day. Look ye here, jingling the leathern bag, as if it were full of gold coins. I, too, want a harpoon made, one that a thousand yoke of fiends could not part, Perth, something that will stick in a whale like his own fin-bone. There's the stuff, flinging the pouch upon the anvil. Look ye, blacksmith. These are the gathered nail-stubs of the steel shoes of racing horses. Horseshoe stubs, sir. Why, Captain Ahab, thou hast there, then, the best and stubbornest stuff we blacksmiths ever work. I know it, old man. These stubs will weld together like glue from the melted bones of murderers. Quick, forge me the harpoon, and forge me first twelve rods for its shank. Then wind and twist and hammer these twelve together, like the yarns and strands of a tow-line. Quick! I'll blow the fire. When at last the twelve rods were made, Ahab tried them one by one, by spiraling them with his own hand round a long, heavy iron bolt. A flaw! Rejecting the last one. 
Work that over again, Perth. This done, Perth was about to begin welding the twelve into one, when Ahab stayed his hand and said he would weld his own iron. As then, with regular gasping hems, he hammered on the anvil, Perth passing to him the glowing rods, one after the other, and the hard-pressed forge shooting up its intense straight flame, the Parsi passed silently, and bowing over his head towards the fire, seemed invoking some curse, or some blessing, on the toil. But as Ahab looked up, he slid aside. "'What's that bunch of Lucifers dodging about there for?' muttered Stubb, looking on from the forecastle. "'That Parsi smells fire like a fusy, and smells of it himself like a hot musket's powder-pan.' At last the shank in one complete rod received its final heat, and as Perth, to temper it, plunged it all hissing into the cask of water nearby, the scalding steam shot up into Ahab's bent face. "'Wouldst thou brand me, Perth?' wincing for a moment with the pain. "'Have I been but forging my own branding iron, then?' "'Pray God, not that. Yet I fear something, Captain Ahab. Is not this harpoon for the white whale? "'For the white fiend!' But now for the barbs, thou must make them thyself, man. Here are my razors, the best of steel. Here, and make the barbs sharp as the needle sleet of the icy sea. For a moment the old blacksmith eyed the razors, as though he would fain not use them. Take them, man, I have no need for them, for I now neither shave, sup, nor pray till... But here, to work! Fashioned at last into an arrowy shape, and welded by Perth to the shank, the steel soon pointed the end of the iron, and as the blacksmith was about giving the barbs their final heat prior to tempering them, he cried to Ahab to place the water cask near. No, no, no water for that. I want it of the true death temper. Ahoy there, Tashtego, Queequeg, Dagoo. What say ye, pagans? Will you give me as much blood as will cover this barb? Holding it high up. A cluster of dark nods replied, Yes. Three punctures were made in the heathen flesh, and the white whale's barbs were then tempered. Ego non baptizo te in nomine patris sed in nomine diaboli! Deliriously howled Ahab, as the malignant iron scorchingly devoured the baptismal blood. Now, mustering the spare poles from below, and selecting one of hickory, with the bark still investing it, Ahab fitted the end to the socket of the iron. A coil of new tow-line was then unwound, and some fathoms of it taken to the windlass, and stretched to a great tension. Pressing his foot upon it, till the rope hummed like a harp-string, then eagerly bending over it, and seeing no strandings, Ahab exclaimed, Good! And now for the seizings. At one extremity the rope was unstranded, and the separate spread yarns were all braided and woven round the socket of the harpoon. The pole was then driven hard up into the socket. From the lower end the rope was traced halfway along the pole's length, and firmly secured so, with intertwistings of twine. This done, pole, iron, and rope, like the three fates, remained inseparable, and Ahab moodily stalked away with the weapon. The sound of his ivory leg and the sound of the hickory pole both hollowly ringing along every plank. But ere he entered his cabin, light, unnatural, half-bantering, yet most piteous sound was heard. O oh, Pip! Thy wretched laugh, thy idle but unresting eye, all thy strange mummeries not unmeaningly blended with the black tragedy of the melancholy ship and mocked it. End of chapters 109 to 113 Moby Dick, chapters 114 to 118 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 114 to 118. Chapter 114. The Gilder. Penetrating further and further into the heart of the Japanese cruising ground, the Pequod was soon all astir in the fishery, often in mild, pleasant weather, for twelve, fifteen, eighteen, and twenty hours on the stretch, they were engaged in the boats, steadily pulling, or sailing, or paddling after the whales, or for an interlude of sixty or seventy minutes, calmly awaiting their uprising, though with but small success for their pains. At such times, under an unabated sun, afloat all day upon smooth, slow, heaving swells, seated in his boat, light as a birch canoe, and so sociably mixing with the soft waves themselves, that like hearthstone cats they purr against the gunwale. These are the times of dreamy quietude, when beholding the tranquil beauty and brilliancy of the ocean's skin, one forgets the tiger heart that pants beneath it, and would not willingly remember that this velvet paw but conceals a remorseless fang. These are the times when in his whaleboat the rover softly feels a certain filial, confident, land-like feeling towards the sea, that he regards it as so much flowery earth, and the distant ship revealing only the tops of her masts seems struggling forward not through high rolling waves, but through the tall grass of a rolling prairie, as when the western emigrants' horses only show their erected ears, while their hidden bodies widely wade through the amazing verdure. The long-drawn virgin veils, the mild blue hillsides, as over these there steals the hush, the hum, you almost swear that play-wearied children lie sleeping in these solitudes in some glad May-time, when the flowers of the woods are plucked. And all this mixes with your most mystic mood, so that fact and fancy, halfway meeting, interpenetrate and form one seamless whole. Nor did such soothing scenes, however temporary, fail of at least as temporary an effect on Ahab. But if these secret golden keys did seem to open in him his own secret golden treasuries, yet did his breath upon them prove but tarnishing. O oh, grassy glades! O oh, ever vernal endless landscapes in the soul! In ye, though long parched by the dead drought of the earthly life, in ye men yet may roll, like young horses in new morning clover, and for some few fleeting moments feel the cool dew of the life immortal on them. Would to God these blessed calms would last! But the mingled, mingling threads of life are woven by warp and woof, calms crossed by storms, a storm for every calm. There is no steady, unretracing progress in this life. We do not advance through fixed gradations, and at the last one pause, through infancy's unconscious spell, boyhood's thoughtless faith, adolescence's doubt, the common doom, then skepticism, then disbelief, resting at last in manhood's pondering repose of if. But once gone through, we trace the round again, and are infants, boys, and men, and ifs eternally. Where lies the final harbor, whence we unmoor no more? In what rapt ether sails the world, of which the weariest will never weary? Where is the foundling's father hidden? Our souls are like those orphans whose unwedded mothers die in bearing them. The secret of our paternity lies in their grave." and we must there to learn it. And that same day, too, gazing far down from his boat's side into that same golden sea, Starbuck lowly murmured, Loveliness unfathomable, as ever lover saw in his young bride's eye. Tell me not of thy teeth-tiered sharks and thy kidnapping cannibal ways. Let faith oust fact, let fancy oust memory. I look deep down and do believe. And Stubb, fish-like, with sparkling scales, leaped up in that same golden light. I am Stubb, and Stubb has his history. 
but here Stubb takes oaths that he has always been jolly. Chapter 115 The Pequod Meets the Bachelor And jolly enough were the sights and sounds that came bearing down before the wind some few weeks after Ahab's harpoon had been welded. It was a Nantucket ship, the Bachelor, which had just wedged in her last cask of oil, and bolted down her bursting hatches, and now, in glad holiday apparel, was joyously, though somewhat vaingloriously, sailing round among the widely separated ships on the ground, previous to pointing her prow for home. The three men at her masthead wore long streamers of narrow red bunting at their hats, from the stern a whale-boat was suspended bottom down, and hanging captive from the bowsprit was seen the long lower jaw of the last whale they had slain. Signals, ensigns, and jacks of all colors were flying from her rigging, on every side. Sideways lashed in each of her three basketed tops were two barrels of sperm above which, in her topmast cross-trees, you saw slender breakers of the same precious fluid, and nailed to her main truck was a brazen lamp. As was afterwards learned, the bachelor had met with the most surprising success, all the more wonderful, for that while cruising in these same seas, numerous other vessels had gone entire months without securing a single fish. Not only had barrels of beef and bread been given away to make room for the far more valuable sperm, but additional supplemental casks had been bartered for from the ship she had met, and these were stowed along the deck, and in the captain's and officers' staterooms. Even the cabin table itself had been knocked into kindling wood, and the cabin mess dined off the broad head of an oil butt, lashed down to the floor for a centerpiece. In the forecastle, the sailors had actually cocked and pitched their chests, and filled them. It was humorously added that the cook had clapped a head on his largest boiler, and filled it, that the steward had plugged his spare coffee pot, and filled it, that the harpooners had headed the sockets of their iron, and filled them, that indeed everything was filled with sperm, except the captain's pantaloons' pockets, and those he reserved to thrust his hands into, in self-complacent testimony of his entire satisfaction. As this glad ship of good luck bore down upon the moody Pequod, the barbarian sound of enormous drums came from her forecastle, and, drawing still nearer, a crowd of her men were seen standing round her huge tripods, which, covered with the parchment-like poke or stomach skin of the black fish, gave forth a loud roar to every stroke of the clenched hands of the crew. On the quarter-deck the mates and harpooners were dancing with the olive-hued girls who had eloped with them from the Polynesian Isles, while suspended in an ornamented boat, firmly secured aloft between the foremast and the mainmast, three Long Island negroes with glittering fiddle-bows of whale-ivory were presiding over the hilarious jig. Meanwhile, Others of the ship's company were tumultuously busy at the masonry of the triworks, from which the huge pots had been removed. You would have almost thought they were pulling down the cursed Bastille, such wild cries they raised, as the now useless brick and mortar were being hurled into the sea. Lord and master over all this scene, the captain stood a wreck on the ship's elevated quarter-deck, so that the whole rejoicing drama was full before him and seemed merely contrived for his own individual diversion. And Ahab, he too was standing on his quarter-deck, shaggy and black, with a stubborn gloom, and as the two ships crossed each other's wakes, one all jubilations for things past, the other all forebodings as to things to come, their two captains, in themselves, impersonated the whole striking contrast of the scene. "'Come aboard! Come aboard!' cried the gay bachelor's commander, lifting a glass and a bottle in the air. "'Hast seen the white whale?' gritted Ahab in reply. "'No, only heard of him. But don't believe in him at all,' said the other good-humouredly. "'Come aboard!' "'Thou art too damn jolly. Sail on. Hast lost any men? Not enough to speak of. Two islanders, that's all.' But come aboard, old hardy, come along. 
I'll soon take that black from your brow. Come along, will ye? Mary's the play, a full ship and homeward bound. How wondrous familiar is a fool, muttered Ahab, and then aloud, Thou art a full ship and homeward bound, thou sayest. Well, then, call me an empty ship and outward bound. So go thy ways, and I will mine. Forward there, set all sail, and keep her to the wind. And thus, while the one ship went cheerily before the breeze, the other stubbornly fought against it, and so the two vessels parted, the crew of the Pequod looking with grave, lingering glances toward the receding bachelor. But the bachelor's men never heeding their gaze for the lively revelry they were in. And as Ahab, leaning over the taffrail, eyed the homeward-bound craft, he took from his pocket a small vial of sand, and then looking from the ship to the vial, seemed thereby bringing two remote associations together, for that vial was filled with Nantucket soundings. Chapter 116 The Dying Whale not seldom in this life, when, on the right side, fortune's favorites sail close by us, we, though all a-droop before, catch somewhat of the rushing breeze, and joyfully feel our bagging sails fill out. So seemed it with the Pequod, for next day, after encountering the gay bachelor, whales were seen, and four were slain, and one of them by Ahab. It was far down the afternoon, and when all the spearings of the crimson fight were done, and floating in the lovely sunset sea and sky, sun and whale both stilly died together, then such a sweetness and such plaintiveness, such in-wreathing orisons, curled up in that rosy air, that it almost seemed as if far over from the deep green convent valleys of the Manila Isles, the Spanish land-breeze, wantonly turned sailor, had gone to sea, freighted with these vesper hymns. Soothed again, but only soothed to deeper gloom, Ahab, who had sterned off from the whale, sat intently watching his final wanings from the now tranquil boat. For that strange spectacle observable in all sperm-whales dying, the turning sunwards of the head, and so expiring, that strange spectacle beheld of such a placid evening, somehow to Ahab conveyed a wondrousness unknown before. He turns and turns him to it. How slowly, but how steadfastly, his homage rendering and invoking brow, with his last dying motions. He too worships fire, most faithful, broad, baronial vassal of the sun. Oh, that these two favoring eyes should see these two favoring sights! Look, here, far waterlocked, beyond all hum of human weal or woe, in these most candid and impartial seas, where to traditions no rocks furnish tablets, where for long Chinese ages the billows have still rolled on speechless and unspoken to, as stars that shine upon the Niger's unknown source. Here, too, life dies sunwards, full of faith. But see, no sooner dead than death whirls round the corpse, and it heads some other way. O oh, thou dark Hindu half of nature, who of drowned bones hast builded thy separate throne somewhere in the heart of these unverdured seas, thou art an infidel, thou queen and too truly speakest to me in the wide slaughtering typhoon, and the hushed burial of its after calm. Nor has this thy wail sunwards turned his dying head, and then gone round again, without a lesson to me. O oh, trebly hooped and welded hip of power! O oh, high aspiring rainbowed jet! That one strivest, this one jettest all in vain! In vain, O oh whale, dost thou seek intercedings with yon all-quickening sun, that only calls forth life, but gives it not again. Yet dost thou, darker half, rock me with a prouder if a darker faith. All thy unnameable imminglings float beneath me here. 
I am buoyed by breaths of once living things, exhaled as air but water now. Then hail, forever hail, O sea, in whose eternal tossings the wild fowl finds his only rest. Born of earth, yet suckled by the sea, though hill and valley mothered me, you billows are my foster brothers. Chapter 117 The Whale Watch The four whales slain that evening had died wide apart, one far to windward, one less distant to leeward, one ahead, one astern. These last three were brought alongside ere nightfall, but the windward one could not be reached till morning, and the boat that had killed it lay by its side all night, and that boat was Ahab's. The waif-pole was thrust upright into the dead whale's spout-hole, and the lantern hanging from its top cast a troubled, flickering glare upon the black, glossy back, and far out upon the midnight waves, which gently chafed the whale's broad flank, like soft surf upon a beach. Ahab and all his boat's crew seemed asleep but the Parsi, who, crouching in the bow, sat watching the sharks that spectrally played round the whale, and tapped the light cedar planks with their tails. A sound like the moaning in squadrons over Asphaltites of unforgiven ghosts of Gomorrah ran shuddering through the air. Startled from his slumbers, Ahab, face to face, saw the Parsi, and hooped round by the gloom of the night, they seemed the last men in a flooded world. I have dreamed it again, said he. Of the hearses? Have I not said, old man, that neither hearse nor coffin can be thine? And who are hearsed that die on the sea? But I said, old man, that ere thou couldst die on this voyage, two hearses must verily be seen by thee on the sea, the first not made by mortal hands, and the visible wood of the last one must be grown in America. Aye, aye, a strange sight that, Parsi, a hearse and its plumes floating over the ocean with the waves for the pallbearers. Ha! Such a sight we shall not soon see. Believe it or not, thou canst not die till it be seen, old man. And what was that saying about thyself? Though it come to the last, I shall still go before thee, thy pilot. And when thou art so gone before, if that ever befall, then, ere I can follow, thou must still appear to me, to pilot me still. Was it not so? Well, then, did I believe all you say, O oh, my pilot. I have here two pledges that I shall yet slay Moby Dick and survive it. Take another pledge, old man, said the Parsi, as his eyes lighted up like fireflies in the gloom. Hemp only can kill thee. The gallows, ye mean? I am immortal, then, on land and on sea, cried Ahab with a laugh of derision. Immortal, on land and on sea. Both were silent again, as one man. The grey dawn came on, and the slumbering crew arose from the boat's bottom, and ere noon the dead whale was brought to the ship. Chapter 118 The Quadrant The season for the line at length drew near, and every day when Ahab, coming from his cabin, cast his eyes aloft, the vigilant helmsman would ostentatiously handle his spokes, and the eager mariners quickly run to the braces, and would stand there with all their eyes centrally fixed on the nailed doubloon, impatient for the order to point the ship's prow for the equator. In good time the order came. It was hard upon high noon, and Ahab, seated in the bows of his high-hoisted boat, was about taking his wonted daily observation of the sun to determine his latitude. Now in that Japanese sea the days in summer are as freshets of effulgences. That unblinkingly vivid Japanese sun seems the blazing focus of the glassy ocean's immeasurable burning glass. The sky looks lacquered, 
clouds there are none, the horizon floats, and this nakedness of unrelieved radiance is as the insufferable splendors of God's throne. Well that Ahab's quadrant was furnished with colored glasses, through which to take sight of that solar fire. So, swinging his seated form to the roll of the ship, and with his astrological-looking instrument placed to his eye, he remained in that posture for some moments to catch the precise instant when the sun should gain its precise meridian. Meantime, while his whole attention was absorbed, the Parsee was kneeling beneath him on that ship's deck, and with face thrown up like Ahab's, was eyeing the same sun with him, only the lids of his eyes half-hooded their orbs, and his wild face was subdued to an earthly passionlessness. At length the desired observation was taken, and with his pencil upon his ivory leg, Ahab soon calculated what his latitude must be at that precise instant. Then, falling into a moment's reverie, he again looked up towards the sun, and murmured to himself, "'Thou sea-mark, thou high and mighty pilot!' Thou tellest me truly where I am, but canst thou cast the least hint where I shall be? Or canst thou tell where some other thing besides me is this moment living? Where is Moby Dick? This instant thou must be eyeing him. These eyes of mine look into the very eye that is now beholding him. I and into the eye that is even now equally beholding the objects on the unknown thither side of thee, thou son. Then, gazing at his quadrant, and handling, one after the other, its numerous cabalistical contrivances, he pondered again, and muttered, Foolish toy! Baby's plaything of haughty admirals and commodores and captains! The world brags of thee! of thy cunning and might. But what, after all, canst thou do but tell the poor, pitiful point where thou thyself happens to be on this wide planet, and the hand that holds thee? No, not one jot more. Thou canst not tell where one drop of water or one grain of sand will be to-morrow noon, and yet with thy impotence thou insultest the sun. Science! Curse thee, thou vain toy, and cursed be all the things that cast man's eyes aloft to that heaven, whose live vividness but scorches him, as these old eyes are even now scorched with thy light, O sun. Level by nature to this earth's horizon are the glances of man's eyes, not shot from the crown of his head, as if God had meant him to gaze on his firmament. Curse thee, thou quadrant! dashing it to the deck. No longer will I guide my earthly way by thee, the level ship's compass, and the level dead reckoning, by log and by line. These shall conduct me, and show me my place on the sea. Aye, lighting from the boat to the deck. Thus I trample on thee, thou paltry thing, that feebly pointest on high. Thus I split and destroy thee. As the frantic old man thus spoke, and thus trampled with his live and dead feet, a sneering triumph that seemed meant for Ahab, and a fatalistic despair that seemed meant for himself, these passed over the mute, motionless Parsee's face. Unobserved, he rose and glided away, while, awestruck by the aspect of their commander, the seamen clustered together on the forecastle till Ahab, troubledly pacing the deck, shouted out, To the braces! Up helm! Square in! In an instant the yards swung round, and as the ship half-wheeled upon her heel, her three firm-seated graceful masts, erectly poised upon her long, ribbed hull, seemed as the three horatii, pirouetting on one sufficient steed. Standing between the night-heads, Starbuck watched the Pequod's tumultuous way, and Ahab's also, as he went lurching along the deck. I have sat before dense coal-fire and watched it all aglow, full of its tormented, flaming life, and I have seen it wane at last, down, down to dumbest dust. Old man of oceans, of all this fiery life of thine, what will at length remain? 
but one little heap of ashes. "'Aye,' cried Stubb, "'but sea-coal ashes. Mind ye that, Mr. Starbuck, sea-coal, not your common charcoal. Well, well, I heard Ahab mutter, here someone thrusts these cards into these old hands of mine, swears I must play them and no others. And damn me, Ahab, but thou actest right. Live in the game, and die in it. End of chapters 114 to 118《Moby Dick》Chapters 119 to 123. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills.《Moby Dick》by Herman Melville, Chapters 119 to 123. Chapter 119. The Candles. Warmest climes but nurse the cruelest fangs. The tiger of Bengal crouches in spiced groves of ceaseless verdure. Skies the most effulgent but basket the deadliest thunders. Gorgeous Cuba knows tornadoes that never swept tame northern lands. So, too, is it that in these resplendent Japanese seas the mariner encounters the direst of all storms, the typhoon. It will sometimes burst out of that cloudless sky like an exploding bomb upon a dazed and sleepy town. Towards evening of that day the Pequod was torn of her canvas, and bare polled was left to fight a typhoon which had struck her directly ahead. When darkness came on, sky and sea roared and split with the thunder, and blazed with the lightning, that showed the disabled mass fluttering here and there with the rags which the first fury of the tempest had left for its after sport. Holding by a shroud, Starbuck was standing on the quarter-deck, at every flash of the lightning glancing aloft to see what additional disaster might have befallen the intricate hamper there, while Stubb and Flask were directing the men in the higher hoisting and firmer lashing of the boats. But all their pains seemed not. Though lifted to the very top of the cranes, the windward quarter-boat, Ahab's, did not escape. A great rolling sea, dashing high up against the reeling ship's high teetering side, stove in the boat's bottom at the stern, and left it again, all dripping through like a sieve. "'Bad work?' "'Bad work, Mr. Starbuck,' said Stubb, regarding the wreck. "'But the sea will have its way. Stubb, for one, can't fight it. "'You see, Mr. Starbuck, a wave has such a great long start before it leaps. "'All round the world it runs, and then comes the spring. "'But as for me, all the start I have to meet it is just across the deck here. "'But never mind. It's all in fun, so the old song says. "'Sings.' O oh, jolly is the gale, and a joker is the whale, a flourish in his tail. Such a funny, sporty, gamey, jesty, jokey, hokey-pokey lad is the ocean O. Oh. The scud all a-flyin', that's his flip-only foeman, when he stirs in the spicin'. Such a funny, sporty, gamey, jesty, jokey, hokey-pokey lad is the ocean O. Oh. Thunder splits the ship, but he only smacks his lips, a tastin' of this flip. Such a funny, sporty, gamey, jesty, jokey, hokey-pokey lad is the ocean, no. Oh. A vast stub, cried Starbuck. Let the typhoon sing and strike his harp here in our rigging. But if thou art a brave man, thou wilt hold thy peace. But I am not a brave man. Never said I was a brave man. I am a coward, and I sing to keep up my spirits. And I'll tell you what it is, Mr. Starbuck. There's no way to stop my singing in this world but to cut my throat. And when that's done, ten to one I sing ye the doxology for a wind-up. Madman, look through my eyes if thou hast none of thine own. What? How can you see better of a dark night than anybody else? Never mind how foolish. Here, cried Starbuck, seizing Stubb by the shoulder and pointing his hand towards the weather bow. Markst thou not that the gale comes from the eastward? The very course Ahab is to run from Moby Dick? 
the very course he swung to this day noon now mark his boat there where is that stove in the stern sheets man where he is wont to stand his standpoint is stove man now jump overboard and sing away if thou must i don't half understand ye what's in the wind yes yes round the cape of good hope is the shortest way to nantucket soliloquized starbuck suddenly heedless of stubb's question the gale that now hammers at us to stave us we can turn it into a fair wind that will drive us towards home yonder to windward is all blackness of doom but to leeward homeward i see it lightens up there but not with the lightning at that moment in one of the intervals of profound darkness following the flashes a voice was heard at his side and almost at the same instant a volley of thunder peals rolled overhead who's there old thunder said ahab groping his way along the bulwarks to his pivot hole but suddenly finding his path made plain to him by elbowed lances of fire now as the lightning rod to a spire on shore is intended to carry off the perilous fluid into the soil so the kindred rod which at sea some ships carry to each mast is intended to conduct it into the water but as this conductor must descend to considerable depth that its end may avoid all contact with the hull and as moreover if kept constantly towing there it would be liable to many mishaps besides interfering not a little with some of the rigging and more or less impeding the vessel's way in the water because of all this the lower parts of a ship's lightning rods are not always overboard but are generally made in long slender links so as to be the more readily hauled up into the chains outside or thrown down into the sea as occasion may require the rods the rods cried starbuck to the crew suddenly admonished to vigilance by the vivid lightning that had just been darting flambeau to light ahab to his post are they overboard drop them over fore and aft quick avast cried ahab let's have fair play here though we be the weaker side yet i'll contribute to raise rods on the himalayas and andes that all the world may be secured but out on privileges let them be sir look aloft cried starbuck the corpusants the corpusants all the yard-arms were tipped with a pallid fire and touched at each tri-pointed lightning rod end with three tapering white flames each of the three tall masts was silently burning in that sulphurous air like three gigantic wax tapers before an altar blast the boat let it go cried stubb at this instant as a swashing sea heaved up under his own little craft so that its gunwale violently jammed his hand as he was passing a lashing blast it but slipping backwards on the deck his uplifted eyes caught the flames and immediately shifting his tone he cried the corpusants have mercy on us all to sailors oaths are household words they will swear in the trance of the calm and in the teeth of the tempest they will imprecate curses from the topsail yard arms when most they teeter over to a seething sea but in all my voyagings seldom have i heard a common oath when god's burning finger has been laid upon the ship when his mine mine tekel uparsin has been woven into the shrouds and the cordage while this pallidness was burning aloft few words were heard from the enchanted crew who in one thick cluster stood on the forecastle all their eyes gleaming in that pale phosphorescence like a faraway constellation of stars relieved against the ghostly light the gigantic jet negro dagoo loomed up to thrice his real stature and seemed the black cloud from which the thunder had come the parted mouth of tashtego revealed his shark white teeth which strangely gleamed as if they too had been tipped by corpusants while lit up by the preternatural light queequeg's tattooing burned like satanic blue flames on his body the tableau all waned at last with the pallidness aloft and once more the pequod and every soul on her decks were wrapped in a pall a moment or two passed when starbuck going forward pushed against some one it was stubb what thinkest thou now man i heard thy cry 
It was not the same in the song. No, it wasn't. I said, the corpusants have mercy on us all, and I hope they will still. But do they only have mercy on long faces? Have they no bowels for a laugh? And look you, Mr. Starbuck, but it's too dark for a look. Hear me, then. I take that masthead flame we saw for a sign of good luck, for those masts are rooted in a hold that is going to be chock-a-block with sperm oil, do you see? And so all that sperm oil will work up into the mass, like sap in a tree. Yes, our three masts will yet be as three spermaceti candles. That's the good promise we saw. At that moment, Starbuck caught sight of Stubb's face slowly beginning to glimmer into sight. Glancing upwards, he cried, See? See? And once more the high, tapering flames were beheld with what seemed redoubled supernaturalness in their pallor. The corpusants have mercy on us all, cried Stubb again. At the base of the mainmast, full beneath the doubloon and the flame, the Parsee was kneeling in Ahab's front, but with his head bowed away from him, while nearby, from the arched and overhanging rigging, where they had just been engaged in securing a spar, a number of the seamen, arrested by the glare, now cohered together, and hung pendulous, like a knot of numbed wasps from a drooping orchard twig. In various enchanted attitudes, like the standing or stepping or running skeletons in Herculaneum, others remained rooted to the deck, but all their eyes upcast. Ay, ay, men, cried Ahab, look up at it, mark it well. The white flame but lights the way to the white whale. Hand me those mainmast links there. I would fain feel this pulse, and let mine beat against it. Blood against fire. So. Then, turning, the last link held fast in his left hand, he put his foot upon the parsi, and with fixed upward eye and high-flung right arm, he stood erect before the lofty, tri-pointed trinity of flames. Oh, thou clear spirit of clear fire, whom on these seas I as Persian once did worship, till in the sacramental act so burned by thee, that to this hour I bear the scar. I now know thee, thou clear spirit, and I now know that thy right worship is defiance. To neither love nor reverence wilt thou be kind, and e'en for hate thou canst but kill, and all are killed. No fearless fool now fronts thee. I own thy speechless, placeless power, but to the last gasp of my earthquake life will dispute its unconditional, unintegral mastery in me. In the midst of the personified impersonal, a personality stands here. Though but a point at best, whencesoever I came, whencesoever I go, Yet while I earthly live, the queenly personality lives in me, and feels her royal rights. But war is pain, and hate is woe. Come in thy lowest form of love, and I will kneel and kiss thee. But at thy highest come as mere supernal power. And though thou launchest navies of full-freighted worlds, there's that in here that still remains indifferent. O oh, thou clear spirit! Of thy fire thou madest me, and like a true child of fire I breathe it back to thee. Sudden repeated flashes of lightning, the nine flames leap lengthwise to thrice their previous height. Ahab, with the rest, closes his eyes, his right hand pressed hard upon them. I own thy speechless, placeless power. Said I not so? Nor was it wrung from me nor do I now drop these links. Thou canst blind, but I can then grope. Thou canst consume, but I can then be ashes. Take the homage of these poor eyes and shudder hands. I would not take it. The lightning flashes through my skull. Mine eyeballs ache and ache. My whole beaten brain seems as beheaded and rolling on some stunning ground. Oh, oh! Yet blindfold, yet will I talk to thee. Light though thou be, thou leapest out of darkness. But I am darkness leaping out of light, leaping out of thee. The javelins cease. Open eyes, see or not. There burn the flames. 
O oh, thou magnanimous! Now I do glory in my genealogy. But thou art but my fiery father. My sweet mother I know not. O oh, cruel! What hast thou done with her? There lies my puzzle, but thine is greater. Thou knowest not how came ye, hence callest thyself unbegotten. Certainly knowest not thy beginning, hence callest thyself unbegun. I know that of me which thou knowest not of thyself, O thou omnipotent. There is some unsuffusing thing beyond thee, thou clear spirit, to whom all thy eternity is but time, all thy creativeness mechanical. Through thee, thy flaming self, my scorched eyes do dimly see it. O oh, thou foundling fire, thou hermit immemorial! Thou too hast thy incommunicable riddle, thy unparticipated grief. Here again, with haughty agony, I read my sire. Leap, leap up and lick the sky. I leap with thee, I burn with thee, would fain be welded with thee. Defyingly, I worship thee. The boat, the boat, cried Starbuck. Look at thy boat, old man. Ahab's harpoon, the one forged at Perth's fire, remained firmly lashed in its conspicuous crotch, so that it projected beyond his whaleboat's bow. But the sea that had stove its bottom had caused the loose leather sheath to drop off and from the keen steel barb there now came a leveled flame of pale, forked fire. As the silent harpoon burned there like a serpent's tongue, Starbuck grasped Ahab by the arm. God! God is against thee, old man! Forbear! Tis an ill voyage, ill begun, ill continued. Let me square the yards while we may, old man, and make a fair wind of it homewards, to go on a better voyage than this. Overhearing Starbuck, the panic-stricken crew instantly ran to the braces, though not a sail was left aloft. For the moment all the aghast mate's thoughts seemed theirs. They raised a half-mutinous cry, but dashing the rattling lightning links to the deck, and snatching the burning harpoon, Ahab waved it like a torch among them, swearing to transfix with it the first sailor that but cast loose a rope's end. Petrified by his aspect, and still more shrinking from the fiery dart that he held, the men fell back in dismay, and Ahab again spoke. All your oaths to hunt the white whale are as binding as mine, and heart, soul, and body, lungs and life, old Ahab is bound. And that ye may know to what tune this heart beats, look ye here, thus I blow out the last fear and with one blast of his breath he extinguished the flame. As in the hurricane that sweeps the plain men fly the neighborhood of some lone gigantic elm, whose very height and strength but render it so much the more unsafe, because so much the more a mark for thunderbolts, so at those last words of Ahab's many of the mariners did run from him in a terror of dismay. Chapter 120 the deck towards the end of the first night watch. Ahab standing by the helm, Starbuck approaching him. We must send down the main topsail yard, sir. The band is working loose, and the lee lift is half stranded. Shall I strike it, sir? Strike nothing. Lash it. If I had skysail poles, I'd sway them up now. Sir, in God's name. Sir? Well, the anchors are working, sir. Shall I get them in board? Strike nothing and stir nothing, but lash everything. The wind rises, but it has not got up to my table-lands yet. Quick and see to it. By masts and keels, he takes me for the hunchbacked skipper of some coasting smack. Send down my main topsail yard. Ha! Glue pots. Loftiest trucks were made for wildest winds and this brain-truck of mine now sails amid the cloud-scud. Shall I strike that? Oh, none but cowards send down their brain-trucks in tempest-time. What a huru shall off there! I would e'en take it for sublime, did I not know that the colic is a noisy malady. Oh, take medicine! 
take medicine. Chapter 121. Midnight, the Foxle Bulwarks. Stub and flask mounted on them, and passing additional lashings over the anchors there hanging. No, Stub, you may pound that knot there as much as you please, but you will never pound into me what you were just now saying. And how long ago is it since you said the very contrary? Didn't you once say that whatever ship Ahab sails in, that ship should pay something extra on its insurance policy, just as though it were loaded with powder barrels aft and boxes of lucifers forward? Stop now, didn't you say so? Well, suppose I did. What then? I've part changed my flesh since that time. Why not my mind? Besides, supposing we are loaded with powder barrels aft and lucifers forward, how the devil should the lucifers get a fire in this drenching spray here? Why, my little man, you have pretty red hair, but you couldn't get a fire now. Shake yourself. Your Aquarius or the water-bearer flask might fill pitchers at your coat-collar. Don't you see, then, that for these extra risks the marine insurance companies have extra guarantees? Here are hydrants, flask. But hark again, then I'll answer you the other thing. First take your leg off from the crown of the anchor here, though, so I can pass the rope. Now listen. What's the mighty difference between holding a mass lightning rod in the storm and standing close by a mass that hasn't got any lightning rod at all in a storm? Don't you see, you timberhead, that no harm can come to the holder of the rod unless the mast is first struck? What are you talking about, then? Not one ship in a hundred carries rods, and Ahab, I, man, and all of us, were in no more danger then, in my poor opinion, than all the crews in ten thousand ships now sailing the seas. Why, you, King Post, you, I suppose, would have every man in the world go about with a small lightning rod running up the corner of his hat, like a militia officer's skewered feather, and trailing behind like his sash. Why don't you be sensible, Flask? It's easy to be sensible. Why don't you, then? Any man with half an eye can be sensible. I don't know that, Stub. You sometimes find it rather hard. Yes, when a fellow's soaked through, it's hard to be sensible, that's a fact. And I am about drenched with this spray. Never mind, catch the turn there and pass it. Seems to me we are lashing down these anchors now as if they were never going to be used again. Tying these two anchors here, Flask, seems like tying a man's hands behind him. And what big generous hands they are, to be sure. These are your iron fists, eh? What a hold they have, too. I wonder, Flask, whether the world is anchored anywhere. If she is, she swings with an uncommon long cable, though. There, hammer that knot down, and we're done. So, next to touching land, lighting on deck is most satisfactory. I say, just wring out my jacket skirts, will you? Thank you. They laugh at long togs so, Flask, but it seems to me a long-tailed coat ought always to be worn in storms afloat. The tails tapering down that way serve to carry off the water, do you see? Same with cocked hats. The cocks form gable-end eave troughs, Flasks. No more monkey jackets and tarpaulins for me. I must mount a swallowtail and drive down a beaver, so... Hello! Whew! There goes my tarpaulin overboard! Lord, Lord, that the winds that come from heaven should be so unmannerly! This is a nasty night, lad. Chapter 122 Midnight Aloft Thunder and Lightning The Main Topsail Yard Tashtego Passing New Lashings Around It Um, um, um! Stop that thunder! Plenty too much thunder up here. What's the use of thunder? Um, um, um. We don't want thunder, we want rum. Give us a glass of rum. Um, um, um. Chapter 123 The Musket During the most violent shocks of the typhoon, the man at the Pequod's jawbone tiller had several times been reelingly hurled to the deck by its spasmodic motions, even though preventer tackles had been attached to it, for they were slack, because some play to the tiller was indispensable. 
In a severe gale like this, while the ship is but a tossed shuttlecock to the blast, it is by no means uncommon to see the needles in the compasses at intervals go round and round. It was thus with the Pequods. At almost every shock the helmsmen had not failed to notice the whirling velocity with which they revolved upon the cards. It is a sight that hardly any one can behold without some sort of unwanted emotion. Some hours after midnight the typhoon abated so much that through the strenuous exertions of Starbuck and Stubb, one engaged forward and the other aft, the shivered remnants of the jib and fore and main topsails were cut adrift from the spars, and went eddying away to leeward like the feathers of an albatross, which sometimes are cast to the winds when that storm-tossed bird is on the wing. The three corresponding new sails were now bent and reefed, and a storm trysail was set further aft, so that the ship soon went through the water with some precision again, and the course, for the present east-south-east, which he was to steer, if practicable, was once more given to the helmsman, for during the violence of the gale he had only steered according to its vicissitudes, but as he was now bringing the ship as near her course as possible, watching the compass needle meanwhile, lo, a good sign, the wind seemed coming round astern. Aye, the foul breeze became fair. Instantly the yards were squared, to the lively song of Ho the fair wind, O ye ho cheerily men, the crew singing for joy, that so promising an event should so soon have falsified the evil portents preceding it. In compliance with the standing order of his commander, to report immediately, and at any one of the twenty-four hours, any decided change in the affairs of the deck, Starbuck had no sooner trimmed the yards to the breeze, however reluctantly and gloomily, than he mechanically went below to apprise Captain Ahab of the circumstance. Ere knocking at his stateroom door, he involuntarily paused before it a moment. The cabin lamp, taking long swings this way and that, was burning fitfully, and casting fitful shadows upon the old man's bolted door, a thin one, with fixed blinds inserted in place of upper panels. The isolated subterraneousness of the cabin made a certain humming silence to reign there, though it was hooped round by all the roar of the elements. The loaded muskets in the rack were shiningly revealed, as they stood upright against the forward bulkhead. Starbuck was an honest, upright man, but out of Starbuck's heart, at that instant when he saw the muskets, there strangely evolved an evil thought, but so blent with its neutral or good accompaniments, that for the instant he hardly knew it for itself. He would have shot me once, he murmured. Yes, there's the very musket that he pointed at me. That one with the studded stock. Let me touch it. Lift it. Strange that I, who have handled so many deadly lances, strange that I should shake so now. Loaded? I must see. Aye, aye. And powder in the pan. That's not good. Best spill it. Wait. I'll cure myself of this. I'll hold the musket boldly while I think. I come to report a fair wind to him. But how fair? Fair for death and doom. That's fair for Moby Dick. It's a fair wind that's only fair for that accursed fish. The very tube he pointed at me. The very one. This one. I hold it here. He would have killed me with the very thing I handle now. Ay, and he would fain kill all his crew. Does he not say that he will not strike his spars to any gale? Has he not dashed his heavenly quadrant? And in these same perilous seas, gropes he not his way by mere dead reckoning of the error-abounding log? And in this very typhoon, did he not swear that he would have no lightning-rods? But shall this crazed old man be tamely suffered to drag a whole ship's company down to doom with him? Yes, it would make him the willful murderer of thirty men and more, if this ship come to any deadly harm, and come to deadly harm my soul swears this ship will, if Ahab have his way. If, then, he were this instant, put aside, that crime would not be his. Ha! 
Is he muttering in his sleep? Yes, just there. In there he's sleeping. Sleeping, aye, but still alive, and soon awake again. I can't withstand thee, old man. Not reasoning, not remonstrance, not entreaty wilt thou hearken to. All this thou scornest. Flat obedience to thy own flat commands. This is all thou breathest. Ay, and sayest the men have vowed thy vow. Sayest all of us are Ahab's. Great God forbid. But is there no other way? No lawful way? Make him a prisoner to be taken home? What? Hope to wrest this old man's living power from his own living hands? Only a fool would try it. Say he were pinioned even, knotted all over with ropes and hawsers, chained down to ring bolts on his cabin floor. He would be more hideous than a caged tiger then. I could not endure the sight, could not possibly fly his howlings. All comfort, sleep itself, inestimable reason would leave me on the long, intolerable voyage. What then remains? The land is hundreds of leagues away, and locked Japan the nearest. I stand alone here upon an open sea, with two oceans and a whole continent between me and law. Aye, aye, tis so. Is heaven a murderer, when its lightning strikes a would-be murderer in his bed, tindering sheets and skin together? And would I be a murderer then, if— And slowly, stealthily, and half sideways looking, he placed the loaded musket's end against the door. On this level Ahab's hammock swings within, his head this way. A touch, and Starbuck may survive to hug his wife and child again. Oh, Mary, Mary, boy, boy, boy! But if I wake thee not to death, old man, who can tell to what unsounded deeps Starbuck's body this day week may sink with all the crew? Great God! Where art thou? Shall I? Shall I? The wind has gone down and shifted, sir. The fore and main topsails are reefed and set. She heads her course. Stern all, O oh, Moby Dick, I clutch thy heart at last. Such were the sounds that now came hurtling from out the old man's tormented sleep, as if Starbuck's voice had caused a long, dumb dream to speak. The yet-leveled musket shook like a drunkard's arm against the panel. Starbuck seemed wrestling with an angel, but turning from the door he placed the death-tube in its rack and left the place. "'He's too sound asleep, Mr. Stubb. Go thou down and wake him and tell him. I must see to the deck here. Thou knowest what to say.' End of chapters 119 to 123《Moby Dick》chapters 124 to 127. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 124 to 127. Chapter 124 The Needle. Next morning the not-yet-subsided sea rolled in long, slow billows of mighty bulk, and, striving in the Pequod's gurgling track, pushed her on like giant's palms outspread. The strong, unstaggering breeze abounded so that sky and air seemed vast, outbellying sails. The whole world boomed before the wind. Muffled in the full morning light, the invisible sun was only known by the spread intensity of his place, where his bayonet rays moved on in stacks. Emblazonings as of crowned Babylonian kings and queens reigned over everything. 
the sea was as a crucible of molten gold that bubblingly leaps with light and heat. Long maintaining an enchanted silence, Ahab stood apart, and every time the teetering ship loweringly pitched down her bowsprit, he turned to eye the bright sun's rays produced ahead, and when she profoundly settled by the stern, he turned behind and saw the sun's rearward place, and how the same yellow rays were blending with his undeviating wake. Ha! Ha! My ship! Thou mightest well be taken now for the sea chariot of the sun. Ho, ho, all ye nations before my prow, I bring the sun to ye. Yoke on the further billows, hello, a tandem, I drive the sea. But suddenly, reined back by some counterthought, he hurried towards the helm, huskily demanding how the ship was heading. east sou east sir, said the frightened steersman. Thou liest, smiting him with his clenched fist, heading east at this hour in the morning, and the sun astern. Upon this every soul was confounded, for the phenomenon just then observed by Ahab had unaccountably escaped every one else, but its very blinding palpableness must have been the cause. Thrusting his head halfway into the binnacle, Ahab caught one glimpse of the compasses, his uplifted arm slowly fell. For a moment he almost seemed to stagger. Standing behind him, Starbuck looked, and lo, the two compasses pointed east, and the Pequod was as infallibly going west. But ere the first wild alarm could get out abroad among the crew, the old man, with a rigid laugh, exclaimed, I have it. It has happened before. Mr. Starbuck, Last night's thunder turned our compasses, that's all. Thou hast before now heard of such a thing, I take it. Aye, but never before has it happened to me, sir, said the pale mate, gloomily. Here it must needs be said that accidents like this have, in more than one case, occurred to ships in violent storms. The magnetic energy, as developed in the mariner's needle, is, as all know, essentially one with the electricity beheld in heaven. Hence it is not to be much marveled at that such things should be. Instances where the lightning has actually struck the vessel, so as to smite down some of these spars and rigging, the effect upon the needle has at times been still more fatal, all its lodestone virtue being annihilated, so that the before magnetic steel was of no more use than an old wife's knitting needle. But in either case the needle never again of itself recovers the original virtue thus marred or lost, and if the binnacle compasses be affected, the same fate reaches all the others that may be in the ship, even were the lowermost one inserted into the kelson. Deliberately standing before the binnacle, and eyeing the transpointed compasses, the old man, with the sharp of his extended hand, now took the precise bearing of the sun, and, satisfied that the needles were exactly inverted, shouted out his orders for the ship's course to be changed accordingly. The yards were hard up, and once more the Pequod thrust her undaunted bows into the opposing wind, for the supposed fair one had only been juggling her. Meanwhile, whatever were his own secret thoughts, Starbuck said nothing, but quietly he issued all requisite orders, while Stubb and Flask, who in some small degree seemed then to be sharing his feelings, likewise unmurmuringly acquiesced. As for the men, though some of them lowly rumbled, their fear of Ahab was greater than their fear of fate. But as ever before, the pagan harpooners remained almost wholly unimpressed, or, if impressed, it was only with a certain magnetism shot into their congenial hearts from inflexible Ahabs. For a space the old man walked the deck in rolling reveries, but chancing to slip with his ivory heel, he saw the crushed copper sight-tubes of the quadrant he had the day before dashed to the deck. "'Thou poor, proud heaven-gazer and sun's pilot! Yesterday I wrecked thee, and to-day the compasses would fain have wrecked me. So, so. But Ahab is lord over the level lodestone yet. Mr. Starbuck, a lance without a pole, a topmall, 
and the smallest of the sailmaker's needles. Quick! Accessory, perhaps, to the impulse dictating the thing he was now about to do, were certain prudential motives, whose object might have been to revive the spirits of his crew by a stroke of his subtle skill, in a matter so wondrous as that of the inverted compasses. Besides, the old man well knew that to steer by transpointed needles, though clumsily practicable, was not a thing to be passed over by superstitious sailors without some shudderings and evil portents. Men, said he, steadily turning upon the crew, as the mate handed him the things he had demanded. My men, the thunder turned old Ahab's needles, but out of this bit of steel Ahab can make one of his own that will point as true as any. Abashed glances of servile wonder were exchanged by the sailors as this was said, and with fascinated eyes they awaited whatever magic might follow. But Starbuck looked away. With a blow from the top maul, Ahab knocked off the steel head of the lance, and then, handing to the mate the long iron rod remaining, bade him hold it upright, without its touching the deck. Then, with the maul, after repeatedly smiting the upper end of this iron rod, he placed the blunted needle endwise on top of it, and less strongly hammered that, several times, the mate still holding the rod as before. Then, going through some small strange motions with it, whether indispensable to the magnetizing of the steel, or merely intended to augment the awe of the crew is uncertain, he called for linen thread and moving to the binnacle, slipped out the two reverse needles there, and horizontally suspended the sail needle by its middle, over one of the compass cards. At first the steel went round and round, quivering and vibrating at either end, but at last it settled to its place, when Ahab, who had been intently watching for this result, stepped frankly back from the binnacle, and pointing his stretched arm towards it, exclaimed, Look ye for yourselves, if Ahab be not lord of the level lodestone. The sun is east, and that compass swears it. One after another they peered in, for nothing but their own eyes could persuade such ignorance as theirs, and one after another they slunk away. In his fiery eyes of scorn and triumph, you then saw Ahab in all his fatal pride. Chapter 125. The Log and Line While now the fated Pequod had been so long afloat this voyage, the log and line had but very seldom been in use. Owing to a confident reliance on other means of determining the vessel's place, some merchantmen and many whalemen, especially when cruising, wholly neglect to heave the log though at the same time, and frequently more for form's sake than anything else, regularly putting down upon the customary slate the course steered by the ship, as well as the presumed average rate of progression every hour. It had thus been with the Pequod. The wooden reel, an angular log attached, hung long untouched just beneath the railing of the after bulwarks. Rains and spray had damped it, sun and wind had warped it, all the elements had combined to rot a thing that hung so idly. But heedless of all this, his mood seized Ahab, as he happened to glance upon the reel, not many hours after the magnet scene, and he remembered how his quadrant was no more, and recalled his frantic oath about the level log and line. The ship was sailing plungingly, astern the billows rolled in riots. "'Forward there! Heave the log!' Two seamen came, the golden-hued Tahitian and the grisly Manxman. "'Take the reel, one of ye. I'll heave.' They went towards the extreme stern on the ship's lee side, where the deck, with the oblique energy of the wind, was now almost dipping into the creamy, sidelong rushing sea. The Manxman took the reel, and holding it high up by the projecting handle-ends of the spindle, round which the spool of line revolved, so stood with the angular log hanging downwards, till Ahab advanced to him. Ahab stood before him, and was lightly unwinding some thirty or forty turns to form a preliminary hand-coil to toss overboard, when the old manxman, who was intently eyeing both him and the line, 
made bold to speak. Sir, I mistrust it. This line looks far gone. Long heat and wet have spoiled it. Twill hold, old gentleman. Long heat and wet. Have they spoiled thee? Thou seem'st to hold. Or truer, perhaps, life holds thee, not thou it. I hold the spool, sir. But just as my captain says, With these grey hairs of mine tis not worth while disputing, Especially with a superior who'll ne'er confess. What's that? There now's a patched professor in Queen Nature's granite-founded college, But methinks he's too subservient. Where wert thou born? In the little rocky isle of man, sir. Excellent! Thou'st hit the world by that. I know not, sir, but I was born there. In the Isle of Man, hey? Well, the other way, it's good. Here's a man from man, a man born in once independent man, and now unmanned of man, which is sucked in. By what? Up with the reel. The dead, blind wall butts all inquiring heads at last. Up with it. So. The log was heaved. The loose coils rapidly straightened out in a long, dragging line astern, and then, instantly, the reel began to whirl. In turns, jerkingly raised and lowered by the rolling billows, the towing resistance of the log caused the old reelman to stagger strangely. Hold hard! Snap! The overstrained line sagged down in one long festoon. The tugging log was gone. I crush the quadrant. The thunder turns the needles, and now the mad sea parts the log line. But Ahab can mend all. Haul in there, Tahitian. Reel up, Manxman. And look ye, let the carpenter make another log, and mend thou the line. See to it. There he goes now. To him nothing's happened, but to me the skewer seems loosening out of the middle of the world. All in, all in, Tahitian. These lines run whole and whirling out, come in broken and dragging slow. Ha, Pip! Come to help, eh, Pip? Pip! Whom call ye Pip? Pip jumped from the whale-boat. Pip's missing. Let's see now if you haven't fished him up here, fisherman. It drags hard. I guess he's holding on. Jerk him, Tahiti. Jerk him off. We haul in no cowards here. Ho! Oh, there's his arm just breaking water. A hatchet! A hatchet! Cut it off. We haul in no cowards here. Captain Ahab, sir, sir, here's Pip trying to get on board again. Peace, thou crazy loon, cried the manxman, seizing him by the arm. Away from the quarter-deck. "'The greater idiot ever scolds the lesser,' muttered Ahab, advancing. "'Hands off from that holiness! "'Where sayest thou Pip was, boy?' "'Astern there, sir, astern! "'Lo, lo!' "'And who art thou, boy? "'I see not my reflection in the vacant pupils of thy eyes. "'Oh, God, that man should be a thing for immortal souls to sieve through!' Who art thou, boy? Bellboy, sir. Ship's crier. Ding, dong, ding. Pip, pip, pip. One hundred pounds of clay reward for pip. Five feet high. Looks cowardly. Quickest known by that. Ding, dong, ding. Who's seen pip, the coward? There can be no hearts above the snow line. Oh, ye frozen heavens, look down here. Ye did beget this luckless child, and have abandoned him, ye creative libertines. Here, boy, Ahab's cabin shall be Pip's home henceforth, while Ahab lives. Thou touchest my innermost center, boy. Thou art tied to me by cords woven of my heart-strings. Come, let's down. What's this? Here's velvet shark-skin intently gazing at Ahab's hand and feeling it. Ah, now, had poor Pip but felt so kind a thing as this, perhaps he had ne'er been lost. This seems to me, sir, as a man-rope, 
something that weak souls may hold by. Oh, sir, let old Perth now come and rivet these two hands together, the black one with the white, for I will not let this go. Oh, boy, nor will I thee, unless I should thereby drag thee to worse horrors than are here. Come, then, to my cabin. Lo, ye believers in God's all goodness, and in man all ill, lo, you, see the omniscient gods oblivious of suffering man, and man, though idiotic, and knowing not what he does, yet full of the sweet things of love and gratitude. Come, I feel prouder leading thee by thy black hand than though I had grasped an emperor's. There go two daft ones now, muttered the old manxman, one daft with strength, the other daft with weakness. But here's the end of the rotten line, all dripping, too. Mend it, eh? I think we had best have a new line altogether. I'll see Mr. Stubb about it. Chapter 126 The Life Boy Steering now southeastward by Ahab's leveled steel, and her progress solely determined by Ahab's level log and line, the Pequod held on her path towards the equator. Making so long a passage through such unfrequented waters, descrying no ships, and ere long sideways impelled by unvarying trade winds over waves monotonously mild, all these seemed the strange calm things preluding some riotous and desperate scene. At last, when the ship drew near to the outskirts, as it were, of the equatorial fishing ground, and in the deep darkness that goes before the dawn was sailing by a cluster of rocky islets, the watch, then headed by Flask, was startled by a cry so plaintively wild and unearthly, like half-articulated wailings of the ghosts of all Herod's murdered innocents, that, one and all, they started from their reveries, and for the space of some moments stood, or sat, or leaned, all transfixedly listening, like the carved Roman slave, while that wild cry remained within hearing. The Christian, or civilized part of the crew, said it was mermaids, and shuddered, but the pagan harpooners remained unappalled. Yet the grey manxman, the oldest mariner of all, declared that the wild, thrilling sounds that were heard were the voices of newly drowned men in the sea. Below, in his hammock, Ahab did not hear of this till grey dawn, when he came to the deck. It was then recounted to him by flask, not unaccompanied with hinted dark meanings. He hollowly laughed, and thus explained the wonder. Those rocky islands the ship had passed were the resort of great numbers of seals, and some young seals that had lost their dams, or some dams that had lost their cubs, must have risen nigh the ship and kept company with her, crying and sobbing with their human sort of wail. But this only the more affected some of them, because most mariners cherish a very superstitious feeling about seals, arising not only from their peculiar tones when in distress, but also from the human look of their round heads and semi-intelligent faces, seen peeringly uprising from the water alongside. In the sea, under certain circumstances, seals have more than once been mistaken for men. But the bodings of the crew were destined to receive a most plausible confirmation in the fate of one of their number that morning. At sunrise, this man went from his hammock to the masthead at the fore, and whether it was that he had not yet half waked from his sleep, for sailors sometimes go aloft in a transition state, whether it was thus with the man, there is now no telling, but be that as it may, he had not been long at his perch when a cry was heard, a cry and a rushing, and looking up they saw a falling phantom in the air, and looking down, a little tossed heap of white bubbles in the blue of the sea. The life-boy, a long, slender cask, was dropped from the stern, where it always hung obedient to a cunning spring, but no hand rose to seize it, and the sun having long beat upon this cask, it had shrunken, so that it slowly filled, and that parched wood also filled at its every pore and the studded, iron-bound cask followed the sailor to the bottom, 
as if to yield him his pillow, though in sooth but a hard one. And thus the first man of the Pequod that mounted the mast to look out for the white whale, on the white whale's own peculiar ground, that man was swallowed up in the deep. But few perhaps thought of that at the time. Indeed, in some sort they were not grieved at this event, at least as a portent, for they regarded it not as a foreshadowing of evil in the future, but as the fulfillment of an evil already presaged. They declared that now they knew the reason of those wild shrieks they had heard the night before. But again the old Manxman said nay. The lost life-boy was now to be replaced. Starbuck was directed to see to it. But as no cask of sufficient lightness could be found, and as in the feverish eagerness of what seemed the approaching crisis of the voyage, all hands were impatient of any toil but what was directly connected with its final end, whatever that might prove to be, therefore they were going to leave the ship's stern unprovided with a boy, when by certain strange signs and innuendos, Queequeg hinted a hint concerning his coffin. "'A life-boy of a coffin!' cried Starbuck, starting. "'Rather queer, that, I should say,' said Stubb. "'It'll make a good enough one,' said Flask. "'The carpenter here can arrange it easily.' "'Bring it up. There's nothing else for it,' said Starbuck, after a melancholy pause. "'Rig it, carpenter. Do not look at me so. The coffin, I mean. Dost thou hear me? Rig it.' "'And shall I uh, nail down the lid, sir?' "'Moving his hand as with a hammer. "'Aye. "'And shall I uh, caulk the seam, sir?' "'Moving his hand as with a caulking iron. "'Aye. "'And shall I then pay over the same with uh, pitch, sir? "'Moving his hand as with a pitch-pot. "'Away! "'What possesses thee to this? "'Make a life-boy of the coffin and no more.' "'Mr. Stubb, Mr. Flask, come forward with me.' "'Off he goes in a huff. "'The whole he can endure. "'At the parts he balks. "'Now I don't like this. "'I make a leg for Captain Ahab, "'and he wears it like a gentleman. "'But I make a bandbox for Queequeg, "'and he won't put his head into it. "'Are all my pains to go for nothing with that coffin? "'And now I'm ordered to make a life-boy of it. "'It's like turning an old coat.' going to bring the flesh on the other side now. I don't like this cobbling sort of business. I don't like it at all. It's undignified. It's not my place. Let tinkers' brats do tinkerings. We are their betters. I like to take in hand none but clean, virgin, fair, and square, mathematical jobs, something that regularly begins at the beginning, and is at the middle when midway, and comes to an end at the uh, conclusion. Not a cobbler's job that's at an end in the middle and at the beginning at the end. It's the old woman's tricks to be giving cobbling jobs. Lord, what an affection all women have for tinkers. I know an old woman of sixty-five who ran away with a bald-headed young tinker once, and that's the reason I never would work for lonely widow old women ashore, when I kept my job shop in the vineyards. They might have taken it into their lonely old heads to run off with me. But, hi-ho, there are no caps at sea but snow-caps. Let me see. Nail down the lid. Caulk the seams. Pay over the same with pitch. Batten them down tight. And hang it with the snap-spring over the ship's stern. Were ever such things done before with a coffin? Some superstitious old carpenters now would be tied up in the rigging, ere they would do the job. But I'm made of naughty aroostook hemlock. I don't budge. Cruppered with a coffin, sailing about with a graveyard tray. But never mind. We workers in woods make bridal bedsteads and card tables, as well as coffins and hearses. We work by the month, or by the job, or by the profit. Not for us to ask the why and wherefore of our work, unless it be too confounded cobbling. Then we stash it if we can. Hem. I'll do the job now, tenderly. I'll have me, let's see, how many in the ship's company, all told, but I've forgotten. 
Anyway, I'll have me thirty separate Turks-headed lifelines, each three feet long, hanging all round the coffin. Then, if the hull go down, <laughs> there'll be thirty lively fellows all fighting for one coffin, a sight not seen very often beneath the sun. <laughs> Come, hammer, caulking iron, pitch pot, and marling spike. Let's to it. Chapter 127 The Deck the coffin laid upon two line-tubs, between the vice-bench and the open hatchway, the carpenter caulking its seams, the string of twisted oakum slowly unwinding from a large roll of it, placed in the bosom of his frock. Ahab comes slowly from the cabin gangway, and hears Pip following him. "'Back, lad. I will be with you again presently.' He goes." Not this hand complies with my humor more genially than that boy. Middle aisle of a church. What's here? A uh, life boy, sir. Mr. Starbuck's orders. Oh, look, sir, beware the hatchway. Thank ye, man. Thy coffin lies handy to the vault. Sir? Uh, the hatchway. Oh, uh, so it does, sir. Uh, so it does. Art thou not the leg-maker? Look, did not this stump come from thy shop? I believe it did, sir. Does the ferrule stand, sir? Well enough. But art thou not also the undertaker? Ay, sir. I patched up this thing here as a coffin for Queequeg, but they've set me now to turning it into something else. Then tell me, art thou not an errant, all grasping, intermeddling, monopolizing, heathenish old scamp, to be one day making legs, and the next day coffins to clap them in, and yet again life-boys out of those same coffins, thou art as unprincipled as the gods, and as much of a jack of all trades. But I do not mean anything, sir. I do as I do. The gods again. Hark ye! Dost thou not ever sing working about a coffin? The titans, they say, hummed snatches when chipping out the craters for volcanoes, and the grave-digger in the play sings spade in hand. Dost thou never? Sing, sir. Do I sing? Oh, I'm indifferent enough, sir, for that. But the reason why the grave-digger made music must have been because there was none in his spade, sir. But the caulking mallet is full of it. Hark to it. Aye, and that's because the lid there's a sounding board. And what in all things makes the sounding board is this. There's naught beneath. And yet a coffin with a body in it rings pretty much the same, Carpenter. Hast thou ever helped carry a beer, and heard the coffin knock against the churchyard gate going in? Faith, sir, I've... Faith! What's that? Why, faith, sir, it's only a sort of exclamation-like. That's all, sir. Uh, hmm. Go on. I was about to say, sir, that art thou a silkworm? Dost thou spin thy own shroud out of thyself? Look at thy bosom. Dispatch and get these traps out of sight. He goes aft. That was sudden now, but squalls come sudden in hot latitudes. I've heard that the Isle of Albemarle, one of the Galapagos, is cut by the equator right in the middle. It seems to me some sort of equator cuts yon old man, too, right in his middle. He's always under the line. Fiery hot, I tell you. He's looking this way. Come, Oakum, quick. Here we go again. <laughs> this wooden mallet is the cork. And I'm the professor of musical glasses. Tap, tap. Ahab to himself. There's a sight. There's a sound. The gray-headed woodpecker tapping the hollow tree. Blind and dumb might well be envied now. See, that thing rests on two line tubs full of tow lines. A most malicious wag, that fellow. Rat, tat. So man's seconds tick. Oh, how immaterial are all materials. 
What things real are there but imponderable thoughts? Here now's the very dreaded symbol of grim death by a mere hap made the expressive sign of the help and hope of most endangered life. A life-boy of a coffin. Does it go further? Can it be that in some spiritual sense the coffin is, after all, but an immortality preserver? I'll think of that. But no, so far gone am I in the dark side of earth that its other side, the theoretic bright one, seems but uncertain twilight to me. Will you never have done, Carpenter, with that accursed sound? I go below. Let me not see that thing here when I return again. Now then, Pip, we'll talk this over. I do suck most wondrous philosophies from thee. Some unknown conduits from the unknown worlds must empty into thee. End of chapters 124 to 127《Moby Dick》Chapters 128 to 132. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills.《Moby Dick* by Herman Melville, Chapters 128 to 132. Chapter 128. The Pequod Meets the Rachel. Next day a large ship, the Rachel, was descried, bearing directly down upon the Pequod, all her spars thickly clustering with men. At the time the Pequod was making good speed through the water, but as the broad-winged windward stranger shot nigh to her, the boastful sails all fell together as blank bladders that are burst and all life fled from the smitten hull. "'Bad news! She brings bad news!' muttered the old Manxman. But ere her commander, who, with trumpet to mouth, stood up in his boat, ere he could hopefully hail, Ahab's voice was heard. "'Has seen the white whale!' "'Aye, yesterday! Have you seen a whale-boat adrift?' Throttling his joy, Ahab negatively answered this unexpected question, and would have fain boarded the stranger, when the stranger captain himself, having stopped his vessel's way, was seen descending her side. A few keen pulls and his boat-hook soon clinched the Pequod's main chains, and he sprang to the deck. Immediately he was recognized by Ahab for a Nantucketer he knew, but no formal salutation was exchanged. "'Where was he? Not killed!' "'Not killed!' cried Ahab, closely advancing. "'How was it?' It seemed that somewhere late in the afternoon of the day previous, while three of the strangers' boats were engaged with a shoal of whales, which had led them some four or five miles from the ship, and while they were yet in swift chase to windward, the white hump and head of Moby Dick had suddenly loomed up out of the water, not very far to leeward, whereupon the fourth-rigged boat— a reserved one, had been instantly lowered in chase. After a keen sail before the wind, this fourth boat, the swiftest keeled of all, seemed to have succeeded in fastening, at least as well as the man at the masthead could tell anything about it. In the distance he saw the diminished dotted boat, and then a swift gleam of bubbling white water, and after that nothing more, whence it was concluded that the stricken whale must have indefinitely run away with his pursuers, as often happens. There was some apprehension, but no positive alarm as yet. The recall signals were placed in the riggings, darkness came on, and forced to pick up her three far-to-windward boats, ere going in quest of the fourth one in the precisely opposite direction, the ship had not only been necessitated to leave that boat to its fate till near midnight, but for the time, to increase her distance from it. 
but the rest of her crew being at last safe aboard, she crowded all sail, stunsail on stunsail, after the missing boat, kindling a fire in her tripods for a beacon, and every other man aloft on the lookout. But though when she had thus sailed a sufficient distance to gain the presumed place of the absent ones when last seen, though she then paused to lower her spare boats to pull all around her, and, not finding anything, had again dashed on, again paused and lowered her boats, and though she had thus continued doing till daylight, yet not the least glimpse of the missing keel had been seen. The story told, the stranger captain immediately went on to reveal his object in boarding the Pequod. He desired that ship to unite with his own in the search. By sailing over the sea some four or five miles apart, on parallel lines, and so sweeping a double horizon, as it were. "'I will wager something now,' whispered Stubb to Flask, "'that someone in that missing boat wore off that captain's best coat?' mayhap his watch he's so cursed anxious to get it back who ever heard of two pious whale ships cruising after one missing whaleboat in the height of the whaling season see flask only see how pale he looks pale in the very buttons of his eyes look it wasn't the coat it must have been the my boy my own boy is among them for god's sake i beg i conjure here exclaimed the stranger captain to Ahab, who thus far had but icily received his petition. For eight and forty hours let me charter your ship. I will gladly pay for it, and roundly pay for it, if there be no other way. For eight and forty hours only, only that. You must, oh, you must, and you shall do this thing. His son, cried Stubb. Oh, it's his son he's lost. I take back the coat and the watch. What says Ahab? We must save that boy. He's drowned with the rest of them last night, said the old Manx sailor standing behind them. I heard. All of you heard their spirits. Now, as it shortly turned out, what made this incident of the Rachels the more melancholy was the circumstance that not only was one of the captain's sons among the number of the missing boat's crew, but among the number of the other boat's crews, and at the same time, but on the other hand, separated from the ship during the dark vicissitudes of the chase, there had been still another son, and that for a time the wretched father was plunged to the bottom of the cruelest perplexity, which was only solved for him by his chief mates instinctively adopting the ordinary procedure of a whale ship in such emergencies, that is, when placed between jeopardized but divided boats, always to pick up the majority first. But the captain, for some unknown constitutional reason, had refrained from mentioning all this, and not till forced to it by Ahab's iciness did he allude to his one yet missing boy, a little lad but twelve years old, whose father, with the earnest but unmisgiving hardihood of a Nantucketer's paternal love, had thus early sought to initiate him in the perils and wonders of a vocation almost immemorially the destiny of all his race. Nor does it unfrequently occur that Nantucket captains will send a son of such tender age away from them for a protracted three or four years' voyage in some other ship than their own, so that their first knowledge of a whaleman's career shall be unenervated by any chance display of a father's natural but untimely partiality, or undue apprehensiveness and concern. Meantime, now the stranger was still beseeching his poor boon of Ahab, and Ahab still stood like an anvil, receiving every shock, but without the least quivering of his own. I will not go, said the stranger, till you say aye to me. Do me as you would have me do to you in the like case, for you too have a boy, Captain Ahab, though but a child and nestling safely at home now, a child of your old age too. Yes, yes, you relent. I see it. Run, run, men, now, and stand by to square in the yards. Avast, cried Ahab. Touch not a rope yarn. Then, in a voice that prolongingly molded every word, Captain Gardiner, I will not do it. Even now I lose time. Goodbye, goodbye. 
God bless ye, man, and may I forgive myself, but I must go. Mr. Starbuck, look at the binnacle watch, and in three minutes from this present instant warn off all strangers, then brace forward again and let the ship sail as before. Hurriedly turning, with averted face, he descended into his cabin, leaving the strange captain transfixed at this unconditional and utter rejection of his so earnest suit. But starting from his enchantment, Gardiner silently hurried to the side, more fell than stepped into his boat, and returned to his ship. Soon the two ships diverged their wakes and long as the strange vessel was in view, she was seen to yaw hither and thither at every dark spot, however small on the sea. This way and that, her yards were swung round, starboard and larboard, she continued to tack. Now she beat against a head sea, and again it pushed her before it, while all the while her masts and yards were thickly clustered with men, as three tall cherry-trees when the boys are cherrying among the boughs. But by her still halting course, and winding woeful way, you plainly saw that this ship that so wept with spray still remained without comfort. She was Rachel, weeping for her children, because they were not. Chapter 129 The Cabin Ahab moving to go on deck. Pip catches him by the hand to follow. Lad, lad, I tell thee, thou must not follow Ahab now. The hour is coming when Ahab would not scare thee from him, yet would not have thee by him. There is that in thee, poor lad, which I feel too curing to my malady. Like cures like and for this hunt my malady becomes my most desired health. Do thou abide below here, where they shall serve thee as if thou wert the captain. Ay, lad, thou shalt sit here in my own screwed chair. Another screw to it thou must be. No, no, no. Ye have not a whole body, sir. Do ye but use poor me for your one lost leg. Only tread upon me, sir. I ask no more, so I remain a part of ye. Oh, spite of million villains, this makes me a bigot in the fadeless fidelity of man, and a black, and crazy. But methinks like cures like applies to him, too. He grows so sane again. They tell me, sir, that Stubb did once desert poor little Pip, whose drowned bones now show white, for all the blackness of his living skin. But I will never desert ye, sir, as Stubb did him. Sir, I must go with ye. If thou speakest thus to me much more, Ahab's purpose keels up in him. I tell thee no, it cannot be. Oh, good master, master, master! Weep so, and I will murder thee. Have a care, for Ahab too is mad. Listen, and thou wilt often hear my ivory foot upon the deck, and still know that I am there. And now I quit thee. Thy hand met. True art thou, lad, as the circumference to its center. So God forever bless thee, and if it come to that, God forever save thee. Let what will befall. Ahab goes. Pip steps one step forward. Here he this instant stood. I stand in his air, but I'm alone. Now were even poor Pip here I could endure it, but he's missing. Pip! Pip! Ding dong ding! Who's seen Pip? He must be up here. Let's try the door. What? Neither lock, nor bolt, nor bar, and yet there's no opening it. It must be the spell. He told me to stay here, I, and told me this screwed chair was mine. Here, then, I'll seat me against the transom, in the ship's full middle, all her keel and her three masts before me. Here, our old sailors say, 
in their black seventy-fours great admirals sometimes sit at table and lord it over rows of captains and lieutenants ha huh, what's this epaulets epaulets the epaulets all come crowding pass round the decanters glad to see you fill up messieurs what an odd feeling now when a black boy's host to white men with gold lace upon their coats messieurs have you seen one pip a little negro lad five feet high hang-dog look and cowardly jumped from a whale-boat once seen him no well then fill up again captains and let's drink shame upon all cowards i name no names shame upon them put one foot upon the table shame upon all cowards hist above there i hear ivory oh master master i am indeed downhearted when you walk over me but here i'll stay though this stern strikes rocks and they bulge through and oysters come to join me chapter one hundred thirty the hat and now that at the proper time and place after so long and wide a preliminary cruise ahab all other whaling waters swept seemed to have chased his foe into an ocean fold to slay him the more securely there now that he found himself hard by the very latitude and longitude where his tormenting wound had been inflicted now that a vessel had been spoken which on the very day preceding had actually encountered moby dick and now that all his successive meetings with various ships contrastingly concurred to show the demoniac indifference with which the white whale tore his hunters whether sinning or sinned against now it was that there lurked a something in the old man's eyes which it was hardly sufferable for feeble souls to see as the unsetting polar star which through the livelong arctic six months night sustains its piercing steady central gaze so ahab's purpose now fixedly gleamed down upon the constant midnight of the gloomy crew it domineered above them so that all their bodings doubts misgivings fears were fain to hide beneath their souls and not sprout forth a single spear or leaf in this foreshadowing interval too all humor forced or natural vanished stubb no more strove to raise a smile starbuck no more strove to check one alike joy and sorrow hope and fear seemed ground to finest dust and powdered for the time in the clamped mortar of ahab's iron soul like machines they dumbly moved about the deck ever conscious that the old man's despot eye was on them but did you deeply scan him in his more secret confidential hours when he thought no glance but one was on him then you would have seen that even as ahab's eyes so awed the crews the inscrutable parsee's glance awed his or somehow at least in some wild way at times affected it such an added gliding strangeness began to invest the thin fadala now such ceaseless shuddering shook him that the men looked dubious at him half uncertain as it seemed whether indeed he were a mortal substance or else a tremulous shadow cast upon the deck by some unseen being's body and that shadow was always hovering there for not by night even had fadala ever certainly been known to slumber or go below he would stand still for hours but never sat or leaned his wan but wondrous eyes did plainly say we two watchmen never rest nor at any time by night or day could the mariners now step upon the deck unless ahab was before them either standing in his pivot hole or exactly pacing the planks between two undeviating limits the mainmast and the mizzen or else they saw him standing in the cabin scuttle his living foot advanced upon the deck as if to step his hat slouched heavily over his eyes so that however motionless he stood however the days and nights were added on that he had not swung in his hammock yet hidden beneath that slouching hat they could never tell unerringly whether for all this 
his eyes were really closed at times, or whether he was still intently scanning them. No matter, though he stood so in the scuttle for a whole hour on the stretch, and the unheeded night-damp gathered in beads of dew upon that stone-carved coat and hat. The clothes that night had wet, the next day's sunshine dried upon him, and so day after day, and night after night, he went no more beneath the planks. Whatever he wanted from the cabin, that thing he sent for. He ate in the same open air, that is, his two only meals, breakfast and dinner. Supper he never touched, nor reaped his beard, which darkly grew all gnarled, as unearthed roots of trees blown over, which still grow idly on at naked base, though perished in the upper verdure. But though his whole life was now become one watch on deck, and though the Parsee's mystic watch was without intermission as his own, yet these two never seemed to speak, one man to the other, unless at long intervals some passing, unmomentous matter made it necessary. Though such a potent spell seemed secretly to join the twain, openly, and to the awestruck crew, they seemed pole-like asunder. If by day they chanced to speak one word, by night dumb men were both, so far as concerned the slightest verbal interchange, at times, for longest hours, without a single hail, they stood far parted in the starlight, Ahab in his scuttle, the Parsi by the mainmast, but still fixedly gazing upon each other, as if in the Parsi Ahab saw his forethrown shadow, in Ahab the Parsi his abandoned substance. And yet somehow did Ahab, in his own proper self, as daily, hourly, and every instant, commandingly revealed to his subordinates, Ahab seemed an independent lord, the Parsi but his slave. Still again both seemed yoked together, and an unseen tyrant driving them, the lean shade siding the solid rib. For be this Parsi what he may, all rib and keel was solid Ahab. At the first faintest glimmering of the dawn, his iron voice was heard from aft, "'Man the mastheads!' And all through the day, till after sunset and after twilight, the same voice every hour at the striking of the helmsman's bell was heard, "'What do you see? Sharp! Sharp!' But when three or four days had slided by after meeting the children-seeking Rachel, and no spout had yet been seen, the monomaniac old man seemed distrustful of his crew's fidelity. At least of nearly all except the pagan harpooners, he seemed to doubt, even, whether stub and flask might not willingly overlook the sight he sought. But if these suspicions were really his, he sagaciously refrained from verbally expressing them, however his actions might seem to hint them. "'I will have first sight of the whale myself,' he said. Ay, Ahab must have the doubloon. And with his own hands he rigged a nest of basketed bowlins, and, sending a hand aloft with a single sheaved block to secure to the main masthead, he received the two ends of the downward reeved rope, and attaching one to his basket prepared a pin for the other end, in order to fasten it at the rail. This done, with that end yet in his hand, and standing beside the pin, he looked round upon his crew, sweeping from one to the other, pausing his glance long upon Dagu, Queequeg, Tashtego, but shunning Fadala, and then, settling his firm, relying eye upon the chief mate, said, Take the rope, sir. I give it into thy hands, Starbuck. Then, arranging his person in the basket, he gave the word for them to hoist him to his perch, Starbuck being the one who secured the rope at last, and afterwards stood near it. And thus, with one hand clinging round the royal mast, Ahab gazed abroad upon the sea for miles and miles, ahead, astern, this side and that, within the wide expanded circle commanded at so great a height. When, in working with his hands at some lofty, almost isolated place in the rigging, which chances to afford no foothold, the sailor at sea is hoisted up to that spot, and sustained there by the rope, under these circumstances its fastened end on deck is always given in strict charge to some one man who has the special watch of it. 
because in such a wilderness of running rigging, whose various different relations aloft cannot always be infallibly discerned by what is seen of them at the deck, and when the deck ends of these ropes are being every few minutes cast down from the fastenings, it would be but a natural fatality if, unprovided with a constant watchman, the hoisted sailor should, by some carelessness of the crew, be cast adrift and fall all swooping to the sea. So Ahab's proceedings in this matter were not unusual. The only strange thing about them seemed to be that Starbuck, almost the one only man who had ever ventured to oppose him with anything in the slightest degree approaching to decision, one of those, too, whose faithfulness on the lookout he had seemed to doubt somewhat, it was strange that this was the very man he should select for his watchman, freely giving his whole life into such an otherwise distrusted person's hands. Now the first time Ahab was perched aloft, ere he had been there ten minutes, one of those red-billed savage sea-hawks which so often fly incommodiously close round the manned mastheads of whalemen in these latitudes, one of those birds came wheeling and screaming round his head in a maze of untrackably swift circlings. Then it darted a thousand feet straight up into the air, then spiralized downwards and went eddying again round his head. But with his gaze fixed upon the dim and distant horizon, Ahab seemed not to mark this wild bird, nor, indeed, would any one else have marked it much, it being no uncommon circumstance. Only now, almost the least heedful eye seemed to see some sort of cunning meaning in almost every sight. "'Your hat! Your hat, sir!' suddenly cried the Sicilian seaman, who, being posted at the mizzen masthead, stood directly behind Ahab, though somewhat lower than his level, and with a deep gulf of air dividing them. But already the sable wing was before the old man's eyes, the long hooked bill at his head. With a scream the black hawk darted away with his prize. An eagle flew thrice round Tarquin's head, removing his cap to replace it, and thereupon Tanaquil, his wife, declared that Tarquin would be king of Rome. But only by the replacing of the cap was that omen accounted good. Ahab's hat was never restored. The wild hawk flew on and on with it, far in advance of the prow, and at last disappeared, while from the point of that disappearance a minute black spot was dimly discerned falling from that vast height into the sea. Chapter 131 the Pequod Meets the Delight The intense Pequod sailed on, the rolling waves and days went by, the life-boy coffin still lightly swung, and another ship, most miserably misnamed the Delight, was descried. As she drew nigh, all eyes were fixed upon her broad beams, called shears, which in some whaling ships crossed the quarter-deck at the height of eight or nine feet, serving to carry the spare, unrigged, or disabled boats. Upon the stranger's shears were beheld the shattered white ribs and some few splintered planks of what had once been a whale-boat. But you now saw through this wreck, as plainly as you see through the peeled, half-unhinged and bleaching skeleton of a horse. "'Hast seen the white whale?' "'Look!' replied the hollow-cheeked captain from his taffrail and with his trumpet he pointed to the wreck. "'Hast killed him?' "'The harpoon is not yet forged that will ever do that,' answered the other, sadly glancing upon a rounded hammock on the deck, whose gathered sides some noiseless sailors were busy in sewing together. "'Not forged!' And snatching Perth's leveled iron from the crotch, Ahab held it out, exclaiming, "'Look ye, Nantucketer!' Here in this hand I hold his death. Tempered in blood, and tempered by lightning are these barbs, and I swear to temper them triply in that hot place behind the fin, where the white whale most feels his accursed life. Then God keep thee, old man. Seest thou that? Pointing to the hammock. I bury but one of five stout men, who were alive only yesterday, but were dead ere night. 
Only that one I bury. The rest were buried before they died. You sail upon their tomb. Then turning to his crew, Are you ready there? Place the plank then on the rail and lift the body. So then. Oh, God! Advancing toward the hammock with uplifted hands. May the resurrection and the life... Brace forward! Up helm! cried Ahab like lightning to his men. But the suddenly started Pequod was not quick enough to escape the sound of the splash that the corpse soon made as it struck the sea. Not so quick, indeed, but that some of the flying bubbles might have sprinkled her hull with their ghostly baptism. As Ahab now glided from the dejected delight, the strange life-boy hanging at the Pequod's stern came into conspicuous relief. "'Ha! Yonder!' "'Look yonder, men!' cried a foreboding voice in her wake. "'In vain, O oh, ye strangers, you fly our sad burial. "'You but turn us your taffrail to show us your coffin.'" Chapter 132 The Symphony It was a clear, steel-blue day. The firmaments of air and sea were hardly separable in that all-pervading azure. Only the pensive air was transparently pure and soft, with a woman's look, and the robust and man-like sea heaved with long, strong, lingering swells as Samson's chest in his sleep. Hither and thither, on high, glided the snow-white wings of small, unspeckled birds, these were the gentle thoughts of the feminine air, but to and fro in the deeps, far down in the bottomless blue, rushed mighty leviathans, swordfish, and sharks, and these were the strong, troubled, murderous thinkings of the masculine sea. But though thus contrasting within, the contrast was only in shades and shadows without, those two seemed one. It was only the sex, as it were, that distinguished them. Aloft, like a royal czar and king, the sun seemed giving this gentle air to this bold and rolling sea, even as bride to groom. And at the girdling line of the horizon, a soft and tremulous motion, most seen here at the equator, denoted the fond, throbbing trust, the loving alarms with which the poor bride gave her bosom away. Tied up and twisted, gnarled and knotted with wrinkles, haggardly firm and unyielding, his eyes glowing like coals that still glow in the ashes of ruin, untottering Ahab stood forth in the clearness of the morn, lifting his splintered helmet of a brow to the fair girl's forehead of heaven. O oh, immortal infancy and innocency of the azure, invisible winged creatures that frolic all round us, Sweet childhood of air and sky, how oblivious were ye of old Ahab's close-coiled woe! But so have I seen little Miriam and Martha, laughing-eyed elves, heedlessly gambol around their old sire, sporting with the circle of singed locks which grew on the marge of that burnt-out crater of his brain. Slowly crossing the deck from the scuttle, Ahab leaned over the side, and watched how his shadow in the water sank and sank to his gaze, the more and the more that he strove to pierce the profundity. But the lovely aromas in that enchanted air did at last seem to dispel, for a moment, the cankerous thing in his soul. That glad, happy air, that winsome sky, did at last stroke and caress him. The stepmother world, so long cruel, forbidding, now threw affectionate arms round his stubborn neck, and did seem to joyously sob over him, as if over one that, however willful and erring, she could yet find it in her heart to save and to bless. From beneath his slouched hat Ahab dropped a tear into the sea. Nor did all the Pacific contain such wealth as that one wee drop. Starbuck saw the old man, saw him, how he heavily leaned over the side, and he seemed to hear in his own true heart the measureless sobbing that stole out of the center of the serenity around. Careful not to touch him, or be noticed by him, he yet drew near to him, and stood there. 
Ahab turned. Starbuck. Sir. Oh, Starbuck. It is a mild, mild wind, and a mild-looking sky. On such a day, very much such a sweetness as this, I struck my first whale, a boy harpooner of eighteen. Forty, forty, forty years ago, ago, forty years of continual whaling, forty years of privation and peril and storm time, forty years on the pitiless sea, for forty years has Ahab forsaken the peaceful land, for forty years to make war on the horrors of the deep. Ay, and yes, Starbuck, out of those forty years I have not spent three ashore. When I think of this life I have led, the desolation of solitude it has been, the masoned, walled town of a captain's exclusiveness, which admits but small entrance to any sympathy from the green country without, oh, weariness, heaviness, Guinea Coast slavery of solitary command. When I think of all this, only half suspected, not so keenly known to me before, and how for forty years I have fed upon dry, salted fare, fit emblem of the dry nourishment of my soul, when the poorest landsman has had fresh fruit to his daily hand, and broken the world's fresh bread to my mouldy crusts. Away, whole oceans away from that young girl wife I wedded past fifty, and sailed for Cape Horn the next day, leaving but one dent in my marriage pillow. Wife, <laughs> wife, rather a widow with her husband alive. Aye, I widowed that poor girl when I married her, Starbuck, and then the madness, the frenzy, the boiling blood and the smoking brow with which for a thousand lowerings old Ahab has furiously, foamingly chased his prey, more a demon than a man. Aye, aye, what a forty years fool, fool, old fool as old Ahab been. Why this strife of the chase? Why weary and palsy the arm at the oar, and the iron and the lance? How the richer or better is Ahab now? Behold! O oh, Starbuck, is it not hard that with this weary load I bear one poor leg should have been snatched from under me? Here, brush this old hair aside. It blinds me that I seem to weep. Locks so gray did never grow, but from out some ashes. But do I look very old? So very old, Starbuck, I feel deadly faint, bowed and humped, as though I were Adam staggering beneath the piled centuries since paradise. God, 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 crack my heart, stave my brain. Mockery, mockery, bitter, biting mockery of gray hairs. Have I lived enough joy to wear ye? and seem and feel thus intolerably old? Close. Stand close to me, Starbuck. Let me look into a human eye. It is better than to gaze into sea or sky, better than to gaze upon God. By the green land, by the bright hearthstone, this is the magic glass, man. I see my wife and my child in thine eye. No, no, stay on board, on board. Lower not when I do, when branded Ahab gives chase to Moby Dick. That hazard shall not be thine. No, no, not with the far away home I see in that eye. Oh, my captain, my captain, noble soul, grand old heart after all. Why should any one give chase to that hated fish? Away with me! Let us fly these deadly waters. Let us home. Wife and child, too, are Starbucks. Wife and child of his brotherly, sisterly, playfellow youth, even as thine, sir, are the wife and child of thy loving, longing, paternal old age. Away! Let us away! 
this instant let me alter the course. How cheerily, how hilariously, oh, my captain, would we bowl our way to see old Nantucket again. I think, sir, they have some such mild blue days, even as this in Nantucket. They have, they have. I have seen them. Some summer days in the morning. About this time. Yes, it is his noon nap now. The boy vivaciously wakes, sits up in bed, and his mother tells him of me, of cannibal old me, how I am abroad upon the deep, but will yet come back to dance him again. Tis my Mary, my Mary herself. She promised that my boy every morning should be carried to the hill to catch the first glimpse of his father's sail. Yes, yes, no more. It is done. We head for Nantucket. Come, my captain, study out the course and let us away. See, see, the boy's face from the window, the boy's hand on the hill. But Ahab's glance was averted. Like a blighted fruit tree he shook and cast his last cindered apple to the soil. What is it? What nameless, inscrutable, unearthly thing is it? What cousining, hidden lord and master, and cruel, remorseless emperor commands me, that against all natural lovings and longings I so keep pushing and crowding and jamming myself on all the time? recklessly making me ready to do what in my own proper natural heart I durst not so much as dare. Is Ahab, Ahab? Is it I, God, or who that lifts this arm? But if the great sun move not of himself, but is as an errand boy in the heaven, nor one single star can revolve but by some invisible power, then how can this one small heart beat, this one small brain think thoughts, unless God does that beating, does that thinking, does that living, and not I. By heaven, man, we are turned round and round in this world, like yonder windless, and fate is the handspike. And all the time, lo, that smiling sky and this unsounded sea. Look, see yon albacore? Who put it into him to chase and fang that flying fish? Where do murderers go, man? Who's to doom when the judge himself is dragged to the bar? But it is a mild, mild wind and a mild-looking sky, and the air smells now as if it blew from a far-away meadow. They have been making hay somewhere under the slopes of the Andes, Starbuck, and the mowers are sleeping among the new-mown hay. Sleeping! Aye, toil we how we may, we all sleep at last on the field. Sleep, aye, and rust amid greenness, as last year's scythes flung down and left in the half-cut swaths. Starbuck! But blanched to a corpse's hue with despair, the mate had stolen away. Ahab crossed the deck to gaze over on the other side, but started at two reflected, fixed eyes in the water there. Fadala was motionlessly leaning over the same rail. End of chapters 128 to 132